by Pana Toothpaste and Sal Hepatica present... Mr. District Attorney, champion of the people, defender of truth, guardian of our fundamental rights to life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. <laughs> Mr. District Attorney is brought to you by Ipana Toothpaste and Sal Hepatica. Ipana for the smile of beauty... Sal Hepatica for the smile of health. Ipana, Sal Hepatica. And it shall be my duty as district attorney not only to prosecute to the limit of the law all persons accused of crimes perpetrated within this county but to defend with equal vigor the rights and privileges of all its citizens. Tonight's case of the sinister cinema, ladies and gentlemen, concerns a master criminal, a man whose knowledge of his fellow man is keen and penetrating. We can almost say that Richard C. Graves has based his astounding crime solely on his understanding that men are vain, and therein lies the tragedy of his success. We begin in the private office of the president of a small bank here in our city. Well, that's my proposition, Mr. Claypool. How does it strike you? Why, I, I hardly know what to say, Mr. Uh, uh, Mr. Graves. Richard Seagraves Productions. Oh, yes, yes, I know. Uh, you're from Hollywood, you say, sir? Well, I've produced most of my pictures in Hollywood, Mr. Claypool. That's true. You've seen them, of course. Gone with the Storm, Valley of Wind. Oh, and... Of course. A cigar, Mr. Seagraves? Oh, yes, thank you. But as I said, Claypool, the tendency these days is to shoot on location. As I was telling the boys at the Academy Award dinner just recently, we've got to get out and photograph the real thing. Oh, the Academy Award, eh? Oh, Ronald Coleman and, uh, who was it my wife was... Oh, yes, Loretta Young. Yes, yes, yes. dear Loretta. Daryl, I said, you and L.B. and the rest of us, we've got to go out and photograph real people. And you want to use my bank, Mr. Seagraves? Uh, just for one shot, Mr. Claypool, but what a shot. Think of it. Think of the Radio City Music Hall in New York. Yes? <laughs> Those dancing girls, you mean? We open up in a bank. Not a Hollywood bank, A.B. A real bank. This one. And who do we see? Whose face do these millions of people look at? An actor's? No. Oh, uh, mine? The face of a banker. A.B. Claypool. Honesty, courage, the backbone of America. Your face. Well, I must say, I... <clears throat> of course, this is irregular, Mr. Seagraves, highly irregular. We have a business to run, you know. You hit it right on the head there, A.B., and that's exactly what we want, to see your business in action. Why, we won't change a thing. Your customers won't even know we're shooting the picture. They won't? Realism, A.B. Realism, it's the coming thing. You'll come out of your office, greet our star, just as if you were another customer, and we grind away. Oh, your star, did you say? Well, let's not let this get out, A.B. Variety and Billboard have spies, you know. Well, they have? Yes, it's Dolly Eads. Dolly Eads? I, I don't think I recall oh, having... Oh, what an actress. What a personality, A.B. And when the cameras start rolling here in the bank, when Dolly turns that smile on A.B. Claypool, man, oh, man. <laughs> well, I, I did a little acting back in college, come to think of it. Uh, Rutgers, 1919. Oh, that's wonderful, A.B., wonderful. It's all set, then. We'll do this shot this afternoon. But this afternoon? Don't you worry about a thing, A.B. We'll be in here shooting before you know it. When did this report come in, Miss Miller? The one from Battle Creek, Chief? Yes. This morning. Well, this is really amazing. Hmm? Oh. I'd hardly believe it possible. Yeah, I want you. Oh, this will interest you, Harrington. Yeah. Uh, didn't you say not so long ago that there are no new tricks in the book? He did. Yeah, certainly I did, Miss Miller. Hmm. Well, look at that bum I put in the lineup this morning. Pulling the old gypsy handkerchief gag. What? That's one of the oldest in the game. Well, this report from Michigan isn't an old one. Yes? Why, it's absolutely astounding. Well, what is the gag, Chief? Uh, bank robbery, actually. Huh? Only the bank hardly knows it's been robbed. What? Well, according to this report, this gang goes to the bank ahead of time and arranges to shoot a movie. Uh, arranges to do what? Yeah, yes, that's what it says here. <laughs> they convince the banking people that they're going to do a shot for a motion picture. What? 
I don't get it, Chief. Well, then they return a few hours later, set up a camera, and photograph what the bank thinks is a scene. Oh, and it ain't. <laughs> Decidedly not. In Battle Creek, they got away with $60,000. What? Oh, Chief, yeah. you're kidding. Well, it's, it's all here. Oh, and it's done with imagination, apparently. Well, Cards printed with impressive Hollywood addresses, a producer with a cigar, or oh, everything. Oh, honestly. The camera equipment, of course. The works. <laughs> Shot for a movie. Yeah. Oh, Chief, now I've heard everything. Say, I don't think we ought to treat this lightly. Yeah. Uh, Miss Miller. Uh, yes, sir. Call the Banking Association here in the city, will you? Ask them if they have any way of notifying their banks about this. Right away, Chief. And if they haven't, we'll do it ourselves. All right. Yeah, any idea where these boys were headed, Chief? Well, the Battle Creek report doesn't say, Harrington. However, I think we'd better check up on that, too. Yeah, right. A movie. <laughs> <laughs> Chief. Well, that's the darndest thing I ever heard of. Uh, it was beautiful, Georgiana, if I do say so myself. He swallowed everything, Dick? Complete. He even thinks he's seen you in the movies, darling. What's so unusual about that? I got a nice figure. That's beside the point. What do you mean, beside the point? I got a peel. Haven't I, Richie? Uh, later, Dolly. Georgia and I, and I, and I have to plan things. What time, Dick? Uh, two o'clock, I thought. I left his office at 11. Two o'clock? Oh, gee, it's noon now. Oh, I'd better get made up. In a moment, Dolly. That's two hours, Dick. I wonder if it's too long a time. He won't call anybody, Georgia. Not A.B. Claypool. Who? Your leading man, Dolly. He's probably in front of a mirror right now, rehearsing. I still don't like too much time between your visit and the fireworks, Dick. Gives them time to think. Time to get suspicious, uh, maybe. Relax, Georgiana. This one is a cinch. Well, everything's ready, at least. Now, how about the camera? I told him we'd use a small crew, the intimate touch, you know. I got the camera. How about you? Huh? Me? Come to, will you? Do you have your makeup? Who's telling whom to come to, uh, to may I ask? <laughs> Dolly, Dolly, you've got to cooperate. Georgiana, ask you a question. My figure beside the point. Sure, I've got makeup, just like Battle Creek. All right, I'll do your face. Get a towel. I can do it myself. Do what Georgiana says, Dolly. I can do what I said. What am I supposed to be? A movie star, dear. A rich young thing making a deposit in a bank, remember? She won't. I will, too. Oh, Richie. Uh, I'll run along, Dolly. You like my figure, don't you, Richie? Um, you're sweet, Dolly. Now run along and get made up. Well, at least I don't look like... like... Like what? Like the broadside of a barn. Well, you brainless little tramp. What? You mustn't mind, Dolly Georgiana, please. I don't. After all, we do need her. The squares could think she's a movie star. I know, Dick. Shall we go on with the plans now? If she gets on your nerves, just let me know. That won't be necessary, Dick. If the time comes, I can handle Dolly in my own way. If the time comes, Georgiana... And I'll get you. When you begin to confuse my figure with her brain. It's a quarter after twelve, Chief. You have a luncheon appointment at one. Oh, yes, I know, Miss Miller. Thank you. Oh, and I called the Banking Association. Mm. They were just as amazed as you were. Oh, on that Battle Creek matter. Mm -hmm. What did they say? <laughs> They never heard anything like it, Chief. Hmm. They're putting out a bulletin on it. Good. Oh. Yes, come in, Harrington. Come uh, in. Yeah. Well, I've been doing some telephoning, Chief. Yes? Among other places, Battle Creek. Oh. Yeah, you were right when you said we shouldn't take this bank thing lightly. Mm -hmm. I found out a lot more about that outfit. Fine. What do you have? Well, in the first place, I got a pretty good description on three of them, Chief. Mm -hmm. A man and two dames. Mm -hmm. One of the women pretends to be a movie star. Well, how can she do that? Yeah, what you say, Miss Miller? How can you pretend to be a star, Harrington? Either you are one, everybody knows you, or you're not. Okay, so she pretends to be a new star, then. Or a foreign one, Miss Miller. How do I know? I, I thought you said you checked. I did. Well, all right, go on, Harrington. Anything else? Yeah, but these interruptions, yeah. Chief, they're confused. Mm. Plenty, well, Chief. Under descriptions, yeah, one of these dames is very, very pretty. Yes, yes. Yeah, the other one sounds like a lady wrestler. Yes, and? Here's the payoff, Chief. Mm -hmm. They're almost sure this gang was headed this way. What? Yeah, I can trace them up to three days ago, and then we lose them, Chief. Mm. And when we lost them, 
they were on their way here. I see. Uh, Miss Miller... Yes, Chief. Of uh, course, that, that don't mean they are here, Chief. No, I ask around a little since this morning. They ain't checked in with the boys around town. Yes, I know, but we can't afford to take a chance. Uh, Miss Miller, call the banking association back, will you? And tell them we'll notify the member banks from here. All right, I'll get their list. What do you do, Chief? Send a letter on it? Oh, we'll do better, I think. Uh, tell the mimeograph room to stand by, please, Miss Miller. Okay. And call the motor pool downstairs. We'll need eight or ten motorcycle messengers. Right away, Chief. We'll just put the whole story in a bulletin, Harrington, and send it around to the banks right now. Mr. Seagraves, right on time, I see. I hope I didn't keep you waiting. Oh, not at all, A.B. We were uh, just getting the camera set up. Uh, oh, uh, A.B., may I present our little leading lady, Miss Dolly Eve. I'm pleased to make your acquaintance. Oh, Miss Eve, this is a pleasure, a great pleasure. Likewise. Oh, pardon my makeup. A.B., I see you change your suit. Hmm? What? Uh, oh, my suit. Well, yes. <laughs> I was home for lunch, and Martha, my wife, she... Uh, you like it? Fine, A.B., just fine. All set up, Mr. Seagraves. Oh, excuse me. Uh, ready, Georgiana? Yeah, I must say, I'm somewhat at sea, Mr. Seagraves. Is, is this all there is to it? Just one camera? Well, just the one by the door, A.B., but what a camera. In the hands of Georgiana Heron, it's sheer poetry. You've uh, seen her name, I know. Oh, yes, yes, I believe I have. My goodness, I expected lights and all sorts of things. Uh, we cleared the space, Mr. Seagraves. Uh, not necessary at all, A.B. Realism, you know, realism. All set, Miss Eves? Oh, Sure. You've uh, notified the tellers and everyone just to go on about their regular duties, A.B.? Yes, I have, Mr. Seagraves. Oh, I've been busy, I can assure you. Why, I haven't even read my mail. Well, we won't take long. You've got the sequence, Miss Eaton. I think so, Mr. Seagraves. I go up to this nice gentleman here, say my lines, and he escorts me behind the little cage. Uh, uh, behind the cage? Uh, just show our money, A.B., pick up a handful of it, and just show it to Miss Eaton. Oh, it's in the script. Script. We won't bother with the lines, A.B. We dub them in back on the coast, you understand. You just make with your mouth like you were talking with me. Uh, I see. Ready, Mr. Seagraves? Oh, I'll just get out of the way, then. All set, A.B.? Miss Eads? Roll them. Yes, I, I think I'm quite ready. Everything okay? Like candy from a baby. Now, just act natural, everybody. All right, Miss Eads? We're rolling. Don't turn your back to the door, Dick. I'm all right. All right, Miss Eads. Your lines, please. I want this realistic, you know. Why, why, I'd just love to see all that money, Mr. Claypool. Oh, oh, back here, behind this tiny little cage. Oh, that's fine, that's fine. Now, take her arm, if you will, A.B. Yes, that's fine. There they go, Georgia. Wait till he gets that cage open. I know. That's right, A.B. Now, let Miss Eads go in ahead of you, please. If she doesn't stand in front of that alarm, I'll murder her. Well, I, I don't know what to say. Should I just move my lips... Oh, it's terrific. It's sensational, A.B. It's sensational. We're getting every expression. Now, where's the bag? Right here. Go on. Now, please don't stare at the camera, folks. It's just a movie. Ah, that's fine, A.B. That's fine. Little smile, Miss Eads, please. All right. Yeah, yeah I'm beginning to enjoy this. Oh, uh, it couldn't be better. Now, please don't crowd near us, folks. It's just a movie. That's right. Go on about your business. All right, Dolly. Let's put the dough in the bag. Oh, did, uh, you mustn't touch the money, Mr. Seagraves. No, no, really. Get it, Georgiana. Now, don't miss his eyes. Right. Come on, hurry it up, darling. Right. I'm a chick. Give me a chance. Oh, now, see here, Seagraves. I asked you not to touch the money. That's real. Now, huh? careful, A.B. Keep your profile to the camera. All set, doll. That's all of it, Richie. Here, where are you going with that? Stop, I say. Uh, Mr. Seagraves. Perfect, A.B. Perfect. Sensational. Did you catch all that, Georgiana? I'm Stop, I say. What's the meaning of this? Come on, Dolly, move. Relax, folks. It's only a movie. Let's get out of here. Right with you, baby. Now, I warned you, Seagraves. Picture or not, I'm going. I'm setting off that alarm. Get away from me, you big Help. Hug. Help. Stop them. Shut up. Somebody stop them. Just a scene in a picture, friend. All right, Mr. Seagraves. Let's have the shot but now. This is unheard of. Get out of my way. I told you, A.B. Shut up. Richie, look out. Sorry, A.B., but I said this has got to be real. Pay no attention, friends. It's just a movie. I just... I'm shot. I, help me. I... Gee. Perfect, A.B. Just perfect. All set, George. All set. Now keep them rolling. Wonderful, A.B. Keep it up. Come on, doll. Stay in front of the camera now. Now back, George. Take it straight back. Let's go. Out the door, doll. Folks, please don't watch the camera. You'll spoil the scene. Hold the door. I am. George, in the car. She's waiting. Okay, then. 
Great work, folks. That was fine. Fine, A.B. One of the best acting jobs I've seen in years. Come on, Dolly. Let's go. In just a few moments, we will pick up the developments of this interesting case. But first, here's an important question. Tell me, who should know best the difference between toothpaste? Who should know best the difference between toothpastes? Why, the dentist, of course. He knows best because his life work is the health of your gums and the care of your teeth. So listen, please, to this sound advice. Ask your dentist about Ipana toothpaste and gentle gum massage. So many dentists recommend massage. Yes, and a nationwide survey shows more dentists recommend Ipana toothpaste than any other dentifrice. And wait a moment. More dentists personally use Ipana than any other toothpaste. Yes, Ipana toothpaste followed by gentle gum massage is the modern way to aid the health of your gums and the brilliance of your smile. So help your dentist help you. He knows the value of gentle gum massage to tone up your gums. Begin now getting your new Ipana smile. Taste the freshness, feel the cleanness, see the sparkle. Get Ipana toothpaste for your Ipana smile. And now back to Mr. District Attorney. Let's get organized, Harrington. Yeah. Everyone's here? Yes, sir. The bank employees are all downstairs in the meeting room, yes, Thank you, Miss Miller. We yes. want all of them. Okay. Boy, that's irony, or whatever you call it, Chief. Your message about the Battle Creek job is on this Claypool's desk. Yes, I saw it. Mm-hmm. Unopened. His secretary said he was so excited about appearing in the picture, he didn't do anything else. In a movie. Well, it's our Michigan gang, all right, Chief. There's no doubt about that. Yes. Hey, what's this, Harrington? What? What do you got, Chief? Yeah, it looks like... Broken glass here on the floor. Huh? Well, Chief, excuse me. Uh, here's Ray. Oh, good. I want photographs and diagrams, Miss Miller. Well, this one shouldn't be too tough, Chief. Mm. We got a whole bank full of witnesses. They all thought when this Seagrave shot, it was part of a scene. Yes, I know. Uh, what's the loss, Harrington? Are they through checking? Well, it'll run about thirty-five grand, Chief. Mm. Claypool used the main cage. Yes. Yeah. You know, it's the audacity of this thing that gets me. Hmm. One man and two women, and they pull this off without a hitch. Oh, it's tricky, all right, Chief. Hmm. Yeah, but maybe we can show them a few tricks of our own. And the district attorney issued a similar bulletin to all banking institutions in the county. I don't get it. So what? We got the dough. Well, Georgiana means, Dolly, that we can't pull it off again. At least not around here. I figured on that. But this stinking paper is a new syndicate. That'll queer the act in every town in the country. Uh, It'll blow over, Georgiana. We could just lie around and take it easy for a while. I'd like that. On what? We need money, Dick. Money? Well, we just got nearly 40 grand from that one bank alone. Georgiana means good money, though. We can't pass the bank stuff until the heat blows over. If we picked a town small enough, maybe we could pull it off again. Someplace where they don't read the papers. The same thing, Georgiana? Just about. I'll have to get another part for the front of the camera. I lost it. What for? You don't really take pictures, do you? Georgiana means that the camera has to look real, doll. I'll take a look at the map. Maybe there's a small town we can hit. Well, I say we don't. You what? We got all the money, and I say spend it. I'm sick of working. Spend it? Are you crazy? Georgiana just explained all. You can't spend money if the bank has a record of the bills. I don't care. You promised, Richie. You said we could just lie around and have fun. That is also beside the point. You stay out of this. I think it's wrong anyway, Didn't know you were going to kill people. No, now listen, just... Never mind, Dick. As I remarked before, I'll handle things when the time comes. Time? What time? Soon, I think. I promise you, Dolly, I'll let you know. Uh, 
Will you switch off that light, please, Miss Miller? I want Harrington to see this. Hmm? Yes, sir. What, in the microscope, Chief? Yes, that's right. It's that broken glass I found on the floor of the bank. Hmm. Hmm. I see it, Chief. Hmm. Now, what's that mean? Well, I'm not quite sure. Uh, did you send for Ray, Miss Miller? Yes, I did. He's on uh, the way up from the photo lab now. Hmm. What's up, Chief? Something in Ray's pictures? Well, no, no. As a matter of fact, I, I simply want his opinion on something. All right, and the lights, please, Miss Miller. Okay. Mm. But you know, broken glass is always interesting. Each piece seems to have a personality all its own. Yeah, sure, Chief, but well, that ain't finding sea graves, Chief. No. You put out the alert? Yeah, right away. I made it a full five states. Good. Oh, and the bills from the bank? Well, they had a pretty complete list of the numbers, Chief. Oh, well, that's a break. Uh, put it out on a full distribution, Miss Miller. Stores, depots, bus stations, everywhere. Okay, it's being prepared down in Mimeo now. Fine. Well, we'll just keep at this, Harrington. One way or another, we've got to bring that trio in. I can't see the point in arguing about it, Dick. It's a matter of common sense. But we might need her, Georgiana. You said yourself you've got a small town picked out. I know that. We'll leave as soon as the part for the camera's ready. Then let's take her with us. I said no. Oh, but she's a nice kid, Georgiana. Should have seen that guy in the bank give her the once over. She softens him up. If necessary, I can play the actress. You? Yes, me. The choice is quite clear, Dick. The girl is blood shy. Well, I guess you know best, Georgiana. You always do. <laughs> My dear boy, the woods are full of fancy figures. Yeah. So are banks. Only if we could just bring... I told you. All right? Yeah, sure. Sure, if you say so. Call her. Now? Now. Okay, okay, sure. Hey, Dolly. Come on in here a minute. Stand back, Dick. Oh, no, you haven't got a chance to talk to her. What for? She's hardly intellectual. Dolly! I'm coming. Well, what are you... Hey! Hey, Richie, stop her. She's got a gun. I told you, young lady, I'd let you know when it's time. Well, it's time! <laughs> it's high time. Dick, you know something? What? She did have a beautiful figure. Tell you, it's definite, Chief. Mm -hmm. They found a dame about three hours ago. Are you certainly, Harrington, uh, sure it's the one who posed as an actress? It's a positive identification, Chief. Mm -hmm. Four employees from the bank just saw her in the morgue. I see. And she was shot, you said? I say she was clean as a whistle. Well, all right, let's get to work. Uh, tell Dr. Colgan I want the slug. He's working on it now, Chief. Uh, when he gets it, set up a comparison check with the slug from Claypool's bar. Right. Oh, Chief. Yes, Miss Miller, what is it? Ray's on the phone, Chief. Yes? He says he's located just what you want. What? Ray, Chief? Uh-huh. Our photographer? Uh, definitely, Harrington. Get the address, Miss Miller, and tell him to stay there. Right. Uh, bring that comparison microscope, Harrington. Uh, we'll need it. All set? I've got it, Chief. All right, let's hope this is it, then. Come on, let's go. It's a small town, Dick. Don't forget that when you talk to the banker. Tomorrow morning, huh, Georgiana? Sooner the better. Anyway, I think it's wise to get out of this town. Mm, you mean Dolly? For one, yes. As soon as we can pack, we'll get going. Uh, what about the camera? Oh, I picked up the part this morning. Huh? Who's that? One of Jerry's boys, I think. I asked him to drop around. Here? Yeah? What for? We need a third, Dick. I thought I'd offer a 20% split on a one-shot. Okay, then. Uh, come in. Yeah? You're from Jerry's? Not quite, lady. This is the district attorney. What? Don't move, bud. Or is the name Seagraves? All set up, chief. Uh, thank you, Harrington. Well, this makes it easy, doesn't it? Easy? What are you talking about? Murder. Or to be more accurate, two murders. All right, get your coats, please. You're both under arrest. Arrest? Well, you're crazy. What for? You heard him, pal. Come on, the camera's rolling. You can play the scene right up to the hilt. 
Your district attorney will return in just a moment to explain the clues which led to the arrest in tonight's case. But first, first let's bend an ear to one of those early morning sounds. One that says, rise and shine. (laughs) Now, to a lot of people, that sound can mean a wonderful morning with a good day ahead. But to a lot of people, there's another sound that can mean the same thing. And that's the sparkling sound of sal hepatica in a glass of water. And remember, unlike slow-acting laxatives, a sparkling glass of sal hepatica, when you get up, brings quick, gentle relief, usually within an hour. That means you don't have to feel dull and headachy all day, waiting until night to take the laxative you needed in the morning. And if, at the same time, you're troubled with excess gastric acidity, let sal hepatica help sweeten your stomach. So keep a bottle of sal hepatica handy. Then, any time you need a laxative... Morning, noon, or night... See how much faster you feel better... Thanks to gentle, speedy Sal Hepatica. And now, here is your district attorney... I'm happy to report, ladies and gentlemen, that both Richard Seagraves and Georgiana Heron will pay the full penalty demanded for the murder of A.B. Claypool and the murder of their associate, Dolly E. Gee, that was one of the strangest, Chief. Yes, Miss Miller, it was. But like all criminals, they made a mistake. And like all criminals, now they'll pay for their mistake. Yep, their mistake being when the dame dropped a part of that camera on the floor of the bank. Yes, Harrington. As you know, under the microscope, we were able to determine that the broken glass from the bank floor was part of a camera lens. So you had Ray check on the camera supply stores in town, isn't that right, Chief? Yes, exactly, Miss Miller. Ray assured me, you see, that not more than a dozen stores carried the kind of lens needed to replace the broken one. Fortunately, Georgiana went to one of these stores for a replacement. And that was the beginning of the end, Chief. She leaves a trail... And we follow it. Yes, and of course, we were able to prove the gun in their possession killed both Mr. Claypool and Dolly Eads. I think I'll just pass up that screen test, Chief. Yeah, uh, what screen test, Miss Miller? What? Oh, nothing, Harrington. A girl can dream, can't she? Oh, Chief, what about next week? <laughs> well, ladies and gentlemen, again next week we see the futility of a life of crime, but in a very different and unusual way in the case of service in silver. And I invite you to join us for it. And so until then, thank you and good night. Say, mister, want some good shaving advice? Forget your whiskers. What counts is your face. How it feels while you're shaving. How it feels and looks afterwards. And to give yourself a better feeling, better looking face, use Ingram Shaving Cream. You see that rich Ingram lather on your brush? Helps condition your face for the razor. Result? Cool, comfortable, soothing shaves. Just remember, comfort means coolness. Coolness means Ingram. I-N-G-R-A-M. Ingram, the cooler shaving cream. Try Ingram tomorrow. of all characters in tonight's dramatization are fictitious and any resemblance to names of living persons or actual places is purely coincidental. Our stars were Jay Justin in the title role, Len Doyle as Harrington and Vicky Vola as Miss Miller. The music was under the direction of Peter Van Steeden. The program is produced and directed by Edward A. Byron and written by Robert Shaw. Mr. District Attorney was originated by Phillips H. Lord. Remember, I pan a toothpaste for the smile of beauty, sal hepatica for the smile of health. Bristol Myers invites you to tune in again next week for Duffy's Tavern and Mr. District Attorney. This is NBC, the national broadcasting company. I Pana Toothpaste and Sal Hepatica present Mr. District Attorney, Champion of the People, Defender of Truth, 
guardian of our fundamental rights to life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Mr. District Attorney is brought to you by Ipana Toothpaste and Sal Hepatica. Ipana for the smile of beauty, Sal Hepatica for the smile of health. Ipana, Sal Hepatica. crimes perpetrated within this county, but to defend with equal vigor the rights and privileges of all its citizens. In our experience, in our war against crime, ladies and gentlemen... Nothing in the popular conception of crime is so widespread and so erroneous as the idea that honor exists among thieves. In tonight's case of the deadly snowflake, we see this so-called criminal code for what it is. A cold, stubborn, selfish fear based on a colossal contempt for decency. We begin in a bedroom darkened by shades drawn tight to the sill. Agnes. Agnes, is that you? Go back to sleep, Larry. The doc says you should rest. I hit my doc. They threw him out years ago. Did you talk to him, Agnes? They told me not to. Don't you think you'd better? What's the matter? Get the bandages off your head, huh? I'm lucky I'm alive, he said, Agnes. That cop's bullet went right across my skull. I know. You're lucky you got home. I still got my fingers, too. That's real talent, Agnes. One in a million. What do you mean you still got your fingers? I'll, uh... I'll get to that. First, I... I just want to say I'm sorry about... Well, about the way I've been treating you. You what? Uh, I don't mean to... Well, knock you around, Agnes. I I just get nervous when I'm going out on a job. What's come over you, Larry? You know how it is... Feeling those tumblers fall with your fingers? It's tough work, Agnes. Oh, uh, that reminds me. What? I want you to get hold of a guy. You remember him? Rudy Bowie? Oh. Oh. What's the matter? Nothing. I just haven't heard you mention Rudy in so long. What do you need him for? To help me. I've got to get back to work, Agnes. We'll be needing dough. We could sell that crazy boat. The snowflake? No, I mean big dough. More jobs, Agnes. Like that transfer office I had cased out. I don't see what you need Rudy for. He's no safe man. I don't need a Peterman, Agnes. Just a helper. Someone to... to take me around. Take you around? Fred, what do you mean? Agnes, I... There's something the matter. Now, what is it, Larry? I'm blind. <laughs> There's a few more, Chief. Squad D report the total arrest on the arson case. Oh, yes, I know, Miss Smitter. Send a copy of the findings over to the commissioner, if you will. It's on the way. Good. Well, what about you, Harrington? Anything on that warehouse robbery? Chief, I've been over that job with a fine-tooth comb. I pulled McHenry out of his prowl car all day yesterday just to get his story again. Uh, Mac Henry's the officer who shot at the men as they escaped, Chief. Well, yeah, shot and missed, I'm sorry to say, Chief. Missed completely? I thought the officer's report a week ago indicated that he might have hit one of the men. Yeah, that's right, Chief, he might, but nobody's been showing up dead in any of the alleys, though. Mm-hmm. So that adds up to what? You've no idea at all? Well, if... Just one, Chief. Yeah, and I'll say this before I start, Miss Miller. It ain't scientific. Harrington, I haven't said a word. I know, but you will, you will. The point is, Chief, I want to... Well, I want to play this one on a hunch. Oh. Well, we've played your hunches before, haven't we? Yeah. Yes, and we've got results, too. What's your thought? Okay, let's go back to this warehouse job for a minute, Okay. I don't have to. The warehouse people have been on the phone about it all week. So what was it? A Peterman job. Am I right? No powder, no dynamite, no blasting. 
just a straight Peterman. A what? A Peterman, Miss Miller, a man who opens safes. Oh. Yeah, you're welcome. Uh, Chief, I went over that warehouse safe 20 times. The guy opened it with his fingers. Yes, yes, you put that in your original report. Right. Now think about this thing. Feeling for those tumblers ain't easy, you know. That's very delicate work. You gotta be trained to it. Yes, go on. Okay, so it comes down to this, Chief. There's three guys I know who could have fingered a safe the way that warehouse job came off. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and one of them's in the happy house. Yes, and the other two? One's in California, Chief. At least I think he is. I'm checking on it. Yeah. And the other? Uh -huh. The other. The boy named Morton. Laird Morton. I got his file out of the master, Miss Muller. Is that M-O-R-T-O-N? That's right. He's been quiet for a couple of years, Chief. Might take me time to find him. Now, let me get this straight. You really think you can narrow down that warehouse robbery to certain individuals just on... On, on technique, Chief. And like I said, on a hunch, too. So, well, can I go on? You've nothing else? Mm -hmm. No witnesses? Fingerprints? Nothing? No, not so far, Chief. I see. All right. I'll hold it over on the disposition report, Harrington. We'll say, how about three days? Starting now, Chief? Starting now. Let's see what this hunch of yours will do. Agnes. I'm right in front of you, Lair. Don't oh. get to jump. I'm sorry. I... It bothers me when you move around, that's all. You here, Rudy? Yeah, just waiting for what you say, Lair. Go on, Lair. Say what you got to say. All right, we won't waste any more time. You can lead me into the transfer office, Rudy. The way I time it, it should be three minutes from the car to the safe. Yeah, if we have luck with the watchman, Lair. Never mind him. Now, you both got this picture? You lead me. Give me, oh, say, six minutes with the tumblers, and then we beat it. Back to our car? That's right, Agnes. From there, we go directly to the snowflake. To the what? Laird's boat. I don't get it. Can you think of a better place to hide out, Rudy? We get aboard, shove off, we can cruise around for weeks. She sleeps, Six. She? His boat. He bought it off some jerk during the war. Yeah. Oh, that's... well, you see her, Rudy. I bought it complete. Right down to the gear and galley. Yeah, sure. Well, I mean, Laird, uh, we make the getaway on a boat? I told you, it's the safest place in the world. She's all set, too. Agnes saw everything, didn't you? I checked all the papers in your billfold there. Swell. Well, now I guess I'll get a little sleep. Big day tomorrow, huh, Rudy? Yeah, whatever you say, Laird. You want some help? No, I can make it. I've been practicing, haven't I, Agnes? Go ahead, show him. Uh, Laird, watch it. I'll be all right, Rudy. You sit with Agnes. Three steps to the left. Turn and... Yeah, shut up. Forward. Forward. Yeah. Where, are you all right? Yet. Yeah. Sit still, Rudy. I I misjudged, I guess. I'll be fine. Good night now. Want a drink? What's the idea, Agnes? You let him walk right into that chair. I know. I forgot to tell him I moved it. Oh, yeah. Never mind the drink. Hold still. Rudy, listen. Still, I said. What was that for? Just wanted to be sure of something. Are you? Yeah, I'm sure. Is it your idea? Laird sending for me when he was blind. I just said it was a good idea. You didn't know then? But, uh... Four? Him? Yeah. Don't be funny. I'm not. I'm just getting organized, Agnes. Yeah, watching things around here the last few days, it strikes me you're, uh... For uh, what? Well, you've changed. Laird used to push you around like a lawnmower. That was before he lost his papers. Yeah, yeah. So now you let him walk into chairs. That ain't all he's walking into. I got it all planned. The transfer office job, the boat, everything. What is he walking into, Agnes? Rudy. Yeah? Now it's your turn to hold still. 
Baby, I... Still want to know what he's walking into? Yes. Okay, Chief, so it boils down to this. Yes. Either that warehouse job was a complete outsider, or it's my boy. Laird Morton, you mean, Hank? Right. And I'm taking bets it was no outside rip and tear job. What makes you say that, Harrington? Because, Miss Miller, when a bunch of the boys plan a job the size of that warehouse deal, they line it up, see? And if they're from out of town, well, they get permission. Permission to break open a safe? From whom? From the boys in this town that know about things like safes. Yes, and they're pretty well cleaned out, aren't they? Aren't they, they are, Chief. And that's why, again, I think Laird's my boy. You know how to find him? Well, he's been off my books now for nearly three years, Chief. But I can find him. At least here's where I try. <laughs> No, oh, I'll shoot your game some other time, Harry. Yeah, and with no chalk on my shoe, too. Oh, hey, hey, before I forget it, uh, you ever hear from Morton? Yeah, Morton, you know, he used to play snooker in here. Laird Morton. Give me three, will you, Rusty? No, 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 the Panatel is that the only good cigar you got. Hey, oh, Rusty. Uh, Harry over at the billiard joint says, maybe that you heard from Laird. Yeah, Morton. Come on, Rusty, you know him. Laird Morton. <laughs> well, I'm, I'm sorry to get you out of rehearsal, Maisie. Find a new number, huh? <laughs> Pretty good, too. Oh, oh, I know now what I meant to ask you, Maisie. You used to go around with Laird Morton, didn't you? I mean, back before he got married? <laughs> uh, well, tell me something, kid. Does he owe you any dough? Pretty talk clear, lad. I look both ways. What about the watchman, Rudy? Is he in the office? What office? I told you a dozen times, Agnes. It should be straight ahead of us, up the steps and to the right. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I see it, lad. No light on. Okay. That's it, then. Let's go in. You got him, Rudy. Yeah, I am. That's it. Keep hold of my coat, Laird. It won't fall. Remember now, both of you, we come right back to the car and drive directly to the boat. We know that. Go on, Rudy. Door's open. I told you it would be. The watchman leaves it unlatched till 2 a.m. What's the matter? It's set around your neck, Laird. What? These, these, these. I got hold of them. Go on in, will you? Somebody will walk by in a minute. They're binoculars, Rudy. You'll need a good pair on the boat. He's still there. Rudy's opening the door. Okay. So far. Now we take the first door to the right, huh? It'll be open, too. Go on. Try it. Like a barn. Look for the safe, Rudy. Is it there? Should be over in the corner. I see him. All right. Lead me to it. Come on, make it fast. That snooper gets back here every 20 minutes. It's right here, Laird. You feel it? Yeah. Yeah, I got it. Shut that door, Agnes. What? Well, we come in. I didn't hear it shut. I got it. I got it. Can you open it, Laird? In a breeze. Just let me warm up my fingers. What's the door, Agnes? Don't worry about me. Anybody comes through it, I'm ready for him. Can you imagine a big transfer company owning a safe like this? The tumblers fall like bowling pins. Two more minutes and I'll have it. Agnes. Shut up, I hear it. Laird, somebody's at the door. What? Can't be. We come in at one five, didn't we? I must have got it mixed up, Laird. Rudy, stand back. Be careful with that one. Agnes. She got a light? Oh, he hasn't. Come on in, Grandpa. Welcome home. I told you I had this planned. Come on, give me your hand, Agnes. We've got to get out of here fast. Yeah, go on. Yeah, I'm going. Take it down to the car, fast. Agnes, take my hand. Sorry, lad, ain't got the time. Agnes, you're not leaving me here. Agnes, no, you can't. Can I? Watch me, just watch me. Oh, I forgot you're blind. 
Agnes! Hey, hey, Agnes, come back! I can't see! Agnes, no! No! Laird Morton, blinded safe cracker, deserted at the scene of a murder. We'll hear the next exciting development of this unusual case in just a moment. But first, let's bend an ear to one of those early morning sounds. One that says, rise and shine. Now, of course, sometimes you may not feel like rising and shining. Like most all of us, you may wake up feeling dull and headachy because you need a laxative. In that case, better tune in on this sound. And that's the sparkling sound of sal hepatica in a glass of water. And remember, unlike slow-acting laxatives, a sparkling glass of sal hepatica, when you get up, brings quick, gentle relief, usually within an hour. And that means you don't have to feel dull and headachy all day, waiting until night to take the laxative you needed in the morning. And if at the same time you're troubled with excess gastric acidity, let sal hepatica help sweeten your stomach. So keep a bottle of sal hepatica handy. Then any time you need a laxative... Morning, noon, or night... See how much faster you feel better thanks to gentle, speedy Sal Hepatica. Now back to Mr. District Attorney. The reporters are going to wait, Harrington. I'll say they are, Chief. Somebody tipped them to the angle in this thing. The angle, Harrington? Well, wouldn't you call it one, Miss Miller? A watchman gets killed. The prowl car boys come looking for him. And they find a blind man yelling his head off. Yes, as I put it together, the watchman must have been shot about one or one ten. Well, by that, Chief, he was supposed to punch his clock at one fifteen, and he didn't. Yes, I know. Then when he didn't report at one thirty, our men came in to investigate. <laughs> Some investigation. A dead watchman and Laird Morton blind. Oh, Chief, he's being booked downtown. They'll hold him in your office until we get there. Yes, thank you, Miss Miller. Well, Harrington, where do we start? No gun, huh, Chief? None so far. Did you tell the men to search the yard outside? Yeah, Brophy's out there, Chief. If Morton tossed the gun out the window, we'll find it. Well, how could he if he's blind? Yeah, that, Miss Miller, is the the break-the-bank question. Brother, what a lot of talking he's going to do. I hope so. There's one thing in particular I'm curious about. Yeah, which one, Chief? If Morton is blind, what was he doing with a pair of binoculars around his neck? Rudy, cold. Oh, uh, this one? There's only one. Shut it. How should I know? I ain't never been on a boat. Well, you are now. Like it? You uh, steer it with that? Sure. It isn't hard. Laird taught me. Okay, so we're moving. Now, where does it go? Any place. I figured we'd just keep cruising around for a while. You know, let things cool down. And what happens when this crate runs out of gas? We buy some more. It's easy. they got gas pumps all along the shore. Well, I still don't like it, Agnes. None of it. It's set up, I tell you. I got all the dough from Laird's warehouse job before. Well, I wondered why we didn't wait and grab the loot at the transfer office. What for? We got plenty. Besides, there's only sick the insurance sticks on us. They can get nasty, too, you know. This way, we're clear. And, uh, what about Laird? He won't talk, if that's what you mean. Well, why won't he? You killed that watchman, Agnes, not him. What's he going to lose by talk? You think I didn't figure? Listen, so they found him with a dead duck, all right. He's blind. No court in the world is convicted. Yeah, Laird but... knows that. So do the cops. I still say it would have been... I ain't finished. Finally, they got to find the gun, don't they? I know that much from the movies. Hey, you still got it, haven't you? Certainly I got it. Right here. Come on, Rudy, relax. What is it Laird was always saying? Oh, yeah, get a load of that air. Now, 
Now listen to reason, Morton. That watchman was killed with a thirty-two caliber slug. He was. Look at the district attorney when you're talking, Morton. I'm tired of looking at him. We've been at this four hours. You're tired of looking, huh? With what? Are you really blind, Morton? You know, we'll be certain when the doctor gets here. Am I? What do you think, D.A.? I think you are. And so do I, Morton. Yeah, and I'll tell you how you got that way, too. From a cop's bullet right across your head where that scar is. That's so? Yeah, we'll know after you're examined, Morton. I can't see your point in delaying things any longer. Anything you say, D.A.? Huh? What do you want to know? I'll read the last question, would you please, Miss Miller? Yes, sir. Um, listen to reason, Morton. That watchman was killed with a thirty-two caliber slug. All right, we'll start from there. Now, where's the gun, Morton? Who was with you, Morton? Now, come on, use your head, man. We've got you. Why shield the others? In a pig's eye, you got me. You were there, Sonny. Right there waiting for me. All right, smart guy. Go ahead on that. Go on, D.A. Tell a jury I did it. Tell them. And you can also tell them I'm blind. Oh, for Pete's sake, Agnes, let's turn this thing towards land. Not till we need gas. Oh, I'm going nuts, I tell you. Nothing but water. That's a nice crack. Huh? I'm here. Gee, I'll say you are. Just what do you mean by that? Oh, look, Agnes. We can't just spend the rest of our lives going nowhere. we got to get back to town. What for? Well, we're layered for one thing. Oh, now, look, I could call one of the boys, Agnes. They'll know if he's singing, maybe. He ain't, I told you. But we don't know, Agnes. Oh, it's driving me off my rock or not I told you before, relax. I'm telling you, head this tub toward the show. No, thank you. Listen, you sleep brain little idiot. Go on, me. Get us back to here, me, now. Go. Oh, Agnes, please. You look at my arm. I'll be black and blue. Will you listen to me, Agnes? Yes, it, Buster. I planned this show and I'm running it. You try any more rough stuff to help me, I'll toss you over the side. What time is it, Miss Miller? It's, uh... 7.10, Chief. The day shift will be coming on at 7.30. Well, you ought to go on home. We can send for a stenographer downstairs. No, I'm all right, Chief, really. Is there any more coffee, Harrington? Yeah, plenty, Miss Miller, in that picture. Oh, thanks. How about you, Morton? Do you like talking some more? Hey, Morton. The Chief's talking to you. Aren't you guys tired yet? <laughs> Boy, we got lots of time left, Morton. All day today, tonight, tomorrow, the next night. Who shot the watchman, Morton? Where's the gun, Morton? I'll get it, Chief. How'd you lose your sight, Morton? Yes. Pulling away from that oh, warehouse that job? I thought you should give up, yes, Harrington. Excuse me. Yes. That's the Harbor Patrol. Oh, hmm? let me have that. Yes, sir, right here. What's that, Miss Morton? Yes. The Harbor Hello. Patrol, Harrington. The chief right. phoned them about an hour ago from outside. You sure yes. now? Yeah. You sure? The number is 20Y205. Yes, I'll repeat it. 20Y205. What's the matter, lad? No. You look excited. No, I have a boat stand by, will you please? We'll be right out. Harrington, we've got it. Come on, let's go. Now, Agnes, put away the gun, will you? I, I didn't mean to get rough. Shut up, a minute. Huh? It's a boat. See it coming up from the port side? Where? There. See it? Uh, Rudy, that's a patrol boat. I don't get it. What patrol? What are you talking about? 20, by 205. Stand by to be boarded. Stand by my foot. Get out of my way, Rudy. Cut your motors and stand by. You're under arrest. Agnes, it's cops. Listen to them, Agnes. Don't you think I can hear? Get back, Rudy. They're coming alongside. Uh, stand by. We're coming aboard. Watch it, Chief. Get back. Get back or I start shooting. Agnes, don't be a fool. The boat's loaded with police. Cover me, Harrington. I'm right with you, Chief. Easy, Billy. Keep her alongside. The Chief's going over. You rats, I told you. Don't reach for that gun. Leave it on the deck. Okay, Chief. Here, wait till I cut these engines. Did I get her? Well, just her arm, I think, Harrington. Stand still, both of you. Now, listen, I didn't do anything. Shut up, was... Bertie. What, you, can't you see I'm bleeding? Now, we'll have you taken care of as soon as we get ashore. Take the man, Harrington. Right, Chief. No, you don't. Come on. Bring her up a little, Billy. All set. 
Now let's take this pair back to town. Your district attorney will return in just a moment with an explanation of his capture of Agnes and Rudy. But first... Tell me, who should know best the difference between toothpaste? Who should know best the difference between toothpastes? Why, your dentist, of course. Your dentist is the skilled guardian of your dental health. The authority on care of your teeth and gums. So ask your dentist about Ipana toothpaste and gentle gum massage. Many dentists recommend gum massage. What's more, a nationwide survey reveals that more dentists recommend Ipana toothpaste than any other dentifrice. And wait a moment. More dentists personally use Ipana than any other toothpaste. There's a difference between toothpastes, all right. And dentists know that difference. Ipana cleans teeth clean, safely, too, without gritty abrasives. And followed by gentle massage, aids the health of your gums. Help your dentist help your smile. Begin now getting your new Ipana smile. Get Ipana toothpaste. Taste the freshness. Feel the cleanness. See the sparkle. See how you look with an Ipana smile. Ipana toothpaste. Now, here is your district attorney. I should like to report, first of all, ladies and gentlemen, that all three of this unusual trio, Laird Morton, his wife, and Rudy Bowie, will pay the full penalty demanded for the murder of the watchman in the transfer company office. Don't say they will, Chief. And that's the end of all those safe-cracking jobs on the list. Yes, Harrington, it is. Oh, Chief, I think you'd better explain just how you knew Agnes and Rudy were on a boat and which boat to go after. Well, we have Laird to thank for that, Miss Miller. As you know, when we found him, he had a pair of very good binoculars around his neck. Sure, Chief. A blind man with spyglasses. Exactly, Harrington. He intended to bring them to the boat for his wife and Rudy. Fortunately, this particular pair of binoculars was of a foreign make. I don't understand, Chief. Well, during the war and before, Miss Miller, all such foreign binoculars had to be registered with the proper authorities. Oh. And when we examined the pair on Laird, I checked the registration and found them assigned to his boat. With the Coast Guard number 20Y-205. Right, Chief? Right, Harrington. And then when the harbor police reported sight of the vessel, we went right out. You certainly did, Chief. Well, it just goes to show what you've said so often, Chief. The crooks don't have a chance of winning, ever. Indeed. For no criminal or criminal gang has the resources of the forces of law and order. And now what about next week? Well, our story for next week, ladies and gentlemen, is another colorful and exciting dramatization. It's the case of the House of Death, and I invite you to join us for it. And so until then, thank you, and good night. Right dress! Yes, ma'am, the right dress for well-groomed hair, for your hair is Sentry. S-E-N-T-R-Y, Sentry Hair Cream. New liquid cream grooms hair without that unsightly, greasy look. What makes Sentry so different? Well, most hair creams are made with mineral oil, but not Sentry. Sentry's the only leading liquid hair cream made without mineral oil. No wonder Sentry grooms without an objectionable, greasy look. Guard your grooming with Sentry. S-E-N-T-R-Y. Sentry. Sentry hair cream. Your right dress. of all characters in tonight's dramatization are fictitious and in a resemblance to names of living persons or actual places is purely coincidental. Our stars were Jay Justin in the title role, Len Doyle as Harrington and Vicky Bola as Miss Miller. The music was under the direction of Peter Van Steeden. The program is produced and directed by Edward A. Byron and written by Robert Shaw. Mr. District Attorney was originated by Phillips H. Lord. Remember, I pan a toothpaste for the smile of beauty. Sal Hepatica for the smile of health. Bristol Myers invites you to tune in again next week for Duffy's Tavern and Mr. District Attorney. This is NBC, the national broadcasting company. Ipana Toothpaste and Sal Hepatica present... Mr. District Attorney, Champion of the People, Defender of Truth, Guardian of our Fundamental Rights to Life, Liberty, and the Pursuit of Happiness. (laughs) 
Chester District Attorney is brought to you by Ipana Toothpaste and Sal Hepatica. Ipana for the smile of beauty. Sal Hepatica for the smile of health. Ipana, Sal Hepatica. <laughs> It shall be my duty as district attorney not only to prosecute to the limit of the law all persons accused of crimes perpetrated within this county, but to defend with equal vigor the rights and privileges of all its citizens. Tonight's case of the unknown source is particularly vital, ladies and gentlemen, because it concerns a lawyer, or at least a man who was once entitled to practice law. Here, indeed, is an infuriating and sorry spectacle. A criminal whose mind was keen enough to attain the privilege of the bar, but warped to the point of degrading himself and his profession. We begin in the lobby of the Revere House, an inexpensive hotel catering to young career girls here in our city. Honey! What? Honey Bartlett, wait up! I just saw you get out of the elevator. Gee, have I got news. Oh, uh, it's you. Look, I, uh... Don't you remember, honey? We were talking last night in the soda fountain downstairs. I'm Alice Stratton. Oh, well, sure, I remember, kid. I'm just in a hurry, that's all. Oh. That gentleman sitting over there is waiting for me. Oh, you got a date, huh? Gee, lucky you. Huh? Oh, well, yeah, you could say that, I guess. Well, I'll see you around, Alice. Oh, but I haven't told you. Remember I said I worked in the district attorney's office? Oh, you oh. remember, honey? I told you when I came from Sheboygan I got a job typing there? Yeah, yeah, well, that's just great, kid, but really, I've got to go. Oh, well, this won't take a minute, honey. Well, anyway, guess what? Yeah, what? Miss Miller, that's the district attorney's private secretary, she's gone on a vacation. And what do you think? I'm going to substitute for her. Isn't it thrilling? I'm going to be the district attorney's secretary. Uh, wait a minute. You know what? Can you imagine? I've never even seen him. And I'm going to be right there in his own private office while Miss Miller's on vacation. The DA himself? Mm-hmm. Are you sure? Of course I'm sure. I start tomorrow morning. Miss Miller came down to the bullpen where all the typists work and shows me herself. Mm, I see. What's the matter? You don't seem excited about it, honey. Gee, a wonderful break like that and everything. I'm just so thrilled. You've, uh, you've never seen the DA, hmm? And he's never seen you? He will tomorrow. Isn't it wonderful? Yeah, come on, um, Alice. Uh, come on with me. Well, come where, honey? I don't understand. Oh, it's just an idea. Oh, uh, Jimmy. Good evening, honey. I'm sorry to keep you waiting. Jimmy, this is a girlfriend of mine here in the hotel. This is Alice, um... Alice Stratton. Alice Stratton. Meet Jimmy. I'm very pleased to meet you. Yes, thank you. Now then, honey, shall we be going? I uh, just wanted you to hear Miss Stratton's good news, Jimmy. Starting tomorrow morning, she's going to be private secretary to the district attorney. What? I'm so thrilled. His regular private secretary is on vacation, and I'm going to substitute for her. Are you really? Uh Uh-huh. I uh, knew you'd be interested, Jimmy. The D.A. has never seen Alice, and she's never seen him. You don't say. I just had to tell Honey about it. Honestly, I'm so excited. Why, it might lead to just anything. You're looking for something, Chief? Uh, yes, Harrington. Have you any idea where Miss Miller keeps my sunglasses? Your sunglasses, Chief? Yes. She usually puts them right here on my desk. <laughs> yeah, don't ask me. Ain't they sending up some girl from the bullpen? Uh, no, to take Miss Miller's place while she's away. Yeah. Yes, I think she did say something about it. She said she was coaching the girl during lunch hour. Yeah, Miss uh, Stratton or something, wasn't it? Uh, something like that, oh. I believe. Oh. Yes, yes. Excuse me, may I come in? Well, yes, of course. What is it? Uh. Oh, you're the district attorney. Yes, I am. Is there something you wanted? And uh, you be Mr. Harrington. Oh, oh, I've heard about you. Oh, you have? Oh, I certainly have. <laughs> um, I'm Alice Stratton. Yeah, who? From the bullpen. I wouldn't have been late my first morning, Mr. District Attorney, but honestly, this office is so upside down. I see. 
<laughs> uh, you're to work up here while Miss Miller's on vacation? Yes, sir. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Although, really, I don't see how Miss Miller got anything accomplished at all. Mm. Why, the files. Now, honestly. Miss Miller does okay. Oh, I'm sure she does, <laughs> Mr. Harrington, in her way. Huh? Uh, was there anything you wanted, Mr. District Attorney? Why, uh, uh, yes, yes. If you'll take notes, please. Mm -hmm. I want to discuss the Nick Venice trial with Mr. Harrington. Uh, Nick Venice? Yeah, yes. there's a folder on him over on that table, Mr. Stratton. Oh, thank you. You are nice. <laughs> I am? Uh-huh. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, not on that. Well, let me see. Where were we? Uh, pretty boy Venice, Chief. Oh, yeah. You're going to trial on him this week. Yes, I hope to. I've got just about all I need. Well, it ought to be first degree, Chief. He sure put the B on that girlfriend of his. I uh, found the folder. Oh, yes, thank you, Miss Stratton. And now, if you'll just take notes as we talk, please. Yes, sir, I will. Yeah, uh, who's defending him, Chief? Venice? Uh, Jimmy Appleton. Uh, he got Nick out on bail on a technicality. You mean this Appleton ain't disbarred yet? There's always hope. And as for Venice, I think we'll have clear sailing. Well, I'll be glad to check him off my list, Chief. He gives me the creeps. Yes, he ought to. Well, the material I've collected on him is absolutely astounding. The fellow's ignorant, rude, arrogant, definitely below normal and intelligent. You're telling me I was downstairs the night they booked him, Chief. Why, that guy even wears perfume. Yes, I know. That's part of the picture. Big, uncouth, ignorant killer, dressed in a loud suit, a fifty-dollar necktie, and reeking of cheap violet perfume. <laughs> this is going to be some trial. Well, let's not underestimate it, however, Harrington. Well, Jimmy Appleton's a tricky defender, and that's a mild word for it. Appleton is that? That's right. Uh, you'll find the name in the folder. Oh, thank you. Well, I promise you this, Harrington. Appleton can pull all the tricks he knows in that courtroom, and I'm still going to nail Nick Venice cold. <laughs> Put the food on that table, Nick. No, no, no. That table over by the girl. I know, Jimmy. Here, huh? That's right. Now untie her, will you? Listen, what am I around here? You're my client, Nick, remember? In my hands, in that courtroom tomorrow, lies the answer to whether you live or die. You're getting paid for it, Shasta. Mm -hmm. You amuse me, Nick. Untie Miss Stratton, please. Yeah. I am. Yeah. Excellent. Now the gag from her mouth, if you please. Hold still, baby. Yeah. Get away from me. I'm just untying you, baby. Hey. You're okay, you know. Ain't you, Jimmy? Okay. Get away from me. Help! Help! Oh, calm now, Alice. I should think after 24 hours you'd be calmed down. There's food on that table. I demand to know the meaning of this. You can't keep me here like a prisoner. Oh, yes, you can, baby. Hey. You like violet perfume? It smells. Don't touch me. That will do, Nick. We leave Alice alone in here to enjoy her dinner. You can't do this, I tell you. Let me out of here. In due time, Alice. Until then, do try to relax, won't you? Come, Nick, this way. She's okay, you know. Funny smooth. Come back here. I demand you... What's she fussing about now? Oh, honey, my dear. I didn't realize you'd come home. Hiya, honey. Hi, Nick. Hey, your girlfriend. She's okay. How is she, Jimmy? Alice? Confused, I'd say. I hardly think she realizes what we've done. Neither does the D.A. Oh, it's a tough racket being a secretary again. I've been at it since nine o'clock this morning. He assumes you're Alice Stratton, of course. He does. Good. Now then, about our client here. Me? You needn't bother trying to follow this, Nick. Rest assured, I have your interests at heart. A chick in there, you know, she's... All... Later, Nick. Well, honey? You've worked on Nick's case all day. With you? Sure, with me. There's the envelope. It contains what I want? Yeah, the works. His brief, copies of his notes, copies of his plan for trial, description of all his evidence, everything. And I made an extra copy of everything I typed for him. Splendid, honey, splendid. I, um, uh, I've been a busy girl, Jimmy. Do I get a reward? My dear child. Can I go in and talk to her, Jimmy? No. Maybe she's lonesome. I said something. no, Nick. As for your question, honey, the answer is yes. Mm -hmm. uh, keep on being Alice Stratton, my love, and you'll get... Everything your heart desires. Oh, you'd be surprised, Mr. Harrington. Yes. Why, I've saved every clipping about you from the newspapers. You have, Miss Grant? Mm-hmm. I certainly have. 
Oh, you'll laugh, but I've even got a picture of you pasted on my dresser at my hotel. No kidding. Mm -hmm. A picture of me. <laughs> well, I told you you'd laugh. <laughs> Incidentally, my name's Alice. Yeah. Well, oh, oh. <clears throat> oh, you're here, Hank. Yeah. yeah. You uh, had some calls, Mr. District Attorney. Yeah, how did it go? In just a minute, Hank. Oh, Miss Stratton. Yes, sir? Will you tell whoever's waiting I'll be delayed, please? I want to talk to Mr. Harrington. You'll be delayed. That's yes, right. sir. I'll tell them right away. Hey. You look worried, Chief. Nothing went wrong over at that courthouse, did it? Harrington, I simply can't understand it. I had to ask the court to recess until tomorrow morning. Under Nick Venice trial? Yes. Why, well, I thought that was all set up, Chief. Yes, it was. And that's just the point. But so help me, Jimmy Appleton was prepared for every move I made. What? I tell you, it was uncanny. Almost as if the man had read my mind. Why, he even knew I intended to put the cab driver on the stand first. What? Oh, Chief, he couldn't have. Why, he only decided that yesterday. Well, he knew it. Yes, and he had prepared notes on his objections. I tell you, Harrington, it was beyond understanding. Hey, you got a delay, you said. Huh? Well, just until tomorrow morning. But I don't get it, Harrington. No, I just don't understand it at all. <laughs> Was he burned up, Jimmy? Uh, His face was a sight. Oh, that's delightful, honey. <laughs> then how did he spend the afternoon? Oh, he made a whole new set of plans for when court opens in the morning. Do you have a copy? Yes, I put it on your desk. Wonderful. Simply wonderful. <laughs> oh, and this Harrington character. He was telling the DA about some raid he's going to pull tonight. Oh? Yeah. He's going to knock over the Green Hat Club at 9 o'clock. That's interesting. Remind me to call Lou Woodruff. Mm-hmm. I'm almost sure I can sell him that information. Hi, honey. Hi, Scheister. Well, if it isn't our boy, hi, Nick. Thought I told you to stay off the street, Nick. Been gone an hour. I was getting the papers. Hey, my picture's all over. I've seen the papers. Now, will you leave us alone, please? Honey and I want to work. Not in there. I was just going to see if she's thirsty or something. Oh, Jimmy, how's the kid, by the way? Somewhat difficult, I'm afraid. Oh. Can I, Jimmy? I won't bother her or nothing. What? Oh, yes, go on, go on. She's some dish, you know. Got a red dress, too. I like red. Now then, honey, I think first we'll go over the eminent district attorney's plan for tomorrow. Hey. Hey, little girl, you, you sleep or something? What do you want? No need to get on your high horse, sister. Just came in to talk to you. What do you want? What in the world is happening to me? Come on, come on. Sit down and be comfortable. Please. Sit down, why don't you? Hey. Hey, you like perfume? Smell. Y your name is Nick, isn't it? You mean you ain't never heard of me? I'm Nick Venice. Oh, listen, Nick, you can help me. Please help me, Nick. I'm scared. Ah, that's no way to be. Little girl like you. You're okay, you know, kid? You will help me. You'll tell me what they're going to do to me? You got nice arms, kid. You're nice and tan. Oh, please, I'll I move don't... away. I said don't no. pull away from me like that. You're hurting my wrist. Go on, go on, pull. No. <laughs> I could break your wrist just by squeezing my fingers together. I said, help! Help! Hey, shut up. You want to get Jimmy sore up You lousy little cat. Shut up. I won't shut up. I won't. Help! Why, oh, you... No, will you leave me alone? Why, oh, you think they slap me in the kitchen. Will you come back here? Get out of here. Get out. Nobody slaps Nicky Venice, little girl, but nobody. Come here. I didn't mean it. Oh, please. Please, won't you leave me alone? You rotten little cat. You ain't going to hit nobody again. Oh! Dumb dame, smack me, will you? What in the world's going on in here? Nick! Honey, come in here. Listen, Jimmy, this crazy man. Honey! What's the matter, Jimmy? Did you what? Hey, what's the idea? What happened to her? I've been trying to tell you. Just got mad or something, Jimmy. Will it, will it be okay? Okay. You blundering boob, this girl is dead. <laughs> Alice Stratton, innocent victim in a monstrous plot, dead. We'll hear what happens next in this unusual case in just a moment. But first, here's an important question. Tell me, who should know best the difference between toothpaste? Who should know best the difference between toothpastes? 
Why, just one man. Your family dentist. For through study and experience, your dentist has become your authority on the care of your teeth, the health of your gums. So don't depend on just anyone. Ask your dentist about Ipana toothpaste and gentle gum massage. So many dentists recommend massage. And very important to you. A nationwide survey also shows more dentists recommend Ipana toothpaste than any other dentifrice. And more dentists personally use Ipana than any other toothpaste. Yes, Ipana wins wholehearted approval from those who know best the difference between toothpastes. The nation's dentists. Ipana's unique formula actually stimulates gum circulation. And with gentle gum massage, aids the health of your gums, the brilliance of your smile. Help your dentist help your smile. Begin now getting your new Ipana smile. Taste the fresh flavor. Feel the cleanness. See the sparkle. See how you look with an Ipana smile. Remember, for healthier gums, for brighter teeth, for a cleaner breath, Ipana toothpaste and massage. And now back to Mr. District Attorney. Well, there she is, Chief. Nobody's touched the body since I threw a blanket over it. You've been here how long, Harrington? About 20 minutes, Chief. I tried to get in touch with you right away, but... Strange. A girl dressed like that in a district like this? Yeah. She's no waterfront character, Chief. About uh, 23 or so, wouldn't you say? Yes, yeah, something like that. Have you checked the neighborhood, Harrington? I was doing that when you drove up, Chief. We can't get much on tire marks. All the trucks in the south end of town dump here into the river. Yes, I know. Of course, the dame's little, whoever she is, and somebody could have carried her from that alleyway, got scared, and didn't even drop her into the water. Yes. What about the cause of death? I don't know. Your guess is as good as mine, Chief. Look, she's got a terrific bump here on the back of her head, mm. and it looks like a broken jaw. I bet either one of them could have done it. Yes, well, we'll get the examiner's opinion when he gets here. What about identification? Not a thing, Chief. No purse, no gloves, nothing. Hmm. They even tore the label out of her jacket. Oh? And that's another reason I thought you ought to have a look. This is strictly a professional job. Yes, yes, it seems to be. Well, let's get to work on it, Harrington. <laughs> I tell you, I just tapped her a little, Jimmy. I didn't mean no harm. Harm? The girl's dead, Nick. Don't you understand that? You're on trial for murdering one girl and you kill another. Nobody knows it, Jimmy. We got rid of the body, didn't we? I know it, my friend, and don't forget that. Yeah? So what do I pay you for? I am an attorney, Nick, not your personal bodyguard. I resent a thing like this happening in my apartment. So go ahead and resent. I got to... That is beside the point. I've got to come up against the district attorney in court in the morning. This kind of thing unnerves me. You'll take care of the DA. Honey got you all the dope, didn't she? You live a simple life, Nick. How you've managed to survive is remarkable. <laughs> I got a smart lawyer. My dear boy, I hope and pray you're right. <laughs> Yes, Doctor. And if I'm not here, Harrington will be. Yes. Yes, call as soon as you can, will you please? Oh, and one thing more. Will you send up that report you did on the victim in the Nick Venice murder? Yes. Yes, that's right. The waitress. Yes, thank you, Doctor. Chief. Oh, come in, Harrington. I was just going to phone for you. Chief, I got something that's... Yeah, well, I haven't much time, here. No, Chief, listen to this. That yes. kid we found down by the river last night? Yes, yes. Skippy took a set of fingerprints off the body, so I checked them against the master file. And? Get this, Chief. That girl is Alice Stratton. Alice Stratton? Yeah. 
Harrington, what are you talking about? Uh, help me, Chief. It's true. The kid we found dead last night is supposed to be your secretary while Miss Miller's on vacation. Yes, but that's impossible. Miss Stratton is right outside. I was just going to send for Chief, it's a positive identification. You know yourself, all the employees around here have their prints in the master. Yeah, you checked carefully? Carefully? I checked four times. I couldn't believe it myself. Well, then this girl outside is... Say, wait a minute. Chief, are you thinking what I'm thinking? Mm-hmm. About how Jimmy Appleton knows so much about what goes on in this office lately? Yes, find out if Appleton is connected with that raid that backfired last night. I did, Chief. Yes? He's a personal friend of Woodruff, the guy that owns the joint. Oh, well, this is beginning to come clean, isn't it, Harry? <laughs> Appleton's success in court and the empty gambling club when you staged the raid? Clean? I'm going to pin that little girl to the wall. Get her in here, Chief. Let's find out what this is. No, no, let's wait, Harrington. Let's wait. Wait? Yes. With that dame out there spying on you, Chief? Why, there's no telling who she is. We can tell, all right. I think we'll play this young lady right into our hands. I can't believe it, honey. Are you sure you copied this accurately? Jimmy, I tell you, he said it himself. He dictated the memo and then went out to the courthouse. Leaving Harrington in the office. He's still there, I guess. I said I had a sick headache and had to come home. What's it all about, Jimmy? I didn't get it. It seems, Nick, we're about to have a visit from the district attorney. Yeah? At your place? So he informed Honey when he dictated a memo this morning. Are you sure, Honey? I tell you, he said he was coming here at 8 o'clock tonight with new evidence against Nicky. Me? What's the bum up with me? Your life, Nicky. I don't like this. I don't like it at all. You think I do? It's after eight now. You better slip out the back way. Certainly be confused to find you here. Confused? Are you kidding? Hey, somebody's at the door. Oh, Jimmy. All right, be calm, honey. No, don't go. You might have someone posted downstairs. Yeah, but I can't stay here. Get into the other room and keep the door shut. Go on, dear. Hurry. For Pete's sake, watch it, Jimmy. This isn't good. <clears throat> what do you want me to do? Just sit still, Nick, and don't say a word. <clears throat> yes? Why, it's my esteemed colleague, Mr. District Attorney. May I come in, Mr. Appleton? It's late, I know. Late? Nonsense. Oh, you know my client, of course. Vividly. As a matter of fact, Nick, it's about you that I've come. What's that mean, Jimmy? This is a business call, then. I'm disappointed. Oh, you won't be, Appleton. I have here a rather interesting document. A completely new kind of evidence against Nick. In this envelope. May I see it? At this time, no. Sorry. Let Jimmy see it. What's that, Venice? You heard me. Hand it over to him. Nick, put down that gun. Yes, Venice. Isn't it unwise to draw a gun in your circumstances? I said hand it over. I'll show you why I got this gun, wise guy. I'm getting sick of this, see? Now we're going to play this game my way. With a gun. <laughs> That's right, Doc. Yeah, sure, I've been waiting here ever since the chief left. Huh? Yeah, yeah, I got that right. No, no, that's all he wants to know. Huh? <laughs> do I know what to do now? Doc, we got this one timed to the second. Put down my hands, Nick. I assure you, I'm not armed. Keep them in the sky. I need hardly tell you, D.A., I'm not responsible for my client's actions. I wash my hands of it. You pipe down too, Shyster. What do you intend to do now, Nick? Or may I offer a suggestion? Huh? Ask the young lady to come out of that bedroom. Oh, there's no need to look surprised, Appleton. I mean, Miss, uh, Miss... Well, there's a question about her name. Honey, Nick, shut up. I'm sick of this. I'm pulling out of here, but good. Hey! Well, don't tell me you got rid of it. The... Oh. Well, Miss Stratton, you do seem to get around. Jimmy, what's the idea? It's making a fool of himself, D.A. I give you my word, I know nothing of all this. Nothing. You pipe down. I gotta take a powder. You got any dough? Dough? For what? And Nick is in the act of escaping, I think you might say, young lady. Oh? Oh, I have a suggestion, Nick, if you're interested. Yeah, what? There's a rather interesting memo in that envelope I brought with me. Why not read it? Not to it. I look shy through. I want to. You know I ain't got any cash around here. Did you say memo? 
What memo? One you couldn't have copied for Mr. Appleton here, Miss Stratton. I had it prepared after you left. Open it, honey. Uh, this? Yeah, this will interest all of you, I know. You too, Appleton. Oh, Jimmy. What's in it, honey? Some more about me? Jimmy, listen. Yes, dear. What is it? Memo to James Appleton, Nick Venice, and to my secretary. Yes, that would be you, Miss Stratton. If you'll open the door, Mr. Harrington is waiting for you. You are all under arrest for murder. Flat mouth here. Oh, you're going to put away the gun, Nick? Oh, Harrington, you outside? Right here in the hall, Chief. The joint's surrounded. Well, Nick? Oh, that's better. It's much better. All right, Harrington. Oh, and uh, will you open the door, please, honey? You know, a competent secretary always does. And closes it behind her. Your district attorney will return in just a moment with an explanation of the clues in tonight's case. But first, do you know what this... <laughs> now, lots of people, that sound says it's morning again with a good day ahead. But, of course, that doesn't mean every morning. For now and then, most all of us wake up feeling dull and logy because we need a laxative. And that's when another sound is so welcome. Yes, that's the sparkling sound of sal hepatica in a glass of water. Sal hepatica. Unlike slow-acting laxatives, a sparkling glass of sal hepatica, when you get up, brings quick, gentle relief, usually within an hour. That means you don't have to feel dull and logy all day, waiting until night to take the laxative you needed in the morning. And if at the same time you're troubled with excess gastric acidity, sal hepatica helps sweeten your stomach. So keep a bottle of sal hepatica handy. Then any time you need a laxative... Morning, noon, or night... See how much faster you feel better... Thanks to gentle, speedy Sal Hepatica. And now, here is your district attorney. I'm happy to report, ladies and gentlemen... That all three members of this unusual trio... Honey, Appleton, and Nick Venice will pay the full penalty demanded for the murder of Alice Stratton. Yeah, and I'm happy to say that Miss Miller will be back at her job next week, Chief. Okay. <laughs> Boy, what a dame that honey was. Fortunately, Harrington, we've seen the last of her. Hey, Chief, why don't you explain just how you put all the pieces in this puzzle together? Well, actually, we didn't connect the murder of Alice Stratton to Nick Venice until the examiner reported traces of strong perfume on her body. And not a scent she was wearing, but... One that had apparently clung to her arms for, uh, from contact with another person. Violet perfume, aren't you? Yes, exactly, Harrington. The same cheap scent Venice reeked of. The same, I might add, that we found on the waitress he'd murdered some weeks before. Sure, and on top of that, there was a nice, clean set of Nicky's prints dug into Alice's wrist, aren't you? Yes, Harrington, and that just about closed the case. I say it did. Oh, hey, Chief, what about next week? Well, our story for next week, ladies and gentlemen, is the case... Of the athletic louse. Timely and dramatic. It's one I'm sure you'll enjoy, and I invite you to join us for. And so until then, thank you, and good night. Tell me, when you think about shaving, do you worry about your whiskers or your face? Better just forget your whiskers and think about your face. How your face feels and looks is what matters. To get a more comfortable feeling, a smoother shave, try Ingram Shaving Cream. That rich Ingram lather on your brush helps condition your face for the razor. You get cool, comfortable, soothing shaves. Remember, comfort means coolness. Coolness means Ingram. I-N-G-R-A-M. Ingram, the cooler shaving cream. and a pair of clever crooks in the case of murder a la carte. I invite you to hear Mr. District Attorney, which follows immediately on NBC. WMAQ NBC in Chicago. The big story tonight at 9 is about the missing chemist who was found by reporter Ike McAnally. His newspaper big story was the winner of the $500 big story award. And stay tuned at 9.30 for Curtain Time. 
and at 10 o'clock for Supper Club. By Pana Toothpaste and Sal Hepatica present... Mr. District Attorney, Champion of the People, Defender of Truth, Guardian of our fundamental rights to life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. <laughs> Mr. District Attorney is brought to you by Ipana Toothpaste and Sal Hepatica. Ipana for the smile of beauty. Sal Hepatica for the smile of health. Ipana, Sal Hepatica. <laughs> Shall be my duty as district attorney not only to prosecute to the limit of the law all persons accused of crimes perpetrated within this county, but to defend with equal vigor the rights and privileges of all its citizens. Mr. District Attorney, and tonight, the case of murder a la carte. Will you cut it out? Stanley, you boob! Yeah, Hannah? For the love of Pete, stop that hammering. I'm trying to concentrate on the racing form. Oh, I'm sorry, dear. I was just finishing this here little ran house. Yeah, yeah, you and your bill. Finishing a what? This ran house, Hannah, you see? I, I put a number five hinge in the bottom so you can clean it out. You're nuts. You know what, Stanley? A ran house. What for? Well, we won't always live in this small apartment, dear. I want to have so many things ready when we get a home in the country. I swear I married an idiot. Hammering, sawing, his kisser full of nails. Sit still, I'll get it. It might be a wren. Oh, I'll I'll use the sandpaper, dear. It won't disturb you. Hello? Hannah? Nikki. Oh, hi, Nikki. I gotta talk fast, Hannah. I have to get back to my table. Yeah, I'm listening. Mr. and Mrs. Mallory are here for dinner again. You got the name? Mallory. I just brought them a bottle of Cordon Rouge on the house. Understand? How long will it take them to drink it? An hour at least. Probably more. All right, what's the address? Jefferson Towers, apartment 16. You got that? Right. Look for a mink, silver fox cape, and a platinum dyed stole. Oh, yes, and a ruby necklace. She is not wearing it tonight. Not bad, Nikki. Send them another bottle. They'll need it when they get home. That's my girl. Good luck now. Bye, Nikki. Hey, useless. Stanley. Hey, look, Hannah. You see how it would hang in a tree? Like a dead duck, darling. Now get shaved and dressed, will you? We're going out on a job. Got nothing on the street, Harrington? No, not a thing, Chief. Mm. I even covered some of the boys on the retired list. Well, it doesn't help, does it? <laughs> I'd counted on picking up a lead. Well, in the first place, there's no pattern in these robberies. Mm. Take the fur coat boys now. They wouldn't be seen dead heisting jewelry. I know. Still, that's what's happening. Yeah. I had Mr. and Mrs. Mallory in here an hour ago. Oh, the ones that got robbed last night? Yes, that's right. They had dinner at some nightclub, and when they got back to the Jefferson Towers, it was all over. Mm, what's the loot? I ain't seen the list. Mink coat, silver fox cape, the first stole, and ruby necklace, mm. same as the others. Oh, oh, boy, the papers ain't going to be fun. Mm. This is five in a row in all riches. Yes. Oh, golly, Chief, I... Sorry, I took so long. Oh, it's quite all right, Miss Miller. How did the meeting go? Well, the meet, actually... meet, what meeting, Miss Miller? Your poker club again? I'm out for spring baseball practice, Harrington. <laughs> didn't you know? <laughs> no, I went to the Girl Scouts luncheon. Oh, oh, they're a wonderful organization. This is their 37th anniversary, you know. Yes, yes. Yes, it is a fine group, Miss Miller. After we've finished, I'd like to hear about their plans. All right. I'll get my notebook. Here. Yeah, I wish there was something to take notes about. Well, our best bet now is to find that pattern, Harrington. Mm. Five robberies, all of them prominent or wealthy residents. Yeah, all of them good addresses, too, Chief. Yes, and in all five cases, expensive loot. Mm. Uh, Let's have the five folders, will you please? I was just getting them. Here you are. Thank you. All right, Harrington, five in a row is plenty, so let's get to work. Right, that's 700 apiece on the platinum and an ace each on the necklace. All right? 
Well, you should have argued with the fence, Nicky. When my dad was alive, he did better. It's tough, Hannah. The papers are full of it. Well, you still should have argued. One night, I saw my old man reach over and put the Jap choke on a fence. He huh? raised the price uh, the, the over. What, dear? The Jap choke. I'll show you sometime, Stanley. Remind me. Got a new deal coming up, Nicky? That's what I wanted to discuss, Hannah. I think now we quit. We what? I told you in the beginning it couldn't be for long. Even now, the district attorney might suspect the Regency Club. In a pig's eye, he might. Why should he? He can't think it is just coincidence all five times we get a hall, they're having dinner at the club. Yes, and at one of my tables. Why not? It is the ritziest joint in town. Yeah, and you're the most popular head waiter. Uh, Hannah, look, could I say something? Not I now. Wait. It's too good to give up, Nicky. You know that. But now, don't... I haven't finished. Look how simple it is. You watch your regular customers, make a list of the furs and hey, stuff. Look, Hannah, what Will you trying? be quiet? They even make it easy, Nicky. They sign their dinner checks. We get their address. I know all that. Well, what could be sweeter? The night Mrs. Richwich leaves something big at home, you call us. We get dressed up, go over with the passkey, and get it. I'm trying to tell you the DA has asked to see all the Regency Club employees tomorrow for questioning. Well, let him question. Turn on the head waiter act for him, baby. He won't understand a word you're saying. Hey, look, In a no, minute, no, Stanley. As long as we look good to the doorman, yeah, and can work the locks while we're in, Nicky. Now, what are you yapping about? Well, uh, uh, I think Nicky is right, Hannah. We could quit now and get a nice house in the country. What? Oh, you should see the plans I got, Nicky. I'm going to do the whole kitchen myself in pine. Stanley. With building sink and cupboards, Nicky. You know. Yeah, dear? Get lost. But I was Beat it, will you? Go down to your workbench and whip up a birdhouse. All right. Matter of fact, I will. <sighs> Excuse me, Nicky. Uh, sure. Go ahead, Stanley. You know, one of these days, Hannah, you'll go too far. <sighs> you don't treat Stanley very nice, Hannah. Oh, why should I? He's happy with a chisel and a bucket of nails. It's good for a man to have a hobby... I suppose. Maybe. What's yours, Nicky? Mine? Sit still. I'll light us a cigarette. Stanley is um, in the basement? Here. Yeah, he makes things. You're not smoking? One's enough. I'll take drags off yours. Good Lord. What is that? So help me someday, I'll hit him with his own hammer. Stanley, turn that thing off, you big head of jerk. Stanley! What was that, dear? I said turn that thing off. Well, it was just my power, so I had I'm sorry. I don't care what it was. You make that racket again, I'll wrap it around your skull. Heaven is wrens. Now... Let's see, where were we? And uh, about pulling any more oh, jobs. Oh, we'll pull more jobs, Nicky. You know we will. We got lots to do, you and me. Come on, honey. Sit down, make yourself at home. You know, it can happen to anyone, even to you. Tonight or tomorrow, you may get one of those dull headaches that leaves you feeling miserable and out of sorts. And all just because you need a laxative. So remember, like millions of others, you too can get gentle relief with Sal Hepatica. A glass of sparkling Sal Hepatica gives you gentle relief. Welcome relief, day or night. Sal Hepatica, taken when you get up, brings gentle, speedy relief. Usually within an hour. And at the same time, if you're troubled with excess gastric acidity, Sal Hepatica sweetens your stomach. So get a bottle of Sal Hepatica, America's most famous saline laxative, at any drug counter and keep it handy. Then, day or night, get feeling right with gentle, sparkling Sal Hepatica, the laxative that suits your convenience. Sal Hepatica. <laughs> Now, as I understand it, Mr. Sylvania, there are several head waiters at the Regency Club. Is that right? Antonio, Frank, Luigi, and that is myself, Nicky. Nicky, I see. Uh, you know Mr. and Mrs. Mallory, do you, Nicky? Pardon? 
I don't need to tell you that we're working on a series of robberies, do I? Mr. and Mrs. Mallory were at the Regency Club the night their apartment was entered. So? Oh, that is too bad. You do remember them? I remember all of my good customers and never forget. I see. And the Fultons? Fulton? Yeah, let's try some of these other names. Uh, Mr. and Mrs. Fulton, Mr. and Mrs. Owen Conroy, Mr. and Mrs. Addington, uh, Mr. and Mrs. Nathan Sims. You know these people, do you? But I have told you, I know all of my customers. Please, I work very hard. I have done nothing, nothing. Well, there's no reason to think you have. I'm merely interested in your cooperation. Pardon? I say, if you can help me, I'll appreciate it. Oh, any time at all, sir. A yes. pleasure. Huh? You come to the club for dinner. I will Let... arrange it personally, sir. Let... Yes, we start with bouillabaisse, a, a chicory salad with romaine, a crown, a roast, a lamb. Yes, yes, that'll be very nice, I'm sure. Oh. Pardon? You, um, you may go now, Mr. Sylvania. If I need any more help, I'll call. Oh, you are most kind of Mr. District Attorney. Merci, merci beaucoup. All right, don't mention it. Uh, Dorothy, if Miss Miller and Harrington are finished in the other room, ask them to come in here, would you please? Oh, they are. Oh, fine. Thank you. Come in. Yeah. I just called Dorothy to see if you were free. Oh, sure. oh, yeah, sure. I'm free and losing my mind, Chief. Those waiters talk everything but English. Harrington isn't kidding, Chief. I don't know whether I was taking notes or ordering dinner. <laughs> yes, yes. I had a little difficulty myself. Oh. <laughs> I got this much, though, Harrington. Yeah? In every single case, the people who were robbed dined at the Regency Club the night it happened. Yeah, I got that too, Chief. I have the notes on it. Well, all right. There's our pattern, then. So let's see what the pattern makes. The name is Phillips, Hannah. Mr. and Mrs. Austin Phillips. They've been customers of mine for years. How big a score? I haven't got it set yet, but it looks fine. Every time she comes in, she's wearing a different coat. Rocks? There must be dozens. Diamond bracelets, rings, solid gold cigarette cases. It's uh, very nice. <laughs> and you wanted to quit. Aren't you glad I talked you out of it? I'm glad about a lot of things, Hannah. The only worry is... I know, Stanley. He would care, would he? If he knew about us? What if he does? I hope you know how to handle him. Oh, don't worry. I do. Like a baby. <laughs> Hey, uh, Hannah, did you see my cross-cut saw? I had it just as... Ah, oh, Nicky, I'm glad you're here. It's uh, good to see you, Stanley. Uh, you're looking for a saw? Oh, no, that can wait. I haven't even told Hannah, but I've been waiting to talk to you. Both of you. So, but it is so late, Stanley. Some other time. No, I, I really must be gone. Hold it, Nicky, and drop the accent. You want to talk about what? Sandpaper? Oh, no. no I, I've, been, I've been thinking, Hannah. With what? Now, look, I warn you, don't treat this lightly. Oh, I, I let you have your way, I know, but this time I'm serious. Hey, Stan, old man. Let him Maybe say that... it, Nicky. Well, I mean, all this here in the papers, the employees of the club being questioned and all, I've come to a decision. I'll be a monkey's uncle. About what? We're quitting, Hannah, not after the next one, not tomorrow or the next day, but now. You kill me, Stanley. Go back to your birdhouse. No, no, no. I, I, I mean it. We got, we got money now. Well over three thousand dollars. Well over thirty cents is more like it. Look, can I happen to know? What's more, with the money, we, we could buy a nice trailer. A nice what? Second hand, I think. If it needs attention, I could fix it up. Hey, did you ever see the inside side of a trailer, Nick? Me? All you can do one is with a hammer and a nail, snug as a bug in a rug. Are you through now? No, no, Hannah, I'm not. Of course, it won't be like a house in the country, but that will come in time. Now, listen to me. In a me, moment, you... dear, in a moment. It has, uh, it has advantages, you know? Travel about, meet people. You know, I've always wanted to see Yellowstone National Park. Just see it? And come for the course. You can have that in a trailer, Hannah. You can. Oh, yeah, yeah. I, I thought a heavy gingham of some kind at the windows, you know, gives all the privacy in the world. On wheels. Oh, now, look, Hannah, you needn't be flipping. After all, half of what we've taken in is mine. All right, brace yourself, Buster. I've got news for you. Uh, perhaps I should go. Just stay put, Nicky. He just don't know the time of day. 
I think I do, Anna. Yeah, well, Mr. Trailer, we ain't got any three grand. At this exact minute, we ain't got a lousy 200 bucks. What did you say? What do you think I've been playing the races with? Shavings? You're lying. Am I? That's Nicky. I'm sorry you lost so much, Hannah. Well, I'm not easy come, easy go. My old man taught me that. Why, you thieving little swine! Hey, hey, no. Anna, are you hurt? Anna! Oh, look, Hannah, I, I'm sorry. I, I, I didn't mean to do that. I, I just lost my temper. Get out of my way, Nicky. Hannah, I said I didn't mean to slap you. Hannah, be, be careful. You Come here. Let me go, Hannah. Hannah. Stay out of this. Hannah, please, you're hurting me. You old stone national park. Hannah, let go of my throat. How do you like this, Gingham? How, how do you like this? And I let go of his neck. You don't know what you're doing. Don't I? He... He's dead? He should be. The Jap choke works every time. The one your father taught you. Pop taught me a lot. Like... Like easy come, easy go, Nicky. Remember that, will you? Now that you're going to hang around. All right, Harrington. I've seen enough. Hmm? Have one of the men throw a blanket over the body. Yeah, all right, Chief. You agree with me? Yes, yes. There's no question about it. Death due to strangulation, I'd say. Uh, the medical examiner's on his way. Good, Mr. Spinner. How would you say the body got down here in the railroad yards, Harrington? Ah, it was brought here. There's no sign of a struggle underground. Yes, yes. That's my idea, too. And in a car, I think. Sure. If he'd been hurled from a train, he'd never have landed over here. Oh, excuse me. Is there any preliminary identity? I have to make out the card. No, not a thing so far, Mr. Spinner. I see. Harrington? Well, it don't look like there's going to be much either. Mm. Nothing in the pockets, labels torn out of his suit and clothes. Yes, yes, I noticed that. Sure, they even tore the laundry marks off his shirt, looks like. Yes, and took his ring. Yeah. Yes, you can see the line on his finger where he wore one. Ah. Well, I still don't buy it as a plain mugging. I doubt that, too. Especially when identification's been so carefully destroyed. Yeah, you know, the neck is what gets me. Hmm. How do you die like that? Oh, excuse me. The examiner's arriving up on the ramp. Oh, thank you, Miss Miller. Well, let's let him get to work, shall we? This one may be more of a puzzle than we know. Hello? Anna, Nikki. Any news? Ah, oh, forget it. I've been waiting for the call about the job. Mr. and Mrs. Phillips are here in the club now. Oh, wonderful. They just ordered dinner, and they want to make an 840 curtain at the theater. Oh, what a break, Nikki. She isn't wearing the chinchilla, is she? She's wearing the mink. The chinchilla must be at home. I'll have it in one hour. Be careful, baby. They have a butler, you know. He may be home. Just so that coat's at home, honey. That's all I need to know. Mr. and Mrs. Phillips are not at home this evening. If you'll just... You got any more questions, bud, or can't you talk? No, thank you. Tell Mr. and Mrs. Phillips I'll be out at three. Yes, thank you. Chief, can't we do something with those reporters? They're tearing their hair outside. Well, not for the moment, I'm afraid, Harrington. Any reports from the morgue, Miss Miller? Uh, yes, sir, just now. Yes? Dr. Colgan finished his examination of the Phillips butler. And? 
The same as the man in the railroad yards. Death due to strangulation. The same discoloration in the neck? Oh, he didn't say. He's sending up his report. Well, tell him not to bother. I'm going down for more. All right. You want me, Chief? Well, I want to set up something else first, Harrington. I got all I needed from Mr. Phillips. Yeah? Not only have all the victims in these robberies had dinner at the Regency Club, but it seems they all had the same waiter captain. Which one, Chief? Well, fortunately, Miss Miller, one you and Harrington didn't see. Oh, as for the two whom you did question, I'm arranging to have them take a vacation. I don't get it, Chief. What's the plan? Well, one that might work, Harrington. However, it's going to take a long time. Dentists say the Ipana way works. Yes, dentists say the Ipana way works. In thousands of reports from all over the country, eight out of ten dentists say the Ipana way promotes healthier gums and brighter teeth. Listen, here's the professionally approved Ipana dental care, the Ipana way. First of all, between regular visits to your dentist, brush all tooth surfaces with Ipana toothpaste at least twice a day. And then, massage gums the way your dentist advises. Remember, Ipana's special formula actually helps stimulate gum circulation. Yes, for healthier gums and brighter teeth, the Ipana way. Dentists say the Ipana way works. Ipana toothpaste with a sparkling flavor that leaves your mouth fresher, your breath cleaner. Ipana, the toothpaste more dentists personally use and recommend than any other. So ask your dentist about Ipana and massage. A good dentifrice, like a good dentist, is never a luxury. Make the Ipana way your way to healthier gums, brighter teeth, and Ipana smile. Get Ipana toothpaste. All right, so I had to take care of the butler. We got the coat, didn't we? It won't be easy to get rid of Hannah. The fences all say chinchilla is too rare. It takes time to dispose of it. All right, so we do another. Now? But we... All right, all right, hold it. Sure, it's getting hot, Nicky. I know that. Very hot. And I agree, we should quit. Go somewhere, like you said. But that is just what I'm saying. But we can't go without dough, can we? You just said it'll take weeks to get the cut on the Phillips coat. But I... So we do just one more, Nicky. One big one, and we go. Now get somebody lined up, baby, and we're free. Good evening, sir. It is a pleasure to see you again this evening. Well, what do you know about that, Edith? He remembers us from last week. Oh, how nice. It is a pleasure, Mrs. Johnson. And if I may say so, sir. Yes, uh, a Nicky, wasn't it? A Nicky, sir. Good. And the management has suggested that if you wish to sign your dinner checks, it will be a pleasure. Well, well, now isn't that nice? Just sure. Send the bills to the apartment, Nicky. Apartment 20, the Westport Arm. A pleasure, sir. Good. May I suggest oysters for Madame to star? The piconic salts are excellent. No, I think a hot consomme, please. It's been so cold. Oh, Harry, would you mind? I'll just put my mink over my shoulder. Oh, allow me, Madame. Oh, oh thank sir. you. And a hot consomme. Yes, please. It will be a pleasure. Was the venison all right, Mr. Johnson? Oh, 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 my favorite meat, Nicky. Even better than last week. Uh, well, my dear, are uh, you ready to go? Yes, Harry, we ought to get home. Oh, will you ask Nicky to get my coat, please? It's the sable there on that chair. For tonight, Mr. Johnson, may I suggest the rack of lamb? Well, it sounds good, Nicky. Oh, dear, oh, dear. Did we have lamb here the other night, dear? Well, Harry, anything that won't take too long. We haven't much time, you know. May I inquire if you are attending the theater again this evening? <laughs> oh, gracious, no. <laughs> Not dressed like this, Nicky. Mr. Johnson insists on going to the boxing matches. Well, you're going to like them, dear. It's a great card tonight. Probably last until midnight, but it's worth it. <laughs> well, thank goodness I am dressed for it. If anyone mauls this old thing, I just don't care. It's all set, Hannah. They've gone to the fights, and she's left all the furs at home. Remember now, the Westport Arms, apartment 20. I'll be in the car in front when you're through. <laughs>
I've been waiting for what? you. Why, you... <laughs> all right, all right. Now, just stand perfectly still. Oh, my wrist. You've broken my wrist. I don't doubt that. It's the only way I've learned to break that choke. Yes, in here, Harrington. All right, Nicky. Oh. Come on, this is enough, please. How dare you... Anna! I can't stand the pain. Get a doctor, Miss Miller, will you please? Right away, Chief. Well, a clean sweep, eh, Harrington? It's looked like this time they've ordered the full meal. Here's a faster, better way to relieve pain. A new product that acts twice as fast as aspirin. The name is Bufferin. Remember that name, Bufferin. It acts twice as fast as aspirin. Now you can get faster relief from your headaches, pains due to colds, neuralgia, and minor muscular aches with Bufferin. Remember that name, Bufferin. It acts twice as fast as aspirin. You see, Bufferin is absorbed twice as fast into your bloodstream, so it goes to work faster to relieve pain, and gently, too. And because Bufferin tablets are antacid, they will not upset your stomach. Remember that name, Bufferin, at drug counters everywhere. Bufferin acts twice as fast as aspirin. And now, with the explanation of tonight's case, here is your district attorney. It's a pleasure to report, ladies and gentlemen, that with the arrest of Hannah Price and Nick Sylvania, we brought to an end the unusual wave of robberies. Both Hannah and Nicky will pay the full penalty demanded by law for the murders of the Phillips Butler, as well as Hannah's husband, Stanley. Golly, that was one assignment I liked, Chief. Uh, I've never eaten such good food in my life. <laughs> yeah, and oh boy, did you look swell in all those furs that you rented, Miss Muller. <laughs> Why, thank you, Harrington. But of course, I look good in just uh, anything. Oh, oh. <laughs> well, it was certainly good work, Miss Muller. You and Harrington sent Hannah right to the apartment where I was waiting, simply by displaying those furs. Yeah, and when we got there, we picked up Nicky in front of the joint chief. Yes, actually, it was Hannah's peculiar method of choking her victims that helped. Harrington. Yeah, that's the Japanese choke, brother. That one's the works. Yes, it nearly always kills and without as much effort as is sometimes needed. Fortunately, it leaves a characteristic discoloration of the neck as well as abrasions on the lower jaw. And uh, you saw those in the morgue, Chief? Yes, I did, Miss Miller, on both Stanley and the butler. And that's why I was ready for Hannah when she tried the Japanese choke on me. Yeah, and you can thank the Army Service for that, huh, Chief? Right. Bring your arms down hard and you can break it, sir, and break the case, I'm glad to say. I'll say so. Oh, Chief, what about next week? Well, our case for next week is one of the most vital in our files, ladies and gentlemen. One which lays bare a vicious crime now being committed against all of us. It's the case of Send the Homeless, and I invite you to join us for it. Until then, thank you and good night. <laughs> The names of all characters in a night's dramatization are fictitious and any resemblance to names of living persons or actual places is purely coincidental. Our stars were Jay Justin in the title role, Len Doyle as Harrington, and Vicki Vola as Miss Miller. The music was under the direction of Peter Van Steeden. The program is produced and directed by Edward A. Byron and written by Robert Shaw. Mr. District Attorney was originated by Phillips H. Lord. Remember... I pan a toothpaste for the smile of beauty, Sal Hepatica for the smile of health. Bristol Myers invites you to tune in again next week for Duffy's Tavern and Mr. District Attorney. Mr. District Attorney, champion of the people, defender of truth. Guardian of our fundamental rights to life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. And this shall be my duty as district attorney, not only to prosecute to the limit of the law all persons accused of crimes perpetrated within this county, but to defend with equal vigor the rights and privileges of all its citizens. The case of free play. Well, I must say the kindergarten looks wonderful, Aunt Martha. Isn't it delightful, Deborah? Like me, Ted. What? Oh, yes, of course. Yes, we. You neglected your old Aunt Ted. I haven't seen you in ages. Well, we, we've been busy, Aunt Martha. You and Miss uh, Hawkins, is it? Hawkins. I, uh, I have thought of you, Aunt Martha. Haven't I, Deborah? Mm. 
Every time someone mentions Miss Mulberry's nursery school, I feel a little glow of pride. Uh, being a Mulberry, too, I mean. What time are the kids out of here? I beg pardon, Miss Hawkins? This building, what time do the kids get out of it? Why, school closes at three, Miss Hawkins. We only take little tots, you know. Uh, oh, my, I think the water's boiling for tea. Will you excuse me? Oh, uh, can I help you? No, no, you sit still. I won't be the minute. Bird brain, will you get to the point with the old fool? Now, Deborah, you promised I could handle it. After all, she is my aunt. I know how. Why don't you just give it to her straight? Tell her we've been peddling the stuff and it got hot. What oh, heaven's name, Deborah, have you lost your mind? And Martha wouldn't know what marijuana is. Say nothing of narcotics. Okay, okay, have it your way. I mean, this head up is perfect. You said the last one was. So it got hot. Now, will you please tell her we're moving in here? Oh, I don't know. I I really don't know. Look, it's a nursery school or whatever you call it, right? One of the best private ones in the city. Great. The brats pull out at three. We can run the joint wide open all night long. Yes, it, um... It does seem advantageous, I'll admit. Advantageous? It's beautiful. There's plenty of room we can even take on more customers. Of course, Aunt Martha will be hard to handle, that one. Very hard. Well, that's your department. All I know is we're moving in. Who'd look for hopheads in a nursery? Oh, all I can say, Chief. When I pull a boner, it's a beaut. Why, Harrington? Did something go wrong? Oh. Uh, you mean last night? I mean last night, Miss Miller. You know, I've been working on that marijuana thing, Chief. Yes, yes, I know. For weeks now, I've been working along with the federal boys. Mm -hmm. The heavier stuff, heroin, cocaine, all that, that's their department. Yes, and what about the marijuana? Well, sure, we've got jurisdiction there. It's a local offense. I know. I mean, weren't you about ready to go ahead? Well, last night, wasn't it, Harrington? That's right, last night. There's a dame named Hawkins, Chief. Mm -hmm. Guess I told you, Deborah Hawkins. Yes, yes, you mentioned the name. Okay, for weeks now, we've been casing her place. An apartment over on West Avenue. And that's where she operated? Oh, in a big way. She not only peddled the stuff, she let the customer stay right there and use it. Mm -hmm. Oh, talk about a fun house. And what happened? Yeah, nothing happened. We got all set to raid the joint. I got four extra crews on duty. I got the whole building roped off. And? We go in. Yeah. Boom. The joint's as clean as a whistle. You mean you couldn't get any evidence? Evidence? The place was empty, Miss Miller. Mm. Deborah and her chum pulled out in the morning. Her chum? Oh, yeah, some punk that works for her. Oh, I see. Any idea where the tip came from? No, I haven't, Chief. It was kind of a big operation, you know. When they're like that, there could be a lot of leaks. With yes, unfortunately, you're right. But I have a stack of complaints a foot high about this marijuana situation. Yeah, don't I know it? The T-boys, too. Hmm. They're absolutely sure narcotics are coming into this town. Yeah, even better. They're coming to Deborah Hawkins. And she's gone. Well, she sure was last night. Well, there's only one answer. She'll open up again some other place. Oh, that you can bet on. Well, let's find her then, and this time, let's bring her in. Ah, oh, here you are, Deborah, in here, huh? Well... Did you see who's in the nursery tonight? Mm -hmm. Martin Dale, light me ten. Well, you might at least have let me tell it. How much did he spend? Oh, here. Thanks. Fifty. I'm not sure I like him as a customer, though. He's got a bad reputation. I think he's fascinating. I do believe he's the first gangster I've ever met. You're somewhat naive, darling. Where were you all afternoon? I was with Aunt Martha in the nursery. In the afternoon? I was helping with the children. <laughs> you know, it's amazing, Deborah, watching their little minds. Yeah, well, you keep your little mind on our children, dear. I made a good start here for a week. I want to make it even better. Ted? Oh, good. You're both here. Why, Aunt Martha, I thought you were upstairs in bed long ago. Oh, I can sleep with people coming and going. I'll never know. Good evening, Miss Hawkins. I was just going. I'd rather you stayed. As a matter of fact, there's something I want to say to both of you. Can I get you a cup of tea, Aunt Martha? Stop fussing, Ted. Fact is, I'm extremely upset. One of the kids fall out of the swing? Deborah, please. What is it, Aunt Martha? 
I told you a week ago you were welcome to stay here for a while, Ted. You too, Miss Hawkins. Thanks. With your tea room burnt to the ground and all, goodness knows you had no place to go. With our wife? I, uh, told Aunt Martha about our tea room, Deborah, in Chicago. Oh, and you're welcome here. I'm sure it isn't that. So it's what? My dear Miss Hawkins, it seems to me you've had company every night since you came. Company? Even now, there are people in the nursery coming and going until all hours. I've heard them. Oh, but my dear, Let right, me we... finish. Stop dancing uh, about. Sit down, Ted. Well, I'm only trying to explain. I realize you're young, you have friends, and you like to have a good time. You bet. On the other hand, this is my nursery school and my home. You mustn't abuse it. Oh, now, we don't mean to, Aunt Martha, really. Well, nevertheless, I don't like it. Smelling up the place with their Turkish cigarettes. How's that again? My dear Miss Hawkins, the nursery is just thick with their smoke. It's getting so I can't air the place out. Aunt Martha, Oh, you, you... need to explain, my boy. I'm tired now, and I'm going to try to sleep. Oh, let me help you. Oh, do leave me alone. Sorry I had to speak, but I just can't have this. Now, uh, if you'll excuse me, good night. She ought to take a drag or two herself and prove her disposition. It's not funny, Deborah. I think it is. The first time I ever heard marijuana described as a Turkish cigarette. She doesn't know. Really? You amaze me. Better go see if Martin Dale wants anything. He usually takes a deck home. Is it just, but what about Aunt Martha? We'd have to find a new place if she makes us move. Now, you're being funny. But you heard of Deborah. She... Will you come to? This is the neatest setup I ever had. But Deb... I don't intend to give it up. Aunt Martha or no Aunt Martha, we're here to stay. <laughs> Please assure the committee we are doing everything we can. Sincerely, et cetera, et cetera. Mm -hmm. I'll have this tap right away, Chief. Uh -huh. Hey, Chief! Oh, yes, come in, Harrington. Well, you look happy. <laughs> oh, boy, why shouldn't I? Hey, Chief, we finally got a break. Oh, on the marijuana problem? Right on the head. Yes? I was prowling around town last night. Pretty late, too, come to think of it, and I see my old pal, Martin Dale. Who? A two-bit bum around town, Miss Miller, mixed up in a dozen different rackets. Uh, well, there's no charge pending against him, is there? No, no, nothing special, Chief, but I spoke to him just the same. A bum like that on parole, well, I do it just for exercise. Uh, well, I don't blame you. <laughs> Dale's in prison oftener than he's out. Well, he's on his way in again, if you ask me. Mm -hmm. When I stopped him, Chief, he was glassy-eyed. First, I thought he was drunk. Yes, and? He was all hopped up, Chief. I could smell marijuana all over him. What? Sure, and to make it even better... He was carrying two dozen cigarettes. No. Sure. I got him down in the bullpen right now. Have you made out the charge? No, not yet, Chief. I thought I'd see you first. Good. Say, this may be an opening wedge, Harrington. Is he able to talk? Oh, yeah, yeah, sure. The jag's worn off. He's he's just depressed now. He's what? Oh, those hopheads get off a low when you take away their candy, Miss Miller. Oh. Well, what time did you make the arrest? 2 a.m. I see. Mm -hmm. Well, all right, let's do this. We'll hold him the full 24 hours without making a formal charge. Right. Oh, and nothing to the papers, Miss Miller. Okay. Notify the desk, will you? Right away. And we'll give him a couple of hours and then bring him up here, Harrington. Right. And by that time, he ought to be real unhappy. Yes, we won't make a deal, you understand, but maybe he'll talk anyway. They usually do. Oh, brother, I sure hope so, because if Martin Dale got his supply from little Deborah Hawkins, Chief, we're in. <laughs> I ought to go to bed, Ted. There won't be any more customers tonight, anyway. Yes, I, I, I will, Deborah. Simply trying to calm myself by reading. Reading what? Hmm? Oh, one of Aunt Martha's books. The Life of Madame Montessori. Who's she? Lighten, will you? Oh, nuisance. Madame Montessori founded a method of educating small children, the theory of free play. That ought to calm anybody. Yeah. Thanks. What's the matter? You run out of comic books? <laughs> Those sense of humor has walked, Deborah. If I want to improve myself, I should at least be encouraged. You like telling stories to the little monsters? I happen to find it stimulating, yes. As a matter of fact, Deborah, oh, I... Hmm? Somebody's coming. But you said everyone's gone. Good heavens, it's after three. Yes? Well... Aunt Martha... I'd find you here. Now, don't speak to your door. We won't mince words. You're up pretty late, aren't you? I'll hear no more from you, Miss Hawkins. Now, both of you pack your bags and get out. 
What did you say? Don't pretend you don't understand me. I said get out of my nursery school. Now? Now. Is that clear? Just what's wrong, Aunt Martha? Well, I'm sure you could answer that better than I, Miss Hawkins. I saw some of your friends tonight. Our friends? Downstairs in the nursery? I did. I don't know what was going on, but it's going to stop. Why, they acted like drunkards. Oh, Martha, no. Don't argue with me. I said pack up and get out. Nobody was drunk, Aunt Martha. Well, worse then. I don't even want to hear about it. Well, didn't you hear me? See your aunt, Ted. Take over. Aunt Martha, now... Now be calm a minute. Oh, you're a spineless, weak jellyfish, Ted Mulberry. Yes, and no telling what else. I said get out. And Martha, don't... Don't talk like that. I might get mad. Mad? You? Oh. oh, I can get mad, can't I, Deborah? Tell her. Take it easy, Aunt Martha. Now, listen, you two. The officer in this neighborhood is a friend of mine. If you are not started in two minutes, I'm going to call him. And get your poor nephew arrested? I don't care what happens to him. He's a sneak, a lying little sneak. I always thought you were a lady. Get out. Deborah? You calm enough, Ted? Completely. You realize now I was right? Perfectly. He talks to that policeman at 15 to 25 years for the both of us. Naturally. I should have acted before. Oh, stop this chattering and get out of I'll here. I'll get the gun, Ted. I have it much first. Let me have it, Deborah. Quickly. Have you gone mad? What are you talking about? What gun? This one. Here, Ted. Thank you. Theodore. What's come over you? Theodore. You don't know your nephew in a crisis, Aunt Martha. He's a riot. There's no need to explain to her, Deborah. I see it quite clearly. Aunt Martha? Ted, uh, No. No, Theodore. No. <laughs> You shot me. You didn't have to. I... I shall have a reaction quite soon, Deborah. I'll need a small brandy. I know. It's the only thing to do, of course. You agree about that? Completely. There's just one thing. Yes? Are you still thinking clearly? We need the nursery for the cover-up, you know. I was aware of that when I shot. Who's going to teach the kids? I am. You? I shall use the Montessori method, I think. The accent on free play. And now my brandy, Deborah. Oh, I... I really do feel quite faint. <laughs> All right, Jerry. Put him back in the cooler. Let's go back to the office, Harrington. All right. How long were we talking to him? Working deal? Mm -hmm. Good three hours, Chief. Yes, and not very profitably, I'd say. Well, let's take the back stairs. Boy, that guy sure is stubborn. Well, there isn't a doubt in my mind that he knows where Deborah Hawkins is. Oh, sure. Every time you mentioned her name... We got a reaction out of him. Yes, a reaction, but no information. Mm -hmm. Well, we can't hold him, Harrington. We'll make out a charge upstairs. All right. Possession of marijuana? Oh, well, that's about all we can do, I'm afraid. We'll have to release the stories to the papers, too. Yeah, I know. <laughs> Brother, wherever Deborah's operating, it sure is terrific. We've got to find it, Harrington. I want to put a stop to her for good. <laughs> I asked you not to disturb me when I'm in the nursery. Where are the kids? In Humpty Dumpty Land. What? In the next room. It's nap time. After that, they get their milk. Fortified, of course. Listen, teacher, will you wake up? Did you see the afternoon papers? But hardly. I've been busy here at the blackboard since noon. You like it? Like what? Well, good heavens, Deborah, don't tell me you don't recognize it. All this colored chalk. It's a turkey. You drew that? Well, I traced part of it, I must admit. Good though, don't you think? I'm trying to tell the you. The tail feathers just delight the children. <laughs> tell me what? Martin Dale is in stir. Martin Dale? 
Our Martindale? Our Martindale. And get this, the DA charged him with possession of marijuana. Oh. Our marijuana, in case you don't get it. That could be very serious. Could be. Suppose he tells where he got it. That's what I meant. That and your Aunt Martha lying out in that ditch, my friend. That don't add up so good. Oh, don't mention her, Deborah. I've told so many mothers she went to Florida, I almost believe it. I don't care about the mothers. Just believe this, Montessori. If Martindale starts talking, this whole act may turn into a turkey. This woman's body was found in a ditch, you said? Yeah, this morning, she. She's up ahead on slab nine. Yeah, I, uh, I heard about Martin Dale. About him getting released on bail? Mm-hmm. Mm. Well, I guess we kind of expected it. Well, there wasn't any way to hold him pending trial. All I'm banking on now, when we do try him, he'll talk. Well, maybe. Yeah, here's the woman. He left the slab. There's been no autopsy? No, or... nobody's even touched her, Chief. There's no identification. Nice-looking woman. Mm. One shot? Yeah. In a ditch, you said? That's right, Chief. What? Nothing. I, I was just looking at these smudges on her dress here. Some sort of chalk, isn't it? Chalk? Yes. It wasn't any in the ditch. Well, we'll have a test taken. It seems like... Hmm. What's the matter, Chief? Oh, it's strange. There's an odor on these clothes. Still quite strong. Hmm? Let me smell. That familiar? Huh. Well, I'll be a monkey's uncle, Chief. That smells like marijuana. Yes, that was my impression, too. Yeah. Now there's the phone. Yeah, that may be for me, Chief. I told Brophy we were coming down to the morgue. Yes? Chief, Miss Miller. Yes? Can you come back to the office? Well, I'd rather not right now, Miss Miller. Harrington and I have just stumbled onto something important. I'll say we have. Well, this is important, too, Chief. Yes? The report just came in. Martin Dale's been killed. The way we tie our shoe, tie our shoe, tie our... Ah. No, no. This is the way we brush our hair, brush our hair, Will you please here. keep still? I'm trying to concentrate. Well, my dear Deborah, you told me yourself the nursery is important. If I'm to run it, I want it run right. Will you please... The children learn through these songs, Deborah. I must say, I've learned quite a bit myself. Great. Now, will you listen to me? Later. You're really feeling your muscle lately, you know it, little man? Why not? Things are going extremely well. The children adored my turkey. Oh, dear. All right, we'll talk quietly. Lightning Why don't you carry matches, Deborah? I'm busy. Listen, Egghead, I spent all afternoon trying to find Martin Dale, and I couldn't. Suppose he's talking. He isn't. What do you mean he isn't? Stop smirking at me. I killed him. He did what? He was here while you were out. Seems he needed a supply. Give me this slow. It was quite simple. I offered to drive him home, and when we got there, I shot him. I, I borrowed your gun. You shot Martin Dale? It's just like that? My dear Deborah, you said yourself if he talked, we'd have to move again. Yes, but I And it didn't... was the only thing to do. I'd simply hate giving up the nursery. Oh, good Lord. So you see, there's nothing to worry about at all. Now, have it. The way we tie our shoe, tie our shoe, God. In heaven's name, how do you tie a shoe? Come on, come on, clear out, will you, fellas? The DA will see you in a minute. That's it, that's the boy. Come on, give us a chance to work, huh? That's it, outside. The yep. examiner's on his way for the body. Oh, good. You may start on the apartment, Miss Murray, and just right. list everything you see. Sure thing. And this Martin Dale sure wasn't neat, Chief. Look at this dump. Well, at the moment, Harrington, I'm more interested in his body. Do you notice anything? He shot once. On the coat sleeve here. Huh? See? Hey, that's funny. Looks like chalk. Exactly. And that was chalk on that woman in the morgue. Hey, Chief. 
This begins to make sense. Yes, a lot of sense. A woman and Martin Dale, both shot once, chalk on both bodies, and the odor of marijuana on both. Well, Marty's got more than odor. His pockets are full of cigarettes. Oh, please. Yes, Miss Miller. I'm sorry to interrupt, but I found this engagement calendar. This one? Yeah. On Martin Dale's desk, Harrington. The page for today is still here. Yes, what about it, Miss Miller? Well, the name seems so strange. Huh? Martin Dale didn't have any children, did he? <laughs> My dear Deborah, I must ask you once more to remain calm. Calm? Now? You're simply putting a series of circumstances together, my dear. It's what we call basic association. What? Basic association. <laughs> For example, take one of the children. I say dog. He answers Bow Wow. I say snow. And he says Santa Claus. <laughs> it's really most interesting. Yeah, well, I say murder, Bob. First Aunt Martha, now Martin Dale. Still association. There's no reason in the world to connect us to any of it. Now, would you like to help me? I'm doing the nursery in crepe paper. Ted. Yes, Deborah? What's the matter with you? You used to be so easy, so gentle. Why, well, I'm the soul of gentleness, Deborah. Then will you think... We gotta get out of here, Ted, now, before things get any hotter. I say no. Oh, you fat headed. No, so help me, Mother Goose, I'll make you see it. Ted. Yes, dear? Please, can we go? You're really very selfish, Deborah. I enjoy the nursery immensely. I see. Okay, that does it. You won't listen to me. Maybe you'll listen to this. Just happen to have here in my purse. I'd put away the gun, if I were you. They make me extremely nervous. I only wish they did. Now, will you get started? We're checking out. Put it down, Deborah. You know my temper. Who's that? One of the mothers, I'd imagine. She'd hardly expect firearms, Deborah. Put it away. Get rid of her, you hear me? But I enjoy the problems. I really do. Enter. This is the Mulberry Nursery School? Yes, I'm Mr. Mulberry. Can I can I help you? Yeah, in here, Chief. Oh, yes, yes, I see. Yeah, I'm just going to... Hey, wait a minute. Well, I'll be darned if it ain't Debbie Hawkins. What? I'm more interested in this one, Harrington. Uh, that's interesting chalk on your suit. I beg your pardon? I said you fool, they're cops. Deborah, quickly, the gun. There you go. Jack, Debbie, old chip. I mean, I'll take I, the... Go on. Keep that gun, Harrington. We'll need it. All right, both of you. This school is out for good. Let's go. This is the United States Armed Forces Radio Service. champion of the people, defender of truth, guardian of our fundamental rights to life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. And it's 
shall be my duty as district attorney not only to prosecute to the limit of the law all persons accused of crimes perpetrated within this county, but to defend with equal vigor the rights and privileges of all its citizens. The case of deadly devotion. You have no idea how these old phonograph records take me back, Mr. St. Charles. Look, here's Dardanella, remember? You select whatever you want to hear, Mrs. Post. The other club members will enjoy it, I know. Well, honestly, I don't know when I've enjoyed myself so. Oh, here's the two black crows, my, my. You do like it here, then? I mean, at the devotion club? Like it? Why, Mr. St. Charles... Harry, please. What? Oh, thank you. Do I enjoy it? But I think what you're doing here is simply wonderful. I hope so. People our age, people in the flush of life, you might say, have a difficult time making new friends. We don't hear, I'll say that. I'm glad you feel that way. You especially, Laura. The moment you came into my office, I... Is something wrong? Well, oh, I'm sorry, but that man seems to be beckoning to you. There, that one near the door. Near the door? Oh, Oh, yes, I... I see. You know him. He doesn't look like one of the members. What? Will you excuse me, my dear? I'll see what he wants. Oh, don't worry about me, Harry. I'll pick out the records before the members start arriving. You don't look glad to see me, Harry. Nick. Nick, my boy, I... Well, don't we shake hands, Harry? Back when we were cellmates, I thought we... got to be pretty good friends. Nick, you can't stay here. Look, my boy, What I... do you mean, cat? I had quite a time looking you up, pal. Yeah, you get quite a layout here. What's the gimmick? Look, I'll uh, I'll give you my address. I have a house. No kidding. We can talk later on, but please, Nick. The Devotion Club, huh? What do you do? Get a lot of old dames in here and take them? Don't say that. Really, you must go, Nick. It... Go. Come off it, pal. We're buddies, remember? Coop in the same hatch back in stir. Yes, I know, my boy, but... Go! Why, you're flubstruck, Harry. I'm gonna stay. Oh, I picked that information request out of the file, Chief. The one from St. Louis. Oh, which one was that, Harrington? A young punk named uh, Oliver. Oh. Nick Oliver. Oh, I saw that when it came through. Uh, he was released from prison out there, wasn't he? That's right, Miss Miller. And from looking at his record, he's on his way back. St. Louis thinks he's here in town. That's the tip they got, Chief. Mm -hmm. For the bum like him, even when he's released, it pays to keep an eye on him. Well, what is his record? I didn't read all the report. Well, <clears throat> little Nick is quite a boy, it seems like. He's got an arrest record as long as your arm. And there's a charge against him now? Well, they want to talk to him about a little accident, Chief. Seems the day he got out, a pal of his turned up with a hole in his head. What? That's right. Then it turns out the dead guy ratted on Nick in the first place. It was his testimony that sent him up. And they didn't pick him up? No, it happened in a little town outside of St. Louis, Chief. Hmm. By the time the local boys notified the city, Nick was on his way. And they think he's here? Yeah, it looks that way. I've been doing a little checking up on him this morning. Oh, any luck? No, it's a little early, Chief. They're sending us his prison record, personnel report, all that. Mm -hmm. If he's got some pals in town, chances are he'll look him up. Well, let's hope so. The St. Louis authorities have helped us a great deal in the past. I'd like to return the favor. Oh, I'll find him, Chief. <laughs> Bums like that always go in a pattern. Oh, how do you mean? Well, that's one way you find a guy, Miss Miller. You study his habits. Find out what kind of bars he hung around in, what kind of people. Uh-huh. Get a line on him. You know, what kind of dames he goes for, whether he likes sports... Drives a car, his clothes, anything. Yes, the personnel report should contain most of that. Sure, then as soon as we know what kind of a guy he is, we pass the word along to places where he might show up. And then wait for a tip. Tips help. Isn't it strange criminals are so willing to turn each other in? Well, it really isn't strange, Miss Miller. It's part of the criminal nature. Fear. That's right. And when he turns a pal in... He feels safer for a little while. You'd think they'd realize that someday they all get caught. Yes, they do. That's the basis of the fear. Take this man Harrington's trying to find. Nick Oliver? Yes. Wherever he is right now, he's afraid. And why? Because he knows that sooner or later we'll get him. And we will. <laughs> Dear, 
I didn't realize you were here in my office. I thought it better to wait in here, Harry. I'm delighted. Have you been waiting long? There isn't much here to amuse you, I'm afraid. It's quite all right. I was reading an article in this week's Colliers. Oh? It's most entertaining about Mr. District Attorney. You know, the radio program. I'll have to read it. Sit down, my dear. No, thank you. You seem so, so formal, Laura. Is anything wrong? Yes, Harry. A great deal. I don't understand. I, I thought the dance last night was most enjoyable. Who is that man, Harry? Uh, a man? I think you're evading me. I mean Mr. Oliver. Nick? Why, he, he's an old friend, Lord. I, I, I told you that. He's been here a week, Harry. Have you any idea how much the club has changed in that short time? Changed? In what way? Good heavens, are you blind? Do you realize that man encouraged the members to gamble? Yes, and to drink. Now, Laura... Oh, you needn't put your arm around me, Harry. I'm disgusted. I wrote my sister about it last night. Now, Laura, listen to me. Perhaps you're right. Perhaps. When that nice Mrs. Webster lost $43 playing dice... As I say, Nick is impetuous... I shouldn't have permitted him to stay. Oh, he's a very bad young man, in spite of that smile of his. I tell you, Harry, this has changed my opinion of everything. Including us? Well, to tell you the truth, I haven't made up my mind. There's something wrong here, Harry. Uh, Laura, my dear, wait. No, I'm going home now. I've had my say. Home before the dance tonight? I won't be at the dance, Harry. I... I'm not sure I shall return here at all. But the money... Uh, Harry, I mean, you decided to do so much. I have my doubts about that, too. Goodbye, Harry. Harry, you think... Oh, sorry. It's quite all right, Mr. Oliver. I was just leaving. Uh, Lord, wait. Thank you. No. Goodbye. <laughs> What's eating the old bag? You fool. You blundering idiotic... Oh, no, I'm wrong. I'm the fool, not you. It's a trouble, pal. She looked pretty steamed up. I was crazy to let you stay crazy. I wait back on that again. I told you, Harry, you ain't got much choice. I was getting along so well. Yeah, well, now you're doing even better. And you can stop yakking about getting rid of me, Harry. Or do I tell these old crows where you and me met? Dice tables, liquor in the punch, shakedowns. In heaven's name, Nick, what are you trying to pull? No, oh, I need plenty, pal. This is as good as any joint to get it from. But I don't operate that way. I told you I play it slow. Well, that's too bad. I play it fast. What was her name? What? The dame in the uproar just now. It was Mrs. Post. Laura Post. Yeah, well, she can take the... Wait a minute. Is that the one? The one what? The dame you were building up for the big one. Sure it was. I remember the name. She has $20,000 in convertible bonds. She's got what? I've worked on her for three months personally. And now it's all for nothing. She was going to kick in twenty grand. She was, even if I had to marry her. Where'd she go, huh? I imagine so. She's washed up, though. You and your quick scheme scared her off. Where does she live, Harry? I never mind. I get it from my membership. You stay away from her. <laughs> you think you could change her mind? You? Change it? You are oh. why she pulled out. It's a wash-up, I tell you. <laughs> you know, you con boys give me a pain. Twenty grand and you quit like a spoiled kid. I know when a score is cold, Nick. Yeah, well, I know when it's hot. Twenty G's, Harry, my boy. That's plenty hot. Now, where are you going? Calling. What? You heard me. I'm calling on Mrs. Post. Oh, come in, Harrington. Yeah. I, I didn't want to bust in, Chief. Oh, that's quite all right. I just thought I'd bring you up to date on Nick Oliver. Oh, uh, the one they want in St. Louis? That's my boy. Oh, I got a pile of dope on him. Brother, he's something. Yes? Yeah, he started out when he was 13 years old. He stuck up a gas station, and when the attendant was slow with the money, little Nick hit him with a hammer. No. Oh, yeah. Yeah, that's only the beginning, Miss Miller. The bum's record runs six full pages. Uh, any idea where he is now? No, not yet, Chief, but I got a good lead. Yes, what is it? Well, a punk that looks like him hit town about a week ago. Mm -hmm. Come in by bus from over the state line. Do you think it's Nick? Well, maybe, but I know this, Miss Miller. When a rip and tear man like that arrives, a lot of guys know about it, and fast. It's yes, remarkably fast, usually. That's the grapevine, Chief. Mm -hmm. And today they're saying there's a baby-faced guy like Nick in town. <laughs> Joe? 
Just a minute, I'm coming. Yes, uh, just a moment. I'll turn on the porch light. No need for that. I could see okay. Now, see here, just what the... Oh, it's you. I got to talk to you, Mrs. Post. It's about uh, something that happened at the club. The devotion club? Uh-huh. I don't want to hear about uh, it. Let's sit down. I'd, uh, how about in here? Now, see here, I've said I don't want to discuss anything. Why, I was getting ready for bed. Now, this is important, Mrs. Post. It's for your own good. For my own good? Whatever do you mean? You and Harry? I beg your pardon? I told you it was important. Go on. Sit right down and relax. Come to the point, please. Ah, that's fair enough. Uh, Harry tells me you've got 20,000 bucks laying around. What, what do you want, Mr. Uh, Oliver, isn't it? Uh, Nick's enough. And I want to tip you off, Mrs. Post. It's just a friendly gesture. I think perhaps you'd better leave. I'm playing straight with you. You take the dough and put it in a big, strong bank. You understand? I'm sorry. I think all this is, uh, well, to say the least, Mr. Oliver, none of your concern. You're sure hard to convince. Look, will you promise me one thing? Hardly. Yeah, well, first thing in the morning, take the dough and put it in a bank. I never heard of anything like this in my life. Is that too much to ask? Put it in a bank? Very well. Suppose I promise you. Now will you go? Uh, Be more definite. You'll... Put it in tomorrow? Yes, yes. Now, will you please leave my house? (laughs) That's funny. And Harry said I wasn't smooth. That's a laugh. What do you mean? Kid, you just told me the one thing I wanted to know. What? I had to be sure that Doe's here, didn't I? Now, get it up. Get it done. Come on, come on, let's not waste time. Where do you keep it? Look, get off of here. You're using the reason I'm a busy man, baby. Get the dough. I don't believe it. I just don't. Look, I got no time to fool around. If I have to, I'll kick this joint upside down. But... Yeah, I may have to take a few belts at you. Now get smart, will you? Just hand it over nice and easy. Uh, I'll do nothing of the kind. Don't look so greedy at the phone, kid. You reach for that and I'll break your little arm. But do you realize what you're doing, do you? Yeah, I do. But you don't. I'm getting sore, sister, and that ain't good, you know. I... But I haven't got the money here. You lie in your teeth. You just said so. Now, get it up fast. Uh, Mr. Oliver, listen Never to mind me. the routine. I got one of my own. You what? How many rooms in this dump? Eight? Nine? I can go through them in an hour. You wouldn't dare. If I have to look for the scratch, that is. And you know something, baby? I just can't do a good job with you around, Bob. I, I don't understand. Oh, it's simple. Either you hand over the dough like a good kid, or I'll kid you. Kill me, you. I'd have to. If I have to search for it, at least. <laughs> you see? You've got a gun. Oh, that's the flash of the week. Okay. Make up your mind. Oh, please. I'll... Where's the dough? I, I don't know. Oh, I'll be. You shot me. Help me, please. You'll make it tough on yourself, sister. Yeah, and on me, too. Now I gotta tear this joint apart. Boy, there's enough reporters out in that yard to cover a World Series. Well, I don't wonder, Harrington. Mrs. Post is very prominent in this city. Yes, we're about ready to add up, Harrington. Yeah. Has Dr. Colgan finished? Uh, yes, just about, Chief. He fixes the time of death as between 9 and 11 last night. That's mm-hmm. right. Shot once at about two feet away. Uh, what about the doors and windows? Did Brophy check? Just finished, Chief. Every one of them closed and locked from the inside. How about inventory, Miss Miller? Well, I've been trying to get somewhere on that. Her nearest relative is a sister, but she lives in Chicago. Yes, well, perhaps one of the neighbors can estimate what's missing for us. You know, Chief, there's one thing I don't like about this. Yes, what's that? Well, when the grocery kid discovered something was wrong this morning and called the patrolman... Yes? It looked like a nice, neat case of robbery. And? I mean, everything's just like we've seen it many times before. The house all ransacked and the dame dead. Yes, yes, that's the impression, at least. She probably resisted, and the burglar got panicky and shot. Except for one thing. Uh, What's that? Well, just look around, Miss Miller. There's her purse with ten bucks still in it. 
There's a gold lighter on the table. Upstairs, there's a hunk of jewelry on her dresser. Yes, yes, I saw that, too. Say, uh, take a look at that purse, Miss Miller. All right. This was a burglary. The guy sure passed up a lot of nice items. Oh, it is strange. Still, if he were frightened after he shot, he might have run out. Say, yeah. Chief. Yes? Here's something odd. In her purse? Yes. Mm. Mrs. Post belonged to the Devotion Club Limited. Mm. Whatever that is. Uh, here's her membership card. The Devotion Club? Uh-huh. Are you kidding? Why? Do you know anything about it, Harrington? Well, sure I do. Well, maybe not that particular outfit, but I've heard that name. Mm-hmm. It's one of those agencies that helps people meet other people. Really? Yeah, most of them are on the up and up, but sometimes they're not. Yes, it's strange that a woman like Mrs. Post should belong to one. Uh, put the card in your pocket, Harrington. Right. We may have to check that club. Mm, I can drop around and ask a few questions. Yes, do that. Uh, no need to arouse suspicion, however. Uh, uh, put a little gray on your temples and you can drop around as a prospective member. It's a cinch, Chief. Well, let's hope the whole case is a cinch. Now, if you'll call Dr. Colgan, Miss Miller, we'll get to work. I hope I've made everything clear, Mr... Harrison, was it? Yeah, that's right, Mr. St. Charles. You see, we don't take just anyone into our membership here. Only those we know to be sincere. Oh, I'm, I'm sincere, all right. I, I've been wanting to meet people for a long time. I see. You dance, do you? <laughs> just a little. Ah, back home, I never had much time for it. And that was where, did you say? Oh, I had a cattle ranch out west. Did you indeed? Yeah, I had 7,000 head at one time. And when I made my pile, well, I just quit. Well, that was sensible, Mr. Harrison. We all work too hard in this life. Wear ourselves out. <laughs> you can say that again. <laughs> From now on, Mr. St. Charles, I'm just going to spend my money and enjoy myself. I don't blame you. <laughs> yeah, well, could I uh, get into your little club here, do you think? Well, ordinarily, Mr. Harrison, I interview a candidate a number of times before we accept it. Oh, yes, yeah, sure. Then, as I explained, we make every effort to see that you meet people of your own age and interests. Suits me. And you know, sir, you suit us. I do. You do. We'll dispense with the interviews, Mr. Harrison. You can meet the members tonight. <laughs> everything the neighbors mentioned, Chief. Mm -hmm. Do you know not one thing's been taken from this house? Well, it's difficult to understand, Miss Miller. Unless, of course, Mrs. Post kept a great deal of money someplace here on the premises. Yes. The neighbors would hardly know if it were missing or not. Well, her sister might. I've got Dorothy back at the office trying to get through to her in Chicago. Yes, that'll help. And perhaps Harrington will have some luck, too. Is he still out? I guess so. He hasn't called back. Mm -hmm. He was going over to that club to see what he could find. Uh, yes, it's the mailman, I think. Uh, do you want me to see? Yes, will you? Okay. Oh, thank you. I was right, Chief. Here's a magazine and one letter. Oh? Uh -huh. It's a uh, postmark, uh, let's see, Chicago. Hmm. It's a woman's handwriting, too, Chief, probably from her sister. Here, may I look at it? Of course. Hmm. Well, I think I'll open it, Miss Miller. Under the circumstances, I can take the responsibility. Oh, sure, Chief. Anything to help. Mm. I'll keep going on this inventory. Right. Mm. Well, I'll be... Say, Miss Miller. Yes? Uh, this letter is remarkable. It may be just what we need. Well, Chief, the guy's a phony from a way back. I could smell it all over him. Uh, this Mr. St. Charles, you mean? Yeah, yeah, Miss Miller. Slick as a whistle. Even if he's got nothing to do with Mrs. Post, we better break up that joint of his on general principles. Yes, we had more reason than that to break it up, Harrington. Yeah? Miss Miller and I had quite a day, too. Oh, yeah, anything look good? Oh, yes, plenty. Uh, you're attending this dance at the club tonight, you said? That's right. Starts at nine. Well, all right, you be there, then. And if you can, get St. Charles into his office. And here's what we're going to do. I'm sorry, I'm busy. Nick, I thought I told you to stay away from here. Can an old pal drop in to say goodbye, Harry? I don't want anything to do with you. You know, you con boys operate funny. We don't get mixed up in a murder. Oh, 
You heard about that, huh? I read the papers. It's funny. I was even thinking of giving you part of the stash. You know, just for old time's sake. You mean you got the money? All of it? I'm leaving, ain't I? What's the answer to that? But the paper said nothing was taken. You read too much, Harry. Just like back in the cell block. I had no idea. Why, sit down, Nick. No need to rush. <laughs> oh, you kill me, you know. Now you're interested all of a sudden. No, no, I'm not, Nick. I give you my word. No kidding. Look, I took in a new member today. He's loaded, Nick. Big cattle man from out west. Huh? Take him, why don't you? I intend to. Only you can help me, my boy. Think of it. We'll take him together. You'll take the old dame's dough, you mean? No, thanks, Harry. I'm shoving off. Hey, do you mind if I come in, Mr. St. Charles? What? Oh, I'm sorry, Mr. Harrison. I'm busy just now. If you'll... Mr. Harrison... Uh, this won't take long. Come right in, Laura. I told you I'm very Thank busy. You. Good Lord. Hello, Harry. Love For the love of... Oh, what's the matter? You fellas look like you've seen a ghost. I think they're surprised to see me. They don't say... Well, Hey, I, I gotta get out of here. No, no, no. Stick around, Sonny. You interest me. You know, I could swear I've seen your face before. Like on the St. Louis police posters. Hey, well, well, what's going on here? Don't you remember? You came to my house last night. No. No, I didn't. Laura, I, I can't believe it. The paper said you, you were dead. Perhaps. Do you think so, Nick? Look at me. No. Don't come near me. Please, don't. Nick, listen to me. She's dead, I tell you. Really, Nick? Look again, closer. No, I tell you, no. Harry, don't let her come near me. Mr. Harrison, please, please take her out of here. Do you remember now, Nick, last night? You, you're dead, I tell you. I was there. I, I saw you die. That's what I'm waiting to hear, pal. All right, back up, both of you. This is a very touchy gun. Mr. Harrison. The name is Harrington, pal. Just stand still. Okay, Chief. Better stand back, oh, ma'am. Thank you, Mr. Harrington. I do feel a little faint. All set in here, Harrington? Perfect, Chief. Nick just spilled the whole story. Nick? Yeah, and a little added touch, Chief. This is our St. Louis boy. Oh. Looks kind of pale right now. Oh, Chief, the members are all waiting downstairs. Yes, we'll go down and explain things to them in just a moment, Miller. Right. Are you all right, Mrs. Rogers? Yes, thank Mrs. you. Mrs. Rogers? What, what do you mean? Hey, look, uh, I don't get it. We were very fortunate, gentlemen. I think you knew Mrs. Post had a sister in Chicago. Sure, she said... Well, she... this is Mrs. Post's sister. What you didn't know, however, is that she happens to be a twin. An identical twin. Mr. District Attorney comes to you through the worldwide facilities of the United States Armed Forces Radio Service.
Sal Hepetica and Vitalis present Mr. District Attorney, Champion of the People, Defender of Truth, Guardian of our fundamental rights to life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. And it shall be my duty as District Attorney not only to prosecute to the limit of the law all persons accused of crimes perpetrated within this county, but to defend with equal vigor the rights and privileges of all its citizens. Mr. District Attorney is brought to you in the public interest as part of the constant fight for a better America by Bristol Myers, the makers of Sal Hepatica for the smile of health and Vitalis for well-groomed hair. Sal Hepatica, Vitalis. And tonight, the case of the money machine. Who is it? Let me in, Joyce. I've got him with me. Is... Is he all right? He won't... He won't get violent or anything. Well, of course he's all right. Uh, sit down, Frank. Take off your coat. Can he understand, Emil? Take off your coat. You hear me, Frank? I understand. I was worried sick. I still am. Worried? Now you just sit there, Frank. You don't have to talk. Oh, did it go all right? Yeah, yeah, there was nothing to it. I slipped in the back door of the asylum, got him out of his room, and here we are. Didn't take an hour. You sure they won't miss him before morning? Oh, look, Joyce, I told you I used to work in the joint three years ago. I took care of cases like him. Oh, I know, but won't he's, they He's just like to... a lump of, of putty or something. You set him down and he stays there. <laughs> He doesn't look crazy, I'll say that for him. No, he, he lives in a state, something like that. They got a lot of them like him. Always seem to be, seem to be thinking about something a million miles away. Frank? Frank, now leave him alone. He's all right. Give him a pan of water after a while. We'll keep him in the back room until we hook up with the carny. A pan of water? Like a dog? I don't want him cutting himself on any glass, kid. He's a little money machine. I still wonder if it'll work. No carnival wants a guy working who ought to be in a hatchery. Well, who's going to know? He'd be a sensation, I tell you. We used to turn him on all the time when I worked the hospital. Turn him on? Yeah, sure. The, the doc explained it one day. He, he's got a mind for figures, see? That's why I thought we'd build the act as a lightning calculator. You like it? Ask him something, Amy. You know, just like you were a square in the crowd. Oh, sure. Well, he likes it. Uh, all right, Frankie. Uh, here's one for you. You ready? <laughs> Look at the way his eyes light up. Go on, ask him. Ask oh, yeah, sure. Uh, multiply, Frank. Three, six, nine, two, one, eight. Got that? Three, six, nine, two, one, eight. Times four, oh, three. Got it? Times four, oh, three. All right, boy. What's the answer? The answer is 148,794,854. Oh, Mr. Gresham is here, Chief. Oh. Well, go right in, please, sir. Well, thank you, Miss Miller. Oh, Mr. Gresham, sit down. Sit down. Now, this is Mr. Harrington. Hi, ah, Mr. Gresham. Mr. Harrington. Oh, do you want me, Chief? Uh, yes, stay if you will, please, Miss Miller. Right. Uh, you're with the State Hospital, Mr. Gresham. That's right. Mm -hmm. I know you're familiar with the institution. Yeah, right? that's for the chronic insane, isn't it? We have the heavier load of the state's incurables, yes, Mr. Harrington. Mm -hmm. I've been in charge of protection out there for the last year. Oh, yes, yes, we know. I know you're busy, so I'll make this brief. When the attendants checked roll this morning, we found one of the patients missing. Uh-oh. Yes, go on, Mr. Gresham. Well, naturally, finding him again is part of my job. However, I wanted you to have a full report, too. Yes, yes, we'd like to have. Uh, take this down, will you, Miss Miller? Right, Chief. A man or a woman, Mr. Gresham? A man. His name is Kent. Frank Kent. Mm -hmm. I'm not a doctor, Mr. D.A., but I, I do know his history. Yeah, which is what? Well, without using technical terms, Kent is... Uh, well, uh, off in another world is one way to describe him. Mm -hmm. 
withdrawn. He's seldom violent. In fact, you're seldom aware of him at all. Yes, well, could he become violent, Mr. Gresham? My answer would be yes. Most of them could, if the right things happened. Yes. However, you can get more exact dope from the doctors. Mm. You got a description of him? Oh, I know Frank quite well. <laughs> he has a unique ability, actually... Something I've never run up against before. A unique ability, did you say, Mr. Gresham? That's right. He has a head for figures, mathematics. Hmm? He's amazing, Mr. Harrington. He can add, subtract, multiply all in his head. And all in a matter of seconds. No matter how complicated the numbers? Well, I've never seen him stumped yet. Yes, there are cases on record like that. Some of them phenomenal. Yeah, how did he uh, escape, Mr. Gresham? Sometime last night, his door was open from the outside. Uh, maybe some other patient. No, Mr. Harrington, that's literally impossible. There are too many doors to get through. And you have no idea where he might be now? I know Frank's habits, Mr. D.A. I think perhaps I can trace him. Uh, where I need your help, though, yes. we want to know who opened that door. The answer is 228,864. Thank you, lightning calculator. All right, folks, the show on the inside will begin immediately. Don't miss this amazing demonstration. There's plenty of room on the inside. Follow the metal master into the tent. Thank you, friends. The show is about to begin. Come on, let's go, Harry. who's taking tickets? Oh, where do I get this flap shut? Gee, the tent's filling up. I told you he'd be a sensation, didn't I? Now we can make real plans. Where is he? Oh, he's all right. He's just changing into his costume. He's been doing it all week. Well, get him out and on the platform. We turn this crowd over fast, we can talk plans before dinner. What do you mean, plans? Well, you think I'm going to waste my time on a carny lot all spring? But you just said... They would play class dates, Joyce. Maybe even a first-rate nightclub. What? Metal acts are big, you know that. I might even teach him some routines. Come on, help me get him going. Well, I still say we ought to stay right... Well, what? Who are you? My name is Gresham. I'm just sitting here in the trailer talking to Frank. Yeah? Well, uh, look, buddy, we don't allow nobody to... Wait a minute. How'd you know his name? Frank, who is this man? I'll handle this, Joyce. Mr. Gresham is my friend. Be quiet, Frank. All right, let's have it. I'm from State Hospital. I've come to take Frank home. In the morning when you awaken with a dull, headachey feeling because you need a laxative, you want relief, fast relief. And you get fast relief when you take gentle, speedy Sal Hepatica. Sal Hepatica, taken before breakfast, brings gentle, speedy relief Usually within an hour. But if it's not until much later in the day that you feel miserable and logy because you need a laxative, well then, too, you want fast relief. And for fast relief, take sparkling sal hepatica one half hour before dinner. Get gentle, speedy relief before bedtime. Yes, for really fast relief, anytime, morning or evening, take sal hepatica and avoid laxative lag. That feeling of discomfort that continues for hours until the ordinary slow-acting laxative brings relief. What's more, because sal hepatica is antacid, it will also sweeten a sour stomach. Anytime you need a laxative, take sal hepatica and get gentle, speedy relief. Morning or night, get feeling right 
with gentle, speedy Sal Hepatica. We'll just use this desk here in the hospital boardroom, Harrington. Uh, did you bring that diagram, Miss Miller? Yes, sir. Right here, Chief. I marked the location of Frank Kent's room uh, right mm, there. Yeah, here we are. Here's the corner right here. Mm-hmm. Now, if you ask me, he went out through here and right in this door here. Yes, and directly to the kitchen. Mm. Yes, from here, it would be easy to get out into the yard. Sure, if you have help. Yes. Yes, I want to go over that with Gresham. Uh, what did his office say, Harrington? Well, I told the guard that we're over here in this wing, Chief. Mm-hmm. He said he'd tell Gresham as soon as he comes in. But he's not here now? No, and he hasn't been since last night. Well, it's my fault, actually. I should have made sure he kept in touch with us. Ah, uh, he'll be back, Chief. In the meantime, we can try to figure out what happened. Yes. Well, it narrows down to this. Kent's been gone over a week. He's ten days now. Mm-hmm. Gresham can't find a trace of him. And there's nothing turned up at missing persons, either. I checked again just before we left to come out here. Mm. Well, all right, let's assume this. If a fellow patient couldn't have released Kent... And that holds because they were all locked up, too. Yes, exactly. And the next guess is an employee. Chief, you mean one of the nurses or doctors? No, no, not necessarily. It might have been a guard. At least someone who knows these passageways very well. Yeah, and knows where Frank's room was. Yes, that's right. And finally, someone who wanted him out. Well, it couldn't have been a relative. His record doesn't list any. Well, nevertheless, somebody helped him, Miss Miller. Our job is to find out who and why. Don't worry about Frank Gresham. Joyce will bring him right back here to the trailer. As soon as the show is over? I promised you, didn't I? You don't want that audience to riot, do you? Well, all right. Can't be much longer. Well, it sure was a surprise to me, I'll tell you that. Do you care for a drink? No, no, thanks. Uh, what was a surprise? Finding out Frank was in a nut house. I hope you know I wouldn't have had anything to do with him if I'd known. You'll still have to answer some questions. As I explained, there's some doubt about how Frank got out. And you got me. He turned up here in the carney, and I hired him. That's all I know. Mm-hmm. You've always been with the carnival? Yeah, for years. What makes you ask that? When I was standing in the crowd outside, I asked some of the other performers about you. None of them seemed to know much. Oh? You ask at the front office? Not yet. I imagine the district attorney will see to that. The DA? I told you his disappearance could have become very serious. Oh, sure. Tell me, how did the, uh, how did the DA find him here? He didn't. I didn't. Oh. Then he don't know you found him yet. Not yet. My job is to see that he gets back. Sure. Well, you can count on me, Gresham. Like I said, he turned up and I hired him. That's about all I know. He looks thinner than when he was at the hospital. Have you been well? You got me. He seemed to want to be alone, so I didn't bother him much. I see. They're taking a long time. The crowds are crazy about him. He'll quit in a minute. Joyce handles the questions for him. <laughs> Amazing. I, I, I had a hunch I'd find him in a place like this. That's why I looked in that magazine. Billboard? <laughs> yeah, you tell me. Hey, you know, it's hard for me to believe. What is? Oh, that he could, well, have a couple of screws missing. He's such a simple guy. His mind isn't. He's sure nuts about figures. You uh, sure you won't have a drink? No, not now. Just cheap whiskey. I don't usually go for drinking myself. Take a bottle like this. Simple-minded jerk. How do you like it now, huh? Come on, you lousing up the chair. Come on, Frank. we got to take him. Ow! Hey, don't just stand there. Help me do something with him. That's my friend. You keep out of this, Frank. Joyce, lock the door. What did you do to him? I hit him with the bottle. Now, will you lock the door? Mr. Gresham is my friend. I think if I'm Shut hungry, up. You'll... I don't want to hear another word out of you. Joyce! I'm locking it. All right, all right. Now put Frank in his closet. What? You heard me. Put him in and lock it. Go on. Not now. I want to stay with my friend. Go with Joyce, Frank. Go on. 
Come on, Frank. In here. Please? Hey, Mo, I can't Frank, please. Frank, get in there. You want a belt in the teeth? No. In here, Frank. And don't make any noise. Any more orders, mastermind? Now, don't get smart. Smart? When you just hit him over the head? You think I'm going to let him take Frank back after all my work? He'll only find you again, Amo. I told you this was no good. Oh, look, this creep was on his own. All I got to do is change my name. And Frank's too. What happens when he comes to? You going to keep hitting him the rest of his life? I don't have to. Why not? Do you think he'll ever come a... What do you mean? The rest of his life is over, kid. He's dead. I'm sorry, Harrington. I... I was so shocked when you told me it was Roy Gresham, I... I didn't get all the facts. You know how you feel, Chief? I couldn't believe it either. Uh, Harrington, you said he died from a blow on the head? Yeah, yeah. Doc Hogan's got him downstairs in the morgue now. Mm-hmm. Where was his body discovered? In a boxcar. What? Yeah, in a boxcar on the railroad side, Miss Miller. Switch out about ten miles out of town. His death occurred there? No, I doubt it, Chief. There weren't any signs of fight or anything. It's, it's more like somebody killed him and then threw him in the empty car. Yes, well, we'll know more when Dr. Colgan's through. Uh, how about his effects? Everything was on him. Keys, identification, billfold. Uh, how much money? About $40. Stuff's all coming up in an envelope. Jewelry? Yeah, watch, ring, the usual. I see. Well, robbery is pretty well ruled out, then. I think so. Yes. Get the state hospital on the phone, William Smith. Oh, sure, right away, Chief. I asked Gresham if Frank Kemp could turn violent. And he said if the right things happened. Yes. I wonder if they did. She even got him into his tuxedo yet? He goes on in another hour. Hey, Mo, I'm scared. You what? All right, shut the door. The door. Never mind, Frank. I wasn't talking to you. I said shut the door. Yes, sir. Now, there's nothing to be scared about, Joyce. You saw the papers this morning. They barely mentioned that bum from the hospital. I mean here. This isn't a carny anymore, Amo. This is a nightclub. Hey, you're telling me. Forty bucks a night. The police will be looking for Frank. Don't you see that? More than ever now. So what? So what? When they find Frank, they'll know about that... that man. Ah, you think I'm a dope? You think they ain't got that squared away? Joyce, shut up. Look, kid, who was looking for Frank? Gresham, wasn't it? Mr. Gresham. Shut up or I'll throw you in the closet. What if they do find him? But who... Who will they they... think killed him? Me? Or a nut who escaped you mean you're going to tell them Frank killed him? Mr. Gresham... I'm telling nobody nothing. Chances are it'll be a long time before they find us. But if they do, what then? They'll assume Frank conked them. It's natural. Mr. Gresham is dead. We know that, Frank. You're my money machine, kid. And I'm keeping you turned on full. <laughs> Listen now to some good grooming advice. Every Jane and Judy and Alice goes for guys who use Vitalis. They have handsome, healthy-looking hair when they give it live action care. So be one of those well-groomed guys. Well-groomed and Vitalis-wise for live action care of your scalp and your hair. Get Vitalis. Do more than just keep your hair well-groomed. Keep it neater in a natural, healthy-looking way with live-action Vitalis Care. Vitalis and the 60-second workout wakes up your scalp. You actually feel the tingling difference, and she'll see the difference in your hair. Yes, be one of those well-groomed guys. Well-groomed and Vitalis-wise. For live-action care of your scalp and your hair. Get Vitalis. Yes, get Vitalis. Well, 
when the doctor out of the hospital calls, let me know, Miss Miller. All right, I will, Chief. I've asked for a full report on Kent's condition. Uh Uh-huh. At least if we understand his illness, we'll know what to expect. And where to find him. Yes, I'll get that. Oh, all right. Maybe the doctor. Yes. Chief? Harrington. I got news. Where are you? About two miles from that railroad site. Oh, where Gresham's body was found? That's right. I found a carnival playing a field out there. A carnival? Yeah, yeah, Chief. This falls right into our lap. Remember that half a ticket stub we found on Gresham? Yes, yes. Did you trace it? Yeah, sure, through the printer. Gresham got it when he paid admission to this carnival last night. A carnival? Of course, of course. Well, be sure, you can just about guess the rest. Yeah. Frank Kent was in the sideshow here until this morning. Yes, who with? Oh, a guy named Emil Hudson. Oh, and a dame. Emil Hudson? Yes, yes, it means plenty, Harrington. His name is on the personnel records of the hospital. Huh? Yes, he used to work there. Oh, brother, this is really narrowing down. Well, all right, let's finish it then. Uh, can you get a lead on where they are now? Uh, well, well, see, we're, we're stymied there. Yes? Looks to me like the three of them pulled out for good. <laughs> Joyce. Sit still, Frank. Now fix your car. Mr. Gresham. Don't keep mentioning him, Frank. He's my friend. Yeah, yeah, I know. Mother, I want to introduce my friend. What? He wants me to walk to school with him, Mother. May I? What are you talking about? If I walk with my friend, they can't laugh at me. Not if I'm with him. Sure. <laughs> sure. Now, hold still. You go on in half an hour. Don't laugh at my friend, Mother. Please don't. There. Now you look okay. Mother? Look. Now snap out of it, will you? You're laughing, Mother. Don't. What? Stop, I said. Frank, let go of me. Frank, Stop no. Stop it. Stop Frank, it. Frank, help. 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 Don't laugh. Get him all excited for. Are you nuts? Relax, I said. Relax. Don't hurt me, Mother. Don't. Wait a minute. Slam the door, Joyce. You want the manager to come in here? You stay where you are. Now listen to me, Frank. We go on in a minute. And you're going to do a show. Mother. Now think, Frank. Think? Numbers. Nothing but numbers. Eight times eight. I... uh, Tell me. Eight times eight. Tell me. The answer is 64. All right. Eight, nine, six, five times four, six, nine... Yes, thank you. Yes, that's right. Yes, I have that. Yes. That's right. Yes, thank you. No, that's all we need. Right? Chief, nothing so far. Me neither. That's all right. We're finished. Finished? Yes, almost finished, Harrington. Get your things, Miss Miller. You too, Harrington. You got what we want, Chief? Oh, I'm sure of it. Now let's go. Quite a change for me, Harrington. I don't get to nightclubs very often. No, me neither, Chief. Not even on a visit like this. Chief, he's coming out on the floor. Oh, yes, I see. All right, Harrington. You better take your station over by the wall. Right. See you in a minute. Does someone over there have a problem? This gentleman has a problem. May I have the numbers, please? Are you ready, calculator? Ready? Six, seven, nine, six. Repeat that, please. Six, seven, nine, six. Multiplied by seven, eight, nine. Times seven, eight, nine. The answer, please. The answer is five million three hundred and sixty-two thousand and forty-four. Oh. 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 I thank you. May we have another question, please? You, sir? 
Yes, yes, I have a question. Go right ahead, sir. The human calculator never fails. Uh, may we have it quiet, please? No. Go ahead, sir. My question is, who killed Roy Gresham? What's the question? Wait a minute. Who killed him, Frank? Tell me quickly. They put sister on right behind him. Frank? Amo killed him. Amo hit him. Shut up. All right, boy. Just stand where you are. All right, just stay at your tables, ladies and gentlemen. This is all part of the show. Uh, Brophy's at the door, Miss Miller. See that he takes charge of Frank. He's all right, Chief. He isn't moving Um, out of his chair. Let go of me, you clown. What are you trying to do? Amo, Mason, stop. All right, take them out the side, Harrington. Come on, both of you. This show is over. Well, there's one good thing, Chief. Yes. Frank is back in the hospital. He certainly is, and under good care once again, Miss Miller. Yeah, so are Joyce and Emil. Under our care. Real special. Yes. Joyce didn't stand up very well under questioning, did she, Harrington? No, I'll say she didn't. She even handed us the bottle Emil used to kill Gresham. Complete with fingerprints. Well, Chief, actually, you didn't need Frank's statement at all, did you? No, Miss Miller, but it helped to unnerve both. Joyce and Emil. That, and it gave them no chance to get together on their stories. And that's why she broke down so readily. Oh, it was a cinch. After that ticket stub led us to the carney, all we had to do was phone nightclubs until we found one that had just booked a mental act. Yes, Emil boasted that he'd put Frank into a nightclub, Harrington, and some of the carnival people were only too glad to give us that suggestion. Yes, some suggestion. We find them waiting for us. Well... Frank sure got a mind, all right. I'm glad he's got a good care now and in a place where he belongs. Ladies and gentlemen, we are happy tonight to join the San Francisco Junior Chamber of Commerce and station KNBC in naming our first honorary Mr. District Attorney. He is 15-year-old Alvin Julian of Sequoia High School in Redwood City, California. Alvin, at great personal risk, lowered himself into a narrow drain pipe to rescue a 13-month-old baby that had fallen 10 feet into the pit. Our first honorary Mr. District Attorney, Alvin Julian. Information on how you can become an honorary Mr. District Attorney can be supplied by the station... To which you are listening. You know, ladies and gentlemen, in each of us somewhere there exists fear. A clever criminal realizes this, and often he can twist that fear into tragedy. We encounter such a man in next week's highly dramatic case of Scared to Death, and I urge you to join us for it. Until then, thank you. And good night. The next time you have a headache, take bufferin because bufferin acts twice as fast as aspirin. Here's why. You see, no tablet, no powder can relieve pain until the pain-relieving ingredient enters your bloodstream. Bufferin, with its exclusive formula, gets into your bloodstream twice as fast as aspirin. That's why it acts twice as fast as aspirin to relieve pain. So for fast pain relief from headache, neuritis, neuralgia, get Bufferin at drug counters everywhere. B-U-F-F-E-R-I-N. Bufferin. The names of all characters in the ninth dramatization are fictitious and any resemblance to names of living persons or actual places is purely coincidental. Our stars were Jay Justin in the title role, Len Doyle as Harrington, and Vicki Vola as Miss Miller, with music by Charles Paul. The program was produced and directed by Edward A. Byron and written by Robert J. Shaw. Mr. District Attorney was originated by Phillips H. Lord. And remember, Sal Hepatica for the smile of health, Vitalis for well-groomed hair. Sal Hepatica, Vitalis. Fred Utell speaking for Bristol Myers, who invites you to tune in again next week for Mr. District Attorney.
Mr. District Attorney, starring David Bryan. Mr. District Attorney, champion of the people, defender of truth, guardian of our fundamental rights to life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. And it shall be my duty as district attorney not only to prosecute to the limit of the law all persons accused of crimes perpetrated within this county, but to defend with equal vigor the rights and privileges of all its citizens. This is David Bryan. In a moment, we'll bring you another case from the files of Mr. District Attorney. But first, a word from our sponsor. And now, here is our star, David Bryan, as Paul Garrett, Mr. District Attorney. One of our biggest problems is the crook who preys on charitable activities, particularly those of local organizations. These groups are often singled out as easy pickings by confidence men, mainly because people connected with the groups are not worried about personal security and are therefore less cautious in their dealings with outsiders. The prevention and prosecution of crime is a difficult job at best and all too often complicated by the carelessness of honest citizens. Citizens whose lack of vigilance invites lawlessness and violence, as in the case we're about to hear. Haven't you got that money ready yet? I'm doing it as fast as I can. Here, here, never mind the silver. Here, let me do it. Oh, don't get so excited, Ralph. Marty's going to get her any second. I want this stuff ready for him. Mr. Bentley, I chased you all the way across the lawn. I just heard that we've taken in more than $3,000. Something like that, Mrs. Pruitt. But if you don't mind, I'm pretty busy at the moment. Well, I just came in to compliment you on your management of the most successful lawn party we've had in years. But of course, if I'm in the way... I'll be happy to talk to you later, Mrs. Pruitt. Well, I must say... That old battle axe, why don't you lock that door? Make it look too suspicious. But if that old cow is going to keep coming in here every other minute... Get the money in the bag. Here comes Marty. All set, Ralph. All set. Where's the car? Back of the building, like you said. Engine running. Here's the money, Marty. We'll meet you at the motel. Uh-oh. Bentley, what's going on here? Who is this man? What's he doing with our money? I told you she caused trouble. That money is supposed to be turned over to me. Why, I believe you were going to steal it. Ah! Oh, but you have a gun. Yes, I have a gun. You meddling old fool. No. Oh, no, you can't. Oh. Are you crazy, Bentley? What'd you do that for? Shut up and get out of here with that money. This door. Hiya, Chief. Miss Miller gave me a message. This is the Welfare League charity affair, isn't it? That's right. Raising money for crippled kids. Miss Miller said it was a woman who was killed. That's right. A Mrs. Donald Pruitt, president of the Welfare League. Bentley says the bandit did it as he ran past him. Well, who's Bentley? He's the promoter of this thing. He and his wife are counting the take when this hood moved in on him. All right, folks, one side, please. Let us through, huh? Thank you. The medical examiner just left. You want to take a look at it, Chief? Uh, I suppose I'd better. Not very pretty, is it? Never is. You know, Chief, lots of people kid these old dames who run around helping the community. But when they can raise 3000 bucks for a bunch of crippled kids, well, I figure they're doing a lot of good. Yes, I'd say so. Put the cover back, Harrington. Well, what was she doing here? Taking care of the money? No. Now the Bentleys were taking care of that. I guess it's part of their job. Do you know if Mrs. Pruitt was already here when the bandit showed up? No. She walked in on him while he was holding up the Bentleys. I guess he just turned around and pumped bullets into her. Too bad. Sounds like a lone gunman deal, doesn't it? Yeah. Of course, he might have had a guy waiting outside, Chief, in a getaway car. 
Yes, we'd better figure that as a possibility. You say they got all the money that was taken in? All but a few hundred dollars in silver. And I imagine the cripple kids could have used it. Well, maybe we'll be able to get it back for them. Any description of the killer? Well, there was a couple of girls claim they saw a tall, blonde guy running out the back. But the Bentleys don't agree with that. I'd like to talk to the Bentleys. They're out here in front. I'll go get them. Oh, Mr. and Mrs. Bentley, would you come in, please? This is Mr. Garrett, folks, the district attorney. How do you do, sir? How do you Hello. do? Were you both here together when the bandit appeared? Yes, we were. We were counting the money and talking to Mrs. Pruitt. When she saw the man had a gun, she tried to run out past him, and he shot her. She tried to run through the front door? Yes. And which way did the bandit come in? Well, he came in the front door, didn't he, Ralph? That's right. In this description we have of him, tall blonde, do you agree with that? Oh, we certainly don't. He was short and thin and dark. And he wore colored glasses. I see. You got that, Harrington? Right. Uh, Mr. Garrett, will you need us for any more questioning? That body bothers me. I think that takes care of it for now, Mrs. Bentley. I might want to talk to you later. Of course. Please, Ralph. Well, we know exactly what to look for, don't we? Oh, sure. A tall blonde who's short and dark and wears colored glasses. Oh, ought to be a cinch. I noticed several people in the crowd had motion picture cameras. Talk to them, Harrington. See if you can get the use of their film for a viewing. Okay, Chief. District Attorney's Office. Hello, Miss Miller. I'm at the Welfare League playground. There's been a holdup and a murder here. Woman victim. Some bystanders were taking motion pictures, and we figured one of the cameras might have caught an accidental shot of the killer. How about our 16-millimeter projector? Is it back from the shop yet? It came back yesterday. Good. I'll need it for this afternoon. What time this afternoon, Mr. Garrett? As soon as we get the films developed. Take care of it for me, will you? I'll check back with you later. You sure this is the right motel? Of course I'm sure. You coming in? Yes, I'm coming in. Come on in. Took you long enough to get here. I figured something had gone wrong. We couldn't run away, you know. We had to stay and answer questions. After that killing, you're lucky they let you go. Why shouldn't they let us go? They have no record on us. I never kill people. You were crazy to do that. What do I have to do for you? Draw pictures? That woman knew made in me. She knew what we were doing. I had to kill her. There's a lot of difference between picking up fast dough and committing murder. I just bluff with a gun. I told you that. Who cares what you do? The cops keep after you more when you kill somebody. Stop yammering about it. Where's the money? Here. A little over 2700 I counted it. Not bad. That's not good either. Not when you have to leave a corpse behind to get it. Maybe I misjudged you, Marty. Maybe you're not the one to work with us after all. Who says so? We can get someone else, you know. And if we were to describe you to the police... What's that supposed to be? A threat? It's not supposed to be. It is. <laughs> I didn't say anything about quitting, did I? Then stop the whining. It irritates me. All right, all right. Let's split the dough. That can wait till we take care of the next job. Yeah? And when is this going to be? Three days from now. Then you'll get your money. And you'd better move out of here right away. Find another place and let me know. Come on, Mater. This is the last real film, Chief. If they don't recognize the crook from this one, we've wasted our time. We'll see. Oh, wait a minute. There he is. That was it. Hold it, Harrington. I'll rewind. Just tell me when to stop. Uh, uh, right there. That's the man. Are you sure, miss? Oh, I'm positive. Was he in this spot when you saw him? Well, no. I was going back to our car with a couple of prizes... I heard the shots, and then I saw this man running. He got into a car and drove away. What kind of car? 
Well, some kind of a sedan. I guess I can't say for sure. Did you notice the license? Oh, gosh, no. I didn't even think of that. Well, you've been a big help to us anyway. Better rewind the film, Harrington. Then get a negative off that likeness. I want photos made up right away. Okay, Chief. Has Marty moved away? No, he hasn't. He's out somewhere, that's all. Get going. How do you know he hasn't moved? His clothes are still there. The stupid jerk. I don't want these small-time crooks get caught. They're too moronic to take simple precautions. The trouble is, if he gets caught, we might get picked up, too. Now, don't start sniveling about that again. We're not going to be picked up. Well, what are you going to do about it? I'll come back in the morning. I'll get him into another place if I have to drag him out of here by the hair. Good morning, Miss Miller. Oh, good morning, Mr. Garrett. Harrington here yet? He's in your office. He has a report on your blonde hold-up man. Good. Hi, Chief. Morning, Harrington. Seen the paper? Yes, I looked at it. Quite a spread on the killing. It's the kind of thing that hits home. Makes people realize that this kind of violence could happen to anyone. Miss Miller says you have a report on the picture we took from the film. Yeah. Suspect turns out to be one John Martin Mallory, alias Marty Manning. Five arrests, one conviction. Not exactly the type you'd call an innocent bystander. The department's got the dragnet out. But Cardway thinks the guy might have left town. Does this Mallory usually work alone? No. Report says he likes to work with partners. And he's never been a brain. Always did jobs planned by somebody else. Well, that doesn't add up in this case. What else does it say? Mm, here. Here. Take a look at it. Age 35, paroled August 8th, 1950. Mallory's M.O. features an unloaded gun in all operations. Submits quietly to arrest. That don't sound like our killer, does it? Well, not unless he's had a complete change of personality. There's something peculiar about this situation, Harrington. Yes, Miss Miller? This is for Harrington, Mr. Garrett. A message from Lieutenant Driscoll. Oh, oh, yeah. It was Driscoll who got me the report on this guy, Mallory, Chief. Well, what do you want, Miss Miller? It was Sergeant Raiden who called. He said to tell you Lieutenant Driscoll had a lead on where Marty Mallory's been staying. He's going out there and pick him up. Driscoll is? That's right. Miss Miller, call Driscoll back right away. If he's already left, ask them to contact him in his car. Yes, sir. Something wrong? Seems to me that Driscoll works alone most of the time. That's right, but I could... Go ahead, Miss Miller. Lieutenant Driscoll left homicide about 30 minutes ago, Mr. Garrett. And he must be out of his car right now because they can't seem to contact him. Do they know where he went? Golden View Motel on Channel Road. You ain't worried about trouble, are you? Not with the M.O. we got on this guy, Mallory. That's the way Driscoll's going to think. He'll be expecting an easy arrest. Come on, Harrington, let's go. Driscoll could be walking into plain murder. This is David Bryan. Before we continue with Mr. District Attorney and the case of the charity killer, here's an important message I'd like you to hear. And now, back to David Bryan, starring as Paul Garrett, Mr. District Attorney. A charity affair had been held up. Money raised for crippled children had been stolen. And a woman had been murdered in the process of the crime. This was a case of decent people lending support to a worthy cause, suddenly finding themselves at the mercy of a crook with a gun. A criminal who killed as violently as a mad dog. By means of motion picture film exposed by people in the crowd, we had been able to establish the identity of the person who had taken the money. But because of information listed in the police report on this man, I felt sure the actual killer was still unknown. And you'll see that this was our greatest problem. Oh, that's you. Come on in. I thought you were going to get moved out of here. I am, I am. 
You know what I ought to do to you? Oh, now, don't try getting rough with me, Bentley. It'll get you nothing but trouble. Marty, you need a lesson. And here it is. Oh! Make it easier, will you? A guy can make a mistake, can he? I don't like mistakes, Marty. Of any kind. On your feet. Come on. I was going to move tonight. You'll move this morning. Get your clothes. We're leaving right now. Who's that? How do I know? You answer it. Move over there. Hello? Who are you? Who are you looking for? A man named Mallory. Marty Mallory. You better try the other rooms. Nobody here by that name. The manager said this was it. The manager made a mistake. I'm a police officer. Any objection to my coming in and looking for myself? I guess not. Come ahead. Hello, Marty. Hello, Lieutenant. Who's your friend, Marty? That's Mr. Bentley. What do you do for a living, Mr. Bentley? What difference does that make? You said Marty wasn't here. What made you say that? You said something about looking for somebody. I didn't quite catch the name. You caught it, all right. Marty, the manager of this place tells me you haven't been working lately. Oh, I've been working here and there. What kind of work? Well, you know, anything I can get. Yeah, I know. I'm taking you in, Marty. What for? Suspicion of armed robbery. And you'd better come with us, Bentley. I'm going to say the same thing Marty did. What for? He'd like to ask you a few questions. And you better get your hands out of your pockets. I'm afraid you thought about that a little too late, Lieutenant. You shot him. You shot a cop. Come on, let's get out of here. Well, here comes the ambulance, Chief. Won't be much help to us, Harrington. Driscoll's heart just stopped beating. Son of a gun. When we found him breathing, I thought there might be a chance. Another cop dying the hard way. Yep. And him with a couple of kids. We'll turn him over to the ambulance, boys. Then I want to get right back to the office. Did you find Lieutenant Driscoll? Yeah, we found him. Dead. Oh, no. Two bullets in him. Somebody got him by surprise. Well, that's the thing that's bothering me right now. That report you got on Mallory, what did it say about his prison record? Did he give any trouble? Mm-mm. Model prisoner. Always cooperative. That's why he was paroled. This thing is beginning to look sticky. It just doesn't shape up as an ordinary hold-up operation. Miss Miller, would you feel like taking on an undercover job? I'll be glad to. I'd like you to cultivate the Bentleys. You might pose as a society reporter interested in charity affairs. What do I try to find out? I want to know if they're tied in with Marty Mallory. If that can be established, we'll break the case, but play it carefully. One of these people is a dangerous killer. You don't think Mallory did the shooting? The M.O.s don't usually lie, Harrington. Mallory's behavior pattern just doesn't include killing. And there's something else. Bentley said Mrs. Pruitt was killed when she ran past the gunman to get out the front door of that field house. Why would she do that when there was a back door? And the Bentleys gave us a phony description. They said Mallory was a little guy with dark hair. We'd better figure the Bentleys as being very smart and very deadly. Well, why don't you let me do the undercover with them? The Bentleys would never fall to you as a society writer. <laughs> yeah, I guess I'm just not the type. But I'd sure like to square things for Driscoll. You'll have your chance. Get the Daily Press on the phone, Miss Miller. I'll arrange for a reporter's credentials for you. Okay, Chief. Hello, darling. Did you find a place for Marty? Yes, I found him a place. What are you fussing around for? I'm having a caller. A reporter from the Daily Press. Reporter? What are you talking about? A society reporter. She's coming to get some information on the charity bazaar. She wants to do it from our angle. You mean you told her she could come here? A reporter? Well, I thought it'd be nice. Our names would be in the society column, and it's about time. <gasps> what did you do that for? Oh, well, stupid... Oh. Mm. You pull another fat-headed trick like this, and I'll give you something you really want to do. I told you I didn't want any... 
I suppose that's your reporter now. I'll get your face straightened out. Hello. I'm Miss Miller from the Daily Press. Yes, we've been expecting you. Come in. You'll have to excuse my wife's appearance. She's suffering from hay fever. Oh, I'm so sorry. I'll be all right. What was it you wanted to know, miss? Well, let's see. The charity bazaar is tomorrow, isn't it? That's right. I thought I'd like to join Mrs. Bentley there and just sort of stay with her. You know, to get the flavor of this sort of thing from the viewpoint of people like yourselves. Well, uh, we'll be pretty busy. Oh, I promise not to get in the way. I hope you won't turn me down. My editor's expecting quite a column out of this. It might be all right. But uh, could you contact us again at the auditorium? We're pretty busy right now. Well, uh... And Mrs. Bentley isn't feeling too well. Uh, I'm sure you understand. Yes, of course. I'll phone you again this evening, Mrs. Bentley. You and your publicity. What are you going to do now? What do you think? I'm going to call the newspaper and see if that girl really works for me. That didn't take long. The husband was there. He wasn't very gracious. What happened, Miss Miller? I think he'd been pushing Mrs. Bentley around. Her face was red and she'd been crying. He said she had hay fever. You think they were suspicious? Not the woman. She was too nice to me over the phone, but I think he was. How about tomorrow? I said I wanted to spend time with Mrs. Bentley. He didn't like it, but he didn't say no. No sign of Mallory around? Nothing I could see. Well, I guess all I can do is wait. Let's go, Harrington. <coughs> Forty-three, and I had forty-one. It's too bad, Harrington. You'd have won a dresser set for your wife. Yeah. Hey, this is quite a party. Can you still see Miss Miller? She's near the ticket booth, talking to someone. Must be a friend. Oh. How about the Bentleys? I can't see Mrs. Bentley. He's at the ticket booth. When he picks up the money, Miss Miller's going to give us the nod. Ralph. Where have you been? Don't head for the office with that money. Come with me to the front door. Something wrong? Plenty. Come on. What's the trouble? You were right about that girl. I just heard her talking to some people she knew, and they asked her if she still worked for the district attorney. What? Mm -hmm. It looks like a trap, Ralph. Mr. and Mrs. Bentley, I've been looking for you. Is there something wrong? For you, there's plenty wrong. This thing I'm holding in my pocket's a gun. We're going out this door, and you're coming with us. You make even a squeak, and you get it. Understand? Yes, I understand perfectly. Let's go. Can you still see Miss Miller, Harrington? Well, all of a sudden, she don't seem to be around. Bentley either. Something's gone wrong. Come on. Get ready to move out, Marty. Get in there, you. Head for your place, Marty. Get moving. Come on, Maida. You too, sister. What are we going to do, Ralph? I don't know yet. We'll hold up in here till I make up my mind. Get that door open. You don't think you can get away with this, do you? What? Get over there and sit down. Such a big, brave man. Just great at slapping women around. Shut up or I'll really give you one. Ralph, I've been figuring maybe we ought to get out of here. I kind of think we were following. You kind of think... Why didn't you tell me this before? Well, I was watching through the mirror, and I thought maybe I shook him off, but I can't be sure. What about her? She stays here. But she'll yell for the cops. Not when I get through belling her alongside the head with this. Better enjoy yourself while you can. I always enjoy shutting a woman's mouth. <laughs> Grab her, Marty. That's it. Now, sister, up. <laughs> Don't try to pick it up, mister. Hold it, Marty. You too, Mrs. Bentley. All right, all right. I, I, I quit. You all right, Miss Miller? 
Oh, yeah, I'm fine, Chief. But I wouldn't have been if you hadn't arrived. Get your hands higher, Marty. Frisk him, Harrington. I've got it. Uh, you won't find no bullets in that gun. I, I I didn't do them killings. Then you'd better tell us who did. You open your mouth, Marty, and you'll wish you hadn't. Take it easy, Bentley. You don't seem to realize it, Bentley, but your days of violence are over. Yeah, and if you think I'm keeping quiet, you're crazy. What do you want to know, D.A.? Save it till we get downtown, Marty, and then you can tell your story to a stenographer. Let's go. This is David Bryan. I hope you enjoy this case from the files of Mr. District Attorney. I'll be back in just a moment after this message from our sponsor. Now, here's the star of Mr. District Attorney, David Bryan with a word about the program you have just heard. I'm sure you read about these people. In a short trial, the man we call Ralph Bentley, his wife Maida, and his accomplice, Marty Mallory, were found guilty on two counts of first-degree murder. They are now serving long sentences for their crimes. And now, this is David Bryan inviting you to join us when we present our next case based on the facts of crime from the file of Mr. District Attorney. Mr. District Attorney was originated by Phillips H. Lord. District Attorney, starring David Bryan. Mr. District Attorney, champion of the people, defender of truth, guardian of our fundamental rights to life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. And it shall be my duty as district attorney not only to prosecute to the limit of the law all persons accused of crimes perpetrated within this county, but to defend with equal vigor the rights and privileges of all its citizens. Here is our star, David Bryan, as Paul Garrett, Mr. District Attorney. One of the real headaches of my job is the unwary person who walks into the trap of a confidence game. If these people are lucky, they lose only their money. All too often, as you will hear in the case that follows, they also lose their lives. This heat... I never saw such country. Yeah, it's a desert. What'd you expect? I'll be glad to get out of it, I can tell you that. You'll be glad to get the money, too, won't you? I quit belly aching so much. You sure she's got the money? She said she's got it. That's good enough for me. She's still behind us? I can't see in all that dust. Yeah, she's still behind us. Dad, you still think it's a good idea? Suppose somebody comes along and finds her. Out here. This road hasn't been used for ten years. What are you stopping for? This is where we're going to do it. Uh, she's coming up and stopping behind us. Hello, Miss Morrow. We can all take my car if we have to. Get out of your car, Miss Smith. But what for? This certainly isn't the place, is it? Are you going to get out or do I have to yank you out? Am I? 
Why, Mr. Morrow, what kind of an attitude is Come that? on, get up. Well, uh, well, it's my car. I, I guess I can stay in it if I want to. You'll stay out of it. Uh, never heard of such a thing. If I want to... Get up! Well, better take it easy, Dan. You don't want to leave any marks. I know what I'm doing. Now, shut up. Oh, she's coming too, Dan. Better hurry. <laughs> Did you get the money? Right here. Gosh, what a wad. Uh Uh-oh, she's on her feet. Mr. Morrow, will you... Will you please tell me why you stalled my car in sand? Keep you from driving it, Miss Smith. Look like you back to town. And tell them about this. How are you going to make it back to town? Well, I guess I can... Wait a minute. You you wouldn't leave me out here. There'd be no one to help me. Person would die out here alone in this heat. Oh, please let me in the car. Get away from that. No. Don't leave me. I'll die. I'll die, Mr. Morrow. Mr. Morrow. Morning, Miss Miller. Oh, good morning, Mr. Gareth. Hello, Harrington. Hi, Miss Miller. Anything stirring? It certainly is. Phone was ringing as I came in the door. Did you read that thing on the front page this morning? About the woman being found dead on the desert? Yes, I read it. I got the paper right here. Died of thirst. Well, this call came from the manager of her bank. He says she drew $10,000 from her account last week in small bills. Thinks it must have been the day before she went to the desert. Well, that's interesting. The bank manager thought so, too. He felt you should know about it. Did he leave his name, Miss Miller? Yes, I've got it here. Um, Mr. Payton. Remind me later to drop him a letter expressing our appreciation for his alertness. Did he give you any information about the woman? Uh, says here in the paper she was a Miss Emily Smith, 48 years old. Mr. Payton says she lived alone, had no relatives that he knows about. Where did they find her, Harrington? Near a highway, wasn't it? Yeah, not far from the general store at Buffalo Springs. What else does it say there? Uh... A woman's car was found on an abandoned mine road five miles from where her body was discovered. The car had been driven off the road and was stuck in the sand. Lonely spinster with 10000 in cash. What would she be doing out in the desert? Might be worth looking into. I think so. Well, Miss Miller, call the sheriff's station at Buffalo Springs. Tell them we'll be there inside the next couple of hours. Come on, Harrington. Captain Kane in. Right here, Mr. Guy. I've been expecting you. Oh, hello, Harrington. Hiya, Pete. Hey, you guys really get it hot up here, don't you? Oh, dry heat. It's good for you. Yeah, it wasn't so good for that woman you found yesterday. No, it sure wasn't. That why you came up? No, that's right, Kane. What do you have on the case? Not too much. Think there's something funny about it? Well, did she have any money on her? Some silver in her purse, a couple of bucks. Anyone see her alive? Yeah, she went into the store... Bought some bottles of pop to take along with her. Storekeeper says she told him she was heading for some kind of an outer space shrine. He said she seemed pretty sensible, though. Shrine? Do you have anything out here like that? Mm, not that I know about. Sounds like one of those phony religious setups, Chief. No. Yeah. Coroner's wagon hasn't come up for the body yet, Mr. Garrett. Uh, would you like to take a look at her? Well, might as well, I guess. Our morgue is right across the hall here. Is there any evidence of anyone being with the captain? Storekeeper says no one he knows about. Oh, this is it. Second table here. Wow. I never saw anything like that before. Uh, Dehydration. 48? She looks like 148. As soon as we get back to town, I'd like you to do a checkup on this woman, Harrington. Her habits, friends, everything. Okay, Captain. Cover her up. Hey, it's it's cold in here. <laughs> it's got to be.
Darn it. What's the matter? Line's busy. Who are you calling? Newspaper. Tell them to cancel our ad. I ordered the phone taken out this morning and the electricity turned off. What are you talking about? Well, we don't want to keep paying for them if we're going to take a trip, do we? You just can't wait to start living up that money, can you? I'm sick of waiting. Well, you're going to wait. Then you get on that phone and cancel those stop orders. I won't do it. You promised me that trip and I'm going to have it. Here, give me that phone. No. Give me that. You try it, Dan. You try calling those people and I'll scratch your baggy eyes Don't out. Don't start anything, Connie. I'm warning you. Keep your claws off me. Put that phone down, then. Get away from me, Connie. I'll show Get you. Get away from me. I'll... Why, you... I hope I broke your jaw. Hello, Miss Miller. Chief in yet? Well, yes, he is, Harrington. He... Find out anything, Harrington? Yeah, I did, Chief. A couple of things. Number one, Miss Emily Smith has been known as a fanatic for years, hopping from one phony religion to another. Number two, she was also nuts about flying saucers. And this neighbor I talked to, well, she said she just recently joined up with some outer space cult. And this ties in with that shrine the storekeeper mentioned. How about the name of the cult? He, uh... Well, neighbor didn't know, but she said she thought Miss Smith got next to it through a through an ad in the personal column. Well, let's see if we can get anything out of that. You still have the paper you had with you this morning? That's here, Mr. Garrett. See if you want ad section. Well, thanks, Miss Miller. Personal column. Now here it is. And here's one that sounds like what we're looking for. Are you aware of the realm of outer space? Are flying saucers the means to our salvation? If you would learn the great truths of our day, join the disciples of the entire universe. Call Elmwood 64245 for an appointment. Hmm. That sounds like a pip. Miss Miller, do you think you'd be interested in joining this group? Sounds like fun. Good. Pick up the phone and see if they'll give you an appointment for this afternoon. <laughs> I can't wait. This is our present meeting place, Miss Miller. But of course, it's nothing to what Mrs. Morrow and I have in mind for the future. You see, Miss Miller, we expect to build a temple of our own. One of the most unique edifices the world has ever seen. A shrine, Miss Miller. A shrine to which the superior beings of outer space will be drawn. Summoned by the vibrations of welcome which we will project into the ether. And where will the shrine be located, Mr. Morrow? In the vast open reaches of the desert. But not too far from here. Well within commuting distance. Oh, I'm fascinated. But won't this take a lot of money? Yes, it will. Our greatest problem. And we have no one to turn to but the people who associate themselves with us. Perhaps Miss Miller might be interested in furthering the development of the shrine. <coughs> well, I'm sure Miss Miller would want to know a lot more about it before she has any thoughts like that. And, of course, you'll only be too glad to take the time to tell her. Frankly, yes, I... I would. There are several things she needs to know, particularly the ritual of our initiation. I'll be happy to learn the ritual, but right now I'd better be running along. I have someone waiting for me outside. You'll be back tomorrow? Will that be all right? It'll be fine. Goodbye, Mrs. Morrow. Goodbye, Miss Miller. Goodbye, Mr. Morrow. Goodbye, my dear. Did you have any luck? I'm expected to come back tomorrow. Were you well received? Very well received. I'm to be told all about a shrine in the desert. A place for flying saucers to land and bring us the superior wisdom about a space. Did they mention money? Oh, yes. They need money to build the shrine. Apparently, Miss Smith's $10,000 was only the beginning. Who are these people, Miss Miller? Well, Mr. and Mrs. Morrow. He's Dan and she's Connie, and I know I'm going to be asked for funds. Well, go along with it. Let them think you're an eager prospect, but watch yourself. You're dealing with a pair of ruthless killers. A 
And now, back to David Bryan, starring as Paul Garrett, Mr. District Attorney. A woman had been found dead of thirst in the desert, five miles from a stalled car. Apparently an accidental death. But word had come to my office that she had withdrawn $10,000 in cash from a bank account the day before her disappearance. Further investigation disclosed that the dead woman had belonged to a pseudo-religious cult featuring flying saucers in its formula, a cult supposed to be building a shrine in the desert. Miss Miller had joined the group, and as you'll see, this gave us the break we were waiting for. Well, what are you doing here at this time of the day? I'm waiting to meet Miss Miller. And why can't you meet her at the apartment like you did the others? Is it because she's young and good-looking and you can't bear the thought of having me around when you're with her? Oh, let's not start that again, Connie. You've been seeing her for three days now, Dan. Is she ready to buy in yet? Well, I don't know. All right, keep quiet. Here she comes. Good. Since you're so reluctant to ask for the money, I'll do it for you. I'll give her the same spiel you gave Emily Smith. Listen to me, Dan. I'm pretty good at it. Shut up. Good morning, Miss Miller. Oh, good morning, Mr. Morrow. Hello, Mrs. Morrow. Good morning. You've come in at a rather sad moment in our lives. Oh, I'm sorry. Is there anything I can do to help? Well, it's rather involved. You see, we have this option to buy the land for our desert shrine, but it runs out tomorrow at midnight. And unless we can put up $10,000, we're going to lose it. Oh, but you can't lose it. That's what we've been telling each other. But there it is. There must be something. Well, the other day you said you might be willing to accept a financial interest in the shrine. Oh, yes. Stop worrying about it, Mrs. Morrow. I'll put up the money. Wonderful. Could you meet us out there with the money uh, tomorrow afternoon? In the desert? Yes. It's a little place called Buffalo Springs. We could meet in front of the general store. Consider it settled. Miss Miller, you're an angel. Isn't she, Dan? Yes. Yes, she certainly is. Oh, you're too kind, both of you. Now I'd better go and make arrangements about the money. I'll see you both tomorrow. It's me, Mr. Garrett. I couldn't wait to come into the office to tell you. They just made the proposition. A trip to the desert? I'm going to meet them at Buffalo Springs tomorrow afternoon with $10,000. Okay. We'll fix up the money for you. Better come on in now and we'll work out a plan. You did all right, Miss Miller. Thanks, Chief. Bye for now. There's Miss Miller's car, Chief. Better go behind the store, Harrington, so the Morrows won't see us. Yeah. That's a good spot. Right. We can see from here, and they won't notice us. Wow. Boy, this is hot country. Look at that thermometer. 110 degrees. 108, Harrington. You'll never notice the difference. Be philosophical. Remember what Captain Kane said? It's dry heat. Good for you. Whatever it's good for, I probably don't have. Why? There are the Morrows. Yeah, we aren't going to be able to follow them too closely. They'd see our dust. We know where they're going, and that's the main thing. There they go. We let them get a start and then follow them. Okay. Now let's not wait too long. Yeah. I guess that's far enough ahead now. Let's go. Hold it, Harrington. We might as well face it. We've lost them. This was the right road, wasn't it? No doubt about that. They crossed us up. Went somewhere else. Yeah, that's bad. I guess we let them get too far ahead. Well, we've got to move fast. No use chasing them all over this desert. There's an airport at Silver Wells. Head for it. Kill the engine, Harrington. I hope so. 
I'm yelling at the top of my foot. Bo- oh, fine. Okay. Now, what are you fellas all excited about? Uh, my name's Harrington. I'm an investigator. This is the district attorney. Oh, well, I'm Tom Mason. Uh, am I in trouble about something? Uh, nothing like that. We need your help. There's a girl lost up here, and we have to have a plane to find her. Well, I'm your man. Climb in. Now, watch where you step. Too bad you have to turn off the engine. No trouble to get it going again. All set. Let it go. Let it go. All right, Dan. Get out and do your stuff. Let, let's call it off, Connie. Let's tell her we've changed our minds. I thought you'd come up with something like that. So I brought this gun along. Oh. You won't take care of her? I will. All right, sister. Where's that money? I see you have a gun. Where's the money? Right here. Thanks. Now back your car off the road. But it'll get stuck. The next one will come a lot closer if you don't do what I tell you. Move the car. Yes, Mrs. Morrow. Now what am I supposed to do? Why don't you try walking? See if it'll do you any good. All right, Dan, let's get going. Uh Are you going to leave me here? Consider yourself left. Get moving, Dan. This trip might not be so simple, Connie. We got troubles of our own. What? Car is heating up badly. Can we make it to that motel near the store? Nah, I guess we can do that. Then do it. We can stay there till it cools off tonight and head back to the city. I guess so. See anything down there, Harrington? No, not a thing. I'm beginning to get worried. How far from the store will she be? Could be miles. Well, we've still got lots of time before dark. Hey, wait a second. What is it? Well, I saw a car down there off to the left. I'll bank around. Hey, he's right, Chief. Look. There's a car in the sand off the road. She's standing alongside of it, waving at us. Good girl. She was smart enough to stay with the car. Can you land there, Mason? We're practically down. Nothing to it on that road. Here we go. Climb in. Yeah, pretty smart. Staying by the car. Well, I figured I could always drink the water from the radiator if I had to. <laughs> You're all right, Miss Miller. We all set? All set, Mason. Here we go, then. Motel is all right. Air conditioning and everything. Yeah. Uh, how do you think that girl feels by now? Who cares? Who's that? How do I know? Open the door. Mrs. Morrow? That's right. I'm Paul Garrett, district attorney for this county. I'd like to ask you a few questions. Well, I can't imagine why. Any objection to my coming in? I think it's kind of nosy, but come on. Thank you. I assume this is Mr. Morrow. Yes, I'm Morrow. What's all this question stuff? You mind telling me what you're doing out this way, Mr. Morrow? Why should I? What are you doing out this way? Well, I came here to investigate the death of a Miss Emily Smith. Huh? So what? Do you happen to know a Miss Smith? No, we didn't. Are you sure about that, Mrs. Morrow? 
I have information that Miss Smith was a member of a cult or a society run by you people. Well, yeah, I knew her slightly. I'm sure you knew her more than slightly, Mr. Morrow. I have information that you knew her well enough to talk her into coming up here with more than $10,000 in cash. You have all kinds of information, haven't you? Yes, I do. I also happen to know that you arranged to meet another person up here. A young woman by the name of Miss Miller. Isn't that true, Mr. Morrow? I don't know what you're talking about. She came up here today. You and Mrs. Morrow took her out to an abandoned road and forced her to turn over the money she had with her. And then you left her there with a car stuck in the sand. You're crazy, mister. Let's see you produce us, Miss Miller. I can do that, all right. She's outside. You see, we landed an aeroplane on that road about a half hour ago and picked her up. And the money you took from her happens to be marked. You think you're going to be able to explain that? Dan, what are we going to do? I told you this was a bad one. You got me into this, you little... (laughs) Now you, mister, get out of my way. You're pretty good at slugging women. Let's see you try with me. I'm going to do just that. Hey, I thought I heard a commotion in here. You did. Come on in, Harrington. They're all yours. This is David Bryan. I hope you enjoy this case from the files of Mr. District Attorney. I'll be back in just a moment after this message from our sponsor. Now, here is the star of Mr. District Attorney, David Bryan, with a word about the program you have just heard. No doubt you remember the facts of this case. The couple we call the Morrows were tried and found guilty of murder in the first degree. Also of conspiracy to commit murder and highway robbery. Both are now serving life sentences. Now this is David Bryan inviting you to join us when we present our next case based on the facts of crime from the file of Mr. District Attorney. Mr. District Attorney was originated by Phillips H. Lord. Mr. District Attorney, starring David Bryan. Mr. District Attorney, champion of the people, defender of truth, guardian of our fundamental rights to life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. And it shall be my duty as district attorney not only to prosecute to the limit of the law all persons accused of crimes perpetrated within this county, but to defend with equal vigor the rights and privileges of all its citizens. This is David Bryan. In a moment, we'll bring you another case from the files of Mr. District Attorney. But first, a word from our sponsor. And now, here is our star, David Bryan, as Paul Garrett, Mr. District Attorney. A district attorney knows that the world of crime has many windows, and that only by looking through all of them may the truth be seen, because nothing is more dangerous than half-truth or half-knowledge. This case we're about to hear had its start three years before it came to my attention. Harry, 
I beg you, please don't go. You get out of here and let me pack, Doris. How can you do this? You're my husband. We're going to have a baby. The kind of doll I make? I'll go back to my job later, Harry. We'll make out. I'm making out right now. Out of here. I'll watch out for me. You watch out for you. You're in love with somebody else, aren't you? I'm not in love with you. I'll never give you a divorce, Harry. Yeah, you've been saying that for months. What else is no? Harry, I, I can't go through this alone. I need you. I love you. Please. Please don't do this to me. You're going to be a father. Doesn't that mean anything to you? Yeah, it means I'm going. Stay. Stay until morning, please, Harry. Harry, I'm frightened when I'm alone at night. This house is so isolated. Stop blabbering. Here. Here, I'll leave you my gun. Do me a favor. Blow your brains out. Harry. Get out of my way. Harry. Doris, put that down. Stay, Harry. No. Harry. What have I done? Harry. Harry. Get out of here. Get out of here before, before the police find out. I'll call the doctor. No, no, that's no good. It's my fault. Doris, go, go on. Far away. Change your name. Harry. I was no good. Go for the, for the baby's sake. Uh, Harry. Harry. I just got in from a movie. I've been trying to reach you for a couple of hours. Oh. I can't find the Sanderson papers in the files. Why, well, I put them on your desk. Thought you might work on them tonight. Well, just a second. <laughs> Here they are, all right. Right under my nose. I'm sorry I disturbed you. Oh, it's, it's all right. I'm, I'm glad you called. Thank you. Good night. Good night. Uh-huh. Business as usual. Oh, well... Who's in there? Don't be frightened, Edith. I waited for a couple of hours. Then your landlady let me in. You seem to know me. Do I know you? Doris Griffin. Uh, I mean, Doris Lloyd, before I was married. We went to high school together. Yes. Last I heard of you, you were modeling. Yes. And then I married Harry, Harry Griffin. Here. You'd better sit down. Now, what's the matter? Why did you come to see me? You work for Mr. Garrett, the district attorney. Yes. Well, I have to go to him. I'm afraid to go alone. Have you done something? I killed my husband. Oh, I see. When did this happen? Three years ago. Our baby was coming. He was going to leave me. Where's the baby now? I gave him out for adoption in Baltimore last week. That's where I ran to after I shot Harry. I want to face it and get it over with. I want you to take me to Mr. Garrett. Well, he's at the office working tonight. I'll go in and talk to him, but you're in no condition to go anyplace tonight. You try to sleep and I'll be back. There's nothing in that file either, Miss Miller. I know. Perhaps the old files in the storeroom? Three years and then solved? No, it should be right here. I should remember it for that matter, and I don't. You sure it happened in this county? She said right here in the city. Well, Hank will be up from the record bureau in a minute. 
They'll be certain to have it there. I may have misfiled it. Oh, you don't usually. It's like I did this time. Chief? Well, you just saved us a job, Harrington. What have you got? Sore eyes from looking. No record? Chief, there hasn't been anybody named Griffin murdered in this county since 1892. There's no report of any such murder in the files, and we have no wanted sheet out on any Doris Griffin. But that's impossible, Harrington. (laughs) Nothing is impossible, Miss Miller. You've been here long enough to know that. We get a dozen confessions a month to crimes that never happened, or from people who didn't commit crimes that did happen. He's right, Miss Miller. Your old schoolmate seems to have all the symptoms of a psychopath. She wasn't lying to me, Mr. Garrett. People who are mentally sick sometimes believe that they've done something they haven't. Miss Miller, I'd like to arrest a murderer. It's my job. But we can't arrest anybody for a murder that hasn't happened. Unless, of course, your friend's story isn't complete. She probably never had a husband or a baby. Or if she did have a husband and shot him, as she says, it wasn't a case of hysteria or temporary insanity. What makes you say that? The simple fact that no body was found. Which would indicate she didn't just run. She hid the body or stripped it of its identity first. Oh, yes. It would have to be that way, wouldn't it? You better get on this again, Harrington. Well, what do you want this time, Chief? Marriage License Bureau. Make sure there's a record of a Doris Lloyd marrying a Harry Griffin. Mm-hmm. Then if you're sure there was a Harry Griffin, check our records and the records of the surrounding counties for all unidentified bodies found during the probable period of the murder. Uh, you going to wait here for it? No, dig up what you can and bring it to Miss Miller's apartment. We'll be there. Come along, Miss Miller. Yes, sir. She's in the bedroom. In the state you say she was in, if she's asleep, we'd better let her rest for a while. I'll look. Yeah, she's asleep, all right. No, no, she isn't. Where's the light switch? I'll get it. Her eyes are wide open. She looks so strange. Doris. Doris, are you all right? Get some water, Miss Miller, right away. What is it? She's in a state of emotional shock. Get the water. I'll open some windows. Mrs. Griffin. Mrs. Griffin, try to talk. Hurry, Miss Miller. I'm coming. Here's the water. Smelling salts, too. Good. Here, open your mouth, Mrs. Griffin. Try to drink some of this. She won't touch it. Try the salts. (laughs) She's in bad shape. We'd better have her taken to the hospital. Where's your phone? On the dressing table. Smell this, Doris. Come on, breathe, breathe, please. Operator? Get me to the general hospital. No, don't push it away. It'll help you. Hello. This is Paul Garrett, the district Angel. attorney. Ambulance emergency. I don't 49 Hooper. Out. Apartment 4D. Harry. Harry. Is he, is he calling an ambulance for Harry? Yes. Yes, ma'am. Now just lie back and rest until it comes. Everything's going to be all right. Is that her purse on the chair or yours? It's hers. You'd better take the liberty of looking into it. The papers are probably in the billfold. Driver's license. Baltimore, Maryland. That's where she went when she ran away. Name on it is Doris Lloyd, though. Same on her social security card. That was her maiden name. Might be her only name. She might have resumed it after the murder. What are those? Newspaper clippings. The one ads. Help wanted and rooms to rent. Apparently, she didn't come to you as soon as she arrived in town. How do you know? Papers dated last week. A couple of ads circled in pencil. Help wanted. Dress manufacturers. She used to be a model. Well, that whole section is circled. How about the rentals? And just one single room, $14 a week. 6611 West Homedale Avenue. She might have been living there. We'll have to check it. And that'll be Harrington. You stay with her. I'll get it. Hi, Chief. How did you make out? Mavis License Bureau was another blank. I guess we were right the first time, then. I don't know. They might have been married in another state. 
Well, it's a possibility, of course. But what makes you think so? Well, I did find a record on a Harry Griffin. What? Yeah, this. Magistrate court. Five years ago, charge was wife beating. Wife's name was Doris. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Dismissed when she refused to press charges. Yep. It could be other people with the same name. No. Lists his occupation as dress designer. Hers as a model. She had a husband, all right. This kind of... Hold on, Miss Miller. Grab a Harrington. I have to. Go ahead. I, I, I didn't want to hit her. That was the only way. Carry her into the living room. Okay. You all right, Miss Miller? You scratched me a little, that's all. Thought I had her calm down. She was staring at the window, jumped up suddenly, tried to throw herself out. She's a very sick girl. Sounds like an ambulance coming, Chief. Yes, I sent for it. Did Harrington find out anything about her husband? Yes, she was married, all right. Maybe she still is. I don't get you, Chief. We know there was a living Harry Griffin. The court record you found proved that. Yeah. We still haven't found any trace of a dead Harry Griffin. This is David Bryan. Before we continue with Mr. District Attorney in the case of the missing corpse, here's an important message I'd like you to hear. And now, back to David Bryan, starring as Paul Garrett, Mr. District Attorney. A woman had confessed to the three-year-old murder of her husband, but the body had never been discovered. Our police files showed no record of such a murder. I went to talk to the landlady in an address circled in a newspaper advertisement we found in the woman's purse, an address where Doris Griffin might have rented a room. Yeah, yeah, stop being knocking. I'm sorry. Your doorbell seems to be out of order. Rooms are $14 a week and no cooking. Well, I'm not looking for a room. I'm looking for information. Do you have a tenant named Doris Griffin? No. How about Doris Lloyd? No. That one. Who are you? My name's Paul Garrett. I'm the district attorney. Oh. And she's in trouble, is she? I can't say it gives me any surprise. None whatsoever. Why do you say that? Oh, them sweet young things. They're all the same. I only lived here a week, but the men, oh, the men, how they telephoned her. Do you mean men or a man? Well, I don't know for sure. I didn't think you did. The phone is right there in the hall. You must have answered it. Well, I did mostly. Maybe it was one man. Had a funny voice, kind of hoarse it was, like I had a cold. Did he ever leave his name? No, never said. Just ask for Doris Lloyd. Did she ever tell you who the man was? She did not. I see. Did the man ever come here? Nope. She never had a visitor in the week she was here. Did the phone call start the day she came? No, no. She went job hunting that day. Started the day after. Oh, that'd be last Thursday. After they started, she didn't go looking for work. She just stayed in her room and cried. I see. Thank you. You'll see how her rent's due again. I'll be holding her back. I'm sure you will. Miss Miller? Oh, Mr. Garrett. Is Harrington back yet? Just came in a minute ago. He's waiting in your office. Well, what are you working on? Monthly report to the mayor. Now, let it go. Go over to the general hospital and see how Doris Griffith is making out. Yes, sir. Tell the doctor I'd like to know as soon as she's in condition for me to talk to her. Yes, sir. Hello, Chief. Got anything? Yes. She rented a room, all right. How about those dress manufacturers? Well, I checked the whole list. She hit them all last Wednesday. Filled out job applications. They know anything about her? No. Only that she seemed very nervous. 
In one place, they said they thought she was crazy. Why? Well, she filled out the application the secretary gave her, and she was waiting for an interview with the boss. He was out to lunch. When he came in, she took one look at him and ran out. Didn't even wait to talk to him. And which place was that? The uh, Frederick Grant Company, a big new outfit. You talked to Grant? Uh, no, no, I didn't. Well, why not? Well, he wasn't there, Chief. The secretary said he'd been home all week, not feeling well. As a matter of fact, he went right home after this thing happened with the Griffin girl. You get Grant's home address? It's a big place in the Ferndale Estates District. Too swanky for house numbers. I'll find it. I'm going out there. You meet Miss Miller at General Hospital and wait for me. I'm sorry to keep you waiting, Mr. Garrett. I was dressing when the maid brought your card up. I'm Mrs. Grant. I guess the maid misunderstood me. It was your husband I wanted to see. Oh, well, he hasn't been feeling well. The staff has orders. He isn't to be disturbed. Perhaps I can help you. Well, possibly. Oh, won't you sit down? Thank you. You have a lovely home. Oh, thank you. Just what is it you came here about? I wanted to get some information about a Mrs. Griffin. Mrs. Harry Griffin. That name mean anything to you? Well, I can't say that it does. Have you ever heard your husband mention her? No. Should he have? Perhaps. Perhaps not. If I could ask him directly. Are you in here, Elizabeth? Oh, yes, dear. For the last time, haven't I told you... Oh, I didn't realize you had company. Mr. Garrett, this is my husband, Mr. Grant. Mr. Grant? Hello. Elizabeth, I want to talk to you as soon as you're free. I'll be in the study. Oh, I can step outside for a moment if you'd like. Uh, that won't be necessary, Mr. Garrett. What's the matter now, Fred? I thought you were leaving for Acapulco tonight. Now Johnson tells me you've unpacked. That's right. Why? Because I don't want to go. <sighs> Mr. Garrett, perhaps you'd better excuse us after all. I'm sorry we subjected you to this. Oh, well, don't apologize, Mrs. Grant. It's been very enlightening. Now, what kind of a smart crack is that? Who are you, anyhow? What are you doing here? Perhaps the name escaped you. Garrett. Paul Garrett. I'm the district attorney. Oh. As for what I'm doing here, I can make that very brief. Do you know a Mrs. Harry Griffin? What is this, some kind of a riddle game? Is that supposed to be an answer? I never heard the name before in my life. Anything else? No, that's all. For now. Good day. The doc said it's okay to see her, Chief, but isn't going to do any good. Why not? She's under heavy sedation. Miss Miller's sitting with her, but she doesn't even recognize her. Oh, it's the next room. If we question her while she's relaxed, half asleep, we may get something. Hello, Miss Miller. Hello. We've got to try to question her. She's barely conscious. It may help. Doris. Mean that... I see him all the time. His face. You shot him, Doris. The, the baby. He was sleeping. What did you do with the gun, Doris? I threw it. Threw it away. Threw it in the water. Where? Where in the water, Doris? He, Wallace. Wallace Pond. <laughs> it's all right, Doris. Go to sleep. It's all right. Oh. All right. Take care of her, Miss Ma. Yes, sir. Come on, Harrington. Now we've got something to go on. Wallace Pond? Yes. Call for a lab squad. We want to drag for that gun. We may find more than the gun. We may find Harry Griffin's body. I doubt it, Harrington. I doubt it very much.
I told you to cover that end systematically. Your bare feet will find anything on the bottom. Those hooks are only stirring up mud. Thank you. There's a lot of junk down here, Chief. I should have been born with fingers on my feet instead of toes. Feel something? Yeah. Metallic. Solid. Right under my foot. Yep. I got it. Uh, Cake with mud, but it's a gun, all right. Bring it out. All right, men. We've got it. Revolver. Small caliber. Only a twenty-two. Open the chamber. See if it's been fired. Uh, Rusted. Uh, uh, three chambers empty. Hey. What is it? Let me empty this cylinder. Look. There's three shells aren't fired. Those are blank cartridges. Oh, sure they are. Yeah, this is the wrong gun. No, Harrington. I don't think so. Now I'm convinced that I know where to find Harry Griffith's body. Where? In a very luxurious home belonging to Mrs. Frederick Grant. Or maybe at the airport, waiting for a place to out the Poco. Let's go. Hey, hey, my shoes. Put them on in the car. Oh, ouch. Oh. Just a minute, mister. What? Go of me. My plane's loaded. Your name Frederick Grant? That's... No. No, it isn't. Well, let's go over there to the baggage room until we find out what it really is, huh? Let go. I said the baggage room, mister. Ah, ah, you're breaking my arm. Not if you stop twisting. Just walk. In. Hello, Mr. Grant. I'll have you broken for this. Making me miss a plane. I've got the money and the influence to do it, too. You mean your wife has, don't you? Your present wife. I don't know what you're talking about. Maybe you'll understand better if I call you by your right name. Harry Griffin. You're crazy. That's not my name. Easy enough to prove. Harry Griffin was arrested once on a charge of wife beating. Police have his fingerprints. Make it easy on yourself, mister. All right. I I was married to Doris once, but it was a mistake. I, I wanted out. She wouldn't give me a divorce. I met another woman, Elizabeth, my wife now. Keep talking, Griffin. Elizabeth had money. She didn't know I was married. I told her my name was Frederick Grant. Marrying her meant a chance to build something big, a company of my own, but Doris was in the way, ready to stick me with somebody else to take care of, a baby. Yes. And you were afraid to kill her, so you made her think she killed you. Who told you where to find me? Elizabeth? She didn't have to tell me. I knew she wasn't going to be using that plane ticket. I figured you wouldn't want it to go to waste. Come on, mister. There's a nice cell waiting for you. You can turn on the water in the sink and make believe you're in Acapulco. You take him in, Harrington. I have to wait here for a while. To meet an arriving passenger. Who? Doris Griffin's little boy. I call the people who are going to adopt him. They're sending him back to his mother. Chief, she's in no condition of... No, but someday soon, when she knows the truth, she will be. This is David Bryan. I hope you enjoy this case from the files of Mr. District Attorney. I'll be back in just a moment after this message from our sponsor. Now, here's the star of Mr. District Attorney, David Bryan, with a word about the program you have just heard. Harry Griffin, alias Frederick Grant, was convicted on charges of bigamy and fraud. He is serving a 10 to 20 year sentence in the state penitentiary. Doris Griffin, completely recovered, is operating a very successful school for models and raising her son in a manner that meets with the complete approval of juvenile authorities. Now, this is David Bryan inviting you to join us when we present our next case based on the facts of crime from the files of Mr. District Attorney. Mr. District Attorney was originated by Phillips H. Lord. <laughs>
Mr. District Attorney, starring David Bryan. Mr. District Attorney, champion of the people, defender of truth, guardian of our fundamental rights to life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. And it shall be my duty as district attorney not only to prosecute to the limit of the law all persons accused of crimes perpetrated within this county, but to defend with equal vigor the rights and privileges of all its citizens. This is David Bryan. In a moment, we'll bring you another case from the files of Mr. District Attorney. But first, a word from our sponsor. And now, here is our star, David Bryan, as Paul Garrett, Mr. District Attorney. One of the most important factors in fighting lawlessness is the person who has witnessed a crime or knows something about it. Usually, these people are cooperative and helpful. But sometimes, as in the case you are about to hear, the witness tries to turn his knowledge into profit, becoming a criminal himself. Okay, let's get him. Hold it, friend. We're going in with you. I'm sorry, but it's only 8.30. The bank doesn't open for business until 10. I just stepped out for some breakfast. Well, you know why you uh, stepped out. We know the manager of the joint. Now, fix this door so it's unlocked and don't argue. You, you mean it's it's a hold-up? Fix the door. If I find it locked when we leave, I'll blow your guts out. But I'll, I'll, I'll fix it. I'll, I'll fix it. There. Okay. Let's go in. Straight back to the vault. Call your people out from behind the counter. Act natural. Yes, sir. Will you please come out here, everybody? Everybody, please? You had it right, Willie. They already got the vault open for us. You still want to tie the hands? Certainly. That's what you got the wire for. All right, folks, against the wall. This is a holdup. Get your hands out. We're tying them up. The thing's too, Willie. Everybody, everybody. Let the manager do the tying. You get in that vault and get the money. Good idea, Willie. Mister, you finish him up. Wait a second. Don't nobody move. What's the matter? You got a guard in this place. Where is he? I, I, I don't know. In my office, maybe. He should have stayed there. All right, Mister, freeze. And don't get any ideas about going for that gun. No, John. John, don't! <laughs> Shot him. And you'll get the same thing if I hear one more bleed out of you. Watch with the loot. I'm coming, Willie. I'm coming. All right, you people. Squeeze back against the wall and stay there. We're going out of here, and I don't want to hear a move, see a move, or smell a move. Let's get out of here, Willie. I'm loaded. Stay right where you are, everybody. And don't try to follow us. Nobody. Open the door for me, Willie. Yeah. Let's go. Folks, let us through here. Let us through, folks. Please, please. Ah, hi, Sarge. Where's the... Oh, oh, I see it. Yeah, lying in front of the vault, Chief. Yes. The officer tells me that you're the district attorney. I'm Harrington. This is the district attorney, Mr. Garrett. How do you do? I'm J.T. Barnes, manager of the bank. I went out for some breakfast this morning, and they practically kidnapped me. Breakfast? After you started work? Oh, yes, yes. I'm the first one here, and my hours start long before the bank opens for business. And you first saw these men outside? Yes, that's right. And they must have known all about the way a bank is run. They had everything down just right. You, uh, you think it was an inside job? Oh, no, 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 no. I never saw either one of them before in my life. But one of them must have worked in the bank at some time. Mm. Well, they spent a lot of time casing this place. Are they waiting at the door, Mr. Barnes? That's right. They made me let them in. 
What could I do? They both had guns, and one of them told me he'd blow my guts out if I made the wrong move. What could I do? Very little, Mr. Barnes. We understand that. I only hope our Mr. Telford understands it. Uh, Mr. Telford is vice president in charge of this district. I hope he understands. I wouldn't worry about it, Mr. Barnes. It's not your job to fight gunmen. No, not when I have a wife and family to think about. Two children, Mr. Garrett. One ten, the other seven. Man has to think about things like that. He certainly does. I, uh, I see the vault is still open. Yes. Wouldn't do much good to close it now. They got just about everything in the way of cash. How much did they get away with, Mr. Barnes? More than 40000 Imagine that. $40,000. And I can tell you everything they did. Everything. Poor Brady. Started to draw on them. They just pumped bullets into him. Poor who? That's Brady, our guard, under that sheet. He's dead. Oh. Well, let's take a look, Hank. Yeah. Jim Brady. You knew him? Yes, for many years. Yeah, both of us. How many were there? The two of them. Uh, what did they look like? Oh, nice looking, well dressed. When they first came up to me, I thought they were bank examiners. Young? Between 25 and 30, I'd say. Both had hats on. One of them called the other one Willie. Willie was the one that killed Brady. Nice, friendly personality. Hand me that piece of wire at your feet, will you, Harrington? They use that to tie up their hands. Ah, bailing wire. A lot faster than rope. Yes, and not many people use bailing wire in the city. Get on this right away, Harrington. Check the hardware stores. See if one of them has sold any bailing wire in the past few days. Okay, Chief. Is there a phone I can use, Mr. Barnes? Oh, yes, of course. Right over here. Thank you. District Attorney's Office. I'm at the First National Bank, Miss Miller. I'd like you to do a quick check on something for me. Find out if there's anything on a bank robber who uses Willie for a first name. Yes, sir. I'll get on that right away. Any characteristics? And he's about 28, flashy dresser, and there's something else. He's a killer. You got that? I've got it, Mr. Garrett. I'll see you at the office. I'll be there in about a half hour. You got the key? Yeah, I got it. Well, we made it better than 42,000 bucks. Of course, that was a fast count in the car, but it's pretty close. You slophead. What? I spent three weeks warning you about pulling boners, and what do you do? Pull the biggest of all. What are you talking about? I told you not to use my name, didn't I? Who used your name? You did. Well, eat this, Willie that. I'd have knocked your teeth down your throat. So I called you Willie. How did that hurt anything? There's millions of guys named Willie. But they ain't robbing banks. They ain't gonna have the cops looking for them. All right, all right, so I goofed a little. They were all too scared to pay attention. Uh, put that bag under the bed and let's get out of here. What are you looking around at? You've seen the place before. You know, Willie, I ain't sure if the dough is gonna be so safe here after all. Well, what do you want to do with it? Carry it around in your hip pocket? This is what we rented the place for, ain't it? Yeah, but suppose somebody comes in and starts poking around. Who's going to poke around a garage apartment? It's all by itself, ain't it? And it'll be locked up? Yeah, how about kids? You know how kids are. Look, we figured this all out, didn't we? We have to have a place to keep the dough, don't we? What are the odds in somebody poking in here? What are the odds? Well, maybe we should split the dough and each take a share and leave town. Uh, like I said, you're a slophead. And you keep proving it. All we have to do to get cops on our back is to leave town or start spending the dough. Yeah. We stay in town. We keep working on our jobs. We leave the dough here. We're mechanics. They don't figure mechanics for bank robbers. So we stay being mechanics, understand? All right, so I understand. You don't have to get so hot about uh, it. You're like a dame, always talking, always changing your mind. Knock it off. I'm warning you. Okay, okay. Okay, so let's get out of here. Come on, what are you dragging your feet for? I'm coming. Patterson? Yeah. Before we leave here, I want you to know something. What? We're going to stay together. I know that. Just make sure you know it good. Don't go trying to sneak back here to pick up the dough. Now, why would I want to do a thing like that? Just don't, that's all. 
Try it and I'll kill you. Let's go. Any calls, Miss Miller? Oh, no calls, Mr. Garrett. I made that checkup you asked for. The only Willie I got to make on is a Willie Sloan, and he's in Alcatraz. Well, so we draw a blank. That makes it tougher. District Attorney's Office. Hello, Miss Miller, the chief there? Oh, yes, he is, Harrington. Hold on. Hello, Harrington. I've been to 16 hardware stores, chief. Where are you now? At the 17th. I'm waiting for a clerk to come back. The manager says the clerk sold some failing wire yesterday. He says he thinks the clerk knows the guy he sold it to. Sounds like a possible lead. Call me back as soon as you find out anything. Yeah, that might be pretty quick. Fella just came in and went behind the counter. Must be the clerk. I'll let you know, Chief. Yes, sir. Can I help you? Oh, how are you? I think maybe you can. Are you Zimmer? Yes, I am. Well, I'm with the district attorney's office. I understand you sold some bailing wire yesterday. Uh, bailing wire? Yeah, that's right. Your boss said he thought maybe you knew the man you sold it to. You're from the DA's office? What's the matter? Somebody pulled something? Do you remember who bought the bailing wire? Hey... A bank robbery this morning. They used bailing wire to tie up the people. You've heard about it on the radio. Uh, who bought the bailing wire, fella? Yeah. What do you know about that? Did you sell the wire? Huh? Uh, yeah, yeah, I sold it. Did you... Did you know the guy you sold it to? Did I know him? Well, what makes you think that? Look, I'm asking the questions. Did you know the man or not? Well, uh, No. No, I don't think I did. You don't think you did? Well, how do I know? People come in here all the time, lots of people. Wouldn't want to accuse anybody Look, of doing something. I'm not something. asking you to accuse anybody of anything. I just want to know if you knew this man you sold the wire to. Sorry, mister, but I couldn't say definitely that I did know. All right. Have you seen him around here at all? You know, at other times. No. Can't say I have seen him around. Well, do you remember what he looked like? Look, I told you. A lot of people come in here to buy things I can't remember all their faces. Okay. I, uh, I might come back and talk to you later. District Attorney's Office. Hello, Miss Miller. Is he there? Oh, just a moment, Harrington. It's for you, Mr. Garrett. Thanks. Hello, Harrington. What did you find out? Uh, I got nothing, Chief. I got a funny hunch this fellow was holding out on me. The clerk? Yeah. He sold bailing wire. He admits that. But he heard about the holdup, and I think he's covering up. He said he didn't know who it was he sold it to. But he acted funny, and, well, I think he was lying. Where are you now? Drugstore, across from a hardware company. Corner of 10th and Trenton. I'll meet you in front of the place as soon as I can get there. Hi, Chief. Well, looks like we missed. What happened? Ah, Clake's gone. Must have ducked out while I was talking to you on the phone. Oh, that's too bad. Well, what do you think we ought to do? Well, hang around. This is our only lead, and somehow we've got to break the case with it. This is David Bryan. Before we continue with Mr. District Attorney in the case of the bank killer, here is an important message I'd like you to hear. And now back to David Bryan, starring as Paul Garrett, Mr. District Attorney. The bank had been robbed, a woman slugged, a bank guard murdered. Indications were that the gunmen were first-timers, and these are often the hardest to catch. We had one important clue, the bailing wire used to tie up the bank workers. But the hardware clerk who sold it to the killer turned out to be an uncooperative witness. We had a hunch he wanted to play along with the crooks. As you'll see, we were right. What 
can I do for you? I'm looking for Patterson. No peddlers here, bud. I'm not a peddler. I'm a friend of his. I'll call him. Patterson! What? Come here! Friend of his, huh? What do you want to talk to him about? What are you, his keeper? This is personal. Don't get tough with me, chum. It'll get you nothing but wealth. What do you want, Willie? Oh, hello, Zimmer. This guy says he's a friend of yours. Yeah, yeah, I know him. Says he's got something personal to talk about. Anything I should know? What do you want, Zimmer? I want to talk to you. Privately. Come on, spell it. I said it's personal. It's okay, Willie. Give us a couple of minutes, huh? Okay. A couple of minutes. Come here, kid. What's on your mind? A fellow come into the store today. Said he was from the district attorney's office. Yeah. Wanted to know about that bailing wire I sold you. What do you want to know about it? Want to know who I sold it to. Did you tell him? No, I didn't tell him. I brushed him off. Good boy. What's it good for? What's this about the DA's office? I thought you was going to let us talk private. Ain't your word good for nothing? Never mind my word. What's this all about? It's okay. You don't have to worry. All I hear is okay, okay. What's okay? Oh, this cop comes into the hardware store to ask about the bailing wire, and Zimmy brushes him off, so it's okay. How come this guy knows about the bailing wire? I bought it from him. You mean you bought that wire from a guy that knew you? Listen, the kid's all right. He brushed off the cop, didn't he? Why, you? What'd you have to do that for? You slop head, I ought to kick your face in. Well, I, uh, I guess I'll be going. Wait a minute, you. Let go of me. You're not going to push me around like that. What'd you come here for? Let him go, Will. He's a pal. He's a creep. Let go of me. I brushed off the cop, didn't I? So you brushed off the cop and you come sucking around here telling us about it. You figure you're going to shake us down for a cut of the dough. I'll show you. Oh, I'll choke you. I'll choke us sneaking inside that. Again. Oh, Billy, the boss is looking this way. You and your pals. You shouldn't have, shouldn't have done that to me. You shouldn't have done it. Take it easy, kid. Take it easy. You're going to be all right. Oh, Willie loses his temper once in a while. That's all. This time he's not going to get away with it. I'm just going to ask you guys for a couple of hundred bucks. No, it's 5,000. You hear that? Will you hear? You hear what you've done? Shut up. You got it pegged for five grand from the start. I ought to... You try that again and I'll let you have it with this tire iron. All right, kid. So we do business. Put down the iron. I'll put it down when I walk out of here. How much do you figure you have to have? I said 5,000. I want 5,000. I want it this afternoon. We're supposed to be working here. We we don't knock off until 4 o'clock. I'll meet you somewhere. And don't get any ideas about getting rid of me. My wife's going to be somewhere close by. Anything goes wrong and she yells for the cops. <laughs> got everything figured, ain't you? That's right. I got everything figured. All right. Meet us at 430. 1034 Maxwell Street. It's in the back, up over the garage. I'll be there. You think anybody followed you here? I know they didn't. Uh, how about where you work? Ain't they gonna wonder why you ducked out? That's my worry. I'll take care of it. I'll see you later. And now you, Patterson. Who's the boss, Willie? I gotta get back to work. That's the guy, Chief. Good. Let's go in and talk to him. Zimmer. Yeah? Oh, it's you. This is the district attorney, Mr. Garrett. I just like to ask you a few questions, Zimmer. I already told this fellow everything I know. I understand you sold some bailing wire the other day. That's right. Your boss seems to think you know the man you sold it to. I'm sorry, but the boss is mistaken. You don't remember the man at all. I already said I don't remember the man. You've got a defiant attitude about this, Zimmer. Why? Who's defiant? Just tired of answering a lot of questions. I don't think you can say we've asked you a lot of questions. You keep asking the same questions over and over. I told your cop here the same thing I'm telling you. I don't know the guy who bought the bailing wire. You have a lot of people coming in here all the time. Half of them I don't even look at. When do you usually take your lunch hours, Emma? What difference does that make? You mind answering the question? All right. I go at 12.30. Well, how long do you usually take? Half an hour. Yeah, it's almost 2 o'clock. You took a pretty long one today, didn't you? 
I had a couple of things I wanted to do. You mind telling us what they were? Yes, I mind. I haven't done anything wrong. I don't see why I have to keep answering your questions. I guess I got my rights, haven't I? You've got your rights, Zimmer. I just hope you have the good sense to keep them. Come on, Harrington. Well, what do you think, Chief? He's too touchy. I'm sure your hunch is right. You stay here in front, Harrington. I'm going around to the alley. I don't want that fellow to get away from us again. It might take quite a while, but we're going to stay with him until something breaks. Is Zimmer coming? No sign of him yet. And what are you doing back up here? Uh, I sure hate to see him get that five grand. I still think we ought to take all the dough and blow town. We ain't blowing town and we ain't giving up any part of the money. What do you mean? Made a couple of phone calls this afternoon. I found out that Zimmer ain't married. He was bluffing when he said he'd have somebody with him when he came up here. So what are you going to do? So when he once gets here, he ain't going to leave. You're going to kill him? He's got it coming, Patterson. Yeah. Yeah, there ain't no honesty in the guy at all. But what do we do with his body? Leave it here. We'll move somewhere else. But I want to be sure he ain't followed by cops. So you get down there and watch. Okay, Willie. Watch it, Harrington. He's slowing down. Yeah. He's going to take that next corner. Stay at least a block behind him. Right. Hang on for the turn. He's slowing down again, Harrington. Watch it. Yeah. Yeah, he's pulling up. We better stop right here. Yeah, this is it, all right. He's getting out. Watch where he goes. Looks like that red house. He's going around the back. All right, Harrington. Well, let's take it easy. You found it all right. Yeah, I found it. Come on in. Yeah, good place for a hideout. This where you're keeping the money? You really want to be in on this thing, don't you? Hey, what's the idea of the knife? Beauty, ain't it? Six-inch blade. Don't move. No, no, wait a second. Who's this cop you talked to? There, 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 were, there were two of them. What all do they say about us? I told you. They just want to know who you are and what you look like. And you told them? no. Why should I tell him when you're going to give me a cut of the money? You told him. No, no. Get that thing away from me. How do I know they didn't follow you here? Look, I had my car parked three blocks from the store. I went out the back, ducked up the alley, cut across the parking lot, and went through the market. I know they didn't follow me. Good. Because now I'm going to do something I've been wanting to do for the last three hours. You get away from me. Get away. You didn't really think we were going to sit still for the shakedown, did you? Wait, wait. Please wait. I'm going to cut you, friend. I'm going to cut you, but good. No. You're gone. Let go of me. Let go. Get him in here. Good punch. How about out there in the street? Anybody around? Don't worry. He wasn't followed. Just a couple of guys selling paint jobs for houses. Try to sell me one. Me. Oh, what's wrong with that? You can afford it. <laughs> Willie, you're a card. A real card. Yeah, he's getting up. Grab his arms. I got him. Listen, you got to let me out of here. I won't say anything. I promise. I'll say you won't say anything. I want to get his throat patterned. Oh, no. Don't move. Any of you. Pops. Watch the gun, Harrington. That's all for you, mister. You too. Drop the knife. Drop it. All right, all right, I quit, I quit. Get your face to the wall. Wait a minute, Zimmer. Where do you think you're going? Oh, home, I got things to do. You're under arrest. What for? I didn't do anything. You'll find out what you did, and it's plenty. Here's your money, Chief. And guess where they had it? Under the bed. Just, just tell me one thing. Are you the two guys who were supposed to be selling paint around here? That's right. Why? It just proves to me why I lost out on this deal. A real slophead for a partner. That's not why you lost out, mister. But you wouldn't believe the real reason. Your kind never does. 
Let's go. This is David Bryan. I hope you enjoy this case from the files of Mr. District Attorney. I'll be back in just a moment after this message from our sponsor. Now, here is the star of Mr. District Attorney, David Bryan, with a word about the program you have just heard. I'm sure you read about this one in your newspapers. The two men we called Willie and Patterson were convicted of bank robbery, assault with intent to kill, and with murder in the first degree. Both will spend the rest of their lives in prison. The hardware store clerk we called Zimmer was tried and sentenced on charges of being an accessory after the fact and attempted extortion. Now, this is David Bryan inviting you to join us when we present our next case based on the facts of crime from the file of Mr. District Attorney. Mr. District Attorney was originated by Phillips H. Lord. Mr. District Attorney, starring David Bryan. Mr. District Attorney, champion of the people, defender of truth, guardian of our fundamental rights to life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. And it shall be my duty as district attorney not only to prosecute to the limit of the law all persons accused of crimes perpetrated within this county, but to defend with equal vigor the rights and privileges of all its citizens. This is David Bryan. In a moment, we'll bring you another case from the files of Mr. District Attorney. But first, a word from our sponsor. And now, here is our star, David Bryan, as Paul Garrett, Mr. District Attorney. A district attorney pays special attention to crimes committed by juveniles, no matter how petty, because the incorrigible minority of the teenagers of today will include the major criminals of tomorrow. There are even a few who don't wait until tomorrow. This case started with a gang fight at night in a public park. Give it to him. Get those three headed for the park. No. He asked for it. High school picnic. I told him this park was closed except for my gang. You're a nice boy from the high school. Look at him run. Are you going to fight? You've got all the sticks and bottles. Get that one, Eddie. Kick his teeth out. Police are coming. All right, guys, get lost. We need to the later. Come on. I hope they get caught. I hope the cops catch them and put them in jail. Shut up. Through the bushes and up the hill path. I don't have to run. I didn't do anything. You're my girl, and if I run, you run. I don't want to be your girl anymore. No, you want to go back to nice little Walter and his nice little picnic. You'll be my girl as long as I want you to. Cut the old path behind the zoo. Go on before leave I... Leave alone. Who's that? Never mind, just leave her alone. Walter. Well, if it ain't Brainy himself, the president of the G.O. I was wondering where you run to, Yellow Belly. I ran to call the police, that's where I ran. Your gang with baseball bats and broken bottles. Oh, that ain't fair, is it? 
Maybe next time we'll bring a platform and have a debate instead. Come on, Julie, I'll take you home. <laughs> on the trolley car? Get wise. She likes automobiles, don't you, honey? I'm going with Walter. Oh, no, you're not. You haven't got your gang with you now, Jackie. Well, isn't the little man getting brave? I don't need the gang for you, Brainy. Now, well, I got this. Walter, it's a knife. Jackie, don't... Look don't... at him, Julie. Look at the big, brave basketball player. Look out, Walter. It's sharp. You might get cut. What's the matter, yellow Kelly? Afraid? Cat got your tongue? Come on, take it away from me. Because if you don't, you know what's going to happen, don't you, Brainy? You dirty father! No! 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 You killed him! You killed him! Shut up! Shut up and get to the car. Run! You're sure the park has been thoroughly searched, huh? Chief, I've even gone over it myself. I've worked with ten different squads in the past five days. There's no sign of the murder weapon. Nothing. Mm, it beats me. None of the high school kids saw it happen. The main fight was down near the park pond. Now, whoever killed Walter Spicer got him off someplace alone up behind the zoo. This will probably be Spicer's parents calling again. Not that I blame them. Almost a week, and that boy's killer is still at large. Yep. Yes, Miss Miller. Is Mr. Hagen here to see you, Mr. Garrett? What about? He doesn't want to tell anyone but you. Oh, you tell him I'm busy. Ask Burton to see him. He says it's very important, Mr. Garrett. All right. Send him in. Well, I guess I've got to get down. No, no. Stay, stay. If he's a crank, you may be able to help me get him out. Right in here, Mr. Hagen. Thank you. Mr. Garrett? He's Mr. Garrett. Oh. My name's Jim Hagen, Mr. Garrett. Well, what can I do for you, Mr. Hagen? It's all right. Mr. Harrington is a member of my staff. Well, it's about my daughter, Julie. I'm afraid she's in some kind of trouble. With the law? I'm not sure. I reckon it must be. Ever since we come here to the city, she's been changing. Staying out late, keeping things to herself. Now, how old is she? Just 16 can't you and your wife exert any authority over her? Oh, my wife said that Julie needed freedom, that it wouldn't hurt her none. She used to bring her friends to the house, and then she stopped. Ruby, uh, that's my wife, said it was because Julie was ashamed of me. Ruby says one look at me and everybody know I used to be a farmer. Mr. Hagen, this seems to be a family problem. I'd like to help you, but... Well, what is it you want me to do? Oh, I thought maybe you might come to the house, talk to Julie. Might scare a little, you being the district attorney. Uh, Mr. Hagen, do you know that your daughter is in trouble, or do you just think so? She's hardly taken a bite of food all week. I've been hearing her crying in her room every night. Then last night... Go ahead. Julie was out late. I was setting up waiting for her to come home... Must have been about uh, one o'clock, I guess, when she come to the front door with a boy. I heard him talking. She's crying. He's twisting her arm or something, hurting her. Telling her to get hold of her nerves and keep her mouth shut. About what? Oh, I don't know. Well, if the boy struck your daughter, you could prefer charges, but she'd have to sign the complaint. Do you know the boy's name? Well, she called him Jackie, that's all. Could you identify him? It was too dark in the hall for me to see him. Julie never brought her friends in. I'd know his voice, though. And you have no idea what it is that he might have been telling her to keep quiet about? No. Well, you just said no sounded like yes. You said this crying had been going on for about a week. When did it start, exactly? I... Uh... No, maybe you're right. Maybe I'd better handle this myself. Hagen? Does your daughter go to Central High School? Yes. Did your daughter know a boy named Walter Spicer? She went out with a boy named Walter before she took up with this Jackie I told you about. She used to go out with Walter Spicer? Yeah. That's why I came here. That's the night she started crying, the night Walter was killed. But she's a girl. She couldn't have had anything to do with it. But she might know who did. It's after three o'clock. School is out. Will your daughter be home? Sometimes she comes, sometimes she don't. 
He'll be home to eat, though, at 6 o'clock. All right, Mr. Hagen. You can go. We'll be at your home tonight at 6 o'clock. Ten o'clock? Where can she be? She's run away from home. That's where she can be. I knew she would. I warned him to quit nagging the girl, Mr. Gatt. She's old enough to take care of herself, and... Well, now she's gone because he brought you here. Your daughter didn't know I was going to be here, Mrs. Hagen. And a 16-year-old girl isn't as self-sufficient as you think. That may be Miss Miller, Chief. Well, may I take it? Go ahead. Hello. Mr. Garrett? Oh, yes, Miss Miller. We finally located Julie Hagen's teacher. The girl wasn't at school at all today. I see. You want me to stay here at the office in case there's anything else? For a while, please. Harrington will give you a lift home later. You could give me a ride to Central Avenue. I could take the bus from there. Well, Harrington goes close to your place, doesn't he? Y- yes, I suppose he does. It'll be fine. Good. We'll see you later. Your daughter never showed up at school today, Mr. Hagen. Where can she be? I told you where. She run away. Did you see her during the day, Mrs. Hagen? Ruby? No, Ruby didn't see her. Ruby was at the beauty parlor all day. She wouldn't know if Julie did come home. I was only at the beauty parlor for two hours. Just two hours. We're not living on a farm anymore. I've been a good mother. It wasn't me who drove her away. Better put out a missing persons report on Harrington. Right, Chief. Do you have a recent photograph of your daughter? In the bedroom. Oh, would you get it, please? We can have telephotos sent to nearby states along with her description. Well, we'll do anything well, well, to He never understood her. Any more than he ever understood me. I'm sure he didn't, Mrs. Hagen. Just want to sit around the house every night. I don't know how I lasted all these years, except for Julie. I was the one who took care of her. I was the one who saw to it that we got away from that dirty old farm so she'd have a chance in life. I wanted her to have all the things I missed. It was all for her. Oh, I'm sure of that, Mrs. Hagen. Uh, Pete, we'll put it on the teletrap right away, Chief. Wants the photo as soon as we can get it to him. Well, I got it right here. We'll take it in. Well, there's not much more we can do tonight. If Julie should come home, or if you hear from her, let me know no matter what time it is. We will, Mr. Garrett. Find her for us, please. Please find her. We'll do all we can. I hope you're satisfied, Jim. I hope you're satisfied now. Oh, Ruby, leave me alone, please. You'd better try to get some rest, Mr. Hagen. I'm sure Mrs. Hagen will take care of herself. Come on, Harrington. Why don't you say it? We was better off back on the farm. Make some excuses. Oh, that poor guy. She's got him in a bad way. I'm not worried about them. I'm worried about the daughter. Let's get this photo in as fast as we can. There's no need for you to drive me all the way home, Harrington. You can drop me off at the subway station. This time of night, Chief would eat me alive. It's out of your way. Oh, oh forget oh, it. Oh, please. The station's just ahead on the corner. Hey, and I... it's just ahead, all right. Look. An ambulance. Yeah. Quite a crowd this time of night. Something must have happened down there. I wonder what it is. It won't take long to find out. A police car there, too. Come on. Hey, get back there. We can't go down. The district attorney's office, officer. Well, let's see your credentials. Yep, yeah, hey, uh, what is it? Girl got killed under the train just to pull into the station. Oh, she fall or jump? Motorman on the train said she was pushed. Pushed? Well, that's what he says. Said he could see her and the boy on the platform as he came out of the tunnel. And the boy shoved her. Well, he was gone by the time the train stopped. All right, take me down there. No, the lady better wait up here. Yeah, I guess he's right, Miss Miller. You better go on back and sit in the car. All right. Down this way. The train was eastbound. It happened right at the beginning of the platform. Ah, wasn't taking any chances on the motorman getting time to slow down and stop. All right, put it back. No identification on her. I know who she is. Wonder why she was pushed. She knew too much about that boy who was murdered in the park last. Well, she isn't going to be able to tell anybody about it now. No, no, she isn't.
This is David Bryan. Before we continue with Mr. District Attorney in the case of the knifing in the park, here is an important message I'd like you to hear. And now back to David Bryan, starring as Paul Garrett, Mr. District Attorney. A high school boy had been stabbed to death in the park after a gang fight. A worried father led us to believe that his daughter might know something of the murder. But the girl died violently under the wheels of a subway train before we could find her and question her. Harrington called me to the subway station. I had no choice but to send for the girl's father. My little girl murdered. Murdered in the city. The city where people hate and kill each other, not like the farm. People live in peace on a farm. Take it easy, Mr. Hagen. How about let me drive you home? Home? Without Julie? Not anymore. There'd be just Ruby and me. Ruby got tired of me a long time ago. Only the girl held us together. She's all I had. Now I got nothing left. Nothing except her picture. Can I get it back? Yes. We had some blown-up copies made. You can get the original at my office at any time. Uh, why don't you give them that copy of the blow-up you got in the envelope, Chief? Oh, yes. Here, Mr. Hagen, I brought it down for identification purposes. I only had this taken three weeks ago at the amusement park. First picture of her in years. Almost like I knew something was going to happen. Three weeks ago? Yeah. Why, Chief? The blouse the girl was wearing tonight looks like the same one she was wearing in the photograph. It is the same one. Mr. Hagen, in the blow-up you have, your daughter's wearing a little pin on her blouse just over the pocket. Oh, yeah. She's been wearing it all the time for a few months. It isn't on the blouse now. No, she stopped wearing it a couple of days ago. I got it. With you? Yeah. May I see the pin? Thank you. What is it, Chief? High school club? No, boys club. See the crest and inscription? Oh, yeah. State Street Target. Got a clubhouse at the foot of State Street near the river. Rented an old store, painted the windows black with a tiger head on them. It was some sort of an organized gang that started that fight in the park. Those State Street kids are tough, Chief. What I want to know is, does one of the members go by the name of Jackie? Yeah. He might have given her the pin. He also might have pushed her off this platform if she saw him kill Walter Spicer. Where is that club? I'll find out if he's there. I want to get my hands on him. The law can handle this, Mr. Hagen. Officer? Yes, Mr. Garrett? You got a prowl car? Yes, sir. Drive this man home. Then go to the county building. My secretary should be back there by now. Yes, sir. Tell her to call Judge Macklin and get a search warrant for the clubhouse of the State Street Tigers. Right. After you get it, pick up a squad and meet Harrington and me at the clubhouse. Yes, sir. Come along, Mr. Hagen. Oh, my girl. Hi, Julie. I'll take my car. It's at the far exit. What's the idea of the clubhouse search, Chief? Well, even if there is a boy named Jackie who belongs to the club, we've got nothing but hearsay evidence against him. Circumstantial. We could never convict him. His fellow members will probably swear he never knew Julie Hagen. That pin could prove he did. No, any member might have given it to her. She might have found it on the street. We've got to prove she knew the Tigers. Find some evidence that she'd been at the club room at one time or another. For a dance, perhaps. Hey, some of those clubs keep a guest book, Chief. No, that's a possibility. If there is such a book, we've got to find it. The club room is on the next corner. You better stop and leave the car here. What time is it? Uh, 1.30. Probably won't be anyone around to disturb us. Yeah. Boy, Judge Macklin will have a fit when Miss Miller gets him out of bed at this hour to sign a warrant. She can handle him. Judge is all right. It's a good thing I gave Miller the ride home. You'd have taken him a different way, and not that she'd have minded what do you mean by that? <laughs> Chief, sometimes you surprise me. What? Oh, here's the place. State Street Tigers. No lights inside. You wouldn't see them anyhow, with the windows painted over like that. Oh, I was looking under the door jamb. Locked. 
Spring lock. Yeah, I could probably pick it with a nail file. Go ahead. The warrant's coming. I'm uh, I'm a little bit out of practice. <laughs> you mean you used to do things like this? Well, <laughs> when I was a kid. Well, my mother was forever forgetting her keys. We were locked out of the house more times than we were in it before I learned this little stuff. Ah, there you are. From now on, I want an alibi from you attached to every burglar report we get. <laughs> come on, come on. You better close it again. Yeah. I'll leave the lock off. You, uh, you got any matches? Yeah. I should have brought a flashlight. There's a floor lamp over there. Yeah, that does it. Well, quite a layout. Furniture, pool table, cue racks, even a telephone on the wall. Yes. Come here. Take a look at this. Hmm? What? On the wall here, by the phone. Names, phone numbers, scribbled in pencil. Yeah. Tigers seem to have a lot of girlfriends. Rusty Denton. Paul Frenchy. Elmwood 41111. Eddie, Marsha call. Fleming, 6589. Mm, no name on this one. Elliot Doe 261. Bread, lettuce, tomatoes. <laughs> Some kid wrote down the grocery list. You know, the things he's here, kiddled... Here, take a look at this one, Harry. Jackie Wilkes. Phone Evergreen 6205. Jackie? Yes. And Evergreen 62050 is Hagen's phone number. Hmm. Give us the kid's last name, too. Oh, what a break. I want a photo of this. We can check the handwriting on every boy in the club and find out who wrote it. He'll have to testify that Jackie Wilkes knew Julie Hagen. Hey, Chief. There's a car just stopped outside. It's too soon for the squad. Kill the light. Anybody in here? Dope's leaving the door unlocked. Hey. Just stand right there, son. Who are you guys? What are you doing in here? We're looking for Jackie Wilkes. Jackie Wilkes? Never heard of him. Well, that's strange. Since his name is written on your clubhouse wall right next to the telephone. Oh, oh, that stuff. That was there before we rented this joint. We've been meaning to paint it over. Oh, is that so? How long has the club been here? A little over a year. You cops or something? Those numbers have been there over a year? Yeah, that's right. That's funny. Because one of those numbers belongs to a girl who has only lived in this city a few months. A girl named Julie Hagen. She was killed tonight, pushed off a subway platform under a train. That's too bad. Mortimer on the train saw it happen. He got a fast look at the boy's face. Maybe just good enough to identify him if he sees him in a police lineup. You just parked the car outside, didn't you? Yeah. How old are you? Eighteen. I got a license. Good, because I want to see it. Sure, you can... What do I have to show it to you for? I didn't do anything. You know why you want it, boy. We want to get a look at your name. Oh. Okay, sure. Take a look at this instead. Put that gun away, kid. You killed a girl tonight. Don't make it any worse. Why would I kill Julie? She was my girl. Because you also killed Wallace Spicer, and Julie saw you do it. And when you thought you couldn't keep her quiet any longer with your threats, you pushed her under a train. It was an accident. She tripped. Did she? What were you doing in a subway when you own a car? Yeah, Jackie, you hear it? Those are police cars. Better give yourself up, boy. Stay back. Gun or no gun, Junior, here I come. No, Harrington. Oh, oh, oh. Harrington. Stay away from him. Do what, he, do what he says, Chief. You tell him, Brainy. I'll take your gun, too. All right, mister. Now you douse that light and stay right in front of me. You're going to lead me out of here with one of these guns right in the middle of your back. <clears throat> do it, Chief. He's, he's killed crazy. You can kill me, Jackie, but you can't kill the law. I won't call them off. One of them will get you. We'll see. Move. You cops out there. Who's that? Jackie Wilkes. And I got one of your big shots with a gun in his back. So listen. Is that you, Mr. Garrett? Yes. Don't let him bluff you. Take him. You try it and the DA is dead. Do what I tell you. Back off across the street. Let me and him get to my car and don't follow us. 
And if you're thinking of shooting, remember, to hit me, you gotta shoot through him. Never mind me. Take him. Mr. Garrett, we can't. He'll be picked up someplace. He's a killer. He'll hurt somebody else even if I get away. He shot Harrington. He's in here, wounded. Wounded, but still alive. What? I can see you against those lights, Jackie, but you can't see me. I'm behind you. I don't have to shoot through anybody but you. Uh, I've got your gun. You should have looked for another one. No! Get down in there! I'll kill all of you! All right, stop! You all right, Mr. Garrett? Yes. Harrington. Here, <laughs> Chief. Grab him, sir. Radio for an ambulance, Don! No, oh, it's, it's not much. Flesh wound on the side. How about the kid? He's dead. How old was he, sir? Eighteen. We had to do what we did, but... A kid? His age stopped mattering when he pulled the trigger. Kid or no kid. He'd have killed you, me, all of us. Yes, sir, I know. You did what you had to do. Thanks, Mr. Garrett. Harrington... When you distracted him with that shot from behind, he had your gun. Why did you start carrying a spare? (laughs) Ooh, I, uh, I didn't, Chief. But you fired a shot. Nope. Well, what was it then? The electric bulb from the floor lamp. I unscrewed it and threw it on the floor. Well, that was clever, Harrington. You heard what he called me, didn't you, Chief? Brainy. (laughs) You just sit still until that ambulance gets here. You'll be all right. I think it's coming now, Mr. Garrett. Yes, it is. This is David Bryan. I hope you enjoy this case from the files of Mr. District Attorney. I'll be back in just a moment after this message from our sponsor. Here's the star of Mr. District Attorney, David Bryan, with a word about the program you have just heard. Death with a gun in his hand was the way Jackie Wilkes chose to avoid trial. The police closed the club room of the State Street Tigers and six of its members who were identified as having taken part in the gang raid on the high school picnic group were given prison sentences ranging up to two years. But life had ended for Julie Hagen, too. Her parents had taken an interest in her friends... Too late. Now, this is David Bryan inviting you to join us when we present our next case based on the facts of crime from the files of Mr. District Attorney. Mr. District Attorney was originated by Phillips H. Lord. Mr. District Attorney, starring David Bryan. Mr. District Attorney, champion of the people, defender of truth, guardian of our fundamental rights to life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. And it shall be my duty as district attorney not only to prosecute to the limit of the law all persons accused of crimes perpetrated within this county, but to defend with equal vigor the rights and privileges of all its citizens. This is David Bryan. In a moment, we'll bring you another case from the files of Mr. District Attorney. 
But first, a word from our sponsor. And now, here is our star, David Bryan, as Paul Garrett, Mr. District Attorney. A district attorney and a watchmaker have one thing in common. They both know the value of accurate time. The ability to fix the exact time a crime has been committed can lead to the conviction of a guilty man or the saving of an innocent one. The time element became very important in this case. It started late on a Saturday night in a roadside diner near a railroad crossing on the south side of town. Hi, Charlie. Oh, it's you. That's a happy greeting for your favorite brother-in-law. Stop clowning, Jack. You're not my favorite anything, and you know it. How's the fight going? Rough. Could go either way. I got pins in front by one round. What round is this? Seven. Dinah sends you down for something? No, it's something I want to see you about, Charlie. Mind if I turn this down a little? What is this, Jack? Another touch? Because if it is, you're wasting your time. It's Saturday night. I got a date. I need five bucks. Try working. That might be a way to get it. Why don't you ask your sister? Ah, don't kid me, Charlie. You know why. She wouldn't give it to me. You told her not to. I told her to use her own judgment, Jack. Turning my own sister against me. She happens to be my wife. And I'd like to see her get herself a decent dress instead of shelling out fives and tens to you. No. All right, then. Maybe I'll just help myself from the register. I wouldn't touch that if I were you, Jack. You just stay on that stool and count your hamburger patties, brother-in-law. Jack! Don't get any crazier than you are. Put that gun back under the counter. Put it back and get out of here or I'll call the cops. Do I get the door, don't I? No! Too bad. Why, you... That's the way you wanted it, cheapskate. Good morning, Miss Millen. Harrington. Morning, uh, Hello, Jack. Chief. Have a nice weekend? Very nice, until I saw the Monday morning newspapers on my desk. Why didn't you send me a wire when this diner murder was discovered? I just thought you needed the rest, that's all. And yesterday was Sunday, and... I don't like to give a murder a 24-hour start, Miss Millen. I'm sorry, Mr. Garrett. It won't happen again. Uh, besides, Chief, he didn't get a 24-hour start. He didn't even get 24 minutes. Prowl car saw him running out of the diner and nailed him on the spot. That's why I didn't feel you had to be bothered right away, Mr. Garrett. I'm sorry if I spoke sharply, Miss Miller. And Rick and Clake have been getting us reports on the suspect. We don't have much here, just these two cards. But uh, here's a batch of stuff from the other states. Walter Bailey, age 40, no visible means. Most of these are arrests for vagrancy. Yeah. Bailey's a hobo. Rode into town on a 1045 freight from the west Saturday night. Arrested for robbery and murder a half hour later. Where is he now? Interrogation room. Had him brought over cheap and thought you might want to talk to him. I do. When they get a complete make on him, Miss Miller, take it up to my office, will you? Yes, sir. Oh, and cheer up. I did need the rest. Fishing yesterday was a lot of fun. Thanks. Yes, sir. <laughs> Bailey had the murder weapon on him when the prowl team caught him? No. No, he didn't, Chief. He left it on the floor of the diner when he ran out. It wasn't his gun to begin with. Huh? It belonged to the diner. The owner said his night man kept it under the counter. It was the night man who was killed, wasn't it? Uh, yeah, yeah. Charlie Porter. Bailey's in here. We can handle this, Kerrigan. Wait outside until it's time to take him back. Walter Bailey? That's right. My name's Paul Garrett. I'm the district attorney. Cheers. Don't get fresh, Buster. What'd you expect, singing and dancing? What are you trying to hang on me? What reason would I have for killing a guy I never saw before in my whole life? Robbery seems to be the reason, Bailey. The cash register in the diner had been emptied. Not by me. They didn't have a nickel on me when the cops caught me. No. They chased you halfway across the railroad yard before they did catch you. You got plenty of time to throw the money away. Get the whole thing in a nice big frame, ain't you? 
Bailey, it isn't the money so much. The big thing is that you ran. Why? Want me to draw you a picture? I know my story doesn't sound good, but it's true. I rode a hotshot freight into the yards at 1045. Fifteen minutes later, I walked into a diner, found a guy murdered. I got scared. I ran. That's all there is to it. I'm going to be a pigeon for you, mister. I can't even hire a lawyer. The court will provide you with counsel without charge, Bailey. It's your constitutional right. <laughs> constitutional right? You mean a bum's got rights? I've been rostered on vagrancy charges in every state from Maine to Sunny Cal. You expect me to think I got a chance? I'll let you answer that question for yourself, Bailey. Meaning what? Meaning that you have a certain positive knowledge that I don't have. I don't know whether or not you killed that man in the diner. But you do know. Come on, Harrington. Take him back, Harrington. Uh, pretty weak story, wasn't it, Chief? Except for one point. Hmm? What? If Bailey did kill Charlie Porter, why didn't he keep the gun when he ran? If he'd already killed one man, he could have gotten into a gunfight with the police, too. He had nothing to lose by more killing... And he might have gotten away. Mm, yeah. <laughs> you punched the down button, Chief. Yeah, no. Aren't you going back up the office? No, down to the garage. We're going to take a ride out and have a look at that diner. Basement, please. Touched inside? No. Nope. Except for removing the body. Here, let me open the padlock. What's that white circle on the floor? That's where we found the gun. The marks at the end of the counter show where Porter's feet were sticking out when the body was found. And the rest of his body behind the counter. The lab figures Charlie Porter was sitting on that stool. Slid off when the slugs hit him. There were a couple of broken dishes there. Must have grabbed at the bottom part of the counter when he fell. How about ballistics? Mm, shots were fired a distance of about uh, eight feet by the register there. The owner says the gun was kept right here, under the counter behind the radio. Behind the radio? Yeah, there's no light under the counter. Not when the set's on. Here, let me show you. No back plate on the set. Tubes lighted up under there. I see. Is the radio playing when the police found the body? Yeah. What are you thinking, Chief? That stool. Why would Porter be sitting here without moving while somebody came around behind the counter to the cash register? Unless it happened to be somebody he knew. Bailey might have been behind the counter working on a meal. No, that's probably it. What's this? What? Pencil and scrap of writing paper on the counter. No, that was there. Something Porter was writing, I guess. Two rows of small squares numbered, one to ten at the top. The letter C in front of one row and the letter P in the other. Numbers in all the squares up to six. He must have been figuring something out. Yes, but what? Certainly not a bill. Who knows? Some kind of puzzle, maybe. Well, whatever it was, he must have been working at it when he was killed. Let's... Hey! What are you people doing in here? District attorney's office and don't come in. Oh, I'm sorry. I knew the joint was closed and I saw a car outside and you guys nosing around in here. Man, you got kind of a long nose yourself. Wait out there. Seen enough, Chief? Yes. A railroad crossing. I see you guys. I figure you might be breaking in. Is that your crossing right over there, about 150 feet? Breaking in. Is that your crossing right over there, about 150 feet? Yeah, a little shack. Are you on duty Saturday night? Sure, I work a 12-hour shift, noon to midnight. Doing what? Opening and closing the crossing gate whenever a train comes. You ever eat here, in the diner? Nah, just coffee. Come over every night to get hot coffee in my toilet, I said so. You do it Saturday night? Yeah. What time? Oh. 
tent tidy, same as always. How long did you stay? Just long enough to get the timers filled. Had to get back to the cross and to lower the gate for that freight that pulls into the yards at 1045. She passes the shack at 1043. Only one comes in on Saturday night. That's the train Bailey rode in on, Chief. I know. Did you hear a shot Saturday night between the time you left here to go back to your shack and say 11 o'clock? No. You're certain of that? With only one train going through, it must have been a quiet night. It was, but I didn't hear anything, except when the cops started to chase that guy, that uh, hobo. What caliber was the murder weapon, Harrington? Forty-five. Well, that makes a lot of noise. You should have heard the report. Unless it was covered by another noise. Like what? A freight train going through at that crossing. But Bailey was on that train. If your figuring is right, he couldn't have killed Porter. You've got to find out exactly what time Porter was killed. Coroner couldn't measure it that close. Yeah, I know. Uh, I'd better be getting back to the crossing. Okay if I go? Yes. Oh, just a minute. Yeah? Those gloves you're wearing, you wear them all the time? Everybody around the railroad wears gloves, mister, even off duty. That's all. Thank you. Why'd you ask him that for, Chief? Because up until now, Bailey's story was hard to believe when only his prints and porters were on the gun. What makes it easier to believe now? You heard what the gentleman said, Harrington. All railroad men wear gloves. This is David Bryan. Before we continue with Mr. District Attorney in the case of the hungry hobo, here's an important message I'd like you to hear. And now back to David Bryan, starring as Paul Garrett, Mr. District Attorney. The night counterman at a diner had been murdered, and all the available evidence pointed to a hobo. To convict or acquit him hinged upon establishing the exact time of death. For two days, Harrington and I tried to fight the clock with no results. Then I went to call on the dead man's widow. Yeah? Is this the porter's apartment? Yeah. If you want to call this dump an apartment, this is it. Well, I'd like to see Mrs. Porter. She ain't back from the funeral yet. Hey, you must be the lawyer I called. Come in. I'm afraid there must be some mistake. No, no, it's no mistake. I left the name when I called. You are a lawyer, ain't you? Yes, I'm a lawyer. Ah, good, good. Sit down. There's a comfortable chair over there. When do you expect Mrs. Porter back? I don't know, soon. She's all busted up. You know, about her husband. Oh, that's not surprising. Yeah, with a man, it's different. You know, you ball once and you're over it. Are you a friend of the family or a relative? I'm Jack Hausman. Nina Porter is my sister. Charlie was my brother-in-law. Didn't your secretary tell you about my call? Mm, Not very much, I'm afraid. Oh, well, you're here now. That's what counts. Let's get on to business. Things are going to be pretty tough on my sister. You know what I mean? She ain't going to like it when she finds out I sent for you, but... It's all for her own good. There must be some kind of a suit you can file against the guy that owns the diner or somebody. Charlie got killed working there, didn't he? It ought to be worth something. You want to sue somebody for your brother-in-law's murder? Why not? Look, I know the tramp killed him ain't got beans, but a Greek guy owns the diner. He's loaded. Why shouldn't he pay off? Do you realize your sister's husband has been murdered? Is money all you can think about? He was my brother-in-law, wasn't he? We got to write to something. What's more important to you, profiting by his death or finding out who killed him? The cops got the guy that killed him. I'm not sure of that. I'm getting less sure every minute. You ain't the lawyer I sent for. I don't think any lawyer would come near you with a ten-foot pole. Hey, what kind of a game are you playing? You asked me if I was an attorney. I am. I'm the district attorney. The DA? Uh... I was just trying to help my sister. Any law against that? No. You're supposed to be prosecuting a killer, not coming around bothering the family and its grief. What grief? You can't wait to get the... What's the matter here, Jack? Mrs. Porter? 
Yes. I'm Paul Garrett, the district attorney. Yeah, he comes waltzing in here trying to tell me that tramp didn't kill Charlie after all. That's not true. I don't know whether he did or not. That's what I'm trying to find out. I... What do you want to see me about? You don't have to help him protect some bum. Jack! What do you want to know, Mr. Garrett? Did your husband have any friends who stopped at the diner regularly? Men from the railroad? All the men at the yards were Charlie's friends. A lot of them came to the funeral. They sent a big wreath. In the diner, do you know if your husband ever let any one of them come behind the counter? Get their own food, maybe. Anything like that? I don't know. Jack my Jack used to work in the yards. Did your brother-in-law permit that? How should I know? I haven't worked in the yards in six months. Where do you work now? I've been out of a job. Is there a law against that, too? You didn't try to work. What do you mean, I didn't try? You know what I mean. You left everything to Charlie and me. Live in office, borrowing... You're my sister. I was his wife. You're old enough to take care of yourself, Jack. You're a grown man. Get out. Get your things and get out. Oh, before you go, one question. Where were you when your brother-in-law was killed? I ought to clip you one for asking me that, but I won't. I'll tell you where I was. I was with my girlfriend from 8 o'clock until midnight. Her name's Helen Campbell, and she lives at 27 Denton Street. Any other questions? Good. <laughs> well, before I go, shall I ask one of the neighbors to come in and stay with you? No, I, I'd rather be alone. Tomorrow would have been our second anniversary. Charlie used to take Saturday nights off. Before we had Jack to take care of. He used to take me to the arena for the fights. He loved them so. I never cared much for him, but I never told him. I wanted to be with him. I wanted to be a good wife to him. I tried to be. I'm sure you are a wonderful wife, Mrs. Porter. Please leave me alone. Of course. Chief. Harrington, what are you doing here? Huh? Waiting for you. I had a squad of 20 men, including the two who arrested Bailey, come in the railroad yards for that money from the cash register. If he threw it away, we didn't find it. I don't think he ever had it. You learned something up there? A couple of things. The main one is that Charlie Porter was an ardent fight fan. Hmm. How does that help? I'll tell you later after you get a rundown on somebody for me. Oh, who? A woman named Helen Campbell... Check the neighborhood around 27 Denton Street. Get back to the office with the report as soon as you can. Right. Lab men just brought in the radio from the diner, Mr. Garrett. Good. Did you get the dial setting? Yes, it was set to the station the Daily Bulletin owns. Well, call the Bulletin, then. See if they carried a fight broadcast and find out exactly what time it started. Yes, sir. I'll call from my office. Oh, sorry, Miss Miller. I didn't didn't see you coming out. It's all right. Mr. Garrett's been waiting for you. Come in, Harrington. What about the Campbell woman? Anything? Uh, nothing pleasant. Broke, out of work. Seems to be a chronic condition. Reputation isn't too good. Oh, that doesn't surprise me, judging by the company she keeps. She seemed to have any money lately? Yeah, and all of a sudden. She was behind the rent and paid it up Monday morning. Yesterday. Paid off a candy store for newspapers and smoke she's been coughing. And a couple of hours ago, she paid $5 on account at the Italian grocery store down the block from her apartment when the owner dunned her for part of the bill she'd been running. Yeah, I wonder where she got it. I've got a fair idea. Oh, where? From somebody who knew Charlie Porter had a gun under the counter in the diner. His brother-in-law. His, his brother-in-law. Here's the information you wanted, Mr. Garrett. Station carried a fight broadcast Saturday night, just the main event between Kid Peens and Tiger Corey. What's that for? That slip of paper, numbered from one to ten, that we found on the counter of the diner. Yeah. Hey, Porter must have been listening to the fight and scoring it. That's what the P and C stood for. 
Pins and Corey, ten rounds. What time did the fight start? Went out at 10, 15 sharp. Did it go the full ten rounds? Yes, sir. Porter scored six rounds. That's three minutes a round with one minute rest periods in between. Twenty-four minutes. That brings us up to... 10.39 p.m. He didn't score the seventh, so he was probably killed during it or just after it. That's four minutes more, 10.43, just as the train was passing the crossing into the yards. With Bailey on it. I knew that was why that crossing guard didn't hear the shot. You find out the crossing guard's name? Yeah, Tom Wells. You got a five dollar bill on you? Yeah, yeah, sure. Hit. Write the name Tom Wells on the margin. What's the gimmick? We're going to try and outsmart Jack Houseman's girl. I'm going to tell her that one of the bills stolen from the diner was marked. That a customer who had been in just before the murder remembered changing a bill he'd written his name on. Some people do that, you know, to see if they ever get the bill back again. Okay, Chief. Yeah, there it is. Thanks. Let's go. Look, I got dishes to do in this joint to clean up. What do you come in asking me crazy questions for? How am I supposed to remember one $5 bill from another? The Italian grocer up the street claims you gave him this one as part payment on a bill, Miss Campbell. So then I gave it to him. What's this all about? I'll tell you what it's all about, miss. That $5 bill was stolen from the diner when Charlie Porter was killed. How could you know anything like that? We know because the bill is marked with a name. A customer gave it to Porter just a few minutes before the killing. Spending that bill makes you a candidate for a murder trial. It isn't my money. I didn't know. Jack Hausman gave it to me. He'll kill me for telling you. Where is he? Here. When you rang the bell, he, he went in there, the bathroom. He must have heard us. Locked. Open up, Hausman. Better break it. All right. Uh, uh, gone. Out the window. He wanted me to swear he was with me. There he is, going over the fence at the back of the alley. Stop, Houseman! Give me a, give me a boost when we hit the fence. He may be armed. Uh, up, uh, Pull me up. Yeah, right. Uh, there, behind that old washing machine. Back off! Don't come for me! Give up, Buster! You had your chance! Stop! How bad is it? He threw the head. He's dead. I have to call a wagon to take him away. Yeah. <laughs> uh, we can go out that way. The gate from the fence. Oh, uh, watch out for those broken bed springs, Chief. Might tell you close. Yeah, I see them. What kind of a place is this, anyhow? Sign on the fence. It's junkyard. Appropriate place for a man like him to end. Yeah. I, uh... I still don't know how come he didn't leave fingerprints on Porter's gun. He used to work on the railroad. I think he knew what he was going to do when he went into the diner. Probably wore gloves. Oh. Uh, you know, there's only one thing that bothers me, Chief. No? That bill I wrote the name on. What about it? You still got it. Ain't I going to get it back? <laughs> sure, Harrington. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> This is David Bryan. I hope you enjoy this case from the files of Mr. District Attorney. I'll be back in just a moment after this message from our sponsor. Now, here's the star of Mr. District Attorney, David Bryan, with a word about the program you have just heard. Walter Bailey, the hobo who was almost convicted on circumstantial evidence, was found to be an amnesia victim. He was sent to a hospital, recovered, and reunited with his family, which he hadn't seen in nine years. He was also restored to a successful business. Jack Houseman's girlfriend, Helen Campbell, is serving a penitentiary sentence as an accessory after the fact. Now, this is David Bryan inviting you to join us when we present our next case based on the facts of crime from the file of Mr. District Attorney. Mr. District Attorney was originated by Phillips H. Lord.
Mr. District Attorney, starring David Bryan. Mr. District Attorney, champion of the people, defender of truth, guardian of our fundamental rights to life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. And it shall be my duty as district attorney not only to prosecute to the limit of the law all persons accused of crimes perpetrated within this county, but to defend with equal vigor the rights and privileges of all its citizens. This is David Bryan. In a moment, we'll bring you another case from the files of Mr. District Attorney. But first, a word from our sponsor. And now, here is our star, David Bryan, as Paul Garrett, Mr. District Attorney. A district attorney listens to all kinds of statements in the course of a day. Some are confessions from people who want to pay their debt to society and make a fresh start. But even a confession can be an attempt to outsmart the law. This case began more than 500 miles from my county in another state. How you know, Pete, the old dame didn't give you a phony combination? Oh, she wouldn't do that, would you, Grandma? Because the wrong combination would mean bruises. Wouldn't it, Grandma? Maybe we'd better take the gag off and let her open it for us. She wrote down the combination, didn't she? She couldn't talk it any better than she could write it. Now, keep quiet a minute. Oh, this tip better be good, Pete. It's good. Nice old lady, afraid of the bad, bad bank. Keeps all the jewels and money nice and safe at home. It's open. <laughs> Look at this. What rocks in the dough. 20, 50 C-notes. Ah, must be 15, 20 grand there. Shove it in the briefcase. Hey, what about her? We just can't leave her like she is. No, because if somebody took that gag off, she could talk. Only one way to stop that. Why didn't you muffle that with a pillar? People, I'll take it to backfire. Come on, let's get going. Car okay? Sure, there it is. Hey, Pete, the other way, somebody running. A cop. You go ahead, get the car started. Okay. Stay where you are, copper. They're gone. Take the corner. You crazy? I made him duck into a doorway, didn't I? Suppose the car hadn't started right away. You were right under that street light without a hat. Why didn't you leave your picture? I'll be 500 miles from here by morning. He wasn't close enough to get our license number. He might have been close enough to see what state we're from. If he asked for mugshots, you got a record. He might just identify you. Then he'll be making a mistake. You taught me a trick when we were in the pen together. Remember, Boland? Never risk ten years of the electric chair when you can get away for six months. And that little hall's worth six months, ain't it? Yeah. It'll work for me when I pull that armored car sticker. Yeah. And it'll work for me. It'll work just fine. What time is it? Uh, 12.20. When we get home, we'll get the newspapers. See if our DA has any little crimes kicking around unsolved. Anything nice and simple committed around uh, midnight tonight. <laughs> We might save Mr. Garrett a lot of work. <laughs> Hello, Miss Miller. Oh, Mr. Garrett. How did it go? <laughs> I wish I knew. You know how I feel about speaking at luncheons. I hate... Oh, this gentleman has been waiting for you since 11 o'clock. I told him you'd be back late. Oh, yeah. I'm, I'm sorry. I know you, don't I? Yes, sir. I'm afraid you do. My name's Pete Grable. Oh, yes. I remember. Burglary, wasn't it? Yes, sir. Three years ago. I did six months. And what can I do for you, Pete? Well, I'm in trouble again, Mr. Garrett. Come into my office. Thanks. Oh, no calls for a while, please, Miss Miller. Unless they're urgent. Yes, sir. Switch the routine stuff to Burton. Oh, and ask Harrington to come up when he's finished at the lab. All right, Mr. Garrett. 
Sit down, Pete. Thanks. Tell me about it. Well, I... I don't know where to begin. Uh, after I did time on that rap, well, I wanted to straighten myself out. I tried. I got a job, even went to night school. I, I guess I wasn't very good at working, though. I got fired. I've been bumming around for a few months, broke. Uh, well, I, I guess I'd better give it to you straight. The night before last, about 11.30, I guess, I was out walking... I passed this hardware store, and... The hardware store on Southern Boulevard and Finch Street? Yes, sir. I guess you know what comes next. I went around the back, broke in. There was $94.62 in the cash register, and I took it. Why, Pete? Why after doing time before? I don't know. I've been asking myself the same question all day, yesterday and the day. The heat must have got me or something. I was crazy. You still have the money? No. I played big shot and spent it. Well, I'm glad you walked in here by yourself, Pete. You were playing it tough the last time when we had to catch you and bring you in. Well, you can hang it on me good this time, Mr. Garrett. I had a chance and I blew it. I'll deserve everything I get. Well, what you'll get will be up to the judge, Pete. The fact that you came in here is going to weigh in your favor. If I recommend a short sentence in probation... Will you promise me to work out the money you stole? Make restitution? Oh, Mr. Garrett, I'd do anything for a break like that. I'll pay back every dime. All right. Miss Miller? Yes, sir. Come in, please. Bring your book. I want you to take a statement. Yes, sir. Oh, uh, Harrington said he'd be here in a couple of minutes. Good. Take this. Head it with the date and location. Statement of Peter Grable, re the burglary of the Amalgamated Hardware Company at 1154 Southern Boulevard, this city. I'll fill in the date. Date before yesterday. Between 11 and 11.30 p.m. Got it? Yes, sir. Now, Pete, do you make the statement you're about to make with the full understanding that it will be used against you as evidence? I do. Do you do so of your own free will without coercion or other undue influence of force? I do. All right, Pete. Tell us in your own words just what happened. Well, at uh, 11.30 Thursday night, night before last, I was... Oh, Chief, I... Uh... Oh. oh, excuse me. I, I didn't know you had anybody in here. It's all right, Harrington. Come in. And this is Pete Grable. Yeah, I remember him. Sit down. He's given us a voluntary confession on the amalgamated hardware burglary. <laughs> Go ahead, Pete. Oh, uh, well, where was I, you know? At 11.30 Thursday night, night before last, oh, I was... Oh, yeah. Um, I was walking past the store. I went into the alley, leading around to the back. I jimmied my way in. I stole $94.62 from the cash register. I spent it, and I can't give it back. That's all. Are you prepared to sign this statement after it's typed? Yes, sir. Good. All right, Miss Miller. Type it up. Have Kincaid take him over to the county jail. You'll have to be held, Pete, until bail is set. It won't be too long. I'll have you arraigned Monday morning. Thank you. Hey, just a minute, Pete. Don't you think I'd better go out there with him, Chief, until Kincaid comes up? Oh, I don't think that'll be necessary, Harrington. He came in voluntarily. You're not going to run, are you, Pete? No, sir. Go ahead. What about those parking lot robberies? You got anything? Nope, not yet. Stuff the lad had is no good. No, keep on it. Then I want you to ballparks, bowling alleys, fight stadiums, any place night parking is heavy. Yeah. Uh, Chief, um... Yeah? You know, I like to see a guy get a break if he rates it. But this Pete Grable, he was a tough monkey. We got nothing at all on that amalgamated hardware job, but all of a sudden he walks in here like a lamb. Bothers me. I know. Been bothering me, too. I thought you were sold on him. He wants me to be sold on him. Let him walk around a while until we see what he's got on his mind. While he's walking, he's got a chance to run. He's also got a chance to trip. Yeah, see what you mean. Uh, you want me to check on him? Home, family? No, not until he's arraigned and makes bail. Why wait until then? Because then it could be a friendly visit to oh, somebody we're sold on. Let's see if that confession is ready yet. I assume we'll be ready, Miss Miller. Just a few more lines. Well, you take it over to the jail and have him sign it, Harrington. And be friendly. Uh, 
No, Peter hasn't been home yet. I cooked dinner for him and I had to throw it all out. Even had to borrow the money to make it for him. And your son's bail was $500, Mrs. Grable. Where did you borrow that? $500. Now, where would I ever get my hands on that much money? Uh, you mean you didn't put up the money? You're not the one who sprung him? I didn't even know where he was until I got a note from him saying he'd be let out this morning for me to bring him a razor and his best suit of clothes. I see. Do you know who did arrange for his release? Was it his father or your husband? His father's been dead since Peter was 15 years old. You don't know where Peter is now? He didn't come home at all after he was released this morning? No. I waited for him outside the prison. But he said he had to go someplace. He'd see me later. So I got on the trolley car and came to see that there'd be a good meal on the table for him. The probation officer will be checking on him before he's sentenced, Mrs. Grable. It's after 10 p.m. If he's keeping late hours, it won't help him. I tried to get him to come home with me. Maybe if we can find him and bring him home for you, if you can give us some idea of where he hangs out. Perhaps the name and addresses of some of his friends. He never tells me about his friends. But you know, there's a place he must go to a lot. I'm, I'm always finding these matchbooks in his clothes. Uh, Boland's Bonanza, it says on them. Uh, with a picture of a man and a woman dancing, you see? Name ring a bell with you, Harrington? Yeah. Yeah, it's a dance hall out the south side. No, I'm not familiar with him. And you'd be familiar with the owner if you saw him. Boland? Ray Boland. You set him up twice for lust. Well, how did an ex-con get a permit to run a dance hall? We never had him on a felony. Oh, I remember now. Petty larceny both times. Misdemeanor convictions wouldn't stop him from getting a dance hall license. You remember when it was we last sent him away? Yeah, uh, two, uh, uh no, no, uh, three years ago. He pulled six months. Oh, that means he and Peter Grable were in prison at the same time. They might even have been cellmates. Yeah, but what's that got to do with this case? Just a small detail from Boland's last conviction that you may have forgotten. Hmm? What? He also walked into my office and confessed. Oh, and now Grable pulls the same stunt. Why? They can't like prison. Maybe they like it better than something else. What? That's what we're going to find out. This is David Bryan. Before we continue with Mr. District Attorney in the case of the man who confessed, here is an important message from my sponsor. And now, here is our star, David Bryan, as Paul Garrett, Mr. District Attorney. A man had walked into my office and confessed to a crime of burglary involving less than $100. His family had no money, but somebody posted $500 bail for him. He was certain to go to jail, but he seemed happy about it. It didn't add up. Harrington and I headed for Boland's Bonanza, a dance hall on the south side. I ought to have two bands, Boland, like the uptown joints. Continuous dancing. People don't like to sit around. Do they, Dolly? Look, when you wake diamond dance joints like I have, you're happy to hear the horn stop. <laughs> you see, Pete? Besides, it's a warm night. Give the concessions a chance to do a little business. I make money there, too, you know. <laughs> yeah, and if this don't work, there are other ways, huh? <laughs> you ought to know, boy. Hey, uh, you didn't tell me how'd it go with the D.A.? A breeze. You should have seen it. <laughs> hey, bring it up. Keep quiet. What's the matter, honey? Those two guys coming across the floor. Garrett, the DA, and that shadow of his, Harrington. Don't move now. They've seen us. It'll look funny if you go. Good evening, Pete. Oh, hello, Mr. Garrett. Mr. Harrington. Uh, I'd like you both to meet uh, Miss Dolly Weeks. Miss Weeks. Miss Weeks. How do you do? And uh, this is Ray Boland. He owns the place. I believe we've met Mr. Boland before. So fast. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> I'm glad you're meeting at my place this time. Instead of yours. Oh, a band's been off the stand too long. Customers getting restless. I'd better go outside and hurt them in. <laughs> nice to see you gentlemen again. Bye. Hello. 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 Uh, yeah, you better go looking for your date, Dolly. 
or he'll think you got lost. Huh? Oh, oh yeah. Um, excuse me, please. Don't you think you should be leaving too, Pete? Yeah, yeah. I, uh, I, I didn't realize it was so late. Uh, good night. Night. Oh, Pete, uh, just a minute. Yeah, Mr. Harrington? Uh, how did you jimmy your way into the hardware store? Through a back door or a window? Uh, what difference does it make? Well, it might make a difference in court. Nothing can make any difference in court, Mr. Garrett. I ain't fighting the case. You got my confession. Yeah. Yeah, I guess you're right. Skip it. Oh. Night. We can get to the parking lot to the back door. Okay. What was that question all about, Harrington? About whether he jimmied a door or a window? Oh, just something I remembered. The bagel again entry by cutting out a ventilator screen with wire clippers. For a man who says he robbed a store, he doesn't seem to know too much about the details, does he? You ask me, he never saw the inside of that hardware store. His confession is a phony. I know that. But why? Oh, a psycho. We get him every day, don't we? Trying to make people think they're tough, or big shots. Or... He's no psycho, Harrington. At least not that kind. There's another reason... There was another reason when Boland did it three years ago, too. He had all the... Hey, Chief, look. Yes, Miss Weeks. The girl we just saw with Pete. Yeah, that's quite a car she's got. About 5,000 bucks on wheels. Yes, and she's no society debutante. Come on. You want to follow her? Yes. Turn right, going out. Yeah, I saw her. There. Park just past the entrance to the dance hall. I'm just driving past her. Don't stop until you get to the end of the street. Dark area under those trees is all right. Okay. What's she waiting there for? See for yourself. Hmm, sure. Little Petey boy. Should I tag them when they go past? No, I'll just get the license number. Get it? Yep. I had jot it down. Ah, now what? Take me home. We've got a lot of work to do tomorrow. Yes, Miss Miller? Harrington's on extension one, sir. Okay, put him on. Hello, Harrington. Hello, Chief. I got a rundown on that registration. Now, who owns the car? It belongs to the Dolly Weeks dame, all right. She bought it last Saturday. Forty-six hundred and fifty-two bucks cash. Does she have a record? No, but she doesn't have any way of earning that kind of money either. I just got all the reports from the burglary detail on that job at Amalgamated. You were right about the burglar gaining entry through the ventilator screen. There's something else that doesn't fit, too. Well, what? Pete confessed to stealing $94.62. Yeah? Store owner's statement lists the amount stolen at $84.62. That's funny. I've got an idea about it. I'll have it worked out by the time you get up here. I'll be there in a minute. Wait a minute. No, no. Before you come up, pull the record view of files on both Bolin and Pete. Everything we've got on them. Bring them with you. Okay, Chief. Be up as fast as I can. Good. Miss Miller? Yes, sir. You get those back issues of the newspapers from last Friday? Yes, sir. I just finished going through them, but there's only one small item on the amalgamated hardware burglary. Well, bring it in. It was on page nine of the post transcript, Miss Garrett. It's only one paragraph. Well, let me see. Burglar broke in through the rear of the store. Go to the cash register of $94.62. Now, that's it, all right. That's what? Well, that's where Pete Grable got his information and his confession. Only the information happens to be wrong. Get Harrington again in the record room. Tell him to wait for me there. I'm on my way down. Yes, sir. All right. Keep your shirt on. 
Who is it? It's Pete. Let me in quick. I tried to phone you. I was busy. I take it out the hook when I'm sleeping. What's the idea of getting me up so early? I think we're getting hot, that's why. Did you goof up on something? It's that gumshoe Harrington from the DA's office. He's been checking on Dolly. Well, what's that to get an uproar about? They saw you to get her, that's all. Well, they... They saw the car, too. What car? I gave Dolly Doe to buy a new car. With hot money less than a week after a killing? Oh, I thought it'd be safe in her name. You're... Goodbye, Pete. What do you mean, Bowen? I mean goodbye. I'm taking myself a vacation to South America. From now on, I don't know you. Goodbye, Pete. I ought to... You be... pull that gun on me and you'll really be cooked. And you got a chance. Be smart. Take it. That's the only reason I'm leaving you alive. District Attorney's Office. Miss Miller, this is Mr. Garrett calling from the record room. I want you to get some more newspapers for me. Yes, sir. Which ones? Out-of-town papers from all surrounding states. Last Friday and Saturday editions. Get the whole staff together and comb them page by page. I want a list of all major crimes committed in those cities last Thursday night. And I want it within an hour. Yes, sir, Mr. Garrett. I'll get right on it. What's the idea of that, Chief? What are you after? I'll tell you what I'm after. Look at this record on Bolin. His confession about stealing a car radio? Yes, a car radio. He does six months in jail for taking something worth less than $50. Then two weeks after his release, he buys a dance hall for $20,000, spends another ten decorating. Oh? What are you driving at? Now, look at this FBI teletype. Received by us while Bolin was doing time. Uh, request all available information, Ray Bolin, York County. Mugshot selected as possible suspect, armored car robbery, state capital. Night of October 3rd to last. October 3rd. Hey, that's the same night he confessed to stealing the car radio. Sure. And the record bureau wired back that he was serving time for an offense committed at the same time, the same night, more than 200 miles away. We provided him with an alibi. And now Grable is afraid he was seen on some job and he's pulling the same stuff. Only this time it isn't going to work. Have a squad pick up Dolly Weeks for questioning. Then get up to the office and let's help with those newspapers. Mr. Garrett and Mr. Harrington. Your son home, Mrs. Grable? Oh, why, yes, he came home this morning. Says he's going to stay. I can watch over him now and he'll give you no more trouble. He's really not a bad one, you know. Must have been the company he was keeping. We'd like to see him, Mrs. Grable. Well, he's in his room, our car. Uh, we'll see him in there if you don't mind. Which room is it? The second door. Mr. Garrett, Harrington. I, I was just getting dressed to come and see you. Or are you, Pete? Yeah. I guess I, I guess I was confused the day I gave you that statement on the hardware store. You see, I um, I, I really went in through a ventilator screen, and and, and then too, I, I told you the wrong amount on the money. We know you did. We also know that you stopped in the hardware store a couple of hours ago and bought a wrench. And spent ten minutes asking the storekeeper about the burglary. You see, we've been doing a little checking, too. The police at Harrisburg are looking for two men who robbed and murdered a wealthy old woman. You know anything about it? <laughs> go ahead, Pete. Go ahead. If the gun's in there, go for it. Or do you only use it on old ladies? It's stolen. The whole idea was Bolin's, not mine. I'm here, ain't I? He's running away. Not far. The police will be waiting for his plane when it lands at Dallas. And Dolly is waiting for you, downtown at my office. Please, Mr. Garrett, you gotta give me a break. I'll give you a break, Pete. The only kind of a break the law permits. What's that? The same kind of a break you gave that old lady in Harrisburg.
This is David Bryan. I hope you enjoy this case from the files of Mr. District Attorney. I'll be back in just a moment after this message from our sponsor. Now, here is the star of Mr. District Attorney, David Bryan, with a word about the program you have just heard. Pete Grable, Roy Bolin, and Dolly Weeks were extradited to the county where the brutal murder had been committed. Grable and Bolin were convicted in the first degree and executed. Dolly Weeks is now serving sentence on a charge of being an accessory after the fact and receiving stolen property. Now this is David Bryan inviting you to join us when we present our next case based on the facts of crime from the files of Mr. District Attorney. Mr. District Attorney was originated by Phillips H. Lord. Mr. District Attorney, starring David Bryan. Mr. District Attorney, champion of the people, defender of truth, guardian of our fundamental rights to life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. And it shall be my duty as district attorney not only to prosecute to the limit of the law all persons accused of crimes perpetrated within this county, but to defend with equal vigor the rights and privileges of all its citizens. This is David Bryan. In a moment, we'll bring you another case from the files of Mr. District Attorney. But first, a word from our sponsor. And now, here is our star, David Bryan, as Paul Garrett, Mr. District Attorney. A district attorney learns that in every man's mind, there is a secret compartment. It can be the hiding place for guilt or for fear. And fear is a deadly enemy of justice. Take this case. It started at one o'clock in the morning in the shadows of a waterfront pier. All right, start it up. Where'd you get this heat from, Crow? That's my business. Looks later, you just drive. Let me do the thinking. Uh, you do the thinking, I do the dirty work. Is that it? You want to keep working, Slater? You want to brass check it to my old shape up? All right, all right. If Rimlinger isn't straightened out, I'm going to be finished. And no stumble bummer like him is going to finish any crew. All right, turn down River Street. He'll be leaving the pier in two minutes. Suppose somebody sees us, Crow. Who's going to see us? He's the only longshoreman I got working on that dock tonight. He'll be coming out alone. Get him in the middle of the street. It's nice and wide. He'll have nothing to duck behind. Better slow down a little. All right. Now, be careful on this stretch. Hey, this thing's sliding all over. Why do you think I told you to slow down? The oil truck turned over here last night. They put sand and gravel on it, but it's still slippery. Watch it now. Pier 37, just past the ferry shed. There's people in that ferry shed, Crow. They're not close enough to bother us. Watch the street. Hey, there. There he is now. Let him walk further into the street. Now, gun it. He stopped, Crow. To let you go by. Perfect. Cut into him. Keep going. 
Think we got him? We knocked him a hundred feet, Slater. But the front of the car's all smashed. So what? I'll give the kid a hundred bucks to have it fixed. That's getting rid of Rimlinger pretty cheap. And the newspapers ain't gonna try to pin this one on any crew. I can see the headlines now. Longshoreman killed in hit and run accident. <laughs> <laughs> Keep in this office, Miss Miller. He's waiting for you, Harrington. Go right in. Hi, Chief. How'd you make out? Lab identified the hot rod we found at the Midtown Garage. It's the one, all right. Any line on the owner? Yeah. We picked him up. A newsboy, 16 years old. Name's Jimmy Leonard. I got him down to the detention room now. You want to see him? Yes. I'll be down in the detention room, Miss Miller. Yes, sir. What's the boy's background, Hank? He lives with his father. Cold water walk up on the east side. No trouble with the police before. As a matter of fact... What? He peddles his papers near the 9th Precinct house, Chief. Every cop in the place swears by him. They don't think he'd do a thing like this. It's his car, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. He keeps it in a public garage near the paper. Says when he went in this morning, a fender and a headlight was smashed up. We picked him up when he took it to a body shop to have it fixed. Four, please. This Leonard kid's hot rod isn't the only one in town, Chief. Half the kids who peddle papers own cars just like it. But not with a smashed fender. Now somebody might have backed into it in the garage. Kid says he didn't drive it last night. And I believe him. Sure, you're not being influenced by the opinions of the men in the ninth precinct. Yeah, it takes somebody pretty cold-blooded to run a man down and then beat it without stopping to help. And this kid, he, well, he just isn't cold-blooded. Sixteen-year-olds can do a lot of foolish things when they're frightened. Well, here we are. All right, Mike, open up for Mr. Garrett. Thanks, Mike. Jimmy Leonard? Yes, sir. My name is Garrett. I'm the district attorney, Jimmy. He'll help you if he can, boy. Just be honest with him. We'd like to know where you were last night. I already told him I was home. Your father says you weren't. Maybe I, maybe he didn't hear me come in. He was sleeping. I, I, I guess I got up this morning before he was awake. Mm-hmm. The man who was killed was struck down just after 1 a.m. Can you tell us where you were then? No. If you're hiding something to protect yourself, son, you're being very foolish. If you're trying to cover up for somebody else, you're being even more foolish. I don't want to say no more, that's all. I just can't tell you, sir. Why don't you go away? Why don't you leave me alone? Your father says you weren't home all night. Not since you left to sell papers yesterday afternoon. Jimmy, did you ever lend your car to anybody? Is anyone else in the habit of using it? Anybody who might have a duplicate of the ignition key? No. I, w- I was the only one who ever drove it. Only assembled the car a month ago. You made it yourself? Yeah, a bunch of us made them. We all chipped in and bought parts so we could get them, you know, whole- wholesale. Mm-hmm. Any of the other newsies keep their car in the same garage, right near the paper? Yeah. Rembrandt, I don't know his real name. Guys call him Rembrandt because he goes to an art school at night. And, the- and Frankie Cutter. They're the only ones. Is that all you can tell us? Yeah. It's no use, Harrington. Come on. Lock him in, Mike. Let's get down and get a car. Where to? I want to talk to the other newsies who keep their hot rods at the Midtown Garage. kid they called Rembrandt was no help, Chief. No, he wasn't. But I still want to see that other newsboy, Frankie Cutter. Did you find out where his stand is? Yeah, 12th and Madison, but he won't be there. Well, why not? He works the corner nights. Somebody else has it in the daytime. He lives over this way in Tenement Row, a couple of blocks from the Rimlinger place. I've got to see Rimlinger's wife sooner or later. Maybe I'd better go over there while you're talking to Cutter. Oh, give me the address. Hey, uh, it's written down here. 
ground floor flat. Should be the next street to the right. Where good night, he'll probably be sleeping. You want to drop me at the corner? <sighs> Sorry to wake you up, Frankie. Uh, those kids in the street wake everybody up anyhow. So Jimmy Leonard's in kind of a jam, huh? A bad jam, Frankie. I understand you've got a car just like his. Sure. A bunch of us got them. We all made them together. You garage them in the same place, too. Got to keep them someplace. What a racket. Eight bucks a month garage rent. I could leave it in the street and save the dough, but the cops keep slapping tickets on it. These your keys on the dresser? Yeah. This your pair of dice, too? Oh, yeah. I must have left them out without thinking. Shove them in the top drawer for me, will you? Thanks. My old lady spotted those. She'd scream like an eagle. Frankie, did you happen to see Jimmy Leonard any place last night? No. Why? He say I did? No. Now, where was your car during the night? Last night while you were working, I mean. Was it in the garage? Where else? Is it there now? Of course it's there now. Rembrandt's, too. Well, thank you, Frankie. That's all I want to know for now. You don't have to go through the kitchen. Other door leads right into the hallway. <laughs> This is supposed to be a parlor. <laughs> Some laugh, huh? A parlor in this rat trap. Thanks. Why don't you stick around for a few minutes? You being the DA got the old lady all excited. She went out to get some breakfast rolls. She'll fix some coffee or something. I'm afraid not, Frankie. Well, thank your mother for me. Tell her some other time. You're the boss. So long. So long, Frankie. You'd be back so soon. How did Rimling his wife take it? Hard. A couple of neighbors with her now. Yeah, she'll be all right, I guess, if she isn't left alone. Two cute kids. Oh, uh, I'd like to stop by the precinct house. Right. The Rimlingers need some help from the police fund. He left no insurance, nothing. And he gets killed coming home from work last night. The first week he's had in three months. Three months? Long showman should be busier than that. Plenty of shipping. Yeah, I know. But his wife said he'd had some kind of a beef with the hiring boss, something like that. Anyhow, he was laid off for quite a while, until yesterday. The local union had a meeting yesterday afternoon, and he was elected delegate. I guess that helped him to get working again. Yes. Yes, it did. For one night. Harrington, I want you to check the license plates on Jimmy Leonard's car. Compare them with registration. Make sure the motor number is right. Why? Rembrandt and Frankie Cutter have cars exactly like Jimmy's. One of them might have switched parking stalls and license plates. I want to make certain that Jimmy's car is Jimmy's car. His key fits a damaged car, Chief. He drove it out to a repair shop. Well, I can always tell his own car, even if a mother's like it. You know that. No, I don't, Harrington. As a matter of fact, at this point, I'm beginning to wonder whether we can tell a case of hit-and-run manslaughter from murder. <laughs> This is David Bryan. Before we continue with Mr. District Attorney in the case of the hot rod killing, here is an important message I'd like you to hear. And now back to David Bryan, starring as Paul Garrett, Mr. District Attorney. A longshoreman had been killed by a hit-and-run hot rod driver. The car had been located, but the 16-year-old owner would neither admit guilt nor speak in his own defense. While Harrington was continuing to check on the death car, I went to see the boy's father. I told him. I told him a hundred times. If I told him once, that that car would get him into trouble. Now, where is he? Behind bars. If I get my hands on him, I'll break his neck. You're talking about your own son, Mr. Leonard. What kind of a father are you? The kind of a father he should have listened to. I've been too easy with him. Just like his mother was. Blood will tell. That's what she'd do, too. Kill a man and run. Never had the guts to face anything. He's a 16-year-old boy, Mr. Leonard. He's alone, and he's frightened. <laughs> he may go to the reformatory for five years. Doesn't that mean anything to you? No. I never should have kept him. She wanted him. She couldn't get him. Not when I got finished with that divorce court. You mean you divorced your wife 
And you got custody of the boy? Yes. I was too smart for her. You took him away from his mother? I did everything for him. Tried to make something out of him. How could anything like that happen in the name of justice? What do you mean by that, Crack? You never wanted that boy. I took care of him. Made a home for him. You took him so you could do just what you have done. You took him so you could punish him. So you could use him to revenge yourself on his mother. So you could ruin both their lives and separate them for your own satisfaction. To appease your petty vanity for whatever you think your wife did to you. Get out of here. You're not going to talk to me like that in my own house, even if you are the district attorney. Go on, get out! And when you see that son of mine, tell him I hope they keep him in jail forever. Tell him I hope he rots there! He'll never rot the way he might have rotted here. If your boy is guilty, I know who should really go on trial. A reformatory won't hurt him. Compared to the home you've given him, his life there will be a paradise. Yeah? Excuse me, but is Mr. Garrett here? I'm from his He's office. He's just leaving. Hello, Miss Miller. Well, there was no phone listed for here, so I came over We can talk the... outside. Mr. Leonard was right. I'm just leaving. Well, does he blame you because the boy's in trouble? No, he blames the world for whatever trouble he has inside himself. Well, why did you come after me? Well, as I said, there was no phone listed for Leonard. Some of the policemen at the 9th Precinct were trying to help Jimmy. Yes? One of them found out where he was last night. Where? Well, it's kind of strange. They found out from another newsboy who has a stand near the park district. Saw Jimmy going to the Saverin Plaza Hotel. They checked with the desk clerk. The boy was registered there. Jimmy Leonard registered there at the Saverin Plaza? That's one of the best hotels in town. The desk clerk says he comes there one night every month, always on the 15th of the month. Do you know why? No. Have you heard from Harrington? Yes. Registration and serial number match Jimmy's car all right. Well, where is Harrington now? Well, he said to tell you he was going down to the docks, near where Remlinger was killed. Now, how did you get here? By cab. Good. Take another one going back. Make out an expense voucher. Couldn't I ride back with you? I'm going to stop at the docks and meet Harrington. Well, there's a couple of things I want you to do. Yes, sir. Get the cop that found out Jimmy was registered at the Saverin Plaza. Tell him to go back to the hotel and check the register for the past year. See if he can find one other particular name besides Jimmy's that appears on the register for the 15th of each month. Get the name, find out who it is and where they come from. Yes, sir. And then go into the civil court's records. About ten years back, I want a transcript of a divorce case. Leonard versus Leonard. Have it all at my office by the time I get back. Yes, sir. See you there. Hey, you, Buster. You talking to me? Who do you think I'm talking to? Docks ain't no place for sightseeing. Voice and everything, you might get hurt. Why don't you just blow out of here? You any Crow, the hiring boss? Yeah. Say, you must be the guy that's been nosing around here asking the longshoremen questions. Yeah, that's right. You shouldn't do that. Those guys got work to do. So have I. Oh, DA's office, huh? Uh, working on that hit-run case, huh? The guy that got killed, uh, Fred Rimlinger? Yeah, that's right. Well, none of my boys know nothing about that. Poor Fred. I just sent some flowers. Bad thing, the poor guy getting killed like that, leaving a family. I bleed for him. Bleed what? Ice water? You're a pretty fresh guy, ain't you? I've been talking to your men, the few that ain't afraid to talk. Troublemakers? <laughs> What'd they tell you? And you make them kick back 20% of their pay every time you hand them a brass work check at the shipment. And they don't like it. Well, you think you can get one of them to say that in court? Rimlinger didn't like it either. He'd have said so in court. That's why the men elected him delegate. And you gave him a brass check for the first time in three months. He gave him the only night job on the dock. And he got killed on the way home. By a hot rod driven by a crazy kid. You blaming me for that? Something wrong there, Ernie? Yes, yeah, Slater. Come here. This flatfoot's been going around the docks, stirring up the men, keeping them from working, making cracks about why Remlinger got killed. Who's this, one of your muscle boys? He's a guard for troublemakers. Now, why don't you hit the road? I think this has gone far enough, gentlemen. Chief, where did you come from? I've been behind those bales for the past two minutes, listening to your very enlightening conversation. You gentlemen have any plans for Mr. Harrington? No. No, of course not, Mr. Garrett, but uh, 
You ought to tell him to be careful about believing what he hears from troublemakers. He shouldn't repeat it. A guy like you has to stand for re-election every once in a while. I know you wouldn't want a taxpayer like me making complaints. I got a lot of connections. I think I'll be able to get by when election day comes without you or your connections. Come on, Hank. Where'd you leave your car? Right over here, under the shed. Where's yours? A couple of blocks down. You can take me to it. Yeah, sure. Which way? Turn right when we reach the street. Now past the ferry slip. That, uh, that hiring boss, Kroll. I think he knows something about the rimbling of killing. Yes, well, we can't prove it. If only Jimmy Leonard would talk. Or we've been able to find a car switch. There was no switch. It was his car. He was the only one who could have been driving it. He took... Look out, Harrington! That screwball almost skidded right into us. Yeah, it wasn't his fault. It's this road. Yeah. Slippery. Oil truck turned over here day before yesterday. They tried to cover it. Hey, you hear that sand and gravel kicking up under the fenders? Yeah, I hear it. Never mind my car, Harrington. Turn south to the Midtown Garage. What's up? That car that killed Rimlinger must have come through that oil slick and gravel. Yeah? Then the death car will be bound to have some oily sand and gravel stuck under all four fenders. I want to see Rembrandt's car and Frankie Cutter's. Hurry. Anything under that one? Nope. Normal road tires. No sand or oil. Have a look at cutters. No. No, this one's okay, too. It's... It... Hey, wait a minute. Let me get this flashlight focused. Well? That's funny. Hey, give me a hand out, will you, Chief? Sure. <clears throat> what did you find? Well, right front fender is clean underneath. But... The left front and the two rear fenders are covered with oil and sand. That's what I was looking for. Cutter's car is the one that killed Rimlinger. But Jimmy Lennon's car has the smash fender and headlight. Because the right front fender and the headlight from this car were taken off and switched for the fender and headlight on Jimmy's. That's why the underside of this fender is clean and the other three aren't. There a phone here? Yeah. I saw the garage man using one in that little office over there. Mr. Garrett, Miss Miller. Oh, Mr. Garrett, Jimmy Leonard's mother's here waiting for you. What? Yes, sir. She just came in on the train from upstate. She heard about his arrest on the radio. Her name's Mrs. Goodrich now. She's remarried. I see. Well, there's something else. Her name has been on the Saverin Plaza Hotel Register the 15th of every month, the same as Jimmy Leonard's. She says he's been meeting her there, so his father wouldn't know. I thought it was something like that. Tell her to wait. Harrington and I are going down to pick up Frankie Cutter. Meanwhile, call Homicide and tell them I want a plain clothes squad to meet me at the River Street Ferry Shed in about a half hour. Tell them to wait. Let's get Cutter. Where are you taking me? I didn't kill the guy, I tell you. Hey, what are we doing down here by the docks? There ain't no police station on River Street. You know what we're doing here, Frankie. You want to tell us who was using a car? Or shall we tell you? You know, don't you? It was Ernie Kroll, wasn't it? Better answer, Frankie. Yeah. He came by the stand. Wanted to know could he borrow the car. So a guy like him, you don't say no. So I give him the keys. What time? Midnight. I was just going to eat. Then he brings the heat back about 2 a.m. Tells me he had an accident. Give me a C note to have it fixed and keep my trap shut. I I thought I'd keep it all, so I glommed onto the fenders and light from Jimmy's car. You want me to drive right on to the dock, Chief? Yes. A lot of guys walking up. Long Charmin finishing their shift. Climb into the back, Frankie. Get on the floor and stay there. Don't worry, mister. I don't want no trouble. Stop here. Uh, 
There's Crow by the hiring shed. Yeah, and that muscle boy Slater, paying off and taking their kickback. Too money happy to see us. And they'll see us in a minute. Morgan, fan your squad out along the dock. Nobody gets off this pier. I'll try to take them in peacefully, Harrington. I don't want any of the workmen to get hurt. I'm with you. All right, Crow. Business is over for the day. But what are you guys doing back here? You're under arrest for the murder of Fred Rimlinger. Slater, come here. Huh? What are you guys trying to pull? We're not trying to pull anything. We have a confession from a newsboy whose car you used, Crow. A, a, a confession? I didn't drive the car. I just borrowed it. Who did drive it? Don't move for a gun, Slater. Stay back, copper. Way back. We got six men on this pier. If you get by me, tell Slater to drop that gun. Hit, drop it, Slater. Do it before they kill us. Uh, all right, all right. Yeah, yeah, we're coming. All right, you men. The law can handle them. They'll get all they deserve. And from now on, you men will get all you deserve. A full day's pay with no kickbacks. Let's go, Harrington. This is David Bryan. I hope you enjoy this case from the files of Mr. District Attorney. I'll be back in just a moment after this message from our sponsor. Now, here is the star of Mr. District Attorney, David Bryan, with a word about the program you have just heard. Jimmy Leonard's father tried to regain custody of the boy, but the court reversed its original decision when the true facts were presented. Meanwhile, hiring boss Ernie Kroll and his strong-armed man, Bud Slater, were sentenced to life imprisonment for the murder of Fred Rimlinger. Frankie Cutter is awarded the juvenile court until he reaches the age of 21. And now this is David Bryan inviting you to join us when we present our next case based on the facts of crime from the file of Mr. District Attorney. Mr. District Attorney was originated by Phillips H. Lord. Mr. District Attorney, starring David Bryan. Mr. District Attorney, champion of the people, defender of truth, guardian of our fundamental rights to life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. And it shall be my duty as district attorney not only to prosecute to the limit of the law all persons accused of crimes perpetrated within this county, but to defend with equal vigor the rights and privileges of all its citizens. This is David Bryan. In a moment, we'll bring you another case from the files of Mr. District Attorney. But first, a word from our sponsor. And now, here is our star, David Bryan, as Paul Garrett, Mr. District Attorney. A district attorney must see people through different eyes than others. The man who passes on the street may be a criminal, one for prosecution. Or he may be an innocent man who will one day find himself enmeshed in the law by a chain of circumstance. To tell them apart is the function of justice. This case started on a lonely road on the outskirts of town. 
How is he, Francie? He, he's still out, Rocky. He hit him awful hard. Well, what do you expect for 93000 A love tap? Well, he isn't just another gambler who can't go to the law. He's an important man. He, he'll make trouble. Yeah. For who? An undertaker? Rocky. You're not gonna... Yeah, I'm gonna. What do you want me to do? Wake him up, tell him I'm sorry, give the dough back to him? he won it. Suckers ain't supposed to win. I run that game for me to win, one way or another. This place is as good as any. Rocky, I'm scared. Oh, you just shut your mouth and help me get him out, will you? Rocky, please. So help me, Francie. One more bleed out of you and I'll shove the muzzle of this gun down your throat and pull the trigger. Now, you're going to help me get him out or you want me to drag you out with him? (laughs) Don't, don't hurt me, Rocky. I'll help you. That's better. Come on. Let's stop, will you? That's it. That's better. All right. Hey, you hear anything coming? How could I hear anything in this rain? That's good. Nobody else will hear anything either. Well, goodbye, Mr. Ferguson. Too bad you got so lucky. In here, Ryan. I wish you'd tell me what this is all about, Mr. Harrington. District attorney will tell you. Morning, Miss Miller. Morning, Harrington. Chief in? Yes? This is Joe Ryan, the cab driver we've been looking for. And you better tell him. Yes, Miss Miller? Harrington's here, Mr. Garrett. He has a Joe Ryan with him. Well, send him in. Yes, sir. All right. Through here, Ryan. You've been a little difficult to find, Mr. Ryan. We've been looking for you for four days. I didn't know that till this morning. Are you in the habit of taking four-day vacations from driving your cab? No, sir. I took the time off because I've been looking for a good buy on a new cab. Why didn't you register a change of address with the Motor Vehicle Bureau when you moved a couple of months ago? I forgot, that's all. Well, you know that's a violation, don't you? Yes, sir, but... Look, is that why you picked me up? No, that isn't why. Four nights ago, Ryan, just before you took this unusual vacation... You picked up a fare outside the Chelsea Club, just a few minutes before midnight, remember? Ah, so that's it. What did you expect it to be? Story of the murder's been in all the papers. I know it. You picked up a fare who was found murdered the next morning, and you know about it. But you don't get in touch with the police. Why? Why should I? I don't know nothing about it. I picked the man up and I drove him home. His body was found out on Pendleton Road. What's that got to do with me? I took him home. Look... If you think I had anything to do with this, you're sending your dogs on the wrong trail. Are we? Do you know we impounded your cab at the garage? No, I didn't know it. I haven't been near the garage. Maybe you should have been. Police lab crews gave the cab a going over. This is their report. Like me to read it to you? I'd like anything that helped to clear this up, yeah. According to this report, Ryan, there were bloodstains on the back seat and the floor mat of your cab. Type O. The report also states that John Ferguson's blood was type O. Now, what's that prove? Lots of people have type O blood. You've been reading up on the subject? I don't have to read up. I was in the medics in the service. I got type O blood myself. You trying to tell us it was your own blood on that back seat? No, a guy got hurt in my cab. When? Why, it, it was the same night I picked Mr. Ferguson up at the Chelsea Club. Look, I've driven Mr. Ferguson lots of times. Yeah, we know. The doorman told us. That's what started us looking for you. Who got hurt in your cab? I don't know who he was. I... Can I tell you about it, uh, about how it happened? Oh, that's why you're here. All right. Well, it was after I dropped Mr. Ferguson off. I picked up these six guys. They were wearing those hats, you know, uh, the convention that was in town last week. Shriners? Yeah, that's right. Well, there were six of them. And brother was at rain, and they flagged me down. I don't usually take six, but, well... With the weather and everything, I packed them in. Then what? Well, like I said, it was raining cats and dogs. They wanted to go to Savern Plaza. I took the freeway in. Some guy cut in front of me at Montrose Turnoff, and I had to go for the brakes. The road was wet, and I went into a skid. Threw him around a little bit in the back seat. One of the guys in the drop seat bumped something, got a nosebleed. That's it. That's the whole story. Look, you you got to believe me about this. Ryan... 
Just before he left the Chelsea Club, Howard Ferguson cashed a check for $2,000. That was at midnight. You say you drove him home, but his body is found the next morning out on Pendleton Road without a cent on him. And we find you out shopping for a new cab. And it doesn't look good, Ryan. I don't care how it looks. Where'd you get the money for the new cab? I won it. Won it where? Well, I... I won it a couple of months ago, just before I moved. That's where I got the dough to move. Well, what do you mean by one? Oh, the guys around the garage. We used to play the numbers. You know, the numbers racket. And you won. Yes, I won. Then you won in a million in that sucker racket. I know it, but that's where I got the dough. I spent part of it moving, and I was holding the rest until now to buy a new cab when the new models came out. They came out the day before yesterday. Uh-huh. That's where the dough come from. Honest it is. Okay. Then there's only one other thing you have to tell us about. Who sold you the numbers? A guy named Willie Lamont. Where can we find him? I, I, I don't, I don't know. What do you mean you don't know? Well, he, he hasn't been around the garage in a couple of months. All, all of a sudden, he, he just stopped coming around. Can any of the other cab drivers verify that you won that money? No, no, I, 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 I never told any of them. Ryan, your story is pretty thin. You can prove the part about the blood, can't you? Find the six guys I picked up. Almost forty thousand of them come in for the convention from every state in the country. The convention ended yesterday. Our chances of finding them might have been good while they were still in town. Yeah, but we couldn't find you until this morning. And you didn't come in on your own. I swear to you, I took Ferguson home. Then how did this body get out in the Pendleton Road? Wait. Wait a minute. I just remembered something. You better remember for your own good. What is it, Ron? Uh, wait a minute. It, when I took him home, there, there's a big circular driveway at his place. Well, there was a car in front of the house when I let him out. I, I passed right next to it. Mm-hmm. It, there, there was a couple of people in the car. It was a limousine. Why didn't you mention this before? Well, I, I didn't think of it. I figured they were waiting to get into the house. You didn't wait to find out? No, I collected them a fair and blue. Ryan, nobody saw that car except you. Servants didn't see anything. They didn't even hear your cab, Ryan. It was raining so hard, th- the rain kept them from hearing. Now, that could be one explanation. What other explanation could there be? The one that all the evidence seems to point to. Ryan, you never took Ferguson home. This is a frame. Take it easy. It's Mr. a frame. Mr. Ferguson was a big shot, so you got to pin this on somebody in a hurry. And I'm the patsy, ain't I? It's a frame, ain't it? No matter what I tell you. Everything you said will be checked, Ryan. Every single point. If you're innocent, I want to know it. I have no choice but to hold you. I know. Take him over to the county jail and book him, Harrington. Then come back and meet me in the record room. Okay, Chief. Come on, Ryan. Miss Miller? Yes, Mr. Gar. Call the county sheriff's office. Vice squad detail. Ask for Sergeant Payne. Sergeant Payne? Yes, sir. Tell him I'd like him to come over and meet me in the record bureau. Yes, sir. Hi, Chief. Had Ryan booked all right? Yep. Well, what'd you think of his story? Weak, but it has possibilities. Like what? This, for instance. There's a petty gambler named Willie Lamond. Three times arrested as a runner for various bookies. Always the same charge. Taking bets on the numbers record. Yeah, but those arrests are all dated before you convinced the state legislature that gambling ought to be a felony. He's probably been more careful since then. Gamblers are hard to put out of business. No regular joints operating. No, but there are floating places. And runners like Willie Lamont picking up bets. Well, can't be much of it. More than you think. I've had somebody on the sheriff's vice squad working on a report. Oh, who? Young sergeant. His name is Ed Payne. He's on his way over now. I thought he might be able to give us some information on Willie Lamont. Look, couldn't I have handled this gambling report? Now, you're too well known to the professionals, Harrington. I need a young man who could work right in with them undercover. Payne's well qualified, fresh out of Army intelligence and a comparative stranger in town. Oh. Ah, don't worry. You'll be there when we have a complete report and the time comes from the crackdown. Uh, Chief, even if we do find this Willie Lamont, he's not going to stick his neck out to help Ryan. He won't admit taking that bet. We'll have to find a way to make him admit it. Without Lamont's testimony, Ryan will be a cinch for conviction. He... Oh, Chief... There's a fellow over there looking around. Oh, that's Ed Payne. Over here, Sergeant. Hi, Mr. Garrett. The secretary said you wanted to see me. Yes. Sergeant Payne, this is my assistant, Harrington. Hello, Sergeant. Glad to know you. Heard a lot about you. 
There's somebody else I hope you've heard a lot about, Payne. A bookmaker's runner named Willie Lamont. He's still operating? Uh-huh. Left town a couple of months ago, went to Chicago. No, oh, that's rough. It's all right. We can extradite him if we have to. That might not be too easy, Mr. Garrett. Why not? There's been some talk about him since he's been gone. They say he got ambitious in Chicago. Word got around that he was holding out some bets on his new boss. And also slipping in a phony winner or two to turn himself a dishonest dollar. The boss got wise to it. You mean Lamont is on the run again? I need him badly as a witness. Mr. Garrett, you know how the mobs are. If you want my opinion, Willie Lamont isn't on the run. He's standing still. Somewhere on the bottom of Lake Michigan, wearing a pair of cement shoes. This is David Bryan. Before we continue with Mr. District Attorney in the case of the vanishing runner, here is an important message from my sponsor. And now, back to David Bryan, starring as Paul Garrett, Mr. District Attorney. A prominent citizen had been murdered, and a cab driver, surrounded by a mesh of circumstantial evidence, had been taken into custody. We needed a small-time gambler to verify the cab driver's alibi. But the underworld grapevine indicated that the only possible witness was dead. For two days, I had Harrington and Sergeant Payne of the Sheriff's Vice Squad check on every possible source of additional information. Haven't you been able to locate Harrington yet, Miss Miller? Yes, sir. Uh, basement garage call. He just drove in. He's on his way up now. Oh. You don't look well today. Well, I had to get a grand jury indictment against Ryan this morning. It isn't a very pleasant prospect. Well, it's not your... Oh, well, here's Harrington now. Yeah, sorry it's gone so long, Chief. But I ran into some pretty funny things. What? It's Howard Ferguson was having an awful lot of trouble before he was killed. And what kind of trouble? Well, believe it or not, financial. Howard Ferguson? Yeah, that's right. Here. Here's a complete rundown. He was draining money away from his business investments and putting it into his personal account, stalling his creditors. Few of them even had him on a COD basis. And a couple of other things, too. He was the... Oh, co- excuse me. Am I interrupting? No, it's all right, Payne. Come in. Answer just came in from Chicago. No line on Willie Lamont. Well, I guess the scuttlebutt you heard was right, then. Go ahead, Harrington. That uh, $2,000 check wasn't unusual. Ferguson had been cashing checks for that amount or more a couple of nights a week. And what would he need it for? Only one thing I can think of, Mr. Garn. Gambling? Only kind of business I can think of where a lot of money changes hands in the middle of the night. Payne, when players go to one of these floating games you've been looking into, how are they notified where the game is going to be held? Oh, they aren't notified. A slip-up could lead to a raid. They don't tell the customers where to go. They come and pick them up in a limousine. Limousine? Chief, Ryan said there was a limousine parked in Ferguson's driveway the night he drove them home. The gamblers wouldn't have killed Ferguson for $2,000, though. They had an easier way to take the money away from him. Unless he won. Yes. If a man got lucky in a big money game, he might win fifty or a hundred thousand with a hot pair of dice. That's enough for a killing. No, I'm not in, Miss Miller. Yes, sir. Hello? It's the Holloway Bank and Trust for Harrington. Oh, that's Ferguson's bank, Chief. They were checking something for me. Well, I better take him. Hello? Miss Harrington? Yep. Uh What's that name again? Uh, no, no. First name. Spell it. F, R, oh, yeah. Yeah, I got it. Thanks. Thanks, Miss Miller. Ferguson had been writing some other big checks made out to cash, in addition to the one he cashed at the Chelsea Club. The bank says the others were endorsed by a Francine DeVoe. Francine DeVoe. Uh, Mr. Garrett, can I call the record room for a minute? Go ahead. Get it for him, Miss Miller. You got a match, Payne? Yes, yeah, sir. Sure. No, oh, thanks. I'm sure will. Record room? Just a second. Thanks. Hello, Mike. Ed Payne. You still got that Willie Lamont folder you pulled for me? 
Uh, no, his wife's maiden name. Yeah, Mike, plenty. Thanks a lot. That's something, Mr. Garrett. Francine DeVoe, alias Francine Lamond. She was Willie Lamond's wife. I heard about it when I was trying to get a rundown on Lamond. How come she didn't go to Chicago with him? She divorced Willie a couple of years ago. Started to run around with the big-time gamblers, working for boys like Rocky Jessup. What do you mean by working for them? Bait. A shill. Stirring suckers to their games. Men like Ferguson? He cashed an awful lot of checks. Can you find out where Rocky Jessup is holding his next game? No, I could find out, but I couldn't get in. Why not? You've been making contact. Yeah, as a small-time gambler. I've never flashed the kind of money they're interested in. And if I did flash it all of a sudden, they might get curious. Well, suppose you called up and said you had a wealthy customer, somebody you'd steer to the game for a percentage. Yeah, that could work. But who? You or Harrington, they might know. How about me? Oh, uh, please. No, no, wait a minute, Harrington. How about it, Payne? Well, could be good. Wealthy young woman from out of town looking for kicks. Hey, I was only joking, Mr. Garrett. I... Well, I wasn't. I'd be scared silly. They won't try anything inside the place. There'll be other people. Anything they do will be outside. And when you come outside, we'll be waiting. But I won't know how to act or what to say. Or... Oh, we'll tell you. But first, take this. A hundred dollars? What would Go I... Go to a costume rental place. Run an evening gown, the best they have, and a fur wrap. Buy some good-looking costume jewelry. You drive it, Harrington. But... Come on, Cinderella. <laughs> you know what I want you to do, don't you, Payne? I... I think so. After we get in, ask questions. Make them suspect I'm a cop. That's right. Maybe if you tip your hand, they'll tip theirs. Now call Rocky Jessup and arrange for the pickup. I'm scared, Payne. Do you like a little action, huh, Miss Miller? Yes, I... I think gambling's very exciting. Well, I run a good game. You'll like it. What's your poison? I beg your pardon? I can't hear you too well back here. No, I, I said, uh, what do you like? The wheel, bone, space board? Roulette, Rocky. She likes the wheel. Oh, good, good. You'll be happy that Payne suggested my place to you. Payne tells me you're from out of town. Yeah, that's right. Cleveland. Uh, family and business there? Eh? Yes, they have a, a chain of grocery stores. Oh, that's nice. <laughs> People got to eat. Yeah. Huh? I said that's right, Mr. Jessup. Yeah. Oh, just call me Rocky, huh? But don't let the name fool you. I'm really a soft guy. Payne will tell you. <laughs> Rocky's tops, Miss Miller. I don't see any particular car following us, Payne. They're working relays on the radio car set up. One turns off, another one turns in behind us. You say something, Payne? Uh, uh, just telling Miss Miller about the percentages in the game. <laughs> Odds, law of averages. Yeah, matter. yeah. You want to listen to him, Miss Miller. This boy knows the score. You might make a killing tonight. Well, here we are. Target for tonight. Well, what what kind of a place is this? Oh, don't be scared. This is just an abandoned airplane hangar. Used to be an airfield here and a flying school. There's no use letting the building go to waste, huh? <laughs> you sure know how to pick the spots, Rocky. Yeah, and you sure know how to pick the dolls. <laughs> well, come on, Miss Miller. <laughs> Thinking you're liable to cost me some money tonight. Nobody's going to be looking at the dice with you around. Gotta be careful, you know. All right, go ahead now, folks. It's dark. Well, it'll be light as soon as we get through the other door. I right, don't be afraid. Come on. Hey, looks a little better than you thought, huh, Miss Miller? <laughs> it's surprising. Well, all my customers go first class. Uh, Francine? I'll be there in a second. All righty. Francine's her hostess. She'll tell you where the action is. Oh, uh, Francie, this is Miss Miller. She's from Cleveland, friend of Payne's. You know Payne, don't you? I've seen him around. Francine. My uncle mentioned meeting Francine the last time he was here on a visit. He likes to gamble, too. Is that so? What's your uncle's name? Miller. Same as mine. Robert Miller. 
I don't remember him. Well, it could have been another fancy, and of course, but... Well, it is an unusual name. How long ago? Just about a, a week ago. Yes, just the night before he came back to Cleveland. I didn't run no game last week. Uncle Bob said the game was in uh, some kind of an old restaurant on... Uh, uh, Penderson Road, something like that? No, Pendleton Road. That wouldn't be our game. Would it, Rocky? No, 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 not out there. Must have been somebody else, Miss Miller. No, he said fancy. He said it was raining like blazes. Oh, yes. And some man won a lot of money. Practically broke the game. Uncle Bob was standing right next to him. His name, uh, his name was Ferguson. Your uncle tells you things in detail, doesn't he? Uh, you better, uh... You better show me what refreshments we got, Francie, huh? Payne and the lady can just drift around with things over. Okay, Payne? Oh, sure. Come on, Miss Miller. I'll show you the dice table. I thought that same Mr. Ferguson might be here. If he was, I'd bet the way he's there. I sure don't like this, Francie. Neither do I. Why didn't you tell me Payne was coming? Why? Because he's the one who's been nosing around asking questions about Willie. Well, we had nothing to do with what happened to Willie. No, but we did with Ferguson, and he was asking questions like a cop. Yeah. Why would a cop steer a rich dame here? Rich dame, nothing. Huh? Did you see the label in that fur jacket she's dragging around? No. Madame Pompadour Costume Rentals. Get him over to the door. Well, I... Do like I tell you. You gotta get rid of him tonight and blow town, but fast. Now, go ahead. Um... Miss Miller. Oh, we were just watching. Uh, there's, a, there's a much bigger game in another room around the side of the building. Rocky thought you and Mr. Payne would rather go in there. Uh, which way? Well, we have to go outside first and then around. Well, that sounds interesting, Miss Miller. Yes. Oh, that dark place again. It's only for a second. All right, cop. You and this dame, outside to the car. And no funny moves or I got a hole in my pocket and you got a hole in your back. Do what they say, Miss Miller. Where are you going to take us? Same place we took Ferguson. And we're going to leave you the same way. I wouldn't count on that, but Rocky. Rocky. You're covered every way. Don't move. You dirty... Hey! Down, Miss Miller. Don't! Don't kill me. He's dead. Don't kill me. Don't! Let me help you, Miss Miller. Oh, thanks. How is he, honey? Rocky, he's not dead. He'll live to stand trial. Well, I, I'll testify. I'll make a deal with you. We don't need any deals, thank you. Take him in, Harrington. Payne? Right, Chief. Yes, Mr. Go. Round up that crowd inside. They can do their gambling in a cell for the night. Come on, Miss Miller. I'll drive you home. Thank you. You're shaking. You scared? Oh, Mr. Garrett, I just kept thinking when they were shooting... What could I ever tell a Madame Pompadour costume company if I brought back this fur jacket with a bullet hole in it? <laughs> what? <laughs> Miss Miller, if I didn't hear it, I wouldn't believe it. Oh, I shouldn't have expected a man to understand. <laughs> this is David Bryan. I hope you enjoy this case from the files of Mr. District Attorney. I'll be back in just a moment after this message from our sponsor. Now, here's the star of Mr. District Attorney, David Bryan, with a word about the program you have just heard. Rocky Jessup was tried and convicted on a charge of murder in the first degree. The death penalty was mandatory. His accomplice, Francine DeVoe, alias Francine Lamont, was sentenced to the women's prison for 15 years. Now, this is David Bryan inviting you to join us when we present our next case based on the facts of crime from the file of Mr. District Attorney. Mr. District Attorney was originated by Phillips H. Lord. <laughs>
Windsor District Attorney, starring David Bryan. Mr. District Attorney, champion of the people, defender of truth, guardian of our fundamental rights to life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. And it shall be my duty as district attorney not only to prosecute to the limit of the law all persons accused of crimes perpetrated within this county, but to defend with equal vigor the rights and privileges of all its citizens. This is David Bryan. In a moment, we'll bring you another case from the files of Mr. District Attorney. But first, a word from our sponsor. And now, here is our star, David Bryan, as Paul Garrett, Mr. District Attorney. As district attorney for this county, it's my job to prevent crimes as well as solve them. But sometimes you can't prevent them. Sometimes you can only pick up the trail after the violence has begun. In this case, it began 18 hours before the first police report reached my office. All right, stop the car. Stop the car, I said. Ellie, put that gun away. Ellie. Shut up, Grandpa. Come on, pull up right here. Ellie, don't be stupid. Take the gag out of his mouth. Give the man a chance. You can't. Why? Would he give us a chance? Look at him. Look at his eyes bug out. He thought he knew all about us. Well, here's something he didn't know. Ellis, you can't kill a man in cold blood. No. Watch it. See, Grandpa? See how easy it is? I knew you were a cheap little no-good punk, Ellis, but I didn't think that you were a murderer. Come on, come on, let's dump him out of here. <laughs> here, I got his wallet. One thing I hate, Ellis, is a killer. I hate killers. Now look, Grandpa, you're in this up to your lower plate. Now come on, give me a hand. Grab his ankles. Come on, come on, will you? <laughs> okay. Swing his feet out. I'll dump him right here. These high weeds. Uh, you, you think the law won't find him here? Sure, they'll find him. But let them try to find us. Come on, shove. There. Pleasant dreams, Mr. Hicks. Okay, shove over, Grandpa. I'll drive back. Killers, Ellie. I hate killers. I hate killers, too. They're easy to hate when it's your job to study their handiwork and track them down. Harrington and I picked up the tracks on this case in the county morgue. Twenty-two years service in this place still gives me the willies. You too, Chief? Sure does. This one, Harrington? Uh, next one. All right, let's take a look. Hmm. Yeah, three shots at close range. Like maybe he was looking right down the muzzle of the gun. Somebody else's gun. Is he a John Doe? Yeah, he was until an hour ago. His wife identified him. His name is Hicks. Alfred Hicks. He's an insurance investigator. Uh, he was, I mean. Oh, what company? Globe, I think. Yeah, that's what Lieutenant Padway said. Globe Casualty Company. I asked Miss Miller to call them and find out what claim Six was working on. I'm good. Where was the body found? Mm, in a vacant lot behind a motel way out on South Street. No identification on him at all. His wife called the cops when he didn't come home last night. Padway and Homicide brought it down here for a look, and uh, that's what she saw. <laughs> Uh, 
Harrington, go on over to Homicide and find out what Lieutenant Padway's learned from Mrs. Hicks. I'll call the office and see if Miss Miller's learned anything from the insurance company. Okay, Chief. We'll see you later. You mind if I use this phone? Thanks. Office. Hello, Miss Miller. Oh, Mr. Garrett, we've been waiting to hear from you. I've just been talking to the chief investigator at Globe Casualty. Well, what did you learn? Well, he said Alfred Hicks had been assigned to a stolen car claim. A big stolen car claim, incidentally. Oh? How big? An auto carrier loaded with four new sedans was hijacked about 14 miles from the factory. Do we have a report on that? We do now. It's on your desk. Fine. Mr. Hicks had been checking the want ads for any slightly used cars that might be for sale. His last call had been at the Sleep Easy Motel on South Street. Well, that was his last call, all right. He was seeing a private party named Thompson. Did you call the motel? Yes, sir. There was a Mr. and a Mrs. Thompson. They checked out about seven last night. Hmm, that figures. Look, if Harrington calls in before I get back to the office, send him over to the Sleep Easy Motel. Yes, sir. Tell him to get a description of the Thompsons and any leads on where they might be. I'll see you in about 20 minutes. Will you forget it? I know what I'm doing. But you promised me faithfully that there wouldn't be any more. I'll see you tonight. Well, what are you looking at, Grandpa? The loving young husband hangs up on his wife. Why don't you mind your own business, huh? Irma is my business. She's my granddaughter. And my wife. And if I'd had my say about her marrying you... You didn't have any say. You were doing time, remember? Yeah, I was doing time all right. But I'd done my time. And anyway, I was up on a good, honest forgery rap, not murder. Shut up. Bad enough, Irma's married to a car thief. How'd she like it if she knows you were the killer, too? Shut up, I said. Easy, sonny, easy. I ain't afraid of that gun of yours. I already messed up my life. I ain't got much left to lose, except you know, maybe Irma. Yeah. Listen, Grandpa. A truck left the plant 20 minutes ago for Woodside. We got about an hour and a half to meet it. Let's get going. Not me, Sonny. What do you mean, not you? I told you before, Ellie, that gun don't scare me. I got nothing left to lose. Except armor. Yeah, except... You know, Ellie, I really believe you'd do it to her, too. I really believe it. You coming with me or not? Yeah. Yeah, I'm coming. You want this last bench of pink slips? Yeah. And run them off yourself. We got enough time? The truck should be here. You make the decision, Sonny. It's your deal, all of it. You print the slips, you make the phony license plates, you plan the hijacking, you do the killing. Okay, this is the spot. The auto carrier is just coming over that hill. Think you can drive this truck, Grandpa? I drove it last time, didn't I? Yeah. But I paid a lot of loot for this wagon, and it's helped me get a lot more. I'm sentimental about it. <laughs> I didn't think you could be sentimental about anything. Here comes our sucker. Yeah, rear axle's locked. 
Can you give me a hand? Yeah, sure thing. I hope you got a good flashlight on you. Yeah. Yeah, these things always happen after the sun goes down, it seems. It's a rear axle. Uh, let's take a look here. Yeah. Looks all right to me. Maybe it just... Hey! Okay, Grandpa, you drive this one. I'll drive his. What are you going to do with that driver, Ellie? Don't worry, I'll take care of him. Get going. Go on, Grandpa. Move, will you? Go on! <laughs> Morning, Miss Miller. Good morning, Mr. Garrett. Harrington check in yet? Yes, sir. I'm typing up his report now. He's in your office. Oh, good. Ah, oh, hi, Chief. Hi. How did you make out, Harrington? Well, I got kind of a fake description of the Thompsons, if that's what their name is. I gave it to Miss Miller. The guy is young, early 20s, curly hair, nervous, smokes a lot. Girl is the same age, about... Has one of them new style haircuts all over her head, you know? Reddish hair. Kind of pretty from what the motel guy said. But you know how motel guys are. Aren't they, all right? Uh, one thing he said, though. He said there was an old guy with the Thompsons. Uh, seemed to be a relative. Like a grandfather or something. Excuse me. Yes? Did you order the morning papers, Mr. Garrett? Oh, yes. Will you bring them in, Miss Miller? All of them? Yes, please. All of them. Why the papers, Chief? You cleaning out bird cages or something? You and I are going to check the one ads. One ads? Another auto carrier was hijacked last night. No kidding. That makes two. Yeah, two. From the same assembly plant. Four brand new cars on it. Two hijackings, two murders. Two murders? The driver of the auto carrier. He was found on the highway last night. Harrington, you and I are going to check the ads for slightly used automobiles. Just the way that insurance investigator did. Only he ended up in the morgue. Here are the papers, Mr. Garrett. Oh, thank you. Well, Harrington, I wonder where we'll end up. to David Bryan, starring as Paul Garrett, Mr. District Attorney. Two auto carriers had been hijacked. Eight brand new cars had been stolen. And two men had been murdered in cold blood. For three days, Harrington and I and other members of my staff tracked down every lead, including the ads for slightly used cars. No luck. Three days. Four days. Five days. Somewhere in this teeming city, our killer was still free. Free to kill again. Ellie, I wish you'd stop that pacing. Ellie, please. Your wife's talking to you, Sonny. I heard her. Ellie, will you stop? Stop what? Stop this. Stop that. Stop the car deal. Stop the phony licenses. Stop living, why don't you tell me? Now, there's an interesting idea. You shut up. I've taken enough from you. Ellie. Oh. Ellie, what's wrong with you? Oh, you know, Irma. This is a big job. We still got two cars left over from the last job. And so far all week, we only got one call about our ad. An old maid school teacher didn't even have her driver's license yet. Oh, I knew you shouldn't have pulled this job. I didn't even know about the first one until after it was done. There's a lot you don't know, honey. Shut up, Grandpa. Ellie, you promised me there wouldn't be any more. I only helped on this one because you promised oh, me you'd stop. Yeah, will you? No. No, I won't forget it. You won't let me. I won't let you. No. You're so tense and, and nervous. What do you expect? Hot cars stashed away all over town and us holed up in this free bag motel waiting for one ads to pay off. Maybe we should have stayed at the sleep easy. Lots of action there. It's more than that, Ellie. It's the way you talk, the way you look. 
You look so cold and hard, like... Well, like a... A real... Like a real what? Go on, say it. Like a real crook, she means. Or even a killer. I told you to keep your big mouth shut. Ellie, stop it! I've taken all from this old man is going to give. Ellie, put down that gun. Ellie! Ellie! That gun, where'd you get it? Ellie! Give me, Irma. Just see that this grandfather of yours doesn't allow us up this whole deal. I don't trust him. Yeah? Uh, hi. You the party running the ad for the slightly used car? Oh. Oh, yeah. Yeah, I'm the party. I, uh... Oh, uh, that your missus in there? Uh, yeah, yeah. The, the, the car's out here. Uh, my name's Harris. Joe Harris, Mr., uh... Johnson. Uh, that's Mrs. Johnson. How do you do? I am Mrs. Johnson. And this gentleman? Uh, uh Mr. McCabe, my wife's grandfather. Howdy. Yeah, I'm glad to know you, Mr. McCabe. McCabe, eh? Oh, Mr. McCabe isn't feeling so good. Uh, my wife has to take care of him. Oh, that a fact. Well, I have a little foot trouble myself, mate. Right? Yeah, well, the, uh, the car's right over here. Oh, not bad. Not bad at all. Practically brand new. Hasn't even been all broken in yet. Just a few hundred miles on it. See? Yep. That's what this speedometer says, all right. Hey, these tires are in good shape, too, ain't they? I told you. Not even broken in yet. Uh, why are you selling it, Mr. Johnson? Hmm? Oh, you know, I, uh, I bit off more than I can chew. I need the cash. Sometimes a guy gets in over his head. Yeah, sometimes they do. Uh, you mind if I look under the hood? Go to it. Hey, that motor is clean, all right. Real clean. Almost like it wasn't even used. I told you, if it was any newer, you'd have to pay new car prices. Best one I've seen today. How much? Two thousand flat. Eighteen hundred. I'm interested. Two thousand. Take a ride in it, and you'll see why. All right. I'll tell you what. I'll go home and get the missus. Then we'll let her drive it. If she likes it, I'll go get the two grand. Okay? Uh. Well, you know, a car like this won't last long, and that ad brings in a lot of calls. Okay, I'll give you a deposit. I'll hold it for an hour or so. Twenty-five, all right? Well, uh, no longer than an hour. It's all the cash I got on me. Uh, mind giving me a receipt? Hmm? Oh, no, not at all. Uh, here, this envelope is good enough. It's only for an hour. Okay. Hey, uh... Now, you won't be more than an hour, will you? Oh, don't worry. I don't want to lose a deal like this. I'll get the wife and see you before an hour, maybe. This your car? Yeah. Well, she'll be glad to get rid of this clunk. See you. Office. Harrington, Miss Miller. Chief there? Yes, he is. Just a moment. Hello, Harrington. Yeah, uh, take this motor number down, Chief, before I forget it. Okay. Three five six P seven three three eight. You got it? Got it. Why do I check it on the motor numbers of the stolen cars? How about a raise and pay it matches? Three five six P seven three three. It matches all right. Where did you find it? Thompson's name is Johnson now. Young fellow in his early 20s, curly hair. That's a pretty wife with him, reddish hair. And an old geezer supposed to be a grandfather. Where are they, Arjun? The Stateside Motel on Highway 99 near Academy Street. I gave him 25 bucks in mark bills to hold the car for an hour. All right, we'll be down there in about 25 minutes. I'll get Lieutenant Padway and some men. You keep your eye on the place and see if they don't check out all of a sudden. That's the Stateside Motel, uh, Highway 99 near Academy Street, right? Right, Chief. They're in cabin number three, and tell Padway not to use the sirens. Okay. Good luck. Did you hear all that, Miss Miller? Yes, sir. I'll call homicide. Tell Padway I'll meet him in front of the building. Yes, sir. Come on. Come on. Well, I 
think we finally hooked a sucker. He... Hey, where's the old man? He said he was hungry. I told you to watch him. I told you. For Pete's sake, Ellie. Grandpa just went to get us some sandwiches. When? When? Why, you were talking to that man. Wait. Let go of my arm. Why did you let him go? I told you not to let him go. I told you to watch him. Ellie, stop it. Let me go. You know what I think? I think you're gone crazy. I think you're gone right out of your head. Why should you be so scared of Grandpa? What did he ever do for you to be scared of? Why should you be so scared of everybody and, and everything? Why, Ellie? Why should you be so... <laughs> Both of you. You and that old man. You turned me in so you can take us. That's why you let the old guy go, so he can call the cops. Get away from the door. No! Get away from the door. I'm a soldier. Let go, Ellie. Get away from the door, I said. You are a killer, aren't you? My grandpa said you're a real killer. Only I didn't believe it. I didn't believe you could be that rotten and crazy. Move. Come on. Get over here. Hiya, Mr. Johnson. Guess I got back a little early, huh? Ah. Uh, yeah, 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 Harris, uh, you said about uh, an hour. Well, I figured it this way. On the way home, I said to myself, why don't I buy the car and surprise the little woman? That'll keep her happy and me happy and... What are you staring at? That... That police car out there. Police car? Oh, that's probably just... There's, uh, two of them. He's a killer, mister! He's got a <laughs> Are you... Get in here! Get in fast! That won't help you bust the... Get in, I said... You're a cop, ain't you? Ain't you? What'd you expect, dancing girl? See, I brought some friends. All right, Johnson, or whatever your name is. Open up. Watch it, Chief. He's going to shoot. That won't help you one bit, chum. We've got more men, more guns, and more patience than you have. Give up, Ellie. Please. Please give up. Please. Go on and shoot, coppers. I got my wife and one of your men in here with me. If I get it, they get it. Now we just wait and see. It's no use, Sally. Give up, please. All right, you two. Get over there, away from the window. Go on. Over against that wall. Both of you. Okay, now stay there. If you try to separate, I'll kill you. Hey, Justin! How do we know our man hasn't gotten it already? Not a word from either one of you. Not a word. Prove he's alive, Johnson, or we'll blow that cabin sky high. We mean it, Johnson. Ellie, let him talk. Let him say something. Okay, cop. Tell those boy scouts you're still alive. It's all right, Chief. I'm right here and so is his wife. But you better do like he says, Chief, because he's armed and he's dangerous. All right, right, all right, that's enough. Hey, what the... What are you... Thanks for the chance. Thanks for now. Hey, let go. Let go of the rock, man. That's a good boy. Oh, come on, killer. Your wife will open the door and you'll walk through it. Some pals you got covered. They know you're in here, but they shoot anyway. Sure. Why do you think they wanted to hear me talk? They could tell where I was so they could shoot where I wasn't. Just enough to get you off guard. You all right, Harrington? Yeah. Yeah, I'm okay, Chief. Here's our gun happy friend. What? What are you gonna do with him? Well, let the what? courts decide that. You're his wife? Yes. I imagine you're involved in all this, too. Yes. Yes, I am. I hope you'll be willing to tell us about it. She don't have to tell you a thing. She's my wife. She can't testify against me. No, but I sure can, Ellie. I can tell plenty. That's the grandfather, Chief. I can tell you gentlemen all you want to know about this cheap, two-bit murdering little punk. He's in this, too. He's in it up to his dirty old neck. I told you a hundred times, Sonny, I got nothing left to lose. I'd like to do one decent service to the world while I still got the chance. Grandpa, no. No. Sorry, Irma, honey. But putting Alice away is it. I hate killers. <laughs> Now, 
now, here is the star of Mr. District Attorney, David Bryan, with a word about the program you have just heard. Perhaps you read about it in your newspapers. The young man we call Ellis was tried and convicted of first-degree murder, three counts. His wife, Irma, and her grandfather, Harold McCabe, are now serving sentences for grand theft. Now, this is David Bryan inviting you to join us when we present our next case based on the facts of crime from the files of Mr. District Attorney. Mr. District Attorney, starring David Bryan. Mr. District Attorney, champion of the people, defender of truth, guardian of our fundamental rights to life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. And it shall be my duty as district attorney not only to prosecute to the limit of the law all persons accused of crimes perpetrated within this county, but to defend with equal vigor the rights and privileges of all its citizens. This is David Bryan. In a moment, we'll bring you another case from the files of Mr. District Attorney. But first, a word from our sponsor. And now, here is our star, David Bryan, as Paul Garrett, Mr. District Attorney. In order to prove the guilt of a murderer, a district attorney must establish a motive. But a motive is sometimes hard to prove, especially when the killer and his victim are total strangers to each other. This case started late one night at the service station on the outskirts of the city. Sorry, fellas, but I'm just closing for the night. We need some gas. I've already locked the pumps. There's an all-night place about two blocks up. Big truck stop. You can't miss it. You hear that, Fred? Yeah, Benny, I heard. Man don't want to wait on us, Fred. I, I didn't say that. I said I'm, I'm closed. He's laughing at us, Benny. He thinks it's funny that he don't want to wait on us. There's no point in getting out of the car. I'm not going to wait on you. Hear that, Fred? This is a real nasty guy. Yeah. No wonder his wife don't like him. What's that supposed to mean? You know, Benny, this guy ain't very bright. Yeah, maybe his wife never told him. Maybe she didn't want to hurt his feelings. What are you guys up to? What's the... Hey, hey, get inside the office. Hey, what the... He said get inside. Gun, huh? Might have known. This jump just don't know enough to shut up, Benny. Move! Good. But if, if this is a stick-up, you're out of luck. All the money's in the safe, and the day man has the keys. <laughs> hey, he thinks it's a hold-up, Fred. I don't know why, Benny. You got a nice, honest face. Could it be me? Nah, you got an honest face, too. It's like his wife says. He's a dope. What is this? Some kind of a gag, Estella's pulling? Oh, no, Mr. Wade. It's not a gag. Would you think it was a gag when she took out the insurance policy last year? Why? I, I, don't, I don't understand you guys. Step into the accident room, Mr. Wade. You heard me get in the storeroom. No. No, listen to me. Get in there. Well, now we have got it nice and private. Don't, 
don't be crazy. You guys, you'll get caught. You'll go to the chair. You know, she was right, Benny. This boy's a very dull talker. Yeah, hey, grab the tire iron, Fred. No, no, let me call Estelle. Let me talk to her. But only borrow. Go ahead, go ahead. Give it to him, will you? You can't. Shut me. Oh, that did it. Let's get out of here. His wife don't get nervous collecting that insurance money. Well, why should she? She got a perfect dollar buy. <laughs> You're spending the evening with her mother-in-law. Next <laughs> mother-in-law, you mean? <laughs> uh, you know something, Benny? Oh, what? I'm hungry. So stop when we get to town. Let's eat. as soon as I finish this paragraph, Mrs. Wayne. Thank you. I'm sorry to keep you waiting. That's all right. It's all I've done for a month. Wait. What does Mr. Garrett want to see me about this time? I'm afraid that's something he'll have to tell you. Mr. Garrett. Yes, Miss Miller. Mrs. Wade is here. Thank you. Come in, Mrs. Wade. Go right in and have a seat. Call Harrington, Miss Miller. Ask him to come in. Yes, sir. I'm sorry to have to call you in again, Mrs. Wade. I'm sorry, too, Mr. Garrett. My husband's been dead for almost five weeks. I want to get away someplace by myself and forget about it. But you won't let me. You want to help us find out who murdered your husband, don't you? Of course I do, if I can. But I wasn't with him when it happened. I was spending the evening with my mother-in-law. Yes, I know. As a matter of fact, that's the only time your mother-in-law saw you in more than a year, except for your husband's funeral, of course. Well, what of it? When you hadn't been speaking, but you paid her rather a sudden visit at what turns out to be a very strange time. What are you insinuating? I'm not insinuating anything, Mrs. Wade. Just stating a fact. I might as well tell you, Mr. Garrett... I don't like your way of stating things. I certainly... Come in, Harrington. Hello, Chief. Afternoon, Mrs. Wade. Sit down. Pardon the interruption, Mrs. Wade. I'd like Harrington to hear this, too. You don't seem to be able to find my husband's murderer. So you seem to have selected me as some sort of a target to, to hide your inefficiency. Well, I'm not going to stand for any more of it. The insurance company was perfectly satisfied... They paid me despite your investigation. They paid you because I suggested they pay you. Is that supposed to be amusing, Mr. Garrett? I hope it was, because this isn't going to be. Read your report, Harrington. Be glad to. Uh, you got a check for $40,000 last Thursday, Mrs. Wade. Double indemnity payment on a policy on your husband's life, taken out uh, 11 months ago. What else is new? Don't be impatient, Mrs. Wade. It gets more interesting. Go ahead, Harrington. During the 11 months the policy was in force, you borrowed the money to pay the premiums from friends, girls you used to work with before you got married. Is that a crime? Your husband's salary didn't warrant that kind of insurance, Mrs. Wade. The agent advised you against it when you bought the policy. Both he and your husband wanted to write it for a smaller amount. And fortunate for me, I didn't let them. Suppose your husband had lived out a normal lifespan of 70 years, Mrs. Wade. Did you intend to keep borrowing premium payments for 40 years? Go ahead, Arrington. Mrs. Wade deposited the insurance company check in her bank on the day it was issued. But the next day, Mrs. Wade, you made a withdrawal of $10,000 in cash. And that's a large sum, Mrs. Wade. Where is it? I'm not obliged to answer that. In other words, you haven't got it anymore. I had some bills to pay. Might I see your receipts? Personal loans from friends. How about a list of their names, then? We can ask them. I won't have you embarrassing me. No. And I'm sure you would be embarrassed if we could find out who got that money and why. I don't have to listen to this. I'm leaving. You do, and I'll have you brought back on a warrant. All right. I'll listen to you for one more minute. 
But the next time you call me in here, I'm going to bring an attorney. I advise it. Because the next time I call you in, you may need one. Do you know what these are? No. Reports on your husband. No criminal record. No dubious associates. No enemies. Well liked by all who knew him. Except you. Do you know what reports like this and cases like this always make me think? I'm not a mind reader. They make me think of professional killers. Killers hired by somebody who can profit by the murder. But be shielded by the safety of a perfect alibi. Do I make myself clear? Too clear. What did you do with that $10,000? None of your business. If the lecture is over, I'll leave now. Mrs. Wade? Yes? A word of advice. Don't make any attempt to leave this state. If you do, I'll have you arrested at the border. That's a cold tomato, Chief. Ice cold. Where did you post Hennessy? Oh, he's waiting in a phone booth in the drugstore on the street level. Call him. Tell him she's on the way out. From now on, I want her under 24-hour surveillance. I just left Garrett's office. What did he want this time? He... Wait a minute. Can't you find another booth to wait for? I'll be some time. Hello? What was that? It was nothing, Kraft. Just somebody waiting for the booth. What about Garrett? He asked a lot of questions about the 10,000 I gave you to... Uh, you know. Let him ask. W what if they happened to pick up those... Uh, those boys you hired for the job? They're strangers in town. They never heard of the grease ball you were married to. Who's even going to ask them? All right. Now, don't get nervous. I waited a long time for this money. I want to enjoy it. Don't worry. Have a ball. Goodbye. How did Hennessy find out it was Max Kraft, she called. He was coming out of the drugstore to tail her after we called him. But when she came off the elevator, she headed for a phone booth herself, so he tagged. He pretended to be waiting for the booth, too, to see if he could hear any of what she said. Well, that's a lucky break for us. Let's hope Max Kraft actually has a hand in this. Well, how do you know he'll be at the Cameo restaurant, though? It's his hangout. Goes there for dinner every night about eight. Sticks around until midnight or later, listening to himself talk. He gets quite an audience, too. True. You know, thugs, hoodlums. You know the kind that place draws. Well, here we are. We'll have a good show for his audience tonight when you start asking him questions. Uh -huh. Well, there he is. Corner booth with those two guys. Quick, into the alcove before he sees us. Before he sees us? You came down here to talk to him, didn't you? Well, not now. Not after seeing who was with him. Take a look. Yeah. You recognize them? And I've seen them on a hundred wanted bulletins. They've done time in half the pens in the country. Benny Fox and Fred Lesser. Yes, Benny Fox and Fred Lesser. The only two members of the Black Sash Gang that Detroit police didn't put away for good. They were with the Black Sash Gang? That's right, Harrington. The Black Sash Gang, alias the Murder Syndicate. A 
And now, back to David Bryan, starring as Paul Garrett, Mr. District Attorney. A man had been brutally murdered, and his widow, with a perfect alibi, had profited handsomely. We suspected professional killers hired for the job. But the only link between the widow and the killers seemed to be a disbarred attorney Harrington and I had traced to a midtown restaurant. They're getting up to leave, Chief. Yes. Benny and Fred seem to be unhappy about something. Have they ever seen you? Well, they know you by sight. Benny and Fred? No. Max Kraft knows me, though. I don't want the others to see you. Not just yet. You stay here undercover. Ah, yeah, what are you going to do? Say hello to the gentleman. Oh, here they come. Next time you got something to tell us, Max, when you tell us by phone. You worry too much, Benny. We like to worry, Max. Well? Hello, Paul. Hello, Max. Paul, I'd like you to meet a couple of friends of mine. They're from California. Mr. Uh, Evans and Mr. Johnson. Gentlemen, this is... Paul Garrett, our district attorney. Nice meeting you, Mr. Garrett. Yeah, real nice. Your friends don't happen to be in the stolen car business, do they, Max? Paul, these gentlemen are in the real estate business. Yeah, yeah, real estate. Thinking of opening offices here. I've been telling them about you. About how nice and clean you keep this county. Then tell them I intend to keep it clean of automobile thieves. Good evening, gentlemen. Come on, Max, let's get out of here. Sure. Good night, Paul. Good night. Hey, does he think we're dumb or something, Chief? Yes, Harrington. I'm afraid he does. What was that stolen car business all about? Just to throw off. To make him keep on thinking as he does. Why didn't you want them to see me? Because you're going to be part of a little scheme, Harrington... A scheme to draw them out into the open. Oh? How? Oh, to be brief, I'm going to have somebody hire them to kill you. Uh, wh well, how nice for me. It's our only chance, Harrington. If we could catch Benny and Fred red-handed, they might open up on Max. And if Max gets trapped... He'll dump anybody overboard trying to get himself out. That's right. Let's go. You know, there's, uh, there's just one thing about it that bothers me, though. What? How dead do I have to get to make this thing work? <laughs> just dead enough to make it convincing. Convincing to uh, who? Them or the undertaker? <laughs> Harrington, you worry too much. Yeah. Uh, who's going to hire them to kill me? Miss Miller. Uh, and from now on, her name is Mrs. Miller. And you're Mr. Miller, her husband. Any objection? No, but just make sure of one thing. What's that? I'd, uh, I'd like my maiden name back when you order the tombstone. <laughs> yes? Are you Max Kraft? That's right. I phoned you yesterday, Mrs. Miller. Oh, yes, come on in. What's so important that you couldn't talk about it over the phone? My husband was around. I didn't want him to know. Yet. I want to divorce him. I see. I want you to handle it. I can't. Why not? You're an attorney. A disbarred attorney. Well, let me make a call. I'll get somebody for you. But I want you to handle it. I've read so much about you... I remember so many of your cases. You were always so clever. Well, I didn't know I had such a good-looking fan. Please, you can find some way to do it. Well, maybe I could work behind the scenes. Sit down, won't you? Oh, thanks. I, I can't pay you too much, though. Even if I get you a nice slice of alimony? From my husband? You'll never have a dime. The only way I could get any money out of him would be if he'd drop dead. Dead men don't pay alimony. No, but insurance companies do. It's all you ever think of, insurance. How's your husband's health? Too good. Or I wouldn't be here. Why? I don't like to see young ladies rush into a divorce without thinking of all the possibilities. I've so. thought of all of them. Have you? 
Let me think about it. Now, how about having dinner with me tomorrow night? Then you will help me? Maybe. After we get to know each other better, I, I can help you a lot. Are you as clever as everybody says you are? You'll find out tomorrow night. Where? The cameo. Eight o'clock. If I can get away. I'll be waiting. Goodbye. Hello? Benny. Yeah, Kraft. You get my letter? Yeah, we got it. You burn it? Well, of course we burn it. What, do you think we're stupid? No, just make sure you remember the instructions, though. We'll remember. You just tell us when. He goes bowling tomorrow night. Eight o'clock sharp. Yeah? He'll leave the house carrying a bowling ball. As soon as he leaves, his wife will go next door to play bridge. Mm Mm-hmm. Do it when he's on his way back home from the bowling alley. Okay. Is Fred there? He's across the street eating again. I'll go tell him goodbye. They still out there, Chief? Yes. And this, he says, they're parked in the far corner of the parking lot. It's almost 11 o'clock. You can get ready to go. You know what to do. Drive straight up Franklin Avenue. There are unmarked prowl cars at every intersection. As soon as they gun you, we'll get them. I hope that car was as bulletproof as you think it is. Don't worry, it is. And when they open fire, break, skid, run into a building, make it look good. The inside of the car is covered with crash padding. You won't get hurt. If I don't, it's a cinch. Nobody else will. Well, here goes nothing. All right, <laughs> Here, you forgot your bowling ball. Oh, thanks. I wish my head was this hard. Uh, just for tonight. He's not going very fast, Benny. Just fast enough to make the lights without stopping the time for 25 miles an hour. Street up ahead looks good. Yeah, street light in the middle of the block. I'll pass him on the outside just as he gets to it. No, 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 not too fast. Look, I know how to drive. Okay, okay. Well, are you going to roll your window down or are you planning to shoot right through it? I'm rolling it down. Happy? Yeah. Then speed it up if you're going to pass it the light. Now, how's this? Perfect. We're coming up just right. Now! <laughs> you got him! Sweet, get rolling fast. Uh, there isn't another car in sight. Hey, Benny, 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 up ahead. Hey, two cars blocking the intersection. Back up, turn around. It's no good. Other cars coming from back there. Red lights flashing, it's police cars. All right, pile up. Don't move, you men. Oh, no. That'll get you no place. Give them a sample, Hennessy. Go all over their heads. Will be five feet lower. They'll chop us to ribbons with that thing, Benny. All right, drop your gun. Hey, we give up. We dropped our guns. That's better. Looks like we got to you a bit too late to save that man you killed back there, though. Well, who tipped you to this? His wife got cold feet at the last moment. I've seen you two before, haven't I? With Max Kraft. I told you, Benny, we were crazy to trust Max. Shut up. Shut up, nothing. He was so sure his dame wouldn't crack up. Oh, no, he tells us. Iron nerves, just like the Wade dame. Mrs. Wade, the wife of the service station operator who was killed. Who else? Max and his bright eyes. I dear. told you to shut up, You Brad. shut up! If I get the chair, I'm going to make sure of one thing. Max Kraft is going to be sitting there right in my lap when he turned the juice on. Max hired you to kill Wade? That's right. And he got the payoff from Wade's wife, Estelle, out of the insurance money. You hear that, Harrigan? Yeah, Chief. Pa- I heard. Hey, this guy ain't dead. Not because you didn't try. Uh, You see what your blabbing did, Fred? They had nothing on us. Until now. All right, boys. Take them in. Go ahead. All right, quit your shut. All right, Harrington. Bring your bowling ball and let's roll for the spare. Mrs. Estelle Wade and Max Kraft are all set up in the middle alley. (laughs) 
All right, Mulligan. Open this one. Go ahead, Mrs. Wade. Lock it up, Mulligan. Down that way for you, Kraft. Mulligan. Okay. Lock it. Uh, Garrett. What do you want, Max? How about me turning state's witness, Paul? Want to make a deal? I don't want to. And I don't have to. Don't be too sure, Paul. When it comes to courtrooms, I know a few tricks. You'll need them because I've got a surprise witness who might be too much for you. Who? Mrs. Miller. She knows your whole operation. Don't kid me, Garrett. Why would she testify and incriminate herself? Because she isn't Mrs. Miller. She's Miss Miller. And she happens to be my secretary. You see, Max, I know a few tricks, too. This is David Bryan. I hope you enjoy this case from the files of Mr. District Attorney. I'll be back in just a moment after this message from our sponsor. Now, here's the star of Mr. District Attorney, David Bryan, with a word about the program you have just heard. The law clearly states that the person who engages a professional killer for a homicide is fully as guilty as the hireling who wields the murder weapon. Estelle Wade, Benny Fox, Fred Lesser, and Max Kraft were all found guilty of murder in the first degree. There were no recommendations for clemency. Now, this is David Bryan inviting you to join us when we present our next case based on the facts of crime from the file of Mr. District Attorney. Mr. District Attorney was originated by Phillips H. Lord. Mr. District Attorney, starring David Bryan. Mr. District Attorney, champion of the people, defender of truth, guardian of our fundamental rights to life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. And it shall be my duty as district attorney not only to prosecute to the limit of the law all persons accused of crimes perpetrated within this county, but to defend with equal vigor the rights and privileges of all its citizens. This is David Bryan. In a moment, we'll bring you another case from the files of Mr. District Attorney. But first, a word from our sponsor. And now, here is our star, David Bryan, as Paul Garrett, Mr. District Attorney. As district attorney of this county, I've had to fight gambling in many forms. The one thing I've learned is that whether it's a back alley crap game or a high stake roulette party, the end result is trouble and sometimes tragedy. Of the kind that happened a few days ago in a very expensive penthouse. Where a few ladies had gathered to try their luck 
on the spinning wheel. Number seven, Rouge. Oh, seven again, my dear. Hey, a winner for Madame Collier. Oh, it's my lucky day. Every day we play is your lucky day. Uh, bless your beds, madame. Uh, pick your lucky number, the lucky ones. A lady will win, a lady will lose. That's me. Here, take it off. Uh, number 13, why? Oh. The number is 36. Oh, oh goodness. Yes, and that, that is all for today, madame. Next week, we'll play again, eh? All for today. 4,000 bucks. Uh, Julie, I, uh, I want a good deal. You're welcome to. No, thanks. 4,000 is just a drop in the bucket. Very deep bucket. Uh, it's too bad. Well, girls, that's all for today. Thanks for the party, darling. Oh, it I was fun, fun. Uh, Don't forget, girls, next week it's at my place again. Oh, you know the address, Sanchez. Yeah, may we, Madame Collier. I will be there, of course. Of course. Well, goodbye, Julie. Are you sure I can't help? I don't need any help. Yes, well, goodbye. Well, where is the case for our wheel, huh? Ah, yes, yes, here. Right here. Never mind putting it away, Francesca. Still have a player. Huh? Hey, both One Madame... roll on black for everything I've lost. I'm sorry. You're not, but you might be. You make that sound like a threat? That figures. It is. My account's empty. We have solved that problem before, Madame Quaid. A piece of jewelry. There is no more jewelry. I'm not giving you a thing. But I do want my jewelry and money back. Oh? Uh, perhaps you think the game was uh, all in fun, eh? Hardly. I think it's crooked. That's unpleasant talk. It gets more unpleasant. Either I get paid back or you get turned over to the police. I understand they don't like men who run illegal gambling games. You forget, madame. I was invited to bank these roulette parties by you and the uh, other ladies. I don't think you really want the police. Stop kidding yourself, Franchette. I'm the wife of the city's most respected banker. The police wouldn't do any more than slap my wrist. And your husband? I expected that. Sorry to disappoint you, but it won't work. If necessary, I'll face Stanley with what I've done. That brings me to an unfortunate conclusion. It sure does. You and your husband were planning a trip in a few weeks. By any chance, do you have a large trunk here? Trunk? Well, yes, in the bedroom, but you'll hardly need a trunk to bring back my jewelry in. Oh, I have no intention of returning your jewelry. The trunk is for you. Me? What on earth are you talking about? It's very simple. I must too greedy to give back your money and jewelry. I'm quite sure I can never trust you to remain silent, even if I did. You're trying to frighten me. No, no, no. Get away from me. Don't you touch me. I'm really quite sorry about this, Madame Quaid. I don't like violence. You're crazy. Stay away or I'll scream. Go ahead, Madame. There is no one here to hear you. You sent away the servants for the afternoon, remember? No, oh, please. Please, you can have the money. I don't want anything back. I won't tell him. Uh, I will make sure of that. <clears throat> Sorry, Madame Quaid. I'm really sorry. District Attorney's Office. Well, just one moment, please. Mr. Garrett, it's Stanley Quaid about his wife again. Oh, well, I'll take it. Yes, Mr. Quaid. Yes, we're doing all we can to locate her. No, there's been nothing new so far. Yes, yes, we'll let you know the moment we have anything. That's right. Goodbye. If I ever get married, I hope my husband loves me that much. Mrs. Quaid's been missing 24 hours, and I bet he's called us a hundred times. Well, I think he's got reason to worry. You think she may have been kidnapped? I wish I did. I wish I could think she's run off with another man. I wish I could think anything but what I'm thinking. The missing trunk? Yes. I can only see one reason why a large and empty trunk should disappear the same time she did. Chief, some news from the bank. What is it, Arthur? Mrs. Quaid cleaned out her accounts, took all her jewelry from the safety vault. When? Mm-hmm. Piecemeal over the last few weeks. Her husband runs the bank. Didn't he know about this? No. 
The manager said she specifically requested him not to tell her husband. Oh, uh, here. Here's a list of the withdrawals. Looked like she made one about every week. That sounds like it might be blackmail. I don't think so. The size of the withdrawals varies too much to be payments. What was the jewelry insured? Franklin Mutual. Well, Miss Miller, give them a call. Get a description of the pieces. Yes, sir. Send the descriptions to Lieutenant Jorgensen. Ask him to put out a detail to cover the pawn shops. Jewelers, fences, the works. If any of that jewelry shows up, I want to know. Yes, sir. Will you be out? I'm going over and have a talk with Paula Collier. She's supposed to be Mrs. Quaid's best friend. Having seen this wicked world as district attorney, I'd say chances are she'll know more than the husband. Oh, I, I can't understand it. Where did she go and, and why? Why? Here now, you drink your tea, ma chérie, hein? Try not to worry. Madame Quaid is all right. But what if she's not? Julie lost so much money, she may have... Well, she may have done something rash. Blah. What did she lose? Twenty, thirty thousand, maybe. Her husband pays twice that for her wardrobe. Oh, I know, I know. Only I didn't realize when I organized these roulette parties for you that... Perhaps you regret this. Perhaps you want me to go Blanche, away. Don't say that. I, I'm glad I could help you, and I... Well, I just couldn't stand for you to leave me. <laughs> Ah, oh, that is more like my Paula. Come here, darling. Oh, Franchet. Franchet, you do love me. Of course, my Shirley. Of course. What? Were you expecting anyone? I know. Well, I'd better answer it. And send him away, huh? And come back. I will. Hello. Miss Collier? Yes, but uh, I'm a little busy. Well, my name is Paul Garrett. The, the district attorney? Yes. I'd like to talk to you for a moment. Oh. Well, as I said, I, I'm a little busy. It's and about I... Mrs. Quaid. Julie? Oh. Well, come in. Thank you. This is Monsieur Fanchette, our district attorney, Mr. Garrett. Delighted, Monsieur. How do you do? Monsieur Fanchette is... Uh, a business acquaintance. Of course. But if we could have a moment in private. Well, certainly. I shall wait in the library. Miss Collier, there's an item that may help us explain Mrs. Quaid's disappearance. Over the past few weeks, she's been drawing her money out of the bank and taking her jewelry from her safety deposit vault. You... You think that has anything to do with jewelry being missing? No, it's possible. It's possible. Apparently, you have reason to think otherwise. Oh, no, 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 it did. Well, that is, I, I hadn't any idea. Miss Collier, we need to know the facts if we're going to locate Mrs. Quaid. So if you know the reason well, for... Well, I'm sorry. I'm afraid I can't help you. I see. Well, maybe you... Excuse me. Hello? Who? Oh, oh, yes, just a moment. It's your office, Mr. Garrett. Thank you. Yes, Miss Miller? I'm sorry to bother you, Mr. Garrett, but something's come up. Is it all right to talk? Yes. Go ahead, Miss Miller. Lieutenant Padway called. He got a report on a man seen early this morning on the Jefferson Street Bridge. He pushed a large object over into the river. It could have been a trunk. Oh, no. Is Padway going to drag for it? He's arranging it now. Mr. Garrett, did you hear it? It sounded like... I heard you, Miss Miller. No, I meant... I know what you meant. Uh, tell Padway I'll be happy to join him for lunch. Understand? Yes, sir. I'll tell him. Goodbye. Well? Is, um, something wrong, Mr. Garrett? Oh, no, no. Uh, just a date I don't want to keep. Well, thank you for your cooperation. Oh, never mind. I'll let myself out. Goodbye. Goodbye. Look at Lieutenant Padway. I think he's getting discouraged, Chief. And now a dragging and all we found is four tires, a garbage can, and 200 pounds of just plain junk. Mm-hmm. Well, what did you find out about Mrs. Quaid's social life? Yeah, there's nothing to find out. No running around, no men. The way she seems to do is get together with the girls once a week for some kind of a party. Some kind? What kind? I don't know. Secret girl-type party. You know, afternoon affairs. 
The servants are sent away for the day. She and a lot of other high society women take turns playing hostess, you know. Oh, yes. It's funny, though, sending the servants away. Well, you think it might be important, I can check on it. You do that, Arnie. Well, here we go again. That's my yeah. favorite. Hooked on to something heavy. Yeah, two to one, it's more junk. Yeah. I wish you were right. Oh, yeah. I'm getting that sick feeling in my stomach. Sure heavy. I get it nearly up. Let's take a look. There it is. I can see it. Chief. Yeah, and it's a trunk. Looks like a big piece of scrap iron tied to the handle to weigh it down. The only question now is, what's inside? Well, we soon know. I'm afraid we do already. Chief, is it? It's Mrs. Quaid. Harrington, from here on in, this is a murder case. This is David Bryan. Before we continue with Mr. District Attorney in the case of the Lady Gamblers, here is an important message from my sponsor. And now, back to David Bryan, starring as Paul Garrett, Mr. District Attorney. Some ladies had decided that they were above the law. They invited gambling into their homes, and along with it, murder. Only my office was starting with less knowledge. All we knew was that the wife of a wealthy banker had been locked in a trunk and dropped into the river. Somewhere in the city was the man with the answers. All the answers. Because he was the killer. No, a man can't even shave in peace. Just a moment. Please, please. One moment. Uh, Paula. Oh, thank you. It's terrible. It's terrible. Uh, oh, what's terrible? Oh, I was shaving. Haven't I told you not to come here? Can't you huh? read it? It's all over the papers. Poor Julie. What? Yeah, let me see. Banker's wife found in trunk. Man was seen pushing trunk of bridge. But witness was too far away to furnish police with description of any value. What are we going to do? What are we going to do, Fanchet? The police will find out about the roulette parties. No, no, no. Not necessarily, my dear. But they very possibly might discover that I was at her house. You, Fanchet, you... You were the last one to leave. No, 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 no. You and I left together. But I... Fanchet, you... You, you didn't... Of course not, my dear. Paula, surely you don't think that I would have done such a thing? You were the only man there. But not the only man in her life. However, if you think so little of me, go to the police. Oh, no, no, no. Well, tell them. Tell them you think that Fanchette is a murderer. Eh? Please don't. You know I love you. Only I'm a gambler. Therefore, I am also Please a... Please don't. I'm... I'm sorry I said what I did. It... It's just that I'm so upset... Please, darling, help me. Tell me what to do. Of course, of course, darling. We're both upset. We must try to control ourselves. Yes, eh? yes. And for my sake, Cherie, we left Madame Quaid's together. But... Please. It's only a small lie, my love. And it could save me a great deal of trouble. More than that, perhaps. Innocent men have been convicted. Darling, you wouldn't want a marriage to be stopped by my going to jail, or worse. Marriage? But of course. Only perhaps I should not ask you to lie to the police just to... Oh, darling, of course you should. My fault was in even hesitating. I'll tell them you left with me. I swear to it. Oh, my sherry. Oh, thank you, thank you. Thank you for your love and your trust. Oh. Now you had better go, eh? Yes, I know, but when will I... I will call you tomorrow. Goodbye, my beloved. Goodbye. (laughs) 
<laughs> what a pigeon. Yeah. But someday, Fanchette, you must find yourself a pigeon that is not old and molting. Eh? <laughs> group, Miss Miller. That's the last one. Good. I'm nearly blind from looking at records. Send them back to R&I. Yes, sir. Maybe we were wrong about him lifting the phone to eavesdrop on our call. No, we weren't wrong. Hello, Chief. Miss Miller. Oh, what a beautiful, lovely, delicious sight. A chair. (laughs) What did you find out, Hyndon? Oh, not much. Except that in my next life, I'm going to be an executive and your callus is somewhere besides on my feet. <laughs> well, none of the women would talk about the parties. None of their neighbors could see anything through the windows, much to their regret. Same group of women at each party? Yeah. Reads like a local who's who, with one exception. A man. A man? Yep. Me too. Who was he? I don't know. Description was always the same, though. Tall, dark, and oh, so handsome. Franchette. You know him? I think so. Go on. Well, I, I don't know if it means much, but he was the first to arrive and the last to leave. And he carried a large case with him, about two foot square by a foot deep. Sounds like a salesman. Last to leave. It makes him worth a further check with Washington. Well, we don't need his prints or a picture. And we'll get both. Harrington, find out where Franchette lives. Use the old street photographer stunt. Get his picture and hand him a card. All right. I'm on my way. Oh, Miss Miller, you better type out a report on this and send it to Lieutenant Padway. Yes, sir. Pictures? Pictures? Have your picture taken for a quarter. Two bits for a perfect candid action shot of yourself and your girl. Uh Uh-oh. Here we come. Pose for the birdies. Got it. Here you are, sir. Beautiful snapshot to give to your wife. What? Oh, oh I don't want it. I'll just take the card, sir. Here you are. Now you send it in with a quarter and you I get... don't want my... Did you say you already took my picture? I didn't say so, but I sure did take the picture, sir. A wonderful natural shot of you. Give me all... the film. Huh? I said give me the film. You got rocks in your head, Dad. Why, oh, you insolent... <laughs> Hey, but I'll say one thing. You got more nerve than I gave you credit for. Have a good nap. Nice work, Harrington. Wiring this photograph for the FBI should bring quick results. I hope you didn't scare him off. No, I don't think so, Chief. He'll just figure me as a blankety-blank street mug. Good. If he's not suspicious yet, he may go to another of those parties. I think if we find the answer to them, we'll be pretty close to the answer to Mrs. Quaid's murder. Yeah. Funny. What? Oh, this uh, wire photo machine. We stick a picture on it, and a minute later, some guy in Washington takes the same picture off his machine. (laughs) Even when you know how it works, it seems like sort of black magic. Attorney's office. Oh, yes, Harrington. Just a minute. He's right here. It's for you, Mr. Garrett. Oh, thanks. Yes, Harrington. Hey, Dad, Chief. Fancher just left his place with his case. I tailed him to Miss Collier's house. He's there with her now and no sign of servants. Good work. Any sign of the other women? No, nope, not yet. Well, let me know if they start right. showing up. Oh, hold on, Harrington. Yes, wait. Uh, Mr. Garrett, it's communications. If that's the FBI report on Franchette, take it down, Miss Miller. Yes, sir. Is that a Washington reply on a man called Franchette? Okay, give it to me. Hang on, Harrington. Miss Miller's getting the word on Franchette. I'm hanging, Chief. Uh-huh. Hope we can do the same for Franchette. Uh, huh? I got it. Send the cold hop up as soon as you can. Take a look. Wow. 
Harrington, we hit a jackpot. Huh? Franchetta's wanted in a dozen countries. Gambler, confidence man, suspicion of murder. Real name, Arthur Jones. Jones? Ten to one, he was born in Brooklyn. Hackensack. You stay put unless he tries to leave, then take him. Padway and I'll be there in ten minutes. You go ahead, I'll have Padway waiting for you to pick him up. Tell him three minutes. Where are they? They should have started arriving an hour ago. Uh, uh, Fan should it... Well, it wouldn't be too bad if... If they didn't show up, I mean. Don't show up? Why wouldn't they show up? Tell me, Paula, why wouldn't they show up, eh? Well, I... You told them not to, eh? Yes. Forgive me, Fanchet. I, I just couldn't go on with this after poor Julia. You stupid old witch. Fanchet. I could have picked up $20,000 today, maybe more, but you had to well, tell... you've won a great deal from them already. Oh, what if I have? I wanted today's take so I could leave town with the so police. So you could leave town? So we could leave. No. No, you meant just yourself. Not Paula, look... You never had any intentions of marrying me. Ah, oh, of course I do. Perhaps I did mean to leave alone, but of course I'll send for you, my cher. Sherry, you're a liar. You're a liar. Oh, Paula. You just wanted me to cover up for you long enough so you could get away safely. All right, all right, you miserable crone. Do you really think I could fall in love with you? I'd rather kill you like I did your friend. Oh, no. no, 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 no. Oh, yes, 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 yes. You weren't so simple and ridiculous. You've known it all along. <laughs> <laughs> Goodbye, my love. <laughs> I'll leave you the wheel as a souvenir. <laughs> Fanchet! What are you... Gun! You're not leaving, Fanchet. Well, I'm not! Why not? I'm just simple and ridiculous enough to believe you deserve this. For Julie. Paula, look! Hold it, Miss Carter. Take him, Harrington. Right. Get away from me! I'm going to shoot! You'll have to shoot me first. That way, keep Fanchet behind me. Harrington, I'll get you. You'd better put that gun down, Miss Collier. No. I don't care what you do to me, but I'm going to kill that pretty face. I said put it down. You stay back. I don't want to hurt you. Get back. Well, all right, if I have Stop, to... Chief. No. Oh. oh, my arm. Oh. Nice shooting, Harrington. Oh, thanks, but don't do things like that, Chief. My, my nerves can't stand it. I don't think mine could stand much of it either. Well, we've solved the parties. Take a look at the wheel. The ladies seem to like roulette. And he, he killed Julie. Oh, my arm is it's broken. I'm sorry about that, Miss Collier. But you really should be grateful to Harrington. If he hadn't stopped you from pulling that trigger, your neck would have been broken by the state. This is David Bryan. I hope you enjoy this case from the files of Mr. District Attorney. I'll be back in just a moment after this message from our sponsor. Now, here is the star of Mr. District Attorney, David Bryan, with a word about the program you have just heard. Perhaps you read about it in your newspapers. The man we call Arthur Jones, alias Franchette, was tried and convicted of first-degree murder. Miss Collier was indicted as an accessory before and after the fact of illegal gambling, but collapsed before trial and is now confined to the state mental hospital. Now, this is David Bryan inviting you to join us when we present our next case based on the facts of crime from the file of Mr. District Attorney. Mr. District Attorney was originated by Phillips H. Lord.
Mr. District Attorney, starring David Bryan. Mr. District Attorney, champion of the people, defender of truth, guardian of our fundamental rights to life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. And it shall be my duty as district attorney not only to prosecute to the limit of the law all persons accused of crimes perpetrated within this county, but to defend with equal vigor the rights and privileges of all its citizens. This is David Bryan. In a moment, we'll bring you another case from the files of Mr. District Attorney. But first, a word from our sponsor. And now, here is our star, David Bryan, as Paul Garrett, Mr. District Attorney. A knowledge of the law is a minor part of the qualifications of a district attorney. Because enforcement of the law depends upon factors outside the law. Things the district attorney must know or learn if the blindfold on justice is to be lifted. Take this case. It started late one night in the cultivated field in the farm area of the county. How many more bales we got to load, Slim? <sighs> Uh, Fifteen, twenty left, that's all. Well, this'll be the last truckload, then. Yeah, the sooner you get off the place with it, the better. <laughs> Mullen's sure going to be surprised when he gets a look at this field tomorrow. What do we got for the stuff? Yeah, market's about $30 a ton. Clear almost $200 a piece. Mm, not as much as we could make stealing livestock. Sure, steal livestock and get sent to the pen. Maybe there ain't as much money in alfalfa, but it ain't marked either. Nobody can say it ain't yours once you get in the clear with it. You suppose Mullen suspects you had something to do with this? Me? His old army buddy? Not a chance. Besides, he saw me take a sleeping pill before we turned in tonight. Hmm. At least he thinks he saw me take it. Give me the pitchfork. Here. Here. Push these bales back away from the tailgate. Slim. What's the mess? I heard something moving. Over by the rack. Yeah. Maybe it's Mullen. Maybe he... Keep quiet, Trent. What's on this field? It is him. You better answer me. I can see the outline of your truck. We better run for it. No. No, he woke up. He must know I'm not in the house. Boy, talk up. Fast. It, it, it's me. It's me, Mullen. Harry Trent. What's the matter, Trent? You lost or something? Your farm's on the other side of that fence. What are you doing in my field in the middle of the night? With a truck full of my alfalfa. Well, I've been... Mean, Save it, Trent. Just tell me where Slim is. Where'd that thief and rat run to? I didn't run any place, Mullen. You don't know. That's a pitchfork you feel against your back. I just march up to the house. Well, what are you going to do to him, Slim? I'm going to lend him my bottle of sleeping pills and see to it that he takes an overdose of them. Nice, clean, and quiet. Well, that'd be a great idea, Slim. If I'd hold still for it. But I ain't about to hold still. You got Slim. Clinch him, Trent. Hit him. Let go of that fork, Mullen. Oh. Now, Mullen, here's something you don't have to hold still for. Oh. You maniac. Now what are we going to do? Shut up. We're going to do just what we started to do. Get that load out of here and sell it like we planned. And keep your mouth shut. If you don't, I'll shut it for you. Now get going. Ain't you coming? Of course I'm not coming, stupid. I'm going into the house and back to bed, where I've been all night. Get going. There's the body, Chief. Hmm. Who found it, Harry? Hound came across it earlier this morning. Set up a racket. Dog's owner knew by the way he was barking that something was up, so he came over. And one of those men? Yeah. Uh, fell in the Mackinac. 
named Sam Richardson. His farmer joins this one along the east fence. Who are the other two men? Well, uh, Harry Trent. Farm on the north is his. The skinny one is Slim Ferryman. He worked for Mullen, lives here on the place. Says he and Mullen were war buddies. Find out if he has any family? Uh, just a sister, married. Name's Wharton, Ellie Wharton. She lives upstate someplace. We're trying to trace her. Well, can't talk to her until we find her. You better talk to the neighbors now. All right, Chinks. Just lie down. He won't fight. Uh, this is Mr. Garrett, the district attorney, gentlemen. Hi. Hi. Hello. Howdy. This Hi. is Sam Richardson, chief. This one's Harry Trent, and this one is Slim Ferryman. Hi. Hi. Hello. Gentlemen, I understand your dog found the body, Mr. Richardson. That's right. When did you last see Mullen alive? Yes, yesterday morning. Passed each other by the fence down there. Talked a minute or two. Well, how about you, Mr. Trent? Well, I ain't seen Mullen for a, a couple of days, I guess. Slim seems to be the one who saw him last, Chief. Except for whoever killed him, he means, Mr. Garrett. I know what he means. Uh, tell me about you while we walk over to the house. Well, sure. I saw Mullen last night. We ate supper. And I turned in early. Then this must have happened during the night. Must have. Why would Mullen come out to this field at night? I don't know. I, I didn't even know he'd left the house until Richardson came pounding on the door and woke me up this morning after he found the body. Is that right, Sam? That's right. Well, how come you didn't hear Richardson's dog? Body's closer to where you were than where he was. Well, I was sleeping kind of heavy. I took a sleeping pill last night. Must have knocked me out good. We put in a hard day yesterday. Doing what? Loading alfalfa from this field onto the truck. Me and Mullen must have moved about mm, 200 bales. Oh? Well, I was wondering why there were so few bales from such a large field. Only a dozen or so left. Well, Mullen had a buyer for most of it, I guess. Anyhow, he spent the day trucking it away. Tire tracks all over the field, Chief. Mm -hmm. Any idea who Mullen sold his crop to, Slim? He didn't say. You think somebody might have paid for the stuff, Chief? Then come back to rob him? Yeah, that's it. Mullen made the robbing mighty convenient by coming out into this field at night. Mm -hmm. There was no money on the body, Chief. Well, he may have hidden it in the house, or maybe he even had time to bank it yesterday. I want a thorough check made on it. If anybody... Oh, that's the phone. Hold it, Slim. I'll get it. You stay out here. Hello? Mr. Garrett? Oh, yes, Miss Miller. We located Mullen's sister, Ellie Horton. Oh, good. Where is she? A town called Haskell, about 40 miles upstate. The address is 414 Sycamore Street. Has she been notified of her brother's death? I called the local minister, asked him to break it to her. Oh, that's good. She may be in condition to talk by the time Harrington and I get there. I want you to call the lab. Have Fred Morgan set out here. Tell him to bring plaster of Paris, moulage equipment. Yes, sir. There are a lot of... Truck tire tracks in the field where Mullen was killed. I want castings made and compared with the tire tread on Mullen's own truck to make sure it was Mullen's truck. Yes, sir. And tell Fred to wait until evening to do it. I don't want anybody to see him. I understand. You know where to reach me. Ellie Wharton's in Haskell. Yes, sir. Who was it? It was for me. What? I'd like to get back to my farm, if it's all right, Mr. Garrett. Well, you can all go about your business for now. Come on, Harrington. Where to, Chief? Haskell, in upstate. We'll get the bullet, sister. You, uh, think you'll know anything? Well, I don't know. But Mullen's friends and neighbors don't seem to know much, do they? Why? Why would anybody want to kill him? Won't you sit down, Mrs. Wharton? Please. I can't. I can't. He was, he was here only last Sunday, spending the day with us, playing with the baby and arguing with Dan. Well, who was Dan? My husband. What were they arguing about, Mrs. Wharton? Oh, I didn't mean a real argument. Politics, taxes. You know how men get to talking. 
Do you know of anybody who might have gained anything by having your brother out of the way? No. He never made any enemies. The motive must have been robbery, Chief. The crop money. Yes. I guess we'd better get back to town. Oh, you shouldn't be alone here, Mrs. Wharton. The minister's coming back later. Can't your husband come home from work? He's away for a few days on a business trip. Away? Where? Buying crop. He works for the Haskell Feed and Grain Company. Oh, see. Well, goodbye, Mrs. Wharton. Uh, Chief, that job her husband's got. Yes, buying feed and grain crops. Seems to me like Mullen had sell that alfalfa to his own brother-in-law. Seems that way to me, too. We'll drive over to Haskell Feed and Grain. I noticed their storage elevators off the highway when we were coming in. Wharton won't be there. Well, no, but they might be able to tell us where to find him. Almost 4 p.m., Chief. We must have covered 50 farms since yesterday afternoon. Well, Wharton's in this area someplace. He... he look. Huh? What? Car parked outside of the barn up ahead. Ah, that's it, all right. Haskell feed and grain emblem on the side of the door. I don't see anybody around. He might be in the barn. The other end of the barn, leaning on the stall. Must be the owner of the farm he's talking to. Oh, he's seen us. Coming this way now. Watch him carefully, just in case. Yep. You fellas looking for me? You Dan Wharton? That's right. Would you mind telling us when you last saw your brother-in-law? Two days ago, when I started out on this trip. You stopped by his place? That's right. Family call or business? Business. Made a bid on his alfalfa. We're just about finished sweating. Ready to be hauled for storage. Oh, how did you pay him for it? Cash or a company check? I didn't pay him for it. He said it wasn't for sale. You better be sure of that, mister. What do you mean? He means Mullen's alfalfa crop was sold and moved just before Mullen was killed. The night of the day you stopped there. Whoever told you that is a liar. It's no lie, Wharton. We saw it with our own eyes. I don't care what you saw. I know that alfalfa wasn't for sale to me or anybody else. What makes you so sure of that? I'll tell you what makes me so sure. And you can check with Bob Mullen's bank. Bob told me he'd made arrangements for a bank loan to buy 20 head of dairy cattle. That's why I'm sure. He was getting them in next month, and he needed that alfalfa for winter forage. He couldn't have sold it. Not to anybody. This is David Bryan. Before we continue with Mr. District Attorney in the case of the blood harvest, here is an important message from my sponsor. And now back to David Bryan, starring as Paul Garrett, Mr. District Attorney. A farmer had been brutally murdered with a pitchfork in a harvested field. His helper had stated that the crop of alfalfa from the field had been sold the day of the murder. But the brother-in-law of the slain man insisted that the crop had not been sold. By the time I got back to my office, there was more disturbing information. Morgan left these plaster castings of the truck tracks yesterday afternoon. Will they match the tire treads on Mullen's truck? He says no. Mullen's tires have just been recapped. These are badly worn. He marked the spots with red ink, especially the crescent-shaped gouge mark. Might have been the buyer's truck, Chief. Yes, except that Slim Ferryman said that Mullen hauled the stuff away after loading it. If it was the buyer's truck, Slim would have known who the buyer was. At least a description. Come on, Harrington. Bring those tire track castings with him. Where to this time? Back to Mullen's farm. I'm going to find the truck those tire marks came from. 
Mullen only had the one truck. Well, some of his neighbors own trucks, too. I want to make sure none of them owns one with a crescent-shaped gouge in one of the tires. Uh, I'm about walked out, Chief. Why are we crossing the fields when we could drive to each place? No, I don't want anybody to know what we're looking for. Well, Richardson's place was clear. But we're lucky we didn't run into that dog of his. Well, this is Trent's place. Yeah, well, it's like he moved his alfalfa crop, too. He was a clear. Where's the house? Yeah, just about making it out, see? Right there through the trees. Good. They'll keep us covered. Keep your eyes on the ground. Right. Hey, hold it. What? Uh, nothing. Tractor marks here. Not what we're looking for. Mm-hmm. Loose straw on the ground over there. Might have been a loading spot. Move that way. Yeah. Trent must have had a lot of bales stacked there. Yes. Mm, he certainly did. And there are the truck marks. Same tread as the casting, all right. And there's our crescent-shaped mark. That truck might be over in the barn. Now, let it go for now. Send the lad crew out late tonight and get a casting right from the tire while Trent's asleep. Are we going to drive all the way back into town? No, no. We'll call them from the village and wait for them. Meanwhile, let's get off Trent's property before he sees us. Cafe in the next block should have a phone. All right. Hey, look. Coming out of the cafe, going for his car. We didn't have to be so careful out of Trent's place after all. He was here in the village. Yeah. <laughs> Too bad we didn't know that. Well, looks like Trent isn't the only one taking a day off. Yeah. Slim ferryman in there at the counter. They must have been together. Now, let's go in. Oh, hello, Mr. Garrett. Mr. Harrington. Hello, Slim. Hi. You mind if we join you? No, no, of course not. Uh, you got any line on who killed Mullen yet? No. Too bad Mullen never mentioned the name of the man who bought his alfalfa. Yeah, I wish he had. You and Mullen go all through Korea together? No. No, I I never got overseas. I thought you were war buddies. Well, sure. Sure we were. I mean, I met Bob at a base hospital when he was shipped back. Bob Mullen was the best friend I ever had, you see? Of course, Slim. When you... When you get the guy who killed him, I'd like to be there to watch when they strap the rat in the electric chair. I know just how you feel. And I'll do my best to arrange it for you. Well, well, I guess I'd better be going. Here's your money, mate. So long. So long, Slim. See you around. He had his teeth rattling there, Chief. Yeah. He was pretty frank about not being overseas with Mullen, though. Well, he knew I could check his service record if he lied. Oh, gosh. I forgot to call the lab. Yes. Uh, but we're not going to wait from here. Call Miss Miller and tell her what we want. Where are we going? Back to Haskell's to pick up Dan Wharton. I need him. Mr. Garrett, I don't know where you're taking me, but I don't want to leave Ellie alone for long. We'll get you back as soon as possible. You want to help us get the persons responsible for Mullen's death, don't you? You know who did it? Well, we oh. think so. But we need your help to prove it. How much acreage did Mullen have in alfalfa? Like seven or eight to me. Eight's right. Know exactly how much the yield was? Well, just about two tons an acre. Sixteen ton all told. That's a good yield for this year. Well, we saw Trent's alfalfa acreage, Harrington. 
I'd say he cut about six acres, wouldn't you? Gee, Chief, I wouldn't know. I can tell you. It was six acres. Well, how do you know, Warden? I bought Trent's alfalfa crop from my company. Saw him right after Mullen refused to sell. Feed and grain companies keep a record of all their purchases, don't they? Sure. And the bales be identified, I mean, are they tagged or stored in such a way that you could tell whom they were bought from? Yes, they are. What are you driving at, Chief? Final proof to break Trent down. I want to know if Trent sold any more than 12 tons of alfalfa. Okay, fellas. Okay, set it down here. Thanks, men. That's all. So he did sell more. That's right, Wharton. This is one of the bales Trent sold to Prescott Grain and Feed. Sold it the day after he sold his entire crop to you. And the day after Mullen was murdered. How much of it did he sell? Fifteen tons. Just a little less than Mullen raised. There are a dozen bales left on Mullen's field, remember? Now, you've got to help us. Is it humanly possible to prove that this alfalfa came from Mullen's fields and not Trent's? Yes. Stuff grown on adjoining acreage? How? Not by the alfalfa itself, but the way it's baled. This stuff Trent sold to me is baled with 14-gauge wire. What about it? This stuff he sold to Prescott's is baled with 16-gauge wire. And that's the wire Bob Mullen baled with, 16-gauge. All right, Harrington. Now we're ready to pick Trent up. And he can tell us where a slim ferryman fits. Come on. Light just went on inside. I saw it. What? Oh. Oh, it's you fellas. I heard your car come up the road and I thought... And you thought it was somebody else. No, 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 I, I didn't know who it was. Oh, we thought you might have been expecting Slim Ferryman. No. Why would Slim come here? To take a few lessons in farming, perhaps, so you can show him how to raise 27 tons of alfalfa on six acres. 27? You must know how to do it, Trent, because you sold 27 tons... But 15 tons of it belonged to Bob Mullen. He bailed heavier. He used 16-gauge wire while you used 14-gauge. I... I bought Mullen's crop. He turned down Dan Wharton and sold it to you? I... I mean, I hauled it for him. He thought... He thought the price might be better someplace else. Not enough to haul it an extra 30 miles to Prescott's. And besides, you made that sale the day after Mullen was killed. I had to do it. I was in a trap. I was afraid Slim would kill me, too. Did he kill Mullen? Were you an eyewitness? Yes, yes, I saw him do it. I never touched Mullen. Where is Slim now? I, I, I thought you were him when you drove up. He was going to come by sometime during the night. I've been holding Prescott's check for Mullen's crop. You see, Slim was going to pick it up, take it someplace tomorrow for cashing. There's a car coming up the road now, Chief. Handcuffed tent to that water pipe, quick. But I didn't kill him, I didn't... Mr. Make it easy. Let's get out there, Hangman. Why not let them come to us? He won't stop. You'll see our car and recognize it the minute he turns in behind the house. He saw it. He's backing up the turn. Get his tires. That stopped him. He's running for it. Move off to that side. The car is shielding him. Stop running, Slim. You can't beat a bullet. He's running into the barn. What's that? Down in the stall there, I think. Dark. I, I can't see. Look out, Harrington! I got him. Yes. I think that's Trent's truck there. I'll turn on the headlights. He's dead, Harrington. Yeah. I didn't see him. I don't even know how I hit him. I just ducked when you yelled, and something whizzed by, and I fired. Yeah, he was on the ladder to the loft. What was it he threw at me? This. <clears throat> what is it? Sickle. Dug into the stall post about two inches deep. Yeah, I was standing right there, too. 
felt that feed bag brush my face just as you yelled. It's a lucky thing you did. Yeah, I'm afraid Slim Ferryman wouldn't agree with him. Look where he landed. Yes. Stall full of alfalfa. Let's get Trent and take him in. This is David Bryan. I hope you enjoy this case from the files of Mr. District Attorney. I'll be back in just a moment after this message from our sponsor. Now, here's the star of Mr. District Attorney, David Bryan, with a word about the program you have just heard. Slim Ferryman's death ended the case. Harry Trent entered a plea of guilty to murder in the second degree and is now serving a 20-year sentence. Now, this is David Bryan inviting you to join us when we present our next case based on the facts of crime from the file of Mr. District Attorney. Mr. District Attorney was originated by Phillips H. Lord. Mr. District Attorney, starring David Bryan. Mr. District Attorney, champion of the people, defender of truth, guardian of our fundamental rights to life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. And it shall be my duty as district attorney not only to prosecute to the limit of the law all persons accused of crimes perpetrated within this county, but to defend with equal vigor the rights and privileges of all its citizens. This is David Bryan. In a moment, we'll bring you another case from the files of Mr. District Attorney. But first, a word from our sponsor. And now, here is our star, David Bryan, as Paul Garrett, Mr. District Attorney. One of the real headaches of my job is the crime committed amid the activity of some unusual event. Here, the lawbreaker uses the stir and bustle of a crowd to cover his act, and often leaves only a confused trail to follow. This was the situation we faced in the case you are about to hear. This ain't very close. What do you want me to do, drive in the front door? We can get out of this spot in a hurry. You sure that motorcycle gang is going to get here? Any second. Sally gave me the pitch on it, and that kid's on the ball. Here, get this jacket on. Yeah. Here they come now. Let's go. They couldn't have timed it better. That girl is great. What do you want, guy? Clayton? Here he comes. Stand right there, mister. This is a holdup. He's ducking out. That's what he thinks. You killed him, please. So what? Let's get at the jewelry. Come on. Brother, look at all them diamond rings. Never mind looking at them. Scoop them up and let's get out of here. Yeah. Who have you got here, Harrington? Chief, this is Boston. Sells newspapers on the corner. 
Boston, this is Mr. Garrett, the district attorney. And you're trying to find out about them hold-up men, ain't you? Well, I can tell you, because I saw them come in here, two of them. They parked one of them little sport cars right near my stand. I saw them leave, too. But I didn't know they'd robbed the place and shot poor Mr. Sloat. If I had, I'd have stopped them. What made you notice these men, Boston? Oh, I noticed everything. I spotted this little car right away, quicker than a sparrow in a puddle. The man who runs the health food store up the street says the men were dressed like motorcycle riders. That's right, they was. Leather jackets and them hats. But they was driving that little car. Believe me, mister, I seen them and I knew. I believe you, Boston. Didn't happen to notice the license of the car, did you? Oh, no, sir. I slipped up on that one. But that was because all them motorcycles come busting into town, a roaring and a blasting. They was enough to make a man forget his own name. Well, it's pretty obvious, Harrington. They used the arrival of the motorcycle club as a cover. Yeah, they must have known right when the club was going to get here, then. Yes, and as soon as we get back to the city, you'd better check on that, Harrington. Find out where the club meets, who the head of it is. I guess they moved Mr. Sloat's body, didn't they? Oh, yes, about a half hour ago. Uh, you fellas leaving now? Yes, we're leaving. Oh, and I want to thank you for your help. It might be very important to us. Well, good. Hey, how about you fellas buying a paper from me? You can read all about the shooting. Why not? Might be a good investment. Here, here. It's this way. Where are you going, babe? I'm going in the house. What do you think? In the car. I want to show you something. What? Kid, you really did a job for us. Those motorcycles come over the hill and into that town just like you said and when you said. Well, I guess I ought to know. I belong to the club, don't I? Were you riding? Well, sure, with a boyfriend. I looked for you guys, but I couldn't see you anywhere. We were busy, babe. Real busy. Yeah. Take a look at that. <gasps> oh. Great. It's, it's beautiful. Yeah. Let me put it around your neck. Huh? Oh, you... <laughs> you mean you're giving it to me? <laughs> sure, I'm giving it to you. You're going to get a lot more. <laughs> oh, Clayton. Oh, let me look in the mirror. <laughs> yeah, that oh. looks swell, don't it, babe? And you are built for that kind of stuff. Oh, I never had anything like this in my life. Well, you have now. Uh-oh. What's the matter? It's Dan. The boyfriend? What do you care? Sally. Hello, Dan. What are you doing here? We're talking to a friend of mine. Dan, I want you to meet Cleet. Cleet, this is Dan Clark. Oh, hiya, Clark. Hi. Dan is president of the cycle club, Cleet. Yeah, yeah, I know. You uh, work with your motor, Clark? He delivers for a multigraph company. What does he care? Well, what are you doing sitting out here with this guy anyway? Oh, what's wrong with me sitting out here with him? He's a friend of mine. So he's a friend of yours. Does that mean you have to sit cooped up with him in this hopped-up baby buggy? Now, listen, chum. Don't talk like that about the car. This job will wax that sucker of yours any day. You got 115 under this hood? Like fat you have. That's what you need to stay even with me. I'll stay with you, and I'll leave you. Anytime, anywhere. Put your money where your mouth is. Oh, listen, delivery boy. I'll put my fist where your mouth is if you keep yapping like that. You talk big. Let's see you step out here and back it up. Well, you think I won't? Cut it out, Cleet. I don't want any trouble here. Not in front of my apartment. Dan, I'll never speak to you again if you don't stop this. Oh, look, Sally. I mean it, Dan. You can't behave like this to my friends. Okay, Sally, have it your own way. <laughs> He's walking out on you. Don't worry. He'll come back. <laughs> Harrington back yet, Miss Miller? Yes, he's in using your phone, Mr. Garrett. And he got the information on that motorcycle club. Oh, good. Hello, Harrington. I hear you got some information on that motorcycle club. Yeah, and I just got a rundown on the president of it, too. A kid named Dan Clark works for the city multigraph company. And he'll be in their office around 3.30. Mm, it's almost 3 now. Let's go and have a talk with him. Will you be back? Probably not. We'll see you in the morning, Miss Miller. Bye. Yes.
Yes, sir. Can I help you? We're looking for Dan Clark. I'm Dan Clark. Well, this is Mr. Garrett, the district attorney. District attorney? I'd like to ask you a few questions, Clark. I understand you're the president of a motorcycle club. That's right. The same club that made a trip to Colton City last Saturday? Yeah. What's this all about? Well, uh, a jewelry store was held up in Colton City on Saturday afternoon. Owner of the store was killed. Made the headlines in yesterday's paper. <laughs> Maybe I shouldn't admit it, but I just read the comics in the sport page and let it go at that. Well, this holdup occurred while your club was riding through town. It was pulled by a couple of fellas wearing motorcycle ride outfits. Oh, now, wait a second. I'm certain none of our gang had anything to do with a holdup. Well, we're not saying they did. But how can you be so positive? Well, I know that bunch. Every one of them. Well, we're not accusing your club of anything, Clark. We're just trying to get at the facts of this case. All our guys work, Mr. Garrett. They just aren't the kind of guys who do anything like that. Uh, do you have anyone in the club who drives cars on these joints? Cars? Mister, when you're a cycle man, you rate cars behind bicycles. How many members in your club, Clark? Sixty-seven, counting the girls. They're not regular members, but you know how it is with women. Well, we're willing to go along with the idea that your club is in the clear on this. But whoever held up that store expected to use the noise of your motors as a cover. They knew just about to the minute when your gang would arrive there. Which means somebody had to tell them. It sure looks that way, doesn't it? It makes me feel bad. Well, there's no need to blame yourself, but we'd like your cooperation. I'll do anything you say. We're looking for two men who drove a sports car. Sports car? Does that ring a bell? Well, uh, I don't know. There's one guy... I'm not sure, though. Yeah, you can leave that part of it to us. I don't even know his full name. Well, could you get it? And where we might find him? I can try. After all, I don't want the club to get to blame for this. Well, why don't you check on it, Clark? And call me at my office. All right, sir, I will. Good. We'll talk to you later, then. It's you. Hello, Sally. I thought maybe you were never coming back. You know better than that, Sally. I do. Well, if you don't, you should. You know how I feel about you. You certainly don't always show it. Getting nasty about nothing, insulting my friends. I see you with another guy, get jealous, that's all. I'm sorry. It shows you don't trust me. I'm sorry. I promise it won't happen again. I'm glad to hear it. I want to talk to you about something. Aren't you going to ask me in? Okay. Come in. Hiya, Clark. I didn't know he was here. Sit down, Dan. Seems as though this guy's taken up a lot of your time. Watch it, Dan. Remember what you just promised me. Why don't you relax, Clark? We've just been saying a lot of nice things about you. Like what? Well, like it takes a pretty smart guy to be president of a club like yours. What am I supposed to do? Take a bow? I'll see you later, Sal. Now, wait a second, Dan. You're not going to go off on another huff, are you? I got you? things to do. All right, if you feel you have to go. I'll see you Saturday on the ride. There isn't going to be any ride. What do you mean? There was a holdup in Colton City last Saturday, same time the club was riding through the town. The police think the crooks used us as a cover for the job. And there was a man killed. So what? Uh, you guys didn't have anything to do with it, did you? No. But I wouldn't like the same thing to happen again. So we're going to cut out the rides for a while. See you around, Sally. Uh, wait a second, Clark. What for? I don't think you ought to call off that ride. Who cares what you think? Well, it's like I said before, Clark. Why don't you relax? I'm the kind of guy who could do you a lot of good. Wait a minute, Cleet. I... I wouldn't go too far if I were you. I know what I'm doing, babe. Clark's no dummy. He's not going to turn down a real good thing. Are you, Clark? I don't know what you're talking about. Well, it's simple. If you let the club keep taking those rides every weekend, it could do me a lot of good. And I'm a guy that likes to return a favor, which means I could do you a lot of good. Which also means you're one of the guys who held up that jewelry store in Colton City. Not a bad operation, was it? A touch of genius, if anyone was to ask you. Somebody did ask me. Yeah? Who? The district attorney. I couldn't tell him very much then, but I can now. Attorney's office. Hello, Miss Miller. 
Put me through the chief, will you? Yeah, he's right here. Hang on. It's Harrington, Chief. Hmm. Where are you, Harrington? Ninth Precinct Station. And you're not going to get any report from young Clark, Chief. No? Why not? He's just been shot dead in front of an apartment house on Harris Avenue. This is David Bryan. Before we continue with Mr. District Attorney in the case of the motorcycle club killer, here is an important message from our sponsor. And now back to David Bryan, starring as Paul Garrett, Mr. District Attorney. A jewelry store had been held up in a small town just outside the city. The owner of the place had been murdered. A motorcycle club entering the town had innocently provided the noise and confusion used by the gunman as a cover for the crime. We had questioned Dan Clark, president of the club, and he had promised us the name of a probable suspect. But a phone call from Harrington gave me some bad news. Young Clark had been shot to death. Report just came in that the ambulance is on its way, Chief. I thought you might like to meet me there. Well, whereabouts on Harris Avenue, Harrington? Between Lamar and 10th Street. I'll leave right away. Well, question any bystanders and the people who live there. There must be a tie-up with the neighborhood some way. Okay, Chief. I'll be waiting for you. Better cancel those two appointments I have for this afternoon, Miss Miller. Looks like I'm going to be tied up for the rest of the day. All right, Mr. Garrett. I'll make the calls right away. Clark was still alive, so they took him in before I got here. But Lieutenant Padway just got a call from receiving. The kid was dead on arrival. Anyone know what he was doing here? Girlfriend lives in one of the apartments. Well, let's go in and talk to her. Did she see it happen? Yeah, claims she didn't see a thing and doesn't know who did it or why. This is it. Not another cop. This is Mr. Garrett, Miss Brady. He's the district attorney. I've already answered a thousand questions. What do I have to do now? Well, I'm sure you won't mind answering a few more. The boy who was killed was a friend of yours, wasn't he? I'm sure he was my friend. But can I help it if he got killed? Were you engaged to him, Miss Brady? Oh, I guess you could say I was, yes. Do you have other men friends? Well, you know how it is. The girl's nice looking and the guys come around. I wouldn't want to push any of them in the face. No, I'm sure you wouldn't. Well, did Dan Clark know any of your other friends? No, he didn't. Well, Dan was kind of jealous. I, I never let him know who else I was running around with. Are you sure he didn't know anyway? I'm sure he didn't. Well, do you live here alone, Miss Brady? With my sister and her husband. They both work. Do you work? Well, right now I'm in between jobs. And that's a very attractive necklace you're wearing. Oh, thanks. I'm glad you like it. Present from one of your friends? Well, yes. Dan gave it to me. Thank you, Miss Brady. We won't trouble you any further. Oh, and thanks for your cooperation. Don't mention it. Something wrong about that girl, Chief. Yes, and I think she's wearing it around her neck. Could you describe that necklace, Harrington? Sure. Where's your car? At the precinct house. I rode over with the squad car. Well, get in. I'll take you over there. Then I'd like you to drive over to Colton City. Find out if that necklace is part of the look. Right. Hi, Cleet. Been waiting long? About a half hour. I wanted to be sure I wasn't followed. Smart girl. How's everything? Everything's wonderful. 
I have them eating out of my hand. Even the district attorney. You should have been there. I'd have died laughing. Oh, incidentally, you didn't give me that necklace. Dan gave it to me. Kid, you sound better to me all the time. <laughs> what about Saturday? I talked to some of the boys at the club. I convinced them that they should make the ride in memory of Dan. In mem... Oh, quit it, will you, babe? You're killing me. What town? Cliffdale. Perfect. I already know the place will knock over. I want to go with you, Cleve. That's out, babe. If you want to see that town, you ride a motorcycle like the rest of them. You think I can't? I think you could do anything. What's it going to be this time? More jewelry? Dough. Lots of dough. You'll find out. Go on home, kid. I'll see you later. <laughs> Hi, Chief. Morning, Miss Miller. Morning, Harrington. Hello, Harrington. Any luck last night? No, nothing. Seems that the store has always been a one-man operation. And with the owner dead, no one can positively identify any of the stolen pieces. That's too bad. Well, we just got a report from ballistics that adds up to something. The bullets that killed young Clark came from the same gun that killed the store owner. Hey, that is something. Can you ride a motorcycle, Harrington? Well, I used to be able to. I guess I can still wobble along on one of the things. Yeah, it seems that motorcycle club is going to take another outing tomorrow afternoon. I'd like you to ride with them. I'd be delighted, Chief. But I haven't got a thing to wear. Oh, Harrington. Well, we'll take care of that for you. I want you to stick near the girl if she goes along. You'll have a two-way radio on the machine so you can contact me in my car. Oh, and maybe I'd better make the arrangement of that right now. Captain Warren of traffic, Miss Miller. You got his number? Let's see. Yes, it's right here. Get him on for me, will you? Okay. We get a break. Parking space right near the joint. Yeah. Hey, there's two lone copies in this block. We're taking the one with the big sign. Get out. Hey, we got to wait for the motorcycles? I want to case the place. Come on. Yeah. KNK-4 to car 662. KNK-4 to car 662. Car 662. I'm getting it, Harrington. Go ahead. We'll be in Cliffdale in about five minutes, Chief. I'm on the main street at the far end of town. How about the girl? She's riding with another guy right in front of me. She didn't recognize me with this headgear and goggles on. She just... Hey. Hey, I lost him. They must have speeded up to the front. Try to pick her up again, Harrington. Keep in touch. Okay, Chief. KNK-4 signing off. Can I help you? We like to talk to somebody about a loan. Will you wait just a moment? The interviews are all busy just now. Sure, we wait. Look at that open safe. I've been looking. There's the motorcycle club. Right on time. All right, folks, this is a holdup. Don't anybody move. And I don't want to hear any more of that, or we'll really start blasting you. Get the money out of that safe. All right, all right. Please, don't point that gun at me. Get the money on the counter. I will, I will. Now the other one. Yank them phones loose. Good idea. Get the dough. Yeah. All right, down on your faces, everybody. <laughs> and stay there. Anybody tries to follow us, gets a bullet right square in a puss. Come on, let's go. Come on, jump in. Three of us in here is going to be a tight fit. Jam yourself in. What are you doing here, babe? I saw the car and here I am. Oh, come on, get going. Turn up the alley. KNK-4 to car 6X2. KNK-4 to car 6X2. Car 6X2. Go ahead, Harrington. I just spotted the girl. She's with two men in a light blue sports roadster. They went down an alley and turned parallel to the next street. I'm following them. Well, which way are they heading? North. And they're moving toward me. I'll see if I can get some help in setting up a roadblock. Stay with them, Harrington. I'm going to switch over to the local police. 
Car 662. Car 662. Car 662. Anybody behind us? Way back. Some guy on a motorcycle. Don't worry about that. This rocket could lose any motorcycle or any cop's car. She's a honey. Look, we're doing 90, and I only have it halfway to the floor. I ought to punch you right in that cute-looking nose of yours. What's the matter? Don't you like my driving? I told you not to try to butt in on this. You might as well get used to me, Cleet. I like excitement. Well, it looks like you're going to get some. There's a roadblock up ahead. Turn into that field, that dirt road. That barn. Stop in front of that barn. Yeah. Come on. <laughs> get the door, Bostick. Huh? Halo. Come on. Come on, come on. All right, all right. Here, grab my hand. There. Oh. What do we do, please? Start blasting as soon as they stick their heads in that door. We can hold out in this place for a week. They're gonna take us, you hear? Give me one of your guns, please. Here they come! Get them! Hey, Lord, Chief! Give it back to them. All right! All right, I quit, I quit! Throw your guns down then. There you are! That's all of them. All right. Now come down here. The three of you. Okay. We're we're coming. What a pair of slobs you turned out to be. Big, tough men. Shut up. Big, tough men till the shooting starts. Then you're quick cold. That's the usual pattern with men like these, Miss Brady. Rough and tough as long as they have the edge. Well, we're going to change all that. We're going to take them out of circulation for a long, long time. And I think we can put you away somewhere, too. Come on. Let's go. This is David Bryan. I hope you enjoy this case from the files of Mr. District Attorney. I'll be back in just a moment after this message from our sponsor. Now, here's the star of Mr. District Attorney, David Bryan, with a word about the program you have just heard. This was another case that made big headlines. The two men we call Cleet and Bostick were tried and convicted on charges of armed robbery and first-degree murder. Sally is now serving time as an accessory before and after the facts. Now, this is David Bryan inviting you to join us when we present our next case based on the facts of crime from the file of Mr. District Attorney. Mr. District Attorney was originated by Phillips H. Lord. Mr. District Attorney, starring David Bryan. Mr. District Attorney, champion of the people, defender of truth, guardian of our fundamental rights to life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. And it shall be my duty as district attorney not only to prosecute to the limit of the law all persons accused of crimes perpetrated within this county, but to defend with equal vigor the rights and privileges of all its citizens. This is David Bryan. In a moment, we'll bring you another case from the files of Mr. District Attorney. But first, a word from our sponsor. (laughs) 
And now, here is our star, David Bryan, as Paul Garrett, Mr. District Attorney. A district attorney's dream is to find an eyewitness to the commission of a crime. But sometimes the dream can turn out to be a nightmare that helps the criminal instead of exposing him. This case started on a Friday morning, just a few minutes before 9 a.m. All right, Carney, let's go over it once more. We've been over it 20 times, Fallon. Let's get it done. I ain't taking a chance in you making any mistakes. I ain't making no mistakes. Think I want to go back to that pen again? Look, I've been casing this place ever since I got out. You sure there's no guard? Guard. <laughs> in a check cashing joint, nobody but the two tellers and the crummy alarm system. If either of them moves for an alarm, start blasting. All right. Hey, how are we going to hide out afterwards? <laughs> you leave that to me. I'm working on a railroad section gang laying new tracks. It's 30 miles out of town and they're short-handed. If I can get the gang boss to take you on. Hey, that's good, Fallon. Yeah. Nobody's going to expect to find two guys with 15 grand driving spikes in a railroad. <laughs> hey. Now my car is pulling away now, Fallon. Good. Now the boys inside will have enough money to cash your check. Park right in front of the place and leave it running. All right. Keep me covered while I cash the check. <laughs> yeah. Bet they never cashed a check like that one before. Shut up. I'd like to cash this. Just read it, mister, and do like it says. Don't even open your mouth. And don't stare at us. You heard him. You've got five seconds, mister. Put the money in the... Hey, he stepped on the alarm. That's the last thing you'll ever step on. Let's get out of here. We'll drop anybody who gets in the way. Come on, Carney, get in. Crowd's gathering already. They won't hurt us any. Look out. Car's coming out of that side street. Let him look out. You're going to hit. Uh, I'm bleeding. Got to get out. Got to get away. Hey, hey, driver, the coop is alive. Uh, uh, you better sit there until an ambulance comes, mister. Your head's cut mighty bad. Get away from me. Why? Get back, everybody. He's got a gun. Get back. You won't run far. Hello, Chief. Hello, Hangdon. Looks pretty bad. Yeah. Which one was the bandit car? Uh, the coupe. Who was in the sedan? Man and a five-year-old boy. Both killed. They take the bodies to General Hospital? Yeah. Oh, uh, one of the stick-up men was killed, too. Any trace of the other one? No. I've got squads doing a house-to-house on the whole area, though. Who's the registered owner of the coupe? No, no, yet. It's being checked. Probably stolen. Yeah, probably. Let's have a look at it. Blood on both seats. Steering wheel, too. The driver must have gotten a cut on his head or his hand. He had a gash in his scalp. Uh Uh-huh. Hit the windshield on this side. A couple of hairs stuck to the jagged edge. Dark brown. Something for the lab to work on. The corner druggist had a good look at him. Saw the whole thing from the store. Ran out to help. Almost got shot for his trouble. Is he around? Yeah, right over there. Oh, Mr. Reber. District attorney wants to talk to you. All right, let him through, man. Let him through. Well, too bad there weren't this many police around when this happened. Well, it's a big city, Mr. Rebor, and they do their best. Well, maybe you'd like to help. I'm sorry, Mr. Garrett. Child that got killed used to stop in the store. Father'd give him a penny for bubble gum. I understand how you feel. Harrington tells me you saw the driver of the coupe. As close as I'm seeing you. Oh, excuse me, Chief. That sounds like the short wave on my car radio. Go ahead. Can you give me a description of the man you saw, Mr. Rebor? Uh... Six feet tall, maybe, uh, built solid, dressed like a laborer. Of course, that could fit a thousand men, but this one had a couple of gold teeth right in the middle of his mouth. Gold teeth, huh? Well, that's very interesting. Anything else? Nothing outstanding, except for a bad cut on his head. I told your assistant the whole thing. Was the cut bad enough to need stitching? Well, we'll have to see a doctor. Well, that was a report on the coup, Chief. 
We stole it from the west side during the night or early this morning. Well, when was it reported? Before or after this happened? Well, just about the same time, Chief, but the owner is home. He's been there since last night. His story checks out. Well, we'd better get down to the general hospital. Well, thanks, Mr. Reba. He may be calling upon you again for an identification. You can get me at the store any time. We'll go in my car. We'll leave yours here. One of the men can drive it in. Okay. The uh, lab boys are on their way out. The car at the wreck scene. Go over them for fingerprints. Not that we can expect much. Prints on a car that could smear. Yes, and even if we do get a clear set, we've still got to find the man who can match them. This body is the dead hold-up, man. Lift the sheet if you want. Hmm. Any identification on him yet? His prints have been taken. They might lead to something. The medical examiner's report has his blood type and other data. I'd rather have the blood type of the man who got away. You instruct the lab to bring in pieces of the windshield where he cut himself? Yeah. They'll call us on it. Doctor, say anything about the teller they shot during the hold-up? Yeah, he's still alive, but in a coma. He's up on the third floor. You want to go up? Well, might as well while we're waiting for the reports. Doc doesn't think he's going to live. Well, he may come around long enough to tell us something. Uh, look, Chief, before we go up, uh, you want to see the man and the child who are in the sedan? They're right in the next room on their way to the elevator. All right. Not that they can help us much. That's the child's mother. Saw at the accident. Happened only a block from their home. Did you come to see my boy and my husband? Did you know them? No. Maybe, uh, maybe you ought to go home for a while, ma'am. Why should I go home? There's nobody there now. He wanted his daddy to be the one to take him to school. He was just being registered. His first day. Five years old. You must try not to think about it. Nothing we can do to help her, Chief. I know. Better leave her until she cries herself out. Guy that's responsible for that order. I know, I know. The elevators are over here. Car coming down now. Hmm. We live in the first room there. Here's the dock now. We're just coming up to see you, Doc. I'm afraid you're too late, Harrington. Mr. Garrett. Was that the cashier? Yes, it just died. If you want to come back with me, your lab is bringing in some glass fragments for blood analysis. Oh, yes. Can you say anything before he died, Doctor? Mm, just a few words. The man who shot him had gold teeth. Sorry to keep us along, Mr. Garrett, but it isn't as easy to get a type when the blood is dried. We understand. Now, only take a second to make a comparison under the microscope now. Did you, uh, kill that overhead light for me, Harrington? No, no, no. Sure thing, Doc. Mm-hmm. Get the focus now. Yeah, yeah, that does it all right. You got it? Mm-hmm. The man you're looking for is an A-B type. That common? No, pretty rare, as a matter of fact. About one in... No, oh, excuse me. Hello, Dr. Swiss speaking. This is Mr. Garrett's office, doctor. Is he there? Yes, just a minute. Uh, for you, Mr. Garrett, your office. Well, thanks. Yes, Miss Miller? Mr. Garrett, some reports just came in from the lab, the fingerprint crew. Now, what is it? The dead bandit has been identified as John Carney, a known criminal. Served time in several states for armed robbery. No known associates since leaving the penitentiary three months ago. Oh, well, that doesn't help us. What about the prints on the car? Anything? All the clear prints belong to the owner of the car, with one exception. Well, what was that? A full right thumb impression on the cap of the gas tank. Has it been checked on? Yes, sir. We had nothing in the criminal file, so we ran it through to Washington by wire photo. We just got the answer. An identification through Army records. A man named Robert Traumer. Robert Traumer. Any location? He owns the Midtown service station on Center Street. Do you want to pick up on him? No, no. Harrington and I will handle it right away. Thanks. 
Well, what is it, Chief? Looks like we're not going to need that analysis after all, Doctor. No. I think we've found our man. Good. Where? Runs a gas station. Come on, Harkin. Let's pick him up. Fellas, in a second. Well, wait. I've got to get this grease off my hands. Just finished the lube job. We're not worried about your hands as long as we can see them. Hey, hey, what's the idea? What are you frisking me for? Looking for a gun that made a hole in a fella. Turn around so we can get a better look at you. Do you mind if I dry my hands? Go ahead. Where were you this morning at nine o'clock? Well, I was right here working. Why? You sure you weren't near the Apex check cashing service at Third and Grand on the south side? Of course I wasn't. Step over this way, under the light. Are you going to tell me what this is all about? Let's see you smile. What? what? You heard him. You heard him. Smile. Just smile, mister. That's all. So you were here at nine o'clock, huh? I told you. Those gold teeth say you weren't. What kind of a cashier gag? Cashier you shot is dead, Trauma. So is a five-year-old boy and his father and your partner, John Carney. I don't know what you guys are talking about. Don't you? Maybe the cut on your head will make you remember. Cut on my head? The cut you got when the cars crashed. Take that grease cap off. Let's have a look at it. Sure, mister. I'll let you look. Well, my cap's off. You see any cut? Either of you? No. No, Trauma, we don't. Chief, the, the druggist Reba said he had a deep gash. I don't know what you're looking for, mister. But if the guy has a gash in his scalp, just look again. Because it ain't me. This is David Bryan. Before we continue with Mr. District Attorney in the case of the man with gold teeth, here is an important message from our sponsor. And now back to David Bryan, starring as Paul Garrett, Mr. District Attorney. Three innocent people had been killed in a hold-up attempt and getaway. One of the bandits was dead, but the other was still at large. Eyewitnesses swore that the man we sought had gold teeth and a gash on his scalp. We found a man with gold teeth, but there was no mark of an accident on him. Harrington and I took him to the doctor's office at General Hospital. What's what's he going to do with that needle? Just take your blood type, unless you object. That's your legal right. Why should I object? I haven't done anything. All right, let me have your hand. Just going to prick your finger a little. Go ahead. Ha! Ouch! How long will it take, Doctor? Just a few seconds with a fresh specimen. Give you an answer as soon as the smear's ready. The blood type we're checking you for is a pretty rare one, Farmer. A.B. I told you before, my blood is type O. I know from giving it to the Red Cross. And if that's true, it eliminates part of your worries. But my assistant is bringing a druggist named Rebar over here. Rebar saw the killer close up. <laughs> he didn't see me. Garrett? Yes, doctor. There it is. Type AB? No. Type O, like you said. I told you, didn't I? I never lied. Come in. Oh, Chief, I got Rebar out here. How about it, Trauma? Bring him in. I've got nothing to hide. Okay, I am. All right, come on in, Mr. Rebar. <clears throat> Hello, Mr. Garrett. Mr. Rebar, I'd like you to take a look at this man. Take a good look, and then tell me if you've ever seen him before. How about it, Mr. Rebar? Well, Mr. Garrett, I'm not sure. After all, the man that got out of the car had a gun in his hand and blood all over his face. All I remember for sure is the gold teeth. I don't want you to identify him unless you're certain, beyond the shadow of a doubt. Now, can you make a positive identification? No, sir, I can't. All right, Mr. Rebo. Thank you. You can go. I'm sorry. I... Don't be. You've done the right thing. Well, my blood's the wrong type. I got no cut, and he couldn't identify me. How about letting me go now? There's still the matter of a fingerprint that is yours, Trammer. I want you to come one more place with us. Voluntarily. Where? Police garage. The wrecks have been towed in there. I want you to see them. 
Will you come? You're not trying to pin this on me, are you? What do you think? I'm with you. Let's go. Recognize this car, Trummer? Well, I see a dozen black coops like this every day. You've seen this one, all right. Your thumbprint proves that. What? Right here in the dusting powder on the tank cap. So I gassed this car at my station, maybe. That's how I make... Hey, wait a minute. Let me see that cap. Don't touch it now. I'll handle it. Well, Trummer? I saw a tank cap like that this morning. You sure? Well, yeah, a big guy in a black coupe. Could have been this car. Well, maybe I should have known there was something fishy about that guy, though. Well, why? Because he didn't have any money to pay for the gas. Didn't tell me until I filled her up, either. She was almost bone dry. You mean you let him waltz off without paying you? Well, what could I do? Siphon it out? Uh, I, I made him leave something for security, though. What? Well, a hunting knife and sheath he had on his belt. Worth maybe eight or nine bucks new. Did he come back to redeem it? Uh, no, no, I got it locked in my tool chest back at the station. We ought to have a look at it, Chief. We will, as soon as I call the office. District Attorney's office. Garrett, Miss Miller. Anything come in on that scalp wound yet? No, sir. We're still checking doctors. The whole telephone and radio division's on it. That cut was deep. It'll need treatment sooner or later. Ask other counties to cooperate. Spread the search. Yes, sir. I'll be at Trommers, the Midtown service station. Yes, sir. Let's go. Would you know that man if you saw him again, Trommer? Well, one customer's face looks like another, but I'd remember him. He have gold teeth like you? Well, that's something I can't tell you. He was chewing a cut of tobacco, talking through it. Tobacco, huh? Not many men chew tobacco anymore, unless... Yeah, unless what, Chief? Unless they're doing a kind of work that keeps their hands too busy for smoking. Well, here it is, the knife, just like he left it. Hmm. Fresh honed and clean as a whistle, Chief. Now, why would anybody be carrying a hunting knife in the city? More likely to be somebody who worked outdoors, away from town. Let me see that sheath. Yeah. Now, look at this. Hey, initials burned in the leather. B.F. Too bad he didn't burn in the full name. Midtown service. Oh, yeah, hold on. It's for you, Mr. Garrett, your office. Hello, Miss Miller. Oh, Mr. Garrett, we just got a report. It doesn't seem to be anything, but I thought I'd better call you. Well, what is it? A man answering the general description of the one you're looking for had 12 stitches taken in his scalp late this afternoon. Where? Colderville, about 30 miles upstate. Did you speak to the doctor? Yes, sir. Colderville Hospital Emergency Room, but he said it was a compensation case. Well, what kind of a compensation case? He said the patient was a workman for the railroad section gang repairing track up in that area. Well, how'd he get hurt? Driving spikes. He said one flew up and hit him. But the man answers our general description. Yes, sir, except for one thing. What? The doctor said he didn't have gold teeth. I see. Well... I thought I'd better call you anyhow. Thanks. Keep working on it. I will. Bye. Goodbye. Oh, Miss Miller. Yes? Did the doctor give you the man's name? Yes, sir. It was Fallon. Bud Fallon. Well, just a minute. Give me that knife sheath, Harrington. There you are. Thanks. Miss Miller, you did say Bud Fallon, didn't you? B as in boy, F as in flag. That's right, Mr. Garrett. And I think we've got our man. But his teeth aren't gold. I've got an idea about that, too. Listen, here's what I want you to do. Harrington and I are leaving for Coterville immediately. I want you to call that doctor back. Yes, sir. Tell him to dig out the swabs used in treating that wound on Fallon's scalp. If you can find the right ones, I want a blood analysis made. We'll pick it up when we get there. Yes, sir, right away. Goodbye. Thanks, Trummer. Come on, Harrington. Is the guy we want in Colville, Chief? In it or near it. He's working on a railroad section gang. That fits what you said about the knife. Guy waking outdoors. Chewing tobacco, too. 
Man with a sledgehammer in his hands doesn't have much time for smoking. But uh, what about the gold teeth? He hasn't got gold teeth. Never did have. It was a disguise he dreamed up when he stopped at Trommer's for gas. Trommer's teeth caught his attention and gave him an idea. Mighty good one, too. It almost saved his neck. But how? How did he do it? That's the one thing we've got to find out. It'll be dark when we get to Coderville. Not as dark as Fallon would like it to be. Yeah. Yeah, the railroad work cars now. Oh. Section boss said Fallon bunks in the next to the last one. Dark. If the moose isn't. Probably use it for a recreation car. Card games, things like that. Anyone try there first? No. Too many men in there. Somebody might get hurt. We'll wait in his bunk car. Yeah, it should be this one. Yeah. Watch out. Big step up. Yeah, I see it. <laughs> Ah. Got your flashlight? Yeah. Let's have a look around. Ah, sleeps about a dozen. I wonder which bunk is Fallon's. I don't know. Here. Throw the light over here. Uh, what? Here on the bunk post. B.F. <laughs> Likes to put his initials on everything, don't he? Now, this must be his footlocker. It ain't locked. No. Gun in there? No, he'll have it on him. Look at this, though. Hmm? What are they? A couple of plugs of chewing tobacco. Wrapped in gold foil. Sure. He tore off a piece of this gold foil after he saw a trauma. Put it over his front teeth like this. No wonder we got a description the way we did. One thing he couldn't change was the A-B type of blood, though. Well, what do we do now? Just sit and wait. That's enough for me tonight. Deal me out. I don't know what I ever did to deserve such lousy luck. that back of my bunk? That you, Jake? Dominic? Don't go, Fallon. Who is it? Who are you expecting? We want to talk to you about a check you tried to cash this morning. You're under arrest, Fallon. Look out, Chief! Oh, my arm! Get, get the gun, Chief. I've got it. Is this the same gun you used to kill the cashier, Fallon? I never kill anybody. Ballistics will tell us if you don't, mister. You'll never get anybody to identify me. We will when they see you with a piece of this gold foil over your teeth. I don't have to say anything while I see a lawyer. <clears throat> my, my arm. I, I'm bleeding. You, you gotta get me to a doctor, quick. I, I already lost a lot of blood from my head. Don't worry about it, Fallon. You'll be getting a transfusion in no time. You won't take long. We already know your blood type. Come on, Harrington. Let's carry him out. <clears throat> This is David Bryan. I hope you enjoy this case from the files of Mr. District Attorney. I'll be back in just a moment after this message from our sponsor. Now, here is the star of Mr. District Attorney, David Bryan, with a word about the program you have just heard. Bud Fallon was convicted of murder in the second degree and three counts of involuntary manslaughter. He was sentenced to life imprisonment. However, he was killed in a fight when he attacked another prisoner with a knife. Now, this is David Bryan inviting you to join us when we present our next case based on the facts of crime from the file of Mr. District Attorney. Mr. District Attorney was originated by Phillips H. Lord.
Mr. District Attorney, starring David Bryan. Mr. District Attorney, champion of the people, defender of truth, guardian of our fundamental rights to life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. And it shall be my duty as district attorney not only to prosecute to the limit of the law all persons accused of crimes perpetrated within this county, but to defend with equal vigor the rights and privileges of all its citizens. This is David Bryan. In a moment, we'll bring you another case from the files of Mr. District Attorney. But first, a word from our sponsor. And now, here is our star, David Bryan, as Paul Garrett, Mr. District Attorney. The ugliest word known to a district attorney is blackmail. And evil in itself, it can also breed other and more violent crimes. It frequently ends in murder. Take the case of Larry Cashman, a used car dealer. It was a Saturday night, late. He was at his lot in the small office, waiting for somebody, not a customer. Hi, Mr. Cashman. Glad to see you waited for me. Never mind a friendly greeting, Stryker. What do you want this time? I'm kind of short of folding money. Thought you might be a pal. Help me out again. You know what this is, don't you, Stryker? The Lord call it a shakedown. I gave you $100 two weeks ago and another 100 a month before that. Does money last forever? I need more. You're not getting more. Not from me. Well, it's too bad. I'm sorry you feel that way, Mr. Cashman. I thought you were a nice guy, the kind of a guy I'd like to see raise my baby. As long as I can't raise her myself. You leave the baby out of this. No, you can't expect me to forget about her, Mr. Cashman. After all, she's my own flesh and blood. She belongs to me and my wife, legally, by adoption. You keep forgetting one important thing. I never signed no papers letting you adopt her. Your wife said you were dead. She thought I was dead, maybe. But my being here proves I ain't. And if we ever have to take this into court, Mr. Cashman, I'm little Ann's natural father. I got my rights. How much? Oh, I guess a hundred will see me through again. I'll give you five hundred. Well, now that's better. Now let me finish. I'll give you five hundred if you go to my lawyer and sign a paper waiving all rights to the baby. Do you think I'm crazy? Oh, no. No, I like our arrangement fine. From now on, I'll be around every Saturday night to pick up my hundred dollars. I'll take tonight's payment now. All right, Stryker. There's your hundred. And it's the last you're getting. So this is your parting gift to me, huh? Not much, considering the size of the roll you peeled it off of. All right, I'll leave you alone. I'll take my payment in full right now. Dig that roll out again and toss it on the desk. I see. Now it's a gun, huh? You see it, and I know how to use it. I'm not going to give you another dime, Stryker. All you're going to get is what you deserve. Put that down. I'm calling the police. You ain't calling anybody. You, you, maybe I'm stronger than you think. You ain't stronger than this. Oh. <sighs> maybe you should have confided in your wife, Mr. Cashman. But you're the only one who knows about me. And you ain't ever going to tell anyone else. Thanks for the final payment. Chief, sorry to get you out of bed. Well, that's what the county pays us for, Harrington. 
Land crew's already been here, huh? Yeah. How'd you know? Fingerprint boys left some dusting powder on the desk there. No. Well, the prints aren't going to be much good, though, I'm afraid. Too many people coming out of a place like this, signing papers on the desk. What time was this discovered? About 11.30. Cashman's wife had spoken to him on the phone just after 10. Said he was coming right home. When he didn't, she called back a couple of times and got a busy signal. Finally, she called the operator. The phone's off the hook, see? Uh Uh-huh. When the operator told her the line was dead, she called the police. Oh, what's that? Hmm? What? Oh, that yellow spot on the floor? Yes. Well, the lab boy said it was some kind of chalk somebody stepped on. They scraped a little of it up and took it in for analysis. Cashman used chalk to mark prices on his cars? Uh Uh-uh. Cardboard cutouts. Floor is pretty clean otherwise. Waste paper basket empty. This place must have been swept out after the day's business. That chalk was ground in there after the place was cleaned. Yeah, it looks that way. Cashman usually carry a lot of money on him? Have to in the used car business, Chief. People selling in a hurry need a fast hour. Hmm. You find any money on the body? <laughs> Only 86 cents and change. Yeah, somebody needed a fast dollar, all right. Robbery motive, no doubt about it. You want to go to Cashman's home? Have a talk with his wife? No. Better wait until morning. She'll be in no condition to talk now. You have the car with him? No, I came over in a cab when I got the call. Good, you can ride back to the office with me. Newspaper photographer and reporters over there, Chief. I've been holding them off. They can go in, as long as the lab crew is finished. All right, Pete, you can let them go in now. Okay. No, 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 fellas. No statements from Mr. Garrett until tomorrow. Check with the office later. Let's get out of here before they mob you. I phoned Miss Miller before I left home. She'll be at the office. Two and what? At 2 a.m.? Finding out all we can about Larry Cashman. My family, known associates, the usual. The more you know about a dead man, the better chance you have to find out who killed him. Here's the Cashman report, Mr. Garrett. Thanks, Miss Miller. How does it look? Mostly vital statistics, I'm afraid. Cashman was 55 years old. Mrs. Cashman in her late 40s, no relative, except a two-year-old baby. Two-year-old baby? Yeah. Oh, see what you mean. The child's adopted. Yeah, I thought they were kind of old to have a baby that young. Was the adoption legal? Yes, sir. Copy of the court record attached. They'd never had a child of their own. A couple of years ago, they took in a girl whose husband had been killed in an accident. When the mother got sick and knew she was dying, she agreed to let the Cashmans adopt the baby. Get that, will you, Miss Miller? Yes, sir. District Attorney's Office. Oh, yes, Pete. Fine, I'll tell him. Thanks. Pete, from the lab, they did an analysis on that yellow chalk from the floor of the shack on Cashman's car lot. Anything special about it? Yes, Pete says it was an ordinary chalk. It's the type that surveyors use for marking. Hmm, Surveyors, huh? That's what he said. That might help us, Chief. Well, not unless we can find out where it ties in. What time is it? Uh, almost 8 a.m. Well, I think we can go see Mrs. Cashman now. <laughs> I have to get the baby's cereal ready. She'll be waking up soon. Well, that's all right, Mrs. Cashman. We don't like to ask you questions at a time like this, but it's necessary. Oh, about that yellow chalk, Mrs. Cashman. No. Larry never used chalk. I never saw any of it, here or at the lot. And he had no friends or acquaintances in the surveying business. Somebody he might have sold a car to or a truck. No. Aside from the money he carried, can you think of any reason for anybody wanting to harm him? No. There was never anybody who didn't like Larry. <laughs> what am I going to say to the baby when she asks for him? How can I tell her he won't ever come home to play with her again? <laughs> would, would you answer that for me, please? I don't want to talk to anybody. No. That yeah, might be for us any hardship. Chief. Go ahead. Hello? Yeah. Yeah, this is Harrington. Now, go ahead. 
I'll write it down. We were going on a picnic today. Yeah. Last night I mm-hmm. made the sandwiches and everything. Yeah, I We were going to leave right after church. Yeah. I knew something was wrong when he didn't come home. Yeah, yeah. I knew it. Try not to think about it, Mrs. Cashman. Oh, what else can I think about? All week long. Yeah. Larry was teaching Anne how to say picnic. She was just learning to pronounce it. (laughs) No. You must get a grip on yourself. For the baby's sake. Yeah. Yes. All right. Yes, I know. All right, thanks. Yeah, we'll be in soon. Hey, uh, I need us back at headquarters, Chief. All right. Oh, you shouldn't be here alone, Mrs. Cashman. Especially when the baby wakes up. I called a nursing service just before you came. They're sending somebody over. Well, that's good. Goodbye, Mrs. Cashman. Goodbye, ma'am. Keep your chin up. I'll try. I wanted to rush back to the office, Arrington. That cleaning man you wanted to question. Guy that cleaned up. Cashman's lot in office. Yeah? His name is Doty Smith. Boys from the Central Division just brought him in and booked him. Booked him? I just wanted him for questioning. Why did they book him? Uh-huh. He looked like the one, Chief. Well, why? Well, he told him he cleaned the office last night at about uh, 8.30, 9 o'clock. Cashman usually closed before then, but Smith admits he was still there. Uh, nothing necessarily wrong with that? No, but the boys found out that Smith was on the town last night. Threw a big party and threw a lot of money around. Still had a few hundred on him when he was picked up. Hmm. Come on, he's going to be worth talking to. This is David Bryan. Before we continue with Mr. District Attorney in the case of death by adoption, here is an important message from our sponsor. And now, back to David Bryan, starring as Paul Garrett, Mr. District Attorney. A used car dealer had been murdered and robbed. The only clue was a piece of surveyor's chalk ground into the floor at the scene of the crime. But other things seemed to point to a cleaning man named Doty Smith. If Smith was innocent, he didn't look it as we questioned him at the county jail. I began to forget about the surveyor's chalk. Come on, Smith. Where were you last night? I told you I was at a party at my own house. Oh, you know about that. But where were you before the party? Working for Cashman at the used car lot. What time did your party start? After 10 o'clock. Later, we left the house and went to a few other places. What places? Oh, dance halls, clubs, places like that. With you picking up all the checks. Well, is that right or isn't it? Who else? It was my party, wasn't it? What time did you leave Cashman's lot last night? Mm. I worked until nine, a little after, maybe. Was Cashman all right when you left the lot? No, he wasn't. Cashman was a good man to work for most times, but... Well, last night, somebody called him on the phone. He didn't say much to whoever it was, but he slammed the phone down real mad and yelled at me to hurry up and finish with the cleaning. All right, never mind the life story. Where did you get the money? You better spill it, Smith. Cashman was robbed, and you had almost $300 on you this morning when you picked up. It was my own money. You never made that kind of money cleaning up around a used car lot. Three days ago, you were broke. You borrowed $2 from Cashman's mechanic. You'd better account for that money, Smith. What if I tell you I'd get in trouble? If you don't tell me, you'll go on trial for murder. That can be trouble, too. I sold a diamond ring. Where would you get a diamond ring? I found it. Just picked it up on the street, huh? No, Cashman had an out-of-state car on a lot, the big black limousine. The one on the front corner of the lot, up on the platform? It's the one. He took it in on a trade two days ago. I wax all the cars as they come in, clean out the inside. I found a ring under the back seat. Must have got lost, slipped down there. Who did you sell it to? Guy named Portman at the Jewelers Exchange. He can tell you. I hope so. Open up, Fogarty. We're coming out. He can make one phone call for legal counsel if he wants. Uh, 
I've had to check the jeweler's exchange. Yeah, but if he's telling the truth, we're still short a murderer. He wouldn't be killing Cashman for money. Not while he was riding high with the money from that ring. Well, that means we've got to start over again. Well, nothing. No, it means we have to start over again from that spot of surveyor's chalk. Teletype from the State Department of Highways, Mr. Garrett. Thanks. Uh, it doesn't look like a very lengthy report. It isn't. They're checking other state agencies, though, to see if any of them have surveying crews in the field. Well, they'd better come up with something, or I'm... Hello, Harrington. Hi. Portman finally broke down. He buy the ring from Smith? Yep. You book him? Yep. Receiving stolen property. That's the end of his license. And it should be. Good jewelers don't buy without asking questions. Well, that's the state capital teletype now, Mr. Garrett. You better get it. You having any luck here? Yes, but it's all bad. Only one crew. Perfect alibis for all of them. Lots of surveyors in the state. Wouldn't have to be one who was working. Well, no, but a working one would be more likely to be carrying a piece of chalk on him. I carry my gun when I'm off duty. That's because the law says you must. You better check up on your regulations. You're never off duty. You're telling me. I think an 80-hour week is a vacation. Now, if I ever decide... Mr. Garrett. What? One other state crew out, Department of Water and Power. Are you checking on them? Well, it's going to take a long time. Why? They're mapping the route for the new viaduct. Oh, great. I read about that. They're way up in the mountains, Chief, a hundred miles from nowhere. Oh, there must be roads. Not until they get the thing laid out and push bulldozers through. Only roads they've been able to use since the rainy season are old back trails. They need trucks with four-wheel drive to get in and out. Mm-hmm. Oh, Miss Miller. Yes, sir? Call the police motor pool. Tell them I want to borrow a car. What kind? Anything they've got with a four-wheel drive. Brother, I'd be more comfortable inside a cement mixer. We must be getting closer to their camp. Yeah. When we get there, they got a permanent border until a nice smooth road comes through here. Oh, there. There's the camp. And that grove of trees to the right. No cars or trucks. Half the tents down. We must be breaking camp. Move further in. Jeep over there. The pack rolls on the back. Must be somebody here yet. Hello. Anybody here? You! Over this way! And taking a field stove will part there, Chief. Yeah, come on. Thought for a minute we got here too late. Almost did. We moved in another couple of miles. We're just hauling some stuff onto the new camp. You the crew foreman? Yep. Jim Tracy's the name. I'm Paul Garrett. This is my assistant, Harrington. Hi. Garrett? That's familiar. District attorney, aren't you? Oh, that's right. How long have you fellas been working through here? Ooh, about... Eight weeks now? Five days a week? No, five and a half. Half days Saturdays. Any of your men go into the city on weekends? Ooh, once in a while. How about last weekend? Any of them go into town then? Last weekend, yeah, yeah. Four of them went in. Phillips, Stryker, Martin, and Canning. Hey, that's Stryker now, coming back with a truck to help me haul some of this stuff. Must be a nut to jockey the thing on this kind of road and then do it weekends just to spend a night in town. <laughs> I know just how you feel. Hey, these fellas want to talk to you, Bill. Me? What about? About being in town last weekend. This is Mr. Garrett, the district attorney. Bill Stryker, Mr. Garrett. Hello, Stryker. Hi. What do you want to know? I'd just like you to account for your time Saturday night, that's all. Well, we just fooled around in town, that's all. Me and three other guys in the crew. You didn't do any shopping? Oh, what could we buy that we'd bring back here? Thought maybe one of you might have been saving some money. Maybe enough to make a deal for a used car. We, uh, rode our bus both ways after we got the truck to the main highway. I see. Well, thanks. That's all we wanted to know. But what's it all about? Well, nothing important, just routine. Thanks. Come on, Hangin. Nothing important? You mean we ride all the way up here just for that? Yeah, I'm afraid so. Hop in. Yeah. 
You're not even going to talk to the other three guys that was with that one? Wouldn't do any good. Yeah, all this riding for nothing. Sorry, Hankin. That's life. If we only knew who made that phone call to Cashman Saturday night. All Doty Smith said he was so upset about it. Yeah. When we get back to the city, I want to see Mrs. Cashman again. Oh, when we get back to the city. If we get back to the city. No. No, Mr. Garrett, I didn't know anybody had called my husband Saturday night before I did. I just knew he was upset, that's all. Anything like that ever happened before? He's being upset, I mean, coming home much later than usual. Yes, it did. Two other times. The first time, more than a month ago. And then again, two weeks ago. Those other times, can you remember if they were Saturday nights, too? Yes. Yes, they were. But I don't know why. I don't know what was bothering him. Did he ever express any concern that somebody might harm the baby or try to take her away from you? No. Who could take her from us? Both of Anne's parents are dead. Her mother agreed to the adoption before she passed on. Did you ever see or know the child's father? No. He died before Anne was born. He was killed in an accident. Are you sure of that? Anne's mother said so. She wouldn't have lied. It's all here in this paper she signed for us before she died. See, she signed it right here. Dorothy Stryker. Stryker? Why, Chief, that's... I know. Her... What was Stryker's first name, Mrs. Cashman? Was it Bill or William? No. She said it was Arthur Stryker. Why? What is it? I think I know who killed your husband now. And I'm beginning to have an idea why. You'll hear from us. Come on, Harrington. You know where we're going. Yeah, but this time I'm not going to mind that ride. This time I know why we're taking it. This must be the foreman's tent. Yeah. Let's go in. Tracy. What the devil? Quiet. Quiet. It's me again. Yard. Oh, you scared me. What'd you come back for? Where is Stryker sleeping? He did something, huh? What makes you think so? Well, I thought he acted nervous after you left. He didn't eat much tonight. Just before I turned in, I saw him take his bedroll out of his tent. He's sleeping in the bed of one of the trucks. That's all we want to know. Uh, you better be careful. He's got a gun. I saw it once. No, we know about it. You just stay right here until we take him. Don't worry. I'm a surveyor, not a hero. There are the trucks. Yeah. If you can get the cuffs on him before he wakes up. Nothing in this one. It must be in the other one, then. Funny, Chief. He's not in this one, either, only... There. There he is. Where? Right over there by the Jeep. Stop, Stryker! He's got to come this way between the rock ledges. Look out, Harry! Oh! Oh, you hit him. Oh, it's all right. How about Stryker? You hit him. He drove into a ledge. He's pinned pretty badly. Uh, Plenty bad. Uh, don't want to die. Don't let me die. Please. You better build a litter and get him out of here fast. Right. Better make that two litters, Tracy. Uh, I'm all right. It's going to be a long, hard ride out, Harrington. Well, like you said, Chief, never off duty. <laughs> this is one vacation... You're not going to cut short on me. I promise you I won't, Harrington. I promise you. (laughs) 
This is David Bryan. I hope you enjoy this case from the files of Mr. District Attorney. I'll be back in just a moment after this message from our sponsor. Now, here is the star of Mr. District Attorney, David Bryan, with a word about the program you have just heard. William Stryker lived long enough to confess his masquerade as the father of his dead brother's child and the murder of Larry Cashman. He was pronounced dead on arrival at the nearest hospital. Harrington underwent surgery for the removal of two bullets. He reported back for duty six weeks later. Now, this is David Bryan inviting you to join us when we present our next case based on the facts of crime from the file of Mr. District Attorney. Mr. District Attorney was originated by Phillips H. Lord. Mr. District Attorney, starring David Bryan. Mr. District Attorney, champion of the people, defender of truth, guardian of our fundamental rights to life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. And it shall be my duty as district attorney not only to prosecute to the limit of the law all persons accused of crimes perpetrated within this county, but to defend with equal vigor the rights and privileges of all its citizens. This is David Bryan. In a moment, we'll bring you another case from the files of Mr. District Attorney. But first, a word from our sponsor. And now, here is our star, David Bryan, as Paul Garrett, Mr. District Attorney. One crime often breeds another, frequently a far deadlier offense. A simple burglary may end in murder, as in the case you're about to hear. That the guy? Yes, that's the dear, dear doctor. Psychiatrist, huh? Looks more like a jockey. Let's go. All right, where are they? Right here on my desk. But he made me give him the key to the drawer. I'll give it open. Why'd he fire you anyway? I had the recorder hidden under the patient's couch. He happened to hear it this morning. Boom, that was it. How'd you keep him from yelling for the cops? I put on an act, bawled my eyes out, swore I'd just put it there for the first time. Can't you get it open? I got it. Dr. Jameson. Well, lucky I forgot something and came back. More tapes. I can see I was wrong when I didn't call the police this morning. I'll rectify that mistake right now. Give me that phone. <laughs> Oh, you knocked him through the window. 
Grab up those tapes and let's get out of here. Well, there goes the body, Chief. Nine stories. That's a long way to fall, Harrington. <laughs> sure is. Has the family been notified? Yeah, Pat, we took care of it. Wife and three kids. Have you noticed this desk drawer? Hmm. Yeah, pride open. Oh, I found this on the floor beneath it. Yeah. Label from a can of recording tape. I wouldn't want to call it suicide, would you? No, oh, not with this setup. Anyone else around? Hmm. The janitor. And he couldn't come up with a thing. Gave me the name of the office nurse. Pauline Colton. But he didn't know her address. Well, why don't you see if there's an address book on the doctor's desk? Yeah, that's a good idea. The lab boys get any prints off this drawer? Yeah, I picked up something. Oh, yeah. Here's the doctor's book. Now, let's see, uh, Colton. Ah, here it is. Pauline Colton, 1436 Carrington Street, Apartment 12. Evergreen, 34221. Shall I call her? No, uh, no, why not ride out and see her? Let's go. Who you call it? Mrs. Charles Francis Palmer. Now, listen, chick, you got some real juicy stuff on these tapes, but I'm going to argue with you about something. Your idea of what you're going to do with it just, uh, just don't make sense. What do I have to do, draw pictures? Mrs. Charles Francis Palmer's going to give me $500 for the recording of what her husband said during his psychoanalysis. I told you that. Okay, okay. She figures it'll help her get a divorce from the guy, but this thing's worth a lot more than 500 bucks. We got to make it pay off, chick. We gotta make it pay off big. How? We ain't gonna let Mrs. Charles Francis Palmer hear this tape. We're gonna let her husband listen to it. Or another recording of it. I won't do it, Bob. Blackmail's too risky. What are you talking about? We knocked the dock out the window, didn't we? That's homicide. Don't say that, Bob. It was an accident. Try to tell the cops it was an accident. Well, they don't know we had anything to do with it. I don't care. We're going to get a lot more than 500 bucks out of this, and we're going to do it my way. No, Bo, this is my deal. We're doing it my way. Hey, what do you think you're doing? I'm going to burn these other tapes. Hey, give me those. Let go of me, Bo. I'll let go of you. <laughs> you lousy gorilla. Well, that'll teach you not to argue with me, chick. I'm a guy that likes his own way. Where are you going with those? I'm taking them with me. When you get some sense in your head, call me. You know the number. Fourteen thirty-six. Hey, here it is, Chief. Now. Oh. Apartment twelve. Must be on the first floor. Yes. Mm, locked. Looks like we'll have to press the buzzer. I'll get it. Hope she's home. Oh, you never know. Who is it? Uh, we're police officers, Miss Colton. We have to talk to you. There we are. Miss Colton? Yes, I'm Miss Colton, but I don't understand this. You work for Dr. Leland Jameson? Yes. Dr. Jameson was killed in his office this evening. We were pretty sure he was pushed through the window. We thought you might be able to help us on a few things. Pushed through a window? Oh, that's right. We were pretty sure it was murder. Well, but we, we'd better not talk out here. Will you come in? Well, thank you. Well, incidentally, I'm Paul Garrett, district attorney. This is Mr. Harrington, my assistant. Gosh, I... I don't know what to say. Dr. Jameson dead. I... 
I'm numb. Are you hurt, Miss Colton? You've got blood on your face. That's a bad bruise. Oh, oh no, no. It, it's really nothing. I I fell against a chair just now. Oh, in here? Yes, as I was running for the buzzer. No, I'm very sorry. Well, don't worry about it. I'll be all right. Uh, Miss Colton, do you mind if we look through your apartment? Why would you want to do that? Well, I must tell you, we can't do this without your permission. That is, not without a warrant. And you don't have a warrant? Not at the moment. You don't need one. I don't know what you expect to find, but go ahead and look. Arrington? Okay, Chief. I just don't get this. You were Dr. Jameson's nurse, weren't you, Miss Colton? Well, that's right. Nurse and receptionist. Well, how long have you worked for him? Well, let's see. About four months. Dr. Jameson was a psychiatrist. Yes. I imagine he did quite a lot of psychoanalysis. Oh, yes, he was in private practice. Uh, was it his custom to use a tape recorder during these sessions with his patients? Oh, no. But he did use a tape recorder. Well, yes, but only for dictating letters and notes that he wanted typed up. And these letters and notes that Dr. Jameson dictated on the recorder, was it your job to type them up? Yes, it was. And where did you keep the tapes? In my desk. Locked up? Yes. Did you keep the key to the drawer? I usually left it on the desk in case Dr. Jameson wanted to refer to anything. Well, there's nothing here, Chief. Okay, Hyde. Miss Colton, I appreciate your cooperation. Well, that's perfectly all right. I've got nothing to hide. Well, we might want to talk to you again. Anytime. I, uh, I tried not to disturb anything, miss. Well, that's all right. Good night, Miss Colton. Good night. Real nice and ladylike, Chief. And she acted as if she wanted to help us. But there's, there's one thing that bothers me. She said she cut her face by falling against a chair. And the only chairs she had in the room were all overstuffed. Right. So she was telling a lie. Why? Well, we'll put a tail on her. And tomorrow morning, I'd like you to call on several other psychiatrists in that building. Find out if they use tape recorders and psychoanalysis. Now get on it first thing. <laughs> you. Well, I haven't had dinner yet. I thought you might like to take me out to eat. I thought we weren't getting along. We weren't until the district attorney came to see me a little while ago. D.A., huh? Did he get anything out of you? Not a thing. But he had a man with him who searched the place. I'd have had a bad time if they'd have found those tapes. Yeah. Yeah, I guess you would. Looks like I saved you from something, don't it, Chick? You saved me from plenty, Bolt. Hmm. From now on, I'm with you. I think you're going to be good luck for me. Well, that's the way to talk. How about dinner? Sure. Sure, we'll go any way you say. First, I want to make a phone call. Huh? Who are you going to call, Bo? The well-known president of our Chamber of Commerce, Mr. Charles Francis Palmer. I'm going to set up a date with him for tomorrow. Hi, Miss Miller. Chief gone to lunch yet? Oh, no. He's still in his office, Harrington. Oh, good. Well, I talked to three psychiatrists, Chief. What do they have to say? They don't use recorders for psychoanalysis. Patients wouldn't like it. So the girl told the truth about that. All right. She moved out of her apartment last evening and left no forwarding address. Hey, that makes it tougher. Did anything come out of those fingerprints? Yeah, nothing. They were all blurred up. Hmm. Which means we don't have a single lead on this case. We've got to find one, Harrington. Dr. Jameson had some of the most prominent people in town as patients. I've got a hunch the thing is going to develop into an extortion setup. Unless we can stop it, this town is going to have its own reign of terror. <laughs> This is David Bryan. Before we continue with Mr. District Attorney in the case of the blackmail killer, 
Here is an important message I'd like you to hear. And now back to David Bryan, starring as Paul Garrett, Mr. District Attorney. A psychiatrist had been murdered in his office, knocked through a window to the street nine floors below. Tapes from a recording machine had been taken from the office, and we felt sure they were going to be used for blackmail. And the crooks proved us right in a hurry. They went to work without losing a bit of time. Having accomplished what I had to do, and started toward my next appointment. This, of course, made it necessary to take extra precaution. <laughs> well, Mr. Palmer? I never agreed to let anything like this be recorded. How did you get this tape? What difference does it make? We got it, and we got copies of it. I suppose you expect me to pay you something to keep this quiet. You're lucky, Mr. Palmer. Your wife wants that tape. She wants to use it to get a divorce. This is fiendish. With that for evidence, she'd make a real monkey out of you in court. When her lawyers got through, you wouldn't have enough left to pay the tax on a movie ticket. <laughs> Dirty blackmailer! Okay, mister, you're asking for it? Go! Oh! Now, you better stay down there, Palmer, or you'll really get hurt. You can't do this to me! You can't do this to me! Oh, take it easy! You'll kill him! Oh! I'm just knocking some sense into him! That's oh! all! Oh! Office. Harrington, Miss Miller. Chief there? Oh, yes, he is. Just a minute. Hello, Harrington. Chief, I'm down at Central Station in Captain Mars office. They just got a report here I thought you should know about. Charles Francis Palmer was beaten up at his home this morning. Hey, wasn't his name on that list of Dr. Jameson's patients? Oh, that's right. Who turned in the report? Uh, Palmer's sister. She's indignant and wants something done about it. But Palmer refuses to cooperate. Won't sign a complaint or make a statement. Maybe we'd better have a talk with him. Do you have his address? Uh-huh. 114 Park Circle. Oh, meet me out there. I'll leave right away. Okay, Chief. There's a spot. Right in front of the bank, too. Well, that's a loading zone, Bold. Who cares? Suppose a cop comes along. So we get a ticket. Oh, shut up. Here comes Palmer. I've been waiting for you. You got the dough? I'll have to talk to you about that. What's there to talk about? All I want's the dough. I've got 5000 here. The deal is ten. I can't get that much. Go back there and get the rest of it. I tell you, I can't. I'm not as wealthy as you think. Now look, Palmer. Wait a I... second, Bolt. Give me the 5000 Mr. Palmer. That'll be all right. Oh, thanks. Here. You're dealing with me, Palmer. I don't care what she says. Go on, Mr. Palmer. I'll talk to him. <laughs> yes. All right. What are you trying to do? Be the mastermind again? We're pushing him too far, Bold. They got 5000 out of Palmer. Let's start working on the other people on our list. Hmm? sister said you wanted to see me. Oh, thanks for coming down. I hope you're not here just because of this accident of mine. Your sister insists that you were beaten up. She says she heard part of it and saw a man leaving the house. I don't care what she said. I hope you'll forgive me, but I have other things to take care of. All right, Palmer. It means we'll have to find some other way to handle the situation, but one way or another, we'll handle it. I'm sure you will. Good day, Garrett. That's a frightened man, Chief. Nothing freezes people up like blackmail. Yes, you're right. Well, let's get back to the office. Well, 
Where are we going now, Bolt? I'm looking for a phone booth so I can make a call. They can't trace you when you make a call that way. If you're going to be that careful, why don't you play it smart all the way? What do you mean? Going to Palmer's house yesterday. We could have walked right into a trap. Yeah, yeah, I thought of that. But how else are you going to do it? You've got to let him hear the tape. Why not mail him a piece of the tape? Hey. <laughs> Kid, you're a real brain. And we meet him somewhere. I'll do that. Be a lot safer. Sure, sure would. And that's the way we'll do it from now on. Is the district attorney in, please? Yes, he is. Who shall I say is calling? I'm Miss Foy. Oh, yes. Just a moment. Yes, Miss Miller. Miss Foy's here to see you, Mr. Garrett. Oh, have her come right in. Yes, sir. Would you go in, Miss Foy? Thank you. Mr. Garrett. Well, won't you sit down, Miss Foy? Thank you. I I came in as you suggested, Mr. Garrett. Trouble? Yes, I... A man called me on the phone last night. He, he told me he was mailing me a piece of tape recording. I got it this morning. I'm frightened, Mr. Garrett. I... <laughs> Miss Foy, if it makes you feel better to have a good cry, you go right ahead. But if you're willing to help us on this case, I don't think you have anything to worry about. You... You really think so? What did the man tell you to do? Well, I, I'm supposed to meet him this evening at the entrance to Carroll Park. What kind of an arrangement did he make for recognizing you? I'm to carry a folded newspaper in one hand, a dog's leash in the other. Miss Foy, I want you to go home and forget all about this. You... You mean you're going to take care of the meeting? That's right. You can leave the rest of this to us. I... I can't tell you how much I appreciate your help and, and your understanding. I want to thank you for coming in. That took courage. I was scared, Steve. But I, I'm glad I did. Goodbye, Mr. Garrett. Goodbye, Miss Boy. How would you like a job, Miss Miller? Dictation? Something more to your liking. How would you like to play decoy for us? For the blackmailers? I'd love it. Yeah, I thought so. Well, where's Harrington? Mm, he said he'd be at the doctor's for the next hour. Call him and tell him to check in here as soon as he's through. Okay. All right, Chick Pocket. Want me to stay in the car? That's right. Keep the engine running. Why, is she there yet? Well, I can't tell with those bushes in the way. Good luck, Bolt. It's a cinch. Miss Foy? Yes, I'm Miss Foy. I guess you know why I'm here. Yes. How much do you want? Three thousand. Cash. Meet me here with her tomorrow night, same time. All right. And, uh, don't bring anyone with you, understand? I understand perfectly. Okay. I'll be seeing you. How'd it go? It was a man, Mr. Garrett. He wants me to be here tomorrow night with $3,000. Now, that's what we want. You'll have the 3000 all right, and mark money. The moment he accepts it, we'll grab him. Just keep walking, Miss Foy. I've got the money for you. Okay, Here. okay, but keep heading for that car. Take a look, Chick. That's not Miss Foy. Get in the car, Are you. Get going, Chick, fast. We 
We're too late. That guy slugged her. One tail light, and they're heading through the park. Let's get back to the car. Anyone behind us, Bolt? Not right now. Well, I'm going to slow down then. No use getting picked up for speeding. How do you know this baby ain't the Foy dame? Foy came into the office, didn't she? I saw Foy. How do you like that? We've got to do something about her, Bolt. She can identify us, testify against us. Yeah, yeah, yeah. All right, what? Well, there's a ravine in the park. I know. It's right ahead of us. Pull over and stop then. Douse your lights. Keep it running. Come on, you. We've got to come up with them, Harrington. Fast. I'm wide open. Lucky it's late and there's no traffic. Car parked up ahead. Fill the lights. Get in behind. Hey, yeah. Come on. It's the nurse. I'll get her. All right. All right. This will do it. You'll never get away with it. Oh, I think I will. Not with me. Hey. No. no, no, you don't. Come here. Now, that's enough of that. Hey, what are you... You're all through, mister. Who are you? Watch it, Chief. He's got a knife. I'll take care of that. Not enough, mister? Yeah. Yeah, just, just let me alone. On your feet. All right. All right, head for the car. You all right, Miss Miller? I'm fine. I'm sorry I didn't get here sooner. Oh, you got here just right. Hey, this looks like old home week. I've got the other one, Chief. Good. Now we can take them both downtown where they can dictate their memoirs to a police stenographer. Get in the car, both of you. Uh, I want a lawyer. You'll get one. But don't expect too much from him. With you, he'll actually be wasting his time. This is David Bryan again. I hope you've enjoyed this case from the file of Mr. District Attorney. I'll be back in just a moment after this message from our sponsor. Now, here's the star of Mr. District Attorney, David Bryan, with a word about the program you have just heard. I'm sure you read about this one in your newspapers. The people we called Bolt and Pauline were tried and convicted on counts of burglary, extortion, assault with intent to kill, and with murder in the first degree. Both are now serving long sentences for their crimes. And now this is David Bryan inviting you to join us when we present our next case based on the facts of crime from the file of Mr. District Attorney. Mr. District Attorney was originated by Phillips H. Lord. <laughs> District Attorney, starring David Bryan. Mr. District Attorney, champion of the people, defender of truth, guardian of our fundamental rights to life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. And it shall be my duty as district attorney 
not only to prosecute to the limit of the law all persons accused of crimes perpetrated within this county, but to defend with equal vigor the rights and privileges of all its citizens. This is David Bryan. In a moment, we'll bring you another case from the files of Mr. District Attorney. But first, a word from our sponsor. And now, here is our star, David Bryan, as Paul Garrett, Mr. District Attorney. To a district attorney, a county is like a reservoir. The level isn't always the same. People move in, people move away. Good people, bad people. The bad ones make trouble. This case started in a trailer parked in an empty field on the outskirts of town. Howdy, Joe. Howdy, Russ. Ain't you gonna ask me in? Yeah, sure. Come on in. What's on your mind, Russ? Joe, I figure that two weeks is long enough for old friends to be mad at each other. Especially friends that grew up together back home. I come to ask you to shake hands. <laughs> you know, now that you're here, I... Can't figure just what we've been mad about. Ain't nobody I'd rather shake hands with than you, Russ. <laughs> You're my boy. But we ain't never going to talk politics again. <laughs> oh, you got a deal. Uh, I was just about to fix me some grub. Why don't you stay and eat? Oh, thanks, but uh, Ella's expecting me back at the motor court. You heard from Marge? Uh, yeah. I got a telegram from Dallas this morning. She's on her way back. Her sister must be better then. Must be. Uh, Marge just stay with her a while longer. I'm mighty close. Ellie'd like to have you and Marge over for dinner when she gets back. Uh, Ellie's been beefing at me ever since you and me fell out. Uh, she'll be here tomorrow. Well, good deal. Then how about tomorrow night? We'd be proud to come. Swell. Ellie'll be tickled. Well, I uh, guess I'd better be getting along with the old pay envelope. So long, Joe. So long, Russ. Thanks for coming. Oh, uh, by the way, you ain't seen your brother-in-law, have you? Oh, no, no, not for a couple of days. Why, he, uh, he owe you money, too? Well, you know Orville. He owes half the guys out at the plant. If he could wire an instrument panel the way he can borrow money, they'd make him a lead man. I'll make good whatever no, you... No, nothing doing. You ain't responsible for his debts. Good night, Joe. Oh, uh, good night, Russ. Just a second. Oh, did you forget something? Oh, it's you, Orville. Well, who'd you expect? Russ was just here. I thought it was him coming back. I know he was here. I've been sitting out back long enough waiting for him to leave. Could have come in. Russ don't bite. Unless you got a reason for ducking him. Well, he don't like me. Reckon that's your fault, Orville. Oh, sure. Everything's my fault. How come you're standing up for him? I thought you and him was on the outs. Not anymore. Besides, it's none of your business. What'd you come for, Orvi? Well, Joe, I, I need some help. I, I got my check cashed, and I, I guess I didn't notice it till I was almost to the rooming house, but well, I got a hole in my pocket. Hey, you see? I, I lost my pay. Do I look like a half-wit to you? Joe, I swear. The I... last time you came with that story, you said your pocket was picked. And the time before that, you said you got stuck with a loan you signed for somebody. It was the truth, Joe. Honest. Stop using the word honest, Orvie. Doesn't sound right coming from you. If your money's gone, you lost it in a pay night crap game at Holland's. I haven't been near Holland's in wheat. Ah, uh, Joe, you gotta help me. My wife will buck like a maverick under a branding iron if I don't bring some money home. But you and Sis have got some side money. I know you have. Yes, and this time we're gonna keep it. Joe, I need money. I ain't leaving here without it. We're family. Family? Fat lot that means to you. There's nothing here for you, Orville. 
You better try someplace else. I said I wasn't leaving without the money. Reckon you'll be here a long time then, Orvie. So you'll have to excuse me. I'm fixing my supper. I ain't gonna ask you again, Joe. Glad to hear. Just gonna keep ignoring me, huh? Like I wasn't even here. That's right. Maybe I can make you pay a little attention with this frying pan. Orvie, put that down. No, I'm gonna remind you I'm still here. Like this. I told you I wasn't leaving. I told you, Joe. I warned you. Refusing help to your own kin. I'll take it myself. You ain't gonna be needing it anymore. I've kept the whole field blocked off, Chief. Nobody's been near the trailer except Frager's wife and me and the lad crew. Oh, good, Hankin. Frager, the dead man's name? Yeah, that's right. Joe Frager, aircraft worker. His wife was in Dallas, Texas, visiting a sick relative. Found the body when she got back this morning. Uh-huh. Where is she now? Yeah, she's sitting over there in my car. I tried to get her to go over to one of the motels on the highway, but she won't. Uh, she's in, you know, she's in kind of a daze. No shock. That's to be expected. I wonder why they parked that trailer in an empty field. Plenty of trailer camps around town. Yeah, save money, I guess. You know how some of those migratories are. Come to the cities and save all they can. Then go back to the home state and buy a piece of land. Mm-hmm. There was a gasoline lamp in the trailer for light. What do they do for water? Well, there was a well out back. Used to be a farmhouse here some time ago. Must have been moved. Part of the foundation is still there. I guess they had enough to get by. You want to walk out to the road? I can have one of the cars radio for a pickup on the body. Okay. Who's that coming up the trail? Huh? One of the boys from the squad? Oh, he's not in uniform. Hey, you. Stay right where you are. Don't come any further. I told them not to let anybody come into this field. And he didn't get too far, whoever he is. Who are you, fella? Who told you you could come in here? Didn't you see those police cars out on the road? They said it was all right. I come to help my sister. Who's your sister? Marge. Joe Prager's wife. He was my brother-in-law. That's why the cops let me through. How about it, Chief? All right. Your sister's sitting in one of those cars over there. I guess it'll help to have somebody with her. Thanks. Oh, just a second. Yeah? Got an aircraft ID button on your shirt? That's right. Orville James. Well, that's a good picture of you. Yeah. Did your brother-in-law work in the same plant? Yeah, not the same department, though. How'd you find out he was killed? Well, the, the cops down by the road told me. Isn't the aircraft plant working today? Yeah, sure it is. You on the swing shift? No, a day shift. plant is on the other side of town. How did you get out here now? Well, it's my lunch hour. I got a lift over this way. I just about take your whole hour. More if you don't catch your ride going right back right away. You make a habit of hitchhiking out here on your lunch hour? No, of course I don't. Anything else you want to know? Yes. When did you see your brother-in-law last? I don't know. Three, maybe four days ago. Not yesterday? No. Not even at work? It's a big place. We didn't even work in the same building. What time did you quit yesterday, Orville? Five o'clock. Then what did you do between six and eight o'clock? And who was with you while you did it? Why, well, I, I cashed my check at Holland's to a place over near the plant. And then I... Then what? Did you come out here? Yes. What? I said yes. Yes, I come out here. I'd have told you before if you'd asked me the right way. Why did you say you hadn't seen Joe Prager in three or four days if you saw him last night? I didn't see him last night. Now, listen, you just told us... I told you I'd come out here, but I didn't see Joe. Why not? If he didn't answer your knock, the trailer door wasn't locked, and you're a relative. I didn't even knock. I changed my mind about going in because there was a car parked outside. Not Joe's own car, another car. He had company. I recognized the car. It belongs to Russ Newcomb. And I didn't want to go in while he was there because I didn't want to get mixed up in no argument. Who is Russ Newcomb, and why did you expect an argument? Russ is a welder out the plant. Him and Joe had been friends, but they got teed off at each other a couple of weeks ago. Hadn't been talking. And why would Newcomb be visiting here? Why don't you ask Newcomb that? Now, are you going to let me go to my sister, or ain't you? Chief? Let him go. All right, Orville, go ahead.
Yeah, it looks like this one might crack easy, Chief. Yes. I want to contact Miss Miller and get the lab crew back here. No, oh, why? Lots of tar tracks in this field. Ah, Prager's own car, probably. Yes, but there should be a set from Newcomb's car, too, if he drove in. When we get to court with him, I want to be able to prove it. First squad cars pulled in off the road here. We can use their radio phone. What unit is this? Now, let me see this number. Ah, there. 414. Thanks. 414 to Central. Central to 414. Go ahead, 414. Yeah, this is Mr. Garrett. Give me a telephone hook up to my office, please. Stand by. District Attorney's office. Mr. Garrett, Miss Miller. Yes, sir. I want a moulage crew from the lab to come back on this trailer case. Have them take castings of all unusual tire tracks that seem to be recent. Recent, yes, sir. I'll contact you again in a few minutes as Harrington and I drive in. And meanwhile, call the Braddock Aircraft Plant. Get the home address of Russ Newcomb. Russ Newcomb. Yes, he may be working. If he is, have the plant security put a watch on him until I get there. But tell them not to let him know he's being watched unless he tries to leave. And if he does try? Well, then they can take him into custody pending my arrival to make a formal charge of murder. This is David Bryan. Before we continue with Mr. District Attorney in the case of the frying pan murder, here is an important message I'd like you to hear. And now, back to David Bryan, starring as Paul Garrett, Mr. District Attorney. An aircraft worker had been murdered in his isolated trailer home. His brother-in-law had disclosed that there was bad blood between the victim and another worker at the plant, and that he had seen them together on the night of the killing. Harrington and I drove out to the plant, and the man we were after was on the job. He was pointed out by the plant security guard. Hey! Hey, you up there! Newcomb! You want me? Yeah! Knock off for a minute. Come down from the wing, will you? Be right there! Watch him, Harrington. Don't worry. What can I do for you? District Attorney's office. This is the DA, Mr. Garrett. My name's Harrington. Oh, police stuff, huh? Now, that's right, Newcomb. Let's go into the washroom there where we can talk. Well, what's up? You fellas find the woman who owned that purse? Purse? What purse? What are you talking about? Well, that's why you're here, ain't it? I found a woman's purse on the street about uh, two months ago. I turned it into the police. Well, we know nothing about that, Mr. Newcomb. It has nothing to do with our call. Oh. Well, what do you want to see me about? Do you know Joe Prager? Why, sure. Joe's my best friend. Uh, Joe ain't in any kind of trouble, is he? When did you see him last? Well, only last night. Remember what time? Well, uh, I reckon it was uh, about 7 o'clock. You go out to his trailer to see him? That's right. You say he was your best friend? Yeah. Other people say you weren't on speaking terms for the last couple of weeks. Well, we weren't. Until last night. We got in a dumb political argument one day during lunch here. Both got hotter than we should have. But you patched that up last night, huh? Yeah, that's right. That's why I went out to see Joe, to bury the hatchet. You sure you mean hatchet, not frying pan? Look, you fellas are asking me something, but you ain't telling me nothing. You, uh, you talked politics with Prager again last night? No. We just patched up our beef. I asked him to bring his wife over to supper with us tonight. And then I left. That's all. And Prager was still alive when you left? What do you mean? Was he still a... Still alive? Are you telling me that Joe's dead? Don't you know, mister? He was beaten to death last night with an iron frying pan. Joe? Joe Prager? Did you see anybody else at the trailer? No. No, we were alone. Just the two of us. Newcomb, the law requires me to warn you that anything you say from this point on can be used against you. Used against me for what? You're talking like I'm under arrest. You are under arrest for the murder of Joe Prager. But you're wrong. I... 
<laughs> Take these off. What are you doing to me? What did you do to Prager? Get moving, mister. You take him in, Harrington. I'll be back at the office by the time you have him booked. Where are you going? Down to the morgue. The body will be in by now, and I still haven't spoken to Prager's wife. had some kind of an argument. But I didn't think it'd ever be as bad as, as this. I never thought Russ would be the kind to kill him. <laughs> Was your husband having trouble with anybody other than Russ Newcomb? No. Did he seem worried? Troubled about anything? No. We were saving money. Saving for a down payment on a house and a piece of land back home in Texas. So Joe could be his own man someday. Working for that kept him happy. Now I'll be using what he saved to bury him. I'm sorry, Mrs. Pringle. Why did Russ do a thing like this to him? Why? Why? I don't know. I've never been able to understand why men do a lot of things they do to each other. I'll be in the next room for a while if you need me. Chief. Harrington, you booked Newcomb so quickly? Yeah, I turned him over to Charlie Rand. Thought you might need me. What's the stuff on the table? No, well, personal effects, the lab boys removed from Prager's clothing. Uh, there's a couple of things you ought to see. Like what? Well, this bank book for one it was in Prager's shirt pocket. Hmm. $930. Mm-hmm. All deposits the same. $30 each. Made every Friday, uh, the day after payday. Well, he won't make any deposits today. No, but yesterday was payday. But Prager's pay wasn't on him. No cash at all? Just what you see there. Less than a dollar and change. And he might have kept the money someplace in the trailer. Uh-uh. Their boys checked it. Not a dime. When you turned Newcomb over to Rand for booking, did Newcomb have any money on him? Eh, about five dollars, that's all. He's had since last night to hide the money, though, Chief. All we've got to do is find out where he hit it, and we've got a double motive for the killing. The bad butt for the argument they had, and robbery. The robbery makes me wonder if we've got any motive at all, so far as Newcomb is concerned. Well, what makes you say that? Remember what Newcomb said when we picked him up at the plant about finding a woman's purse and turning it over to the police? Yeah, yeah. I want to find out if he actually did, and if there was any money in the purse. What's the connection? A man who finds money in the street and turns it over to the police isn't liable to commit murder in the commission of a robbery. I'll call Miss Miller and have her check the police lost and found while we're on the way in. Well, while she's at it, I'll have her check with somebody else. Who? Newcomb's butcher. Newcomb's butcher? Now, that's right, Harrington. Newcomb said they were expecting the Pragers over for dinner tonight. I wanted to find out what kind of meat Mrs. Newcomb intended to serve. The Newcombs patronized a butcher shop on Emerson near Longacre Boulevard. Now, what about the order? Mrs. Newcomb ordered stewing beef yesterday for tonight's dinner, but she called up this morning and changed the order to lamb chops. Eight lamb chops. Was that a usual order? Eight chops? No, the butcher said she always ordered four at a time, but only for Sunday dinners. You figure anything from that, Chief? Well, don't you? Eight chops instead of four? Two apiece. They must have been expecting the Pragers. And Prager was dead and she put that order in. Newcomb might have told her to order them for a cover-up. Yeah, that's a little too smart, Harrington. Newcomb didn't strike me as being that clever. Well, that may be the lost and found report. I'll get it. Yeah. District Attorney's Office. Yes, Pete, let's have it. Our men find any sign of bloody clothing when they check Newcomb's place? No, but they're still checking dry cleaners and laundries. Thanks, Pete. Bye. Turn in a purse, all right, Mr. Garrett. The fourth precinct, two months ago. There's no identification in it, and it still hasn't been claimed. Any money in it? Eighty-three dollars. Well, Newcomb could have taken that and shoved it right in his pocket. Come on, Harrington. Where to now? Back to Prager's trailer. Uh, 
I don't know, Chief. We fine combed the place, and there's nothing we didn't see before. I see a deep heel and pointed toe marks on the ground there. A lot of them. Fragus, Chief. He wore western boots. Some regular shoe marks here. Not many. Hmm? Where? Damp ground leading toward the well. Yeah, it might have been one of the lab boys coming back for a drink. I don't think so. Why? Well, whoever it was sat down here, leaned back against the well with his feet stretched out. You can see where the edges of his heels were resting on the ground. Cigarette butt there, too. I want that lab crew back again. What for? To drag this well. For what? We've got the body and the murder weapon. I'm looking for clothing. Newcomb or anybody in a car might have driven away from here in bloody clothes and changed it home. But it was somebody on foot. They'd have had to hitchhike or take public transportation. They wouldn't try it in bloody clothes. You're figuring on Orville. Orville said he came here at 7 o'clock after he cast his check at Holland's. Yeah, yeah. And you know what goes on at Holland's on pay night. Backroom crap game in which Orville lost. How do you know? Because he left early. The winners don't leave early. The other players make them stick to the end. Yeah. Yeah. They get sore at a winner who quits without giving a chance to get even. Let's get that crew out here. Go on, get in there. Stop your pushing. What's the idea? What's this all about? Hello, Orville. Yeah. What's the idea of pulling me away from the ball game? What do you want now? A few things rolled up in that bundle on the lab table that you might be able to identify them. What are they? Open it. Find out. We found them in the well behind Prager's trailer, wrapped around a rock. Go ahead, Orville. Open it. Oh, Who's are they? Joe's or, or Newcomb's? We want you to tell us. The blood on them is Joe's. We know that. What's the matter, Orville? You look kind of sick. I, I, I'm just upset about Joe, that's all. I I was at the funeral home with my sister almost all night. Well, it's nice to relax at a ball game after such a rough night. All right, Orville, how about it? You ever see these things before? Yeah. Yeah, I think so. Who do they belong to? Well, I, I hate to say it, but... They look like Newcombs. Oh, that's funny. <laughs> yeah. That gives you fellas a real tight case against Newcomb now, don't it? It would, if it weren't for the laundry mark on the shirt. A laundry mark? That's right, Orville. Your laundry mark. <laughs> they, they can't be a laundry mark. They can't. They... Keep your hands <laughs> off those things. Let, let me go. I, let me go. I, I'm on my own. Might as well tell the truth now, Orville. It'll be better all around. I, I, I didn't do it. I, I didn't... All right, Harrington. Let's take him into the detention cells. My wife. My wife always hounded me about money. Always screaming about how hard she worked. Always yelling about how she was ruining her hands, scrubbing my work shirts. But she wasn't. She was sending them out to a laundry. A laundry, and I didn't know it. Laundry marks the lazy... I'll kill her. I'll kill her. You're not going to kill anybody, Orville. Not anymore. Your killing days are over. Oh, Mulligan, open it up. All right, Orville. Inside. This is David Bryan again. I hope you've enjoyed this case from the file of Mr. District Attorney. I'll be back in just a moment after this message from our sponsor. Now, here is the star of Mr. District Attorney, David Bryan, with a word about the program you have just heard. Orville James was tried and convicted on a charge of murder in the first degree with a mandatory death sentence. The case was appealed and a new defense of temporary insanity was made. 
But both the psychiatrists and the appellate judges ruled that Orville James was sane. He was subsequently executed in the manner prescribed by law. During all his time in the death house, he was alone. He never had a visitor. Now, this is David Bryan inviting you to join us when we present our next case based on the facts of crime from the file of Mr. District Attorney. Mr. District Attorney was originated by Phillips H. Lord. Mr. District Attorney, starring David Bryan. Mr. District Attorney, champion of the people, defender of truth, guardian of our fundamental rights to life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. And it shall be my duty as district attorney not only to prosecute to the limit of the law all persons accused of crimes perpetrated within this county, but to defend with equal vigor the rights and privileges of all its citizens. This is David Bryan. In a moment, we'll bring you another case from the files of Mr. District Attorney. But first, a word from our sponsor. And now, here is our star, David Bryan, as Paul Garrett, Mr. District Attorney. A district attorney knows that crime has its roots in emotion, and of these, the most deadly is greed. This case started in a large, badly kept junkyard on the outskirts of town near the city dump. The junk dealer and his wife are seated at the dinner table in the ramshackle house, but the man isn't eating. He's reading a newspaper. Will you stop reading that thing and eat your supper, Nick? I ain't hungry. You've had your nose buried in them new car ads ever since you got the check from the salvage company. Fat lot of good it's doing you. We can't buy one. Oh, well, we could. I didn't have to pay that Mexican for helping me. Well, you do have to pay him, so stop daydreaming. New car. You ain't never gonna do enough work on your own to get anything new, let alone a new car. You know what's good for your men, you'll stop picking on me. You could have taken the pipe and stuff out of those condemned buildings by yourself if you wasn't so lazy. Are you gonna shut up? Or are you looking for a punch in the mouth? I didn't mean nothing. All right. Shut your trap and keep it shut. Eighteen hundred dollars for that pipe, and I got to give half of it away. Well, there ain't nothing you can do about it, Nick. He knows you got the check. You were supposed to be paid as soon as the stuff was weighed out. You can't stall him much longer. He'll be coming over again tonight to ask for it. Uh, yeah. That'll be him now, Nick. Yeah. Coming right up to the front porch. Looks like he owned the place. Get busy with your dishes. I'll handle him. Well, Morales, what do you want? Oh, Mr. Howard, I come for my money for the work I do. I told you I'd bring it to you when it come. I ain't got it yet. I can't give you what I ain't got. Please, Mr. Howard, I don't like to bother you, but my wife, she's sick. We're going to have another baby. Well, oh, look... Nobody. I got troubles of my own, Morales. Well, I know you got the money, Mr. Robert. I call the salvage company, they say everything you paid. Oh. <laughs> so you're checking up on me, are you? Now, look, Morales. I'm going to tell you what I'll do. I'll... Here. It's better than you deserve. Here. 
Here's fifty dollars. For three months' work? Uh, go on, take it, and we'll just call it square. And if you don't like it, you and your family can get out of that shack of mine by morning. Oh, no, Mr. Robert, you don't cheat me. I want my money. All my money, $900. You better take this 50 while you can, Morales. Because it's all you're going to get. Mr. Robert, if you don't pay me now, I go tomorrow to the law. The law? <laughs> Why, well, you no good... Mr. Hall, oh, please, don't. you'll take that 50. You'll sign that paper right now, or I'm going to beat the life out of you. Nick, what's going on? Stay out of this, men. Rollis and I just made a deal. In the second drawer on the... No, don't sign no paper, Mr. Aubrey. No. Come back here, Morales. Come here. I go to the law. And you ain't going far. Nick! Nick, no, not the shotgun! Yeah, let go of me with it! Oh! Nick, you're crazy! Morales! Come back here! No! All right, then. You ain't never gonna reach that fence. <laughs> Nick! Nick, what did you do? Shut up. Shut up, Shut up, Pete. Rick? He's dead, man. Rick, what are you going to do? Will you shut up? Shut up now, I have. Let me think. I gotta think. I gotta think. And then we, we gotta move him someplace away from here. Come on. Help me lift him up. We, we gotta move him. Come on. Nick, I can't touch you. Come on, help me, I said. Keep your mouth shut. Forever. From now on, forever, you keep it shut. Or I'll shut it just like I shut his. Come on. Come on, grab his feet. Is, Chief. Department of Sanitation boys found them. They were bulldozing some of those ash heaps to level them out. Yeah, it's a good thing they saw him, Harrington. If he ever ran the bulldozer across here, he'd been buried for good. Yeah. Doc says he's been dead about 40 hours. You say the Missing Persons Bureau has a report on a man of this description? Uh-huh. Report was filed yesterday by a Mrs. Morales. Said her husband didn't come home the night before last. Well, that fits in with a month of time. The doc says he's been dead. Now, let's get a better look. Shotgun killing, huh? Yeah, yeah. He got it behind the head and through the back. Heavy charge. Gun was probably 12 gauge. You know where Morales lived? Yeah. One of those shacks on the edge of the dump someplace. None of them have any address. But when Mrs. Morales made the missing person report, she said the shack belonged to a junk dealer named Hubbard. Although it beats me how Hubbard owns anything that's standing on city property. Where is Hubbard's junkyard? Well, it's uh, way down at the end of the dump. About a mile and a half, that high board fence. Hey, see it? Yeah. You'll have to drive around past the gas works to get to it. There's no direct way from here, unless you want to ruin your car. Yeah, I'll go around. Herbert may be able to give us some information about Morales. I'll meet you in town when I'm finished. Okay, Chief. Yeah, we uh, heard about it maybe an hour ago. Somebody called to tell my husband. Let me turn this washing machine off, will you? So old you can't hear nothing when it's gone. Everything we've got is old. Junk my husband picked up someplace. Well, where is your husband now, Mrs. Hubbard? Oh, he uh, drove over to the shacks to tell Mrs. Morales and see if maybe there wasn't something he could do for her and the kids. Morales sometimes worked for my husband. Well, so I understand. Did Morales ever come here? Here to your home, I mean. Only when he had some business with Nick, my husband. When was the last time? Why, well, I can't say for sure, Mr. Garrett. Like I said, he'd come to see Nick on business. You'd probably be around when he came, though. When was the last time you saw him? Well, I, I can't say for sure. I'm... I'm too upset to think. Well, that's Nick's truck coming now. Nick will know. He'll tell you.
Uh, hello. Hello. Uh, Nick, this here man is Mr. Garrett, the district attorney. Oh. Well, sure glad to know you, Mr. Garrett. Seemed like an old friend. I voted for you so often. Uh, thank you, Mr. Hubbard. Hey. Is this your car? Mm-hmm. Boy. Sure is slick looking. I must ride like a dream. Nick, Mr. Garrett wants to know something about Morales. Yeah, I know. I... Well, I just left his widow. You know, this thing's hit her kind of hard. Sure feel awful sorry for her and them kids. Just a few things I want to know, Hubbard. When did you see Morales last? Your wife couldn't remember. Hmm? Well, you sure, sure are upset, men. Now, you ought to remember Morales stopped by here night before last. Well, I, I wasn't sure that... Night before last? Hmm? What time? Well, it was just after we finished supper, eight o'clock, maybe. Hmm. Same night he was killed. Huh? You, you mean he's been dead that long? Well, that's what the coroner thinks. You have any reason to think differently? Well, I, well, I mean, he, he was only found this morning. He's been missing since the night before last, though. His wife reported that to the police yesterday. You knew that, didn't you? Well, sh- sure, I knew it, but... Well, I, I figured he was off celebrating with that roll of money he had. What roll of money? Money I paid him for the job we did together. You mean you paid him when he stopped by here the night before last? Sure. Sure, I handed him $900. Wait. Wait a minute. What, Harvey? Something Mrs. Morales told me. Uh, just a while ago when I was over there. Somebody dropped in on Morales the night he disappeared. Who? One of the shantytown bums, a guy named Shorty. Morales wasn't there when he came. This the Shorty waited around for a while, and she said, and then he then he said he he'd walk across the dump toward my place, see if he couldn't meet Morales on the way. You know, you ask me, this Shorty may be the man you're after. It sounds like a strong possibility, Hubbard. I'm going to see Mrs. Morales and get more information about Shorty, whoever he is. Want to tell me how to get there? Well, uh, I'll do better than that, Mr. Garrett. I'll, I'll drive over with you. Oh, fine. Let's go. Goodbye, Mrs. Hubbard. Uh, bye, men. I'll be back later. Goodbye. Oh, uh, okay if we take your car, Mr. Garrett? Sure. You know, you jounce around too much in my old truck. It's ought to be a pleasure for me to ride in a new job like yours, eh? Hop in. Yeah. Ah, boy. Sure is smooth. I'm going to get me a new car soon. Ah, sure does hum, don't you? Yeah. Now, which way do I go? Hmm? Oh, uh, through the gate and turn left. Ah, Sure is a shame, Bob Morales. But I... uh, Guess you ain't gonna have much trouble finding your killer once Mrs. Morales tells you where to look for that, that fellow Shorty, huh? Seems like he had a motive, all right. Sounds like the killer to me. I hope you get him, Mr. Garrett. Morales was a mighty fine worker, mighty fine. Hate to see anybody get away with killing him. Oh, man. Yeah, this, this is a fine car, ain't it? Hey, j- just, just listen to her purr. <laughs> This is David Bryan. Before we continue with Mr. District Attorney in the case of the murderous junk man, here is an important message I'd like you to hear. And now, back to David Bryan, starring as Paul Garrett, Mr. District Attorney. The body of Juan Morales, a junk man's helper, had been found in the city dump. The dead man's employer directed me to a threadbare but cleanly scrubbed shack where the widow lived with two wide-eyed kids who clung to their mother's skirt. There was heartbreak in her eyes, but she kept it smothered for the sake of the children until she sent them out so we could talk. Go. Go. Lean the back. Pepito. Help Rosa find her doll. I, I try not to cry when they are near me. Take it easy, Mrs. Morales. Easy? What is easy? Life is hard for me. 
for them. And now they have no father to turn to. Now, nah, now, nah, everything's going to be all right. I told you you can stay on here, rent-free. We didn't want to stay here. We were going to move away to, to the apartment house for the new baby that is going to come. As soon as you gave Juan his money, why did you make him wait so long? Oh, well, for I... For three days, every day he asks you for his share. And you keep saying that you don't get the check yet. What is this, Hubbard? Oh, well, I... I didn't want to give Juan the money. I I wanted to give it to Mrs. Morales here. I, I asked him to bring her down to the house to collect it. Why? To make sure it went to her and the kids, that's all. Mrs. Morales, Herbert says you told him about somebody coming here to borrow money from your husband the night he didn't come home. See, the man who works with Juan at the brickyard one time, two years ago. They call him Shorty. His name is Shorty Davis. Did you tell him that your husband had gone over to Hubbard? See? Yet he said he would not wait anymore. He would walk across the dump and try to meet Juan, and then he went away. Where does Shorty live? I don't know. The shacks of that way. I'll have my men check them all. They'll get him. I'll see that somebody comes to give you some help, Mrs. Morales. Goodbye for now. Goodbye. Come on, Hubbard. I'll drive you home. Here's the ballistics report on the Morales killing, Mr. Garrett. Oh, thanks, Miss Miller. Any report on Shorty Davis yet? I don't know, but Harrington got his way in. All right. Anything worthwhile in this? A few things, I think. The shotgun pellets followed a downward trajectory, indicating that the gun was fired from above and behind the victim. Hi, Chief. Oh, hello, Harrington. Just got the ballistics report. Yeah, I know. Morgan handed me a copy when I passed the lab. I read it in the elevator on the way up. And what about Shorty Davis? Yeah, we're too late, Chief. Looks like he's making a run. Why? I will locate at his shack. A few of the dump tramps said he took off a couple of hours ago with his clothes in a bundle. You put out an all-points bulletin? Yeah, gave it to the radio division a half hour ago. He won't run too far if they spot him. Well, how come? He's got a bad leg. Broke it in a transit accident on the subway three months ago. He's got a civil suit pending against the transit company. It's supposed to come up in court tomorrow, but he won't be there. I want that courtroom covered just the same. Yeah, it will be. But he's the kind that... I'll get it. District Attorney's office. That's right, Lieutenant. Good, I'll tell him. He'll probably be over right away. Lieutenant Levis from the 9th Precinct. One of his prowl cars just picked up Shorty Davis. They're holding him. Good. Come on, Harry. Let's go. Levis say where they picked him up? Yes, sir, the railroad yards. He was trying to get into an empty boxcar on a southbound freight. Not that he had to take a freight train. What do you mean by that? Levis says he had a couple hundred dollars in his pocket. Come on. Just sit down right there. Cross the table. Yeah. Hello, look, won't somebody tell me why them cops picked me up? I ain't done nothing. If you haven't, you've got nothing to worry about. Where are you heading for? Florida. I got a bad leg. I wanted to get where it's warm. Why see? the rush? You've been around here a couple of months with that bad well, leg. Well, I, I couldn't go before. They're rough on tramps down there. I was waiting to get some money. Well, apparently you got it all right. And we want to know where you got it. Well, I got it from the subway company. I busted my leg in the subway. Your suit doesn't come up before the judge until tomorrow morning. Yeah, well, we settled it out of court yesterday. They give me $300. It won't take long to find out if you're telling the truth. Who's your lawyer? Robert Hoxie over on Center Street. Call him, Harrington. Right. Listen, mister, tell me something, will you? Sergeant. What do you think I got the money? You'll find out later, Shorty. Do you have the whole 300 you claim you settled for? Yeah. Well, all except a couple of bucks I spent for eating. What time did you leave your shack this morning? Oh, left it early. As soon as I knew the bank was open, I could get my money. They give me a check. And you didn't know that Juan Morales was found dead this morning? Yeah. Dead? Morales? Murdered. He was murdered the night you stopped by his shack to see him. Oh, I never got to see him that night. But you did stop by the shack. Yeah, but he wasn't home. His wife could tell you that, Esther, huh? 
Your story about the money is legitimate, Chief. I know it is. I'm telling you the truth. And just keep on telling it. Mrs. Morales told you where her husband went that night, didn't she? Just that he was over to Hubbard's junkyard. Didn't you say you were going down there to meet him? Yeah, that's right. Well, look, I wanted to borrow a couple of bucks, see, because one knew me. We worked together once, and we used to borrow, you know, from each other, and I always paid him back. We're not checking you for a credit rating, Shorty. What we want to know is what happened after you met Morales. I, I didn't ever meet him, I told you. I must have waited, oh, half hour, maybe. Then I seen the Hubbards come walking through the gate. Walking? So I... And you didn't let them know you were there. Why? Oh, I'll tell you why, mister. I didn't want Hubbard asking me what I was doing on his property at night when he was out. Yeah? What were you afraid of? A shotgun, if you want to know. A shotgun. He's a mean guy. You'd ask anybody in Shantytown. He thinks everybody's crooked. He's afraid they'll cart some of that junk off and sell it off to another junkie. He has a shotgun, huh? Ooh, you bet he does. He near blasted one of the guys once. The Hubbards could have been walking back from the dumps, Harrington. You mean they might have packed Morales' body out there? Why would they kill him? Hubbard's been stalling Morales on some money he owed him. And his excuse was full of holes. <laughs> I'm going to call Miss Miller. Shorty can repeat what he told us and sign it. District Attorney's office. Garrett, Miss Miller. I want you to take a cab over here to the 9th Precinct. Take a statement from Shorty Davis. Have him sign it. Was it a confession? No, he's not the man. Whoever the man is, I hope you get him soon. Why? What's the matter? Mrs. Morales collapsed at the morgue after she identified her husband's body. He had to take her to General Hospital. How bad is it? She lost the baby she was carrying, Mr. Garrett. I'll see you later. What are you so mad about, Chief? I don't want to talk about it right now. Listen, Shorty. Yeah? How did you get into Hubbard's yard? If you were so afraid of him, you didn't use the gate. No. There's, uh, there's a couple of loose boards in a fence. You know, a part that runs right alongside the dump? Thanks. We're going to have a look at that place, Harrington, without being seen. What's she watering with that hose, Chief? No plants or anything growing there, not even grass. I know. He's been out it for some time, too. <sighs> What's she want a mud puddle in the middle of the yard for? The rest of the place looks like it never got water. Come on. You gonna let her see us? I want to find out why she's doing that. Hubbard isn't around. His truck is gone. Good evening, Mrs. Hubbard. Uh, oh, hello. You frightened me. Excuse me, collector of the saw. I'll get it. The ground seems kind of dry. It's wet enough now. At least this one spot is. Wet enough to cover any blood stains that might have seeped into the ground. Well, I don't understand what you mean. Don't you? Let's have a good look around here, Harrington. What are you looking for? Maybe I can help you. If we find what we want, we won't need your help. If there was anything, Chief, it's washed away for good. Much an inch thick all the way over to that old car cushion on the ground. It's a car cushion. Look at it, Harrington. Hmm? I don't see... Hey. Hey. It's riddled with small holes. The same kind of holes that shotgun pellets might make. The full charge didn't hit Morales. Some of them went past him. Nick didn't kill Morales. He didn't. He committed two murders if the truth is known, Mrs. Hubbard, because Mrs. Morales just lost the new baby she was expecting. Oh, oh no. Where's the shotgun? In the house, I'll show you. We started water in there after you brought him back from Morales' shack. And he told me to do it. Just keep wetting it down good till it was all soaked. The gun is behind that bureau hanging on nails. He put it there. Yeah, 12 gauge, all right, Chief. Maybe I ain't a good wife. Maybe I shouldn't have told you. But I feel better about it now. Some night, maybe I'll sleep again if I live to be old enough. Where's your husband now, Mrs. Hubbard? I don't know. He just walked out this afternoon whistling. Whistling like he owned the world. Chief, Chief, there's a car just turned into that gate. That don't sound like Nick's truck. It isn't a truck, Mrs. Hubbard. It's a car. A brand new car. Get away from the window, Harrington. Nick! 
Hey, men! Come out and give your eyes a treat. Don't answer him. Men! Hey, men, why didn't you... Oh. Hello, Mr. Garrett. I, uh, I forgot Don't something. Don't move, Mr. You know this shotgun is loaded. It's yours. I told him, Nick. What? I told him everything. How you tried to cheat Morales, how you shot him in the uh, trap. Shut, shut your crazy mouth! No, you don't. Oh. Don't try that again. Now get up. Uh, you <sighs> finally got a new car, didn't you, Nick? You know where you're going to drive it, don't you? You know where? <laughs> Come on, Nick. This time we'll use your car. This is David Bryan again. I hope you've enjoyed this case from the file of Mr. District Attorney. I'll be back in just a moment after this message from our sponsor. Now, here's the star of Mr. District Attorney, David Bryan, with a word about the program you have just heard. It took a jury less than 15 minutes to return with a verdict of murder in the first degree against Nick Hubbard. He was subsequently executed. Mrs. Hubbard, an unwilling accessory, was sentenced to prison for a term of five years. With the help of civil authorities, Mrs. Morales was able to find and maintain a more suitable home for her minor children. And now this is David Bryan inviting you to join us when we present our next case based on the facts of crime from the file of Mr. District Attorney. Mr. District Attorney was originated by Phillips H. Lord. (laughs) 